This videotape is edited from an advanced training in Boulder, Colorado, May 1988. Many of the participants had also attended two advanced trainings with Richard six and nine months earlier. The first day of the training, Richard teaches and installs the major elements of a positive learning strategy in preparation for the next three days. The rest of the training is devoted to how people build and maintain generalizations using time and metaprogram distinctions. Since this training is a carefully sequenced one, you will gain most by viewing the tapes in order. The, the thing that I want to start with this morning is, is, is a tune-up thing. Uh, basically, what I want you to do is to close your eyes. That's where the lids go down. And some of you have trouble with that, I know, but you'll learn. But now, <laughs> now what I want you to do is I want you to go inside and I want you to stop and I want you to pick something that you are extremely motivated to do each time you do it. That as soon as you think about whatever the particular activity is, that one of the things you find is that you are readily motivated. Okay? Now, what I want you to do is to take that particular phenomenon, I want you to examine, you know, whether there are images, where are the images, how big the images are, how close, and what kind of sound is there. Now, this may require, if some of you can go way back to the ancient days of strategies, that you run through it more than one time. Because one of the things we're going to begin with here is to dissect some of the aspects that have to do with motivation. Now, in particular, for those of you who who have as one of the steps in your strategy that, that you have images and you step inside them, I want you to pay particular attention to what angle you enter from. Now, one of the things that I want you to do is, is to go through it, run through it, and find till you get to the feeling of being motivated to do whatever the phenomenon is. Then I want you to go back to the beginning and I want you to begin to slow it down. So whatever the strategy is, that you literally yourself take a deep breath and begin to slow it down. Now what we want to do at this point in time is to begin to examine for yourself by stopping for a moment and going and finding something which you do get motivated to do, but it isn't easy. It's one of those things where you have to compel yourself. But once you get going, once you get into the activity, you do fine, but getting a jump start is hard. Now, I want you then to run through that particular one. Again, notice things about where the location of the images are, the size, the clarity, the focus, and particularly the direction of sound, how close the sound is. If it appears to be coming from the left, does it appear to be coming from three feet, two feet, two inches, or almost already be inside your head? If it comes from the back or the front, and whether images and sounds and feelings start at what azimuth, that being directly at eye level, straight across being zero azimuth, and those things above being plus 10, plus 20, 45, and going down the same way. Because the direction of sounds and the directions of images themselves becomes extremely vital in the kinds of things as we're doing, or at least the things we're going to start with. Now, as you run through the thing that's a little bit harder to get jump started, it may in fact be the same strategy or it may be one which is only similar. Now, what I want to do is to now roll back to the one that actually motivates you and run through to the moment, the point at which you actually begin to get motivated, where the jump start, so to speak, occurs. Because there'll be a point in the strategy that we used to call in the old days a kicker. That is, where you get from the point of warming up to the point where actually the feeling engages where you begin to get fired up. And I want you to take whatever images are there and whatever sounds are there and whatever feelings, and what I want you to do is to begin to blow them up so that they begin to become more dynamic. Now, one of the things I've noticed is some people's idea of a large internal images is something that's three inches by three inches. And what I've discovered is that when these, pe these people ask me questions, of, you know, with their idea of being dynamic, is somewhere between a yawn, you know, and a burp, as far as I'm concerned. The thing is, is I want you to begin now to start by taking the internal images you have and push them back away from you a little bit. And as you push them back, I want you to have them get bigger. And I'm talking really bigger, 
we're talking 30 to 40 feet high and 30 to 40 feet wide with a curved screen. Now, as soon as you hit that height and that dimensionality, I want you to freeze your screen. I want it to curve all the way around to the edges of your peripheral vision. And if you want to get creative, go 360 all the way around. And when you blow it out, I want you to hold the screen as a clear glass frame and then take everything that's behind it and put it in three dimensions. Vivid, so that it is actually behind, like you're looking through a window and seeing it outside the window. And add three-dimensionality to it. Make the colors more vivid. Now, I want you to do the same thing with sound, with whatever sound is connected to it. Again, I want you to push the sound away, but as it gets away, I want it to become fuller, louder, and again, at a certain distance, I want you to just hold that distance steady of wherever the origin of sound is. And I want you to build for you a thing where the sound comes from all directions around you. 360 degrees up and down. So sounds are coming from above you, below you, behind you, from the side of you. And again, give it full rich timbre. Now, for some of you who may not have, in your strategy, had much sound, throw an orchestra around you. A full tilt, big orchestra. Not a string quartet, but the full regalia. Maybe a choir of black singers will help. <laughs> now, as you begin to build this kind of a three-dimensional representation, both in sounds, I want you to do the same thing. But I want you to test the magnitude of your feelings by taking the image and the sound, what we might call a sensorium that surrounds you. And what I want you to do is take it and turn it 15 degrees to the right while you remain steady, and then turn it 15 degrees back just so that you can feel that it's there. If it has no kinesthetic effect, you are doing this wrong. Then I want you to take the whole thing and tilt it 15 degrees to an angle forward and pull it 15 degrees back up straight. And if that don't jolt your kinesthetics, you are doing this wrong. Go back to the beginning and rebuild it. Now, this is going to become the essential tool because as you begin to magnify these internal things, it should beginning, begin to light your fire in terms of the point of a jump start. Now, taking this kind of a representation, what I want you to do is to rotate back to the beginning of the strategy and run through it with this kind of a representation to the point of the jump start and beyond. Is it different that way? Now, what I want you to do is, as soon as you get to that point, what I want you to do is to stop, and I want you to take your timeline, and I want you to magnify out into the future. Look out into the future of the next four days, and I want you to see yourself in the kind of representation I just built. Don't go back to some dinky little two-dimensional fart-ass internal representation. Keep the big picture, so to speak and go into the future during the next four days and see yourself going to do exercises and going to talk people in this state and find yourself being motivated to do so. Because we've got a lot of things we can do and some of them are going to be complicated, some of them are going to be easy, but they'll all be fun if you can build into yourself a couple of things and that's what we're going to start with. Now, Whenever dealing with strategies, especially motivation strategies, one of the things that's important is to use your own motivation to be able to dig through these things. For a long time, people have talked about strategy installation. If you are going to bother to install strategies, install big ones. You know, because when you let people do this on their own, they build dinky little pictures and have squeaky little voices. You know, they don't bother to put rich, full voices. If they have an internal voice that says, go do this, it doesn't say, go do this. It goes, well, would you go do this? This isn't the kind of stuff we want. We want it to be rich and full. Now, you can go ahead and reorient back here, but hold the feeling constant. 
Now, as your eyes open, I want you to hold the feeling and I want you to pay attention to where it's located. And I want you to stop for a minute and think, when I began to get motivated, where did the feeling begin? Where's the first location that I noticed it? And then the second location, and the third location, and the fourth location. In other words, did you start with a feeling in your stomach? Maybe it broadened out to your chest, and then maybe some tingling in your fingers. And maybe your feet felt like they were claws and wanted to run. Now, what I want you to do is, as you notice those locations, then I want you to stop in your mind, stay on the outside with your eyes and ears, and then just pay attention to those locations in that order, and cycle around about five times. While you pay attention on the outside with your other senses. That's like having your eyes open. And seeing. <laughs> just internally, just take your kinesthetics and cycle through the locations, each time amplifying the feeling a little more while keeping your eyes and ears clear. You don't have to say anything to yourself, you don't have to make any pictures, just do it with a kinesthetic lead and stay on the outside so you can notice things and breathe and blink all at the same time. <laughs> The breathe part counts, by the way. That's where you go. <gasps> hey, hey, how's it going? <laughs> when are we going to do something? <laughs> <laughs> now, what we're going to talk about is impatience. <laughs> well, what we're going to do is we're going to do this insecurity. <laughs> it's one of my favorite ambiguities from Milton. Come on, you guys, wake up. <laughs> if I'm awake, you have to be. It's a rule, unless we're doing hypnosis, but not yet. Now, these are too small, Steve. I can't write this small. <laughs> you ever noticed on forms when they give you a place to sign your name, they give you a little space about this big. Who the fuck signs their name that small? I don't, I don't understand that. Now. What we're going to start with here is we're going to start with some elicitation. And I'm assuming, of course, being this is an advanced group, that you guys know how to elicit strategies. You, you guys all remember that, right? <laughs> Basic strategy elicitation. Okay, now the components of how we're going to elicit the strategy has two dimensions that we're, going, that we're going to start with. And I'm going to assume that you know how to do this. If you don't find a partner who does, for God's sake, do it in a group of three and let the other person do the work and figure out what they're doing as you go along, okay? Don't just get lost and sit there and go, I don't know what's going on. You know, there's enough people here that know enough. And if your partner seems to be having trouble and told you they know how to do it, get a new partner. <laughs> and remember, when you do this, you're going to elicit strategies from other people and stick them in yourself. Be choosy about who you do it with. You know, if you find somebody, if you get somebody's motivation strategy and they're the kind of person that, like when they break for the exercise, sits around and waits for somebody to come to them and stuff, bad choice. Okay, now, the dimensions that we want, because, because I, I want to go back to something. You guys all remember in the beginning of, you guys have read NLP Volume 1, right? No? Okay, well, if you haven't, then this will be new to you. If you have... It's, I'm going to go through that part in the beginning that, that seemed, it was, was supposed to be informative, but it turned out to be the confusion technique. Um, there was a sentence of arithmetic that we put in there. Now, this is a sentence of the language called arithmetic. Now, the, the reason we put it in the book was as we went through and we described that when you look at this, it says 100 equals 100. It doesn't give you new generalizations. It doesn't give you directions to go in, given just its form. Now, all the techniques that, that we deal with, and I'm going to go through, I'm going to actually, during the course of the next four days, I'm going to go back to some things. For example, the meta model. I keep discovering this is the most misunderstood tool of all of them. It is not designed to torture people by going, and what specifically? <laughs> You know, meta-monsters. Um, 
that, especially the people that learn to do it with that thing with the hand. <laughs> That's right. It should be shaped like this, <laughs> the way they do it. Because, I mean, these, peop these people don't understand. Is it's, it's, not, it's not that we're trying to use Pavlov's technique, you know, where you hear a sentence and you bark out an answer. This is not what it's about. Those are digital examples of how to use an information tool. It doesn't, you see, like when somebody says a sentence, you are not required to bark out a question. You can actually listen to two, three, four sentences in a row. All you have to do is notice what's going on and that you use the actual tools themselves to elicit information so you can understand how a person builds generalizations and how they preserve them by distorting and deleting information. That's what the structure of magic is about. Now, if we take this sentence here, and the first thing we do is we simply sequence the information that's in it. That is, we simply put it in a different order than it's in. Not the right order, just a different order. Now, when you sit down and you begin to do anything with any human being, especially NLP, what you are deliberately trying to do is to reorder their experience. Not to find the right order, but to put it in an order. An order from which it will make it easier for them to build new generalizations. See, whether people have strategies or whether they get installed when you elicit them isn't the question. The point is, is if you don't like the one they have, you can elicit a different one. <laughs> it's a great piece of installation. Don't ever underestimate it. That while you're doing, while you're doing elicitation, you're always doing installation. And as long as you know it, you can do a good job. If you always go and elicit bad strategies from people, think about it. It might be you. See, I know a particular very famous neurolinguistic programmer who kept eliciting the same strategies from everybody. And guess whose strategy it was? Theirs, of course. Now, if we take this and reorder it and make it a sentence which says 1 plus 8 plus 27 plus 64 uh, equals 100. Okay, we're actually 97 plus, or 3 plus 97, but it doesn't matter. What happens is, is the first thing we've done is we've given it a new order. And the order we've given it has to start with arbitrary meaning. But it's a, it's a more logical order. Now, for numbers, this is more logical. Now, in experience, whenever we do anything, whether it's a phobia cure or all these things, this is what we're doing to people. We're first going through and resequencing their experience. Now, once you resequence somebody's experience, then, and only then, if you don't want to confuse the shit out of yourself and them, you then rechunk their experience. Now, with some techniques, these things are built in, so you do it almost simultaneously. But when you're actually going through and doing work where you're figuring out things and how to build new things and working with individuals that don't already, you know, because people walk in, they say, I have a phobia. You go, whoosh, tsh, chop it off. <laughs> now, if you're lucky, and I do mean this, if you're lucky, then you'll end up where you get something where, where suddenly the tools break down. Now, this is when the last time that I did uh, a master track, I gave people a test. I told them they had to write a fictitious transcript. That is, they had to play both parts of the transcript. And I told them a person walked in who had a phobia. Okay, and this will be one of your challenges, of course, for the next four days. The person had a phobia of seeing themselves in the mirror. <laughs> what do you do? But write that down and answer it later. I actually had the client, when they walked in, I went, ooh, oh boy. And if that's not your response to that kind of thing, if it's uh-oh, right, then the new motivation strategy you're going to install today is going to have to have a certain piece in it, which is that, that what makes something worth doing is that it's a challenge. Because we're going to do something about changing certain people's values there. I found out there's too many people looking for the easy way to do. It's like they have to screen their clients in order to find out which ones the techniques will work with. That way they only have to learn three techniques. Learn three simple techniques and qualify your clients and send the rest away. You can do the same thing over again. Of course, a computer could do it too, but, you know, why waste a machine when you can have a person do it? That's what I always say. <laughs> now, once you read Chunk, the same thing. And build a new representation. What happens is, is you can begin 
as a function of the form of the representation, having been resequenced, having been rechunked, you can then begin to notice things and to ask new questions from which you can build new generalizations. You cannot do it without. For example, if you notice 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 equals 10. So if you notice, these are all you know, cubes over there, and, and it equals 10 squared. So that if you add you know, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, it equals 10. These are all cubes. That's a square. You can ask questions that you couldn't ask before. For example, if you made all of these to the fourth power, would this come out to the third power? You can ask the question, if I took all of these and added a 5 cubed, would it then equal 15 squared? And in fact, it does. Now, this means that you can then say, well, if I added a 6 cubed, would I then come out with 21 squared? And so on and so forth. And in fact, you do. Now, what happens is, is then you can then make a formula which tells you that, you know, uh, you know n, n cubed plus n plus 1n cubed equals, you know, n squared, n being the numbered. Now, you can make that formula so that you could predict, no matter how many numbers were there, what the answer would be, whether it would be valid or invalid. The formula being the same thing as a human generalization. This is not possible the formula or the belief or the generalization is not possible even though you can't actually sit down and do the infinite number of cases that are possible you still know from enough examples that it's going to work and you can build that generalization and that belief and if you live in the land of mathematics you can operate on, on use it and it actually has practical application in the world of higher mathematics but it's no different than the beliefs that you form in your life you can't build new ones without resequencing and rechunking. It's the way in which it's accomplished. Now, as you go through and pull out somebody's motivation strategy, the thing that's going to come out is, is, is just like in, you know, when we did it before, things are going to fall out of it. For example, it will tell you how they can get stuck. It'll tell you which things are easier to be motivated to do. Somebody has a purely visual strategy where they have to see themselves doing things, then they're not going to do a lot in the dark, for example. I mean, there's real obvious stuff that falls out. and People will go, oh, well, that's a cheap example. Well, that's the thing about it, is they're all cheap examples. That the kinds of things that, you know, for example, if people don't have a visual portion, I mean, it's like people who don't make good visual representations don't spell well, you know. And I mean, that's a cheap example, too. But all of these things fall out. Now, the thing about the, the pattern over here, about learning to resequence and rechunk, is to keep in mind that this is what you're up to. When you discover, a, first you want the sentence of arithmetic, and then you want to know things about the order in which it occurs, and then you want to know things about the size of the pieces, because you're going to artificially alter it. Now, here are going to be some of the things that we're going to look for, all at the same time, because I want to start off with something hard and get more complicated as we go along. See, this is the fun part about doing an advanced group. See, because those of you who have a motivation strategy at the end of this exercise in which you respond to challenges being fun are going to have a lot of fun in this workshop. Those of you who don't are going to suffer a lot. <laughs> this I promise you. So if you get the first exercise right, you're going to have a good time. If you fuck this up, you're in deep shit. That's a technical description. Now, in terms of the sequence, the sequence we want is, is in basically the order in which representational systems themselves are paid attention to. That is, you know, do the, we have to start, for example, you remember the old thing about the tote? Right. Test, operation, test, okay. Well, the initial test itself is going to have within it certain components. For example, when people, in order for it to be an operation where they're going to start the operation of getting motivated, it has to meet some kind of a criterion. So you're going to find inside the sequence that there's going to be a representational system, okay, and the initial test itself will have usually something external, and then it'll have an internal loop where they're going to go through and they're going to make what we could call a mini decision. And you will find that this is going to have to meet something that will fit what we call criteria. Now, 
the thing is, is what kinds of things, mo you can ask questions like what kinds of things motivate you as opposed to which things don't. And if you ask that and just let them give you some examples and kind of talk around it, it's going to fall right out. Now, one of the other things you can do is literally have them uh, go into an altered state where they see which things motivate themselves more than others. And you'll find that there's a hierarchy. And that some people, for example, are motivated by things that they can do quickly. You know, for example, they are highly motivated to eat chocolate cake, right? Uh, some people are motivated. Now, you're going to find that, that inside of this, you're going to, you're going, what's going to, one of the things that's going to fall out is you're going to start getting information about meta programs. Okay, and what I'd like to, what I'd like to, to warn you is to not get lost in it. Because there'll be a few things, for example, some, motivation, some people are motivated to avoid, and some people are moving towards as opposed to people that are moving away. And that, that component of metaprograms may be important. But the, not, I don't want you to go into eliciting their metaprogram, because really what you're after is just the minimum piece of information that gives you the sequence that keeps, keeps them moving in order, so that they go from the test to the operation phase. Now, the operation phase is whatever they have to do to crank themselves into being motivated. In a lots and lots of cases, you will find that that's a loop. By comparing the case where they can be motivated instantly from the one where they really have to work at jump-starting themselves, the one where they have to work at jump-starting themselves is the one that will give you the operation phase. The one where they're motivated instantly will give you the first test. Now, then you want the test is how do they know when they're motivated, how to stop motivating themselves and start doing. Right? Now, you'll, if you go back to the first example, you will find that, that the operation is, very, is, is accomplished very quickly. So therefore, you'll get information about the second test a lot easier. Now, by picking different kinds of examples, the examples which will most exemplify the information you want, whenever you do a elicitation of any kind, the trick is, is to pick your example so that you have them go through a series of different things so that it, the information is easier for you to get. Whether it's harder for them is not the problem. You want to make it so that you emphasize whatever it is that you want to know about. Now, the other thing that you're going to need here is as you go through, you're going to find out things about the natural chunk size. Because one of the things I can guarantee you is, is that if you really want to change the way in which they're motivated, which you may or may not want to do, but if the person wants to be motivated a lot quicker and a lot easier, and for our purposes here, that's going to require almost instantaneous motivation when they look at something that's really difficult. You know, if you take the kind of person that when they looked at fractions went, Bleh! right, and you want to be able to make it so they go, oh boy, since I don't understand it at all, this is going to be great. Look at all the stuff I can learn. This is the subtle shift we want. <laughs> okay, now when you look at the natural chunk size, what you're going to be looking at, and you want to elicit examples where the motivation strategy doesn't work versus where it does, because what you want here is literally submodalities. And you want to know, because submodalities are, if you remember in strategies how there were different rep systems and there was arrows in between them, you know, it's like there'd be a visual construction and then an arrow and a K. And then it would go in a loop four or five times and then it would go to, you know, something else and A sub D. You guys remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is yes. Okay. Because if I don't know if you understand this, then, you know, it's tough in this workshop. But other times it would matter. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. That's a lie. Now, the thing is, is what those arrows are is a shift in a submodality or more than one submodality. For example, as it, as it runs through a visual construction, okay, you make a visual construction, even a decision strategy, where somebody's trying to decide what, what they'd like to make for dinner. So they visualize a meal, right? And they look at it, and they, they even, maybe even get some of the taste, and then feel how they would feel if they ate it, right? And then they run through, and they visualize another one. Well, if they run through, now some people do it with numbers. They do three, and they pick. Some people can go on forever. Some people take the one meal, and then they go through, and it feels like too much. So they just delete one of the things that's on the menu, or they reduce the portions. Or they do something to change what's in the image. Now, by changing what's in the image and checking their feelings, how do they know how to get out of the loop? How do they know to move from the visual construction to checking their feelings? Because they're making a picture, how do they know when they've done? 
Now, typically, it will have something to do with not just what's on the plate, because they could put anything on the plate. They're picturing you know, a plate of food, you know, and they, do they do it till the plate is full? And that's how they stop? If so, this is somebody that's going to have trouble dieting, unless they get small plates, you know, inside their head at least, you know. Buy new dishes and make smaller pictures. Now, one of the things, and this, by the way, is a legitimate way in which people have difficulty with this. Now, one of the other solutions is that people make the image and it, it becomes clear or it gets closer, like they adjust it and then at a certain point, they pull it up, check their feelings. If their feelings don't work, they push the image back, change what's on the plate. Now, some people will move it from side to side, all kinds of variations. What you want to know is the actual shift, what goes from what to what for them to move to the next step. You don't want to know everything, just that. So that you have an idea of which shifts make them move from which representational system to another in terms of their primary focus in what we call a step in a strategy. Does that make sense? Now, I realize this is a lot of information to go and get, but it really shouldn't take you that long if you make the person you're working with do the work for you. Now, think about it this way. When you ask them for examples, the example, and this is the real pattern that I want to teach you here to start with, is, is that when you're getting information from an individual, it's not that you just compare two different examples to find out what's going on. Pick your examples precisely so that they emphasize whatever part of the strategy you want to elicit. So, and the way you do it is by making whatever part you want to know about, pick an example where that part is difficult. The very description of, of when you pick something that you get motivated to do, and once you're going, there's no problem. It's like something you know you want to do, but you have a difficult time getting motivated to do it, and once you get there, it's easy. That's a description of pick a, a time where your operation phase doesn't work that well and takes a long time. That will put it more into their consciousness and will give you better quality information. Does that make sense? Now, the same thing is true with the submodality shifts. It's like when, you want it, when you're going through the motivation part, you want to pick one where it gets stuck at the stage where you want to, where you want to get the information. So as you're going through, if you know you're moving from where they have, you know, let's say they have a visual construct where they see themselves doing the activity, Right? And they say, and then I step inside the picture. Well, your question is, how do they know when? Because submodality questions are when questions. They're the ones that tell you about when, what we would call being in one step in a strategy. When you're in that step, you're still shifting submodalities until one of them lets you go to the next gate, through the gate that allows you to be in the next step in the strategy. So if you're making a picture where you're seeing yourself do the activity, well, what allows you to know when it's time to step in? You know, and people will say things to you like, well, when it becomes clear. You know, ooh, well, that's simple. That tells you that they have to be able to focus the image. Now, it may also have to do with distance. And one of the things I want you to do is that when you get an answer that seems definitive and simple, I also want you to try having them do it and messing up a couple of others. Like if, they, if, you ask, if you ask, well, is there any difference in the distance when you're constructing the picture as opposed to when it comes focus? Because a lot of times the images will come in focus by, by moving up. And I want you to pay attention because a lot of times there may be a double shift in submodalities. So you, what you do is you have them hold other analog sh systems of submodalities constant. Like don't change the distance and pull it into focus. And sometimes people will go, I can't! And then you'll know that there's more than one. Okay, does this make sense? Okay, this is beginning phase of the operation. This is just the first step in the exercise. Now, what I want you to do is to get into groups of two or three. You don't need to elicit them from all of you. Just get one or two examples because you can do that, this at home in your spare time. I want you to learn how to do it. That's the important part of this. So let's start out by taking 20 minutes and in each group only do two people. So if you're in a group of three, only two of you are going to get your strategy elicited. The important part is going to have to do with installation later on. You can all do the installation phase. But let's start with the elicitation phase, OK? 20 minutes apiece, meet me back here. One of the reasons that it was not essential for you to elicit all the information is that you may have discovered that, not in all cases, but my suspicion is, is that some of these strategies might have been any strategy that took that long to elicit probably is too complicated. 
and in and of itself leads to difficulty because if I've discovered the strategies that are difficult to elicit because they have a lot of steps are not in and of themselves what we refer to in the field of modeling as elegant. Elegance is the property of any system where it uses the fewest number of distinctions to create the widest range of variability. If you take, for example, that uh, in, the, in English, it only takes 10 different on-off switches to create all the sounds and all the, you know, you're either pursing your lips or not. You're either blowing wind through your throat or not, vibrating your vocal cords or not. With just 10 on-off switches, you create all the variability of all the language that constitutes English. Now, that's an elegant system. What we're looking for in strategies is to take strategies and to make them elegant. The equation that I wrote up on the chart before is an elegant example of how to quickly recode something. Now, in and of itself, it, it, as an equation, you know, it's not magnanimous, but it is an elegant way to show people what it takes to build new generalizations. Now, what we're interested in in this group here is to be able to go in and to streamline if you remember from strategies, there, there, was, there was two different domains. There was artificial design and streamlining. Now, those are the pieces that we're going to use to be able to resequence a strategy. Because what we're going to do is we want to start by going after the initial test. Now, m most of you, I assume, in here have gone things about how you change values and how you change beliefs. You guys remember that shit? Okay, well. Inside the initial test, of, is there's a part where you're calibrating to the world. Because it's, it's not like you're sitting around and suddenly, you know, you get struck out of the sky with something to be motivated about. You still look, you, you, you operate in the same way like there's a grid and you're scanning. Now, some people, some people, for example, are looking for easy things. And I find them a lot in my workshops. People come in and they find, for example, they learn to do reframing. This is what I refer to as reframing disease. <laughs> now, they learn, for example, they'd learn to do six-step reframing, and they'd use it for everything. Rather than learning lots of different ways to do things, they'd do a reframe with one client that would work. So then they would start reframing madness. And this usually builds up where they reframe everything. Everything that's broken into parts. Everything is reframing. And then it, it ultimately you know, reaches the thing where they start designing the ultimate reframe, where you reframe everything at once. Now, I've noticed this disease runs rampant inside the community of NLP people with those people who inside their scan are looking for, an, one of the criteria they're, they're looking for is the right way. <laughs> In other words, they're looking for a thing that will do everything. They're not looking for variety. They're not looking for a challenge. They're not looking for a way to test the limits of what they know. They're looking for something that they can stamp out. These are people who should work on an assembly line. You know, they should be in a factory going chunk a chunk, chunk a chunk, chunk a chunk. <laughs> because that's what they're after. Unfortunately, they went to college. <laughs> and so they have to have a more interesting profession, and they're trying to find a way of making it dull. Now, for our purposes, what we're interested in is first take going through and, and changing the values that people have. We want them to scan and to first look for variety, that what they're interested in is the difference between things. They're sorting for, for they're sorting for in, in essence, they're looking for worst case scenarios. In other words, if they know how to do a technique, for example, they know how to do the phobia cure. When, when I suggest to them that they have a client that walks in the door who has a phobia of seeing themselves in the mirror, their response is, ooh, oh boy, rather than ee. <laughs> now, what we want to do is we want to change this so that their response is, ooh. And that's what gets them motivated, because here's an example to really be able to test their limits. It's a challenge. And what they know is that it's going to give them the next step in their learning process. They're going to be able to do everything they do better, because they're going to find a way to do all kinds of things. Because if they can get that one, the rest of them should be a piece of cake. Now, this is a motivated learner. Now, this afternoon, we're going to talk about acquisition, learning acquisition. In other words, how to learn. Learning to learn, or what Bateson called learning three steps. So that we can, when we get inside this, we can begin to take the skills we have. And when you find something you're motivated to learn, you don't just sit there and go, oh, boy. 
<laughs> now what? <laughs> Which is something I've... <laughs> You know, it's, it's sort of the, the experience I had this morning when you came out of the motivated thing and she said, she goes, well, what do we do? Okay, well, what you do is the next part because being able to find your own things to learn and your own things to do is an important part of NLP. Rather than taking reframing and coming out with 90 million ways to rehash it, there's tons of things we haven't figured out how to do yet. And the thing is, do something new. Now. The first thing I want you to do, because what we're going to start doing is we're going to go through and we're going to resequence. In other words, we're going to build now a new tote. And the way we're going to, the way we're going to reorganize it is we're going to build a new tote, and actually the tote itself is going to become the chunk level that we operate on. We're going to build new pieces, and they're going to be a different size. Now, what you're going to need to do is to start out by going in and literally using the, the procedures, you know, a belief change so that you go inside the person and you literally go in and you start sequencing and building in a thing that gets them to scan for these criterion. This is what's going to be the first test. Now you take inside of the test that they had, the one that went snap like this, you make it snap when those things are there. Okay? Got that? Right. Now, whether you have to change their values or literally change their beliefs, you know how to do both. If you don't, somebody near you will. If you don't know how to do it, turn around and go, hey, who knows how to change beliefs, man? He goes, I do. Come here and change this one. <laughs> Pay attention to what they do. Remember, if you don't know how to do it, somebody near you will and just make them do it and watch what they do. Now, the next thing is, is the operation phase. Now, the operation phase is, 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 is nice and elegant because the information you've elicited, you have, you have the difference between when the operation is complicated and when it goes quickly. Now, you're going to find that this is the point where you're actually going to test limits. It's right out of the meta model, testing limits. The thing, remember, you used to ask people, you know, well, what would happen if you did? Right, okay, instead of going, or what stops you, what we're going to do is we're going to say, what would make it easy? So that if somebody has an image, for example, in, in the, the things where they, had, where they had some difficulty, they had trouble stepping inside a picture, for example. Sometimes they, it wasn't solid enough, for example, is what she said. If it, if I said if she could just grab a hold of it, she could step in. But in this one, it was too amorphous. Now, when you start asking questions like, well, what would make it easy? Well, if it was more solid, fuck it, make it more solid. <laughs> Now, this is the kind of stuff we want to know is what we want to be able to do is to cut as much out of the operation phase as we can and still get to the result. In other words, we want a cranked up motivated feeling just like you have in the quick one, the one where zip it was there, but we want to be able to have the operation have a minimum number of steps in order to produce it. Now, you may find that, that this is the point where you may, with some people, need to go to straight artificial design. Some people, it will be a question of just slicing out the unnecessary steps, because you'll find that the steps themselves are maneuvers to change some submodality. In other words, if they keep going through variations, they can get the image to be solid enough to step through it. Or if they go through it enough times, they can get to the right angle to step in. Now, if you know what the angle is or what the steps are, simply have them whirl through it. If it requires they go through it X number of times, have them do it at top speed. Instead of doing it slowly, like, you know, maneuvering their way around like this, have them go zzzz and get there. So that what you do is you create an elegant strategy so that when they get to the second test in the, to the tote, the final test, the one thing that you want to add in there to the final test is a thing that, that when they find they're fully motivated, at that point in time, you stick in a piece which future paces them that at any point in time where it begins to get difficult or it begins to get hard or complicated, it fires itself off again. In other words, it meets all of these criterion. So that's done by future pacing or post-hypnotic suggestion, if, if you will. They're pretty much the same thing. So that the second test where they find they're fully motivated, right? If they, what you do is you have them fully motivated as they begin to fall out of it. If it's complicated, it should fire it right back off. This is a recursive loop. You either are motivated or you're motivated. <laughs> Those are your choices. Now, this builds, this builds a, mo a motivation strategy that has the quality called tenacity. 
Because the, the more difficult things are, the harder time you're having, the more motivated you get. Now, this has one, th one thing in it that's important. Make sure that the motivation is a positive K so that they're enjoying it. <laughs> if they're motivated by it gets so terrible they have to do something about it, you elicited the wrong kind of strategy. I said find something that's irresistible they have to move towards. For this strategy to work, it's got to be a moving towards strategy. Now, if, people, if the person you are working with has an overabundance of negative Ks in it, what I want you to do is to realize negative Ks and positive Ks are only their opinion to start with. There's nothing intrinsically good or bad about feelings. Just some of them you like and some of them you don't like. Now, if you take whatever, if they have a negative feeling, one of the things you can do is to simply rechunk it. Simply take the feeling, exaggerate it so it gets worse, and then collapse it down real fast and then go into whatever the opposite feeling is. And if you swing that back and forth, it's like the swish pattern, but kinesthetic. You literally have them turn up the intensity of the feeling and then turn it all the way down and go right through the floor and out the other side and do another feeling. So that what happens is it's just like, it's just like what, it, what it builds. is the same thing you get when you do chaining. Have this feeling, it goes zap and becomes this one. But you can do it just literally mechanically by having them turn up the intensity of the feeling and then turn it down to a zero point and pop out into whatever the inverse feeling is, which hopefully will be a pleasant one. Yeah. That's great. I love that. <laughs> Congruity. <laughs> I really like that. <laughs> Neither do we. Now, the thing is, is, okay, sequencing is done by streamlining, artificial design, changing the values, changing the beliefs. And what you're after is to create an elegant way to create the desired result. The desired result is sustained motivation wanton drooling and continued so that the minute it begins to be where they get into the bog and the mire of where it's complicated this is the point where they light up now I want you to test the, the, the thing because as you go through it I want you to literally do it the same way you've always done installation and literally go through and chop out and force them to do it and have them pick the most complicated thing they've had to do and use it as a test run it through the system and if they, the harder it is the more they're pumped up you got it now, the rechunking part of it is done by taking each of the submodality steps that took a long time where there was a mire, whenever they had trouble getting motivated, and chopping out all the unnecessary maneuvers that, that, that are actually maneuvers to get it so that something happens, so that the picture moves from the side to the front. Whatever it is they have to go through to do it, just make it so it happens right away. And the easy way to get to that is to ask questions about, well, what would make it easy to get it over there? And if you know, they, t they give you that shit they don't know, then just start trying s other submodality shifts. Well, if you made it more focused, go right down the list of submodalities, and you can do it by testing. You know, well, if the image was solider, would it be easier to step in? If it was bigger, if it was at this angle, you'll find angle is absolutely critical in stepping inside of pictures. Uh, these, are, these are the tools that you take to literally go in and streamline these things then what I want you to do is to again test it with worst case scenarios. Have them think of going through the, you know, have, reading the appendix of Magic One. <laughs> I like the look of fear in her face. Oh no, anything but that! Don't make me read System Simple, or System Deep, or System Trance. Did you guys ever notice that? In the appendix? Few people did. But that's what formulas are, it's just a simple deep trance anyway. Seemed appropriate somehow. <laughs> Actually, that's the best part of the book. The other, stuff is, the other stuff is a model of therapy. That's why the transcripts don't have any end. <laughs> <clears throat> now, I won't go into that. Okay, now, keep in mind that the level I want you to operate at, I want you to chunk up now in your minds. Where you're thinking at is that what I'm doing is building a new sequence, a more elegant sequence, and then I'm resizing the pieces so that it only takes a minimum number of steps for them to see how easy it is to be motivated and to stay that way. And now, this part here about the second test, right, being connected with when it gets difficult, right, and it's, and it's hard, and whenever you're having problems with it, it meets this criterion so that these criterion should fire off automatically. That puts it into a loop, which means the more difficult it is, the more motivated they'll be and testing it and putting, coming up with worst case scenarios. 
You know, I have a copy of Patterns of Plausible Inference up here if you need something that's a mire. You know, anything it takes to be able to make it so that you can see that your installation has made it so that they go into this recursive loop where it's a challenge. The harder it is, the better it is. Make sure you install those initial beliefs strongly. Yeah? Is the, um, the looping is the staying power? It's the staying power. It's tenacity. What, you, what you're making is... Tenacity is the... It's, it, well, it is. It's the more difficult it is. See, if you're looking for a challenge, okay, in the first place, and you find one, and you go and do it, and it's over, who cares? But if you go it, and it gets hard, and it's the very thing you were looking for in the first place, when it hits that second test, you remain motivated. So a challenge motivates you. Now, the thing is, is that this, make sure you put in the thing about you're testing your limits so they don't go out and just do something that's so hard and spend the rest of their life on an impossible problem. You're looking for the next step in what you need to know. You want to stretch your limits. When you find something that's difficult, what you're out is to take all the techniques you know and then go one step further with each one to find out what you need to know next so that it remains realistic. Otherwise, you end up with a megalomaniac. You know, you end up with somebody without a high school diploma who decides that they want to be king of the world. You know, that's a challenge. But of course, they never get any further than a wine bottle. Um, this isn't what we're after. We're after a next step function. Somebody that tries, they want to find something they can do and then something that's a little bit harder and a little bit harder and a little bit harder. It's a challenge. Not impossible, it's a challenge. That's different. It's not that it's an insurmountable and you have no idea where to start. It's that you, you know you're on the edge. You feel that you should know how to do it, but you don't quite know how. Okay? So that you just, yeah. you should have, they should have that gnawing quality about them. They want to know. What is it? It's like opening a present, you know, just before the lid comes off. You, know, you go, shall I lift it or not? I know I can do it. All I have to do is go. Even though it's not Christmas yet. It's Christmas every day. Okay? Now, what I want you to do is I want you to do this concisely. Take about 20 minutes a piece, roughly. If you're not done, I want you to stop and switch to the next person and then come back and finish it. Remember, change lasts when you do it quickly. This counts in this too. All right? Go to it. Now, you want something complicated to do? Yeah! You're supposed to ask how complicated. <laughs> You don't want something overwhelming, you want something right on the edge. That's right. <laughs> One of the things that we found, especially when we studied uh, the people in the military that do what I consider to be the most difficult sale of all, Army recruiting, <laughs> that it turned out that the top ten Army recruiters were all people who, who had done everything else in the service. They'd been a commando, they'd done everything. The only thing that was left for them that was a challenge was to be able to get people to go in the military, especially at the time we did the modeling project, because it was not a time where being in the military was extremely popular. Uh, and these guys batted on the average, between the 10 of them, their average batting was 97%. How's that for a close ratio? Now, these guys all had this motivation strategy. I mean, they were looking for a challenge. They weren't the kind of person that sat around in a recruiting office waiting for somebody to walk in the door or were bopping by high schools. These people were out scouring through shopping malls. And I mean, literally, you know, walking into a shopping mall and going, ha, 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 new meat to carve. You know, full military dress, too. Walking up and tapping some guy sitting there smoking a cigarette with long hair. Tap him on the shoulder and the guy turns around looking at him and going, want to join the army? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the toughest, worst case scenario. Now, one of the things that they had was the ability to keep this motivation strategy running by creating for themselves internally. See, like if there wasn't enough on the outside world to entertain them, they would take examples like the one I gave you and run it through that strategy so that they would run through their motivation strategy. They'd make up a challenge. They'd take a fictitious situation, which was difficult, so you take, the, you take, all right, you know the phobia cure, right? All right, you know where the paradox lies in, in the case. Well, if you have somebody that can't look in the mirror, as soon as they make a picture of themselves, they start freaking out. So this creates a problem using the phobia cure. So you have to be able to take it and to take what makes it work rather than the formula. Because what makes the formula work in most cases is this stuff up here about chunking and sequencing. 
Now, if you understand that, all the component pieces are there. Now, what they would do in this kind of context is, is they literally go inside and they run a simulation. And what's amazing about these guys is they run simulations inside and outside constantly. When there's nothing to do in their office, they get the other guys in the office to pretend to be worst client they can think of and badger them. They practice constantly so that they refine their skills. What they do, if there isn't anybody around to play with, they go on the inside and they make up scenarios and they'll run hundreds and hundreds of cases till they find the one that their internal side says, that's going to work. <coughs> now, it's that internal guide that tells you an internal reference because when you know when something is right, you know when it's a little bit off, and you can literally use your internal self-referential guide. Now, the thing we're going to want to add this afternoon is internal references. There's too many people that are going, is this right? right? And the thing is, is you've got to find out for yourself. You're going to be self-directed. You also have to be self-corrective so that you know when you're getting off base and when you're getting closer. You know when you're warm and when you're cold. The thing is, is to be able to move from one to the other so that you can calibrate and go in the kind of direction that increases the quality of what you do. See, there's a lot of people that have confidence and no competence because they, they, the thing is, is they're self-referential, but that isn't based on input. It's not based on whether what they're doing is working. If they, what they're doing isn't working, they start blaming their clients. You know, they go, oh, well, you know, he's not ready yet, you know. Oh, he's just a dork anyway. <laughs> you know. But that's not it. It's like when you're doing it, the thing is, is that when you can use input from the outside to calibrate your internal reference to tell you when you're getting closer, the thing that makes people have a strategy that works good is what we're going to talk about this afternoon. Now what we're going to do is take an hour and a half for lunch and return back here promptly. <laughs> This videotape is edited from an advanced NLP training in Boulder, Colorado, April 1989. Many of the participants had also attended previous advanced training with Richard. Richard considers this seminar to be his best ever presentation of how he works with clients. Although he presents some new submodality methods, his major emphasis is on how he puts things together and the methods that he uses to create lasting change. Since this is a carefully sequenced seminar, we recommend viewing the videotapes in order. And you have to understand that with the generalizations that people, people build, that one of the things that you can count on is, is that through their life, there, is, there are many external cues. And, you know, in terms of the, the wealth of external data, that they're, they're in essence grids that are formed that there are things that are more discrete than others. They, in the old research psychology stuff, they used to study, uh, they used to study different things, like they used to torture animals. They used to do things like they train an animal to respond that if something was a circle and they pressed a button, it would get a banana. And the other thing would be a C, and if they pressed it, it would get shocked, right? And then what they do is they take the circle and they'd begin to open it up. So it became close to a C and take the C and close it to a circle, thus confusing the animal immensely. Because at a certain point in time, they become the same. And up to a certain point in time, the animal could handle it, and then it would go into a confusion state. Well, the same thing is true, that, uh, that with external expressions, things with voice tones, uh, with certain things and behaviors of other people, many of us have learned to calibrate. And the, the thing is, is that people build grids. Now, they also build, as time goes on, differences, because they build generalizations. There's, there's internal responses, which are, are automated. There, there, are cha there are chains of internal responses that get fired from some of these external cues. Now, the cues may or may not have anything to do with what's going on, but these things also interact in terms of, of a functional and what appears to be, as best as I can tell, a set of interface patterns. 
because they don't always work the same. Uh, our internal state a lot of times serves as what they call in holography a, a reference beam. And uh, see, when you make a hologram, a laser hologram, what happens is, is that you take and you, you put an object, okay, behind a film plate. And you take a beam and you split it in half and you shine the beam on the object and you shine the other beam onto the plate. And what happens is, is the light that's shining off the object goes onto the plate, plus the beam itself goes directly onto the plate. And just before it hits the plate, the, the light collides, and it creates what's called a dispersion pattern. Now, when you take the object away, right, and you hold up the plate, you don't see anything once the plate's developed. But if you put the reference beam right back where it was, then the object looks as real as an external object. I mean, you know, you have to stick your finger through it to know it's not there. And, I mean, you know, when you make a good one in a lab, the thing about about that is that the reference beam is the way of getting the object back in your mind because when you look at a hologram you don't see the object the way when you look at a picture a picture like that one over there when you look at it you see what's there with a hologram what it what it is is that the reference beam and the dispersion pattern the Fourier pattern you look through tells your brain what must have been there when it was made and if you take the the hologram and you crack it in half put the same reference beam you see the same whole object. You don't see half the object. Now, in essence, for us, they're, they're, the interaction of sound and light and, and feelings and temperature interacts as, as a reference beam that accesses internal things. But instead of it being one reference beam, it also is juxtaposed with our internal state because our feelings also constitute part of that. That's why sometimes things trigger off and sometimes they don't. Now, for me, when I'm dealing with change, one of the things that I'm also dealing with is, is getting, building an essence in people something that's a profound enough altered state that whatever altered state they automatically go into that gets in their way, like a phobia, I want to build a state that intercepts it or precedes it because I want the same cues to trigger off something before the fear because it's not that they forget that they were afraid of, of, of elevators. I don't think human beings are a read-write system. All of their past experiences or fear are there, but they don't get to it because what they get to is the altered state that you, you induce when you do something like the phobia cure. That what happens is, is that the, the techniques or the tricks that you use, like running the memory backwards, the disassociation, all of that stuff <coughs> is the state that they'd go into. Now, if you're really good, you even stick in front of that state something else because I have... I have a tendency, rather than to just leave it at that, to, to create what will happen when they go in so that those cues actually build something else that precedes it. And it's not that, they're, that it's impossible to get the person back to being afraid. And the more you layer things in front of whatever a difficulty or an automated response is, the more depth you create, the more lasting the effect will be. Because anybody who is capable of creating fear of elevators or this or that is capable of doing it again. Plus, they have a wealth of experience. Uh, I was talking last night about this thing with subliminal tapes. Any of you who are up at night now have seen that the uh, cure-all of the universe is subliminal tapes. And, and I was listening to this, uh, the, the guru of this stuff. And the theory is, is that the, it's the number of positive suggestions that, that induces change. Uh, I tested this and found out that it doesn't work. We made a tape that had the... Uh, uh, for a friend of mine has a uh, stress class that meets once a month. It's a good name for it anyway, if you think. It's not even a relaxation class, it's a stress class. But uh, we made a subliminal tape for the class in which we, we laced, uh, you know, everything will freak you out. Well, I figured it was a stress class. It's the thing to do. <laughs> Underneath the sound of the ocean, you know, that the thousands and thousands of suggestions that everything will make you nervous, you'll be uptight, your blood pressure will rise at every moment. And uh, gave people the tape and told them it was a relaxation tape and to listen to it, you know, as much as they could all day long, play it in the car, everywhere they were. They all came back, and not some of them, they all came back and said it was the best, most relaxing month of their life. <laughs> Which means that perhaps we had a group of people that had a polarity response at the unconscious <laughs> level. But I don't think so. Because, see, it's not the number of suggestions. It's the way in which suggestions are made. Because it's not the amount of times you've been afraid. It's 
It's what you access and in what order you access your own experience. See, that, that the trick is, is given the variety of ways of, that people have to, it, to access the way in which they're going to respond at a moment, you need to be able to lace and to layer down uh, uh, the kinds of responses that they're going to have. It's not enough to wipe something out. You have to put things in its place. And the more depth you put, see, for me, that, that, that by building a chain, chain of responses that will happen kinesthetically, to build in uh, automated responses, to build in layers of generalization, and to build in uh, propelled systems. For me, propulsion systems are one of the interesting things about human beings, that the, the kind of effort that that guy put into the activity of dealing with what he was afraid of, and that the way that the thought that went into it, and the, that if by taking that amount of energy, that powerful of a propulsion system, and getting it to aim towards making his life better, towards, towards uh, as I put it to him, making up for lost time, you know, so that 30 years from now when he looked at his life, he will have filled it up with good stuff, you know. Uh, see, there was a theory for a long time that if you experienced, you know, fear fully, that it would go away. Uh, it's the old confront your fear thing, you know, that if you just confront it and feel it deeply, that somehow or other it will go away. Well, people like him are a good example of the fact that if you stuck him in fearful situations, it wouldn't help because it, w it wasn't the fearful situation that was creating it. It wasn't a group of people that made him afraid. It was what he was doing. That his ability to become immobilized when he tried to walk up at the bar was based on what he did when he walked in, looked and saw a group of people, realized he had to go and talk with other people there. It, it actually, because I asked him, I said, how long did it take? And he said, well, it didn't take long to get afraid. And it doesn't. And he's mastered it, and he can do it quickly. <coughs> now, if I was sitting by myself, he wouldn't have bothered. But if instead, you know, because I said, you know, think of all the things you didn't scan that group for. And he went, what? Now, this is a good response to get from clients. Because a lot of times I'll say, just repeat what I said. Because there are certain things that I, I, I delineate are not within the scope of the study. And, and we, we've tried an experiment during the practitioner course of getting people to just change the way they said things. And we found out there were some people just couldn't say it certain ways. Uh, like we had in my group, I had a lot of real estate people. And I, <coughs> one of them said, you know, well, that they, that they found out, you know, that they can get people to want to buy a house, but it's too expensive. And if I said, well, uh, do you, is there one you can call? And the guy said, well, he said, I could call a hundred of them. And I thought, well, he's exaggerating until I found out how much real estate the guy owned. 600 pieces in San Diego alone. He don't have any trouble buying real estate. It's Robert Allen's top student. But I said, if you take one of these people and what you do is, what you do is tell them that you want them to say, the house is too expensive. I said, just have them say that to you. And so he called up this guy on the phone, and he says, okay. He said, uh, you know that house I showed you? And the guy said, yeah. He said, I want you to tell me it's too expensive. The guy said, well, the house is too expensive, but I want it. Now, that's a change in direction. Now, and, and in fact, then the guy started calling him on the phone, <laughs> wanting to buy the house. Because, you see, if you start in one place, then you lead to another. And it's not just a polarity flip-flop back and forth, because you can flip-flop back and forth. But when you set up a direction, and pay, it sets up what becomes a primary focus. See, whereas the guy goes, I want the house, but it's too expensive, it creates an end. Whereas if the house is too expensive, but I want it, then you start doing things about changing what your payments will be and what the cost is. One puts things inside the scope of the study. By changing the way you think about things and the way you talk about things, it changes what's, what you're capable of doing. Now, the exercise you just did, to me, the next, the next step in it, and which we don't have time for, so we won't do, um, has to do with taking that kind of an attitude and then layering more things onto it so that you can layer onto that state things about being ferocious, 
that you can layer on top of that things about being more intrigued, especially building for yourself. Remember the belief stuff? You guys remember how you build a belief? Do you guys know how to build a belief? Well, you know you, know you have beliefs, right? You guys read Using Your Brain for a Change? Try it sometime. <laughs> it's, you're not supposed to just read the words. OK. Yeah, I read the book. I know that. OK. If, if you can change a belief from one to the other, as soon as you know what the, the submodalities of a belief are, you, you can build one. All you do is you take the submodalities and you decide what you want to believe and you put it in there. Now, one of the beliefs that I find to be extremely useful is the belief that people work perfectly. There's, there's nothing wrong with them. That, you know, the way, see, the, you have to start with the thing about, about disassociating from any of you who have what I refer to as empathy disease. Um, empathy disease is, is cause like when I was in college, I took this uh, uh, psychology class and they told me how to be warm and empathetic and genuine in order to be, to be helpful to people. And the one I had trouble was, was the empathy one. Because if you put yourself in their shoes, you were stuck like them. And I mean, to me, that made sense. Uh, to my teacher, my teacher couldn't see that from my point of view, so he was stuck. <laughs> so he couldn't help me to understand something I razzed him about to no end. <laughs> Now, the thing is, is when you do switch referential index with people where you put yourself with their limitations and feel their pain, then you feel how it would be unpleasant to work a certain way. And then the fact that it feels unpleasant or that it limits you or it's frustrating or it's frightening is true, but it nonetheless is none of, it's not something that identifying with is going to make it so that you can help them out of it. It's, the fact is, is that I know how terrified this guy was I worked with. I also know I, want, I don't want to live that way. I want to have nothing to do with it. I don't want to live that way, but I knew out of the gate I didn't have to. Now that means I'm free. And a lot of people don't build that into themselves that, you know, when a client comes in and tells me how horrible things are, my response is, is God, I'm glad I don't have to live that way. And people think that's callous. Well, I think it's the only foundation from which you can help them at all. That, you know, if you go, you know, if you go, God, boy, you know, he must be lonely, he must be this, he must be that, oh, what, how terrible it is. You're not talking about him, you're talking about you. And when you're talking about you in that context, since you don't even have the problem, it's utterly ludicrous. I mean, it really is. And until you can really look at it as ludicrous, you'll keep doing those things. I mean, the response is, is when this guy comes in, I go, God, what a pain in the ass to live that way. Sitting on the floor in your car? You know, I mean, I even look at him and I go, don't you feel foolish? And the guy goes, well, why do you think I get on the floor? You know, and I go, well, that clears it right up. You know, and, you know, because when you can look at him, you can go, you know, does it strike you as stupid to live this way? And the guy goes, the guy will say to you, well, yeah, but, you know, with his fear, there's no other way to live. And then I can say to him, say to me. With this fear, there's no other way to live. Ooh. You feel that ooh? Now, tsst, that's when you get them started. Because to begin with, you've got to break, you've got to break it up. I don't even have to tell them what the next line is, because they'll fill it in. They, they're going to fill it in, and that's what they're there for. They're not there for to have anybody reinforce their difficulty, because you couldn't do it as well as them if you tried. I mean, this guy's got this down cold. Now, in order to break them out of it, you've got to be able to create that ooh phenomenon. And you've got to be looking to do it, too. You know, it's one of those things that hurts so good. It does, because, because it makes it so they know that they're getting up to the edge of the limits of their model. And there's two ways to bring people to the limits. One gets them to start fighting back, and the other gets them to look at that open doorway and realize they can step through it. And, they, and then that's when you've got to hold it back. You've got to go, yes, but not yet. Right? Because when you want them to go through, you want them to go through like they were shot out of a cannon. Right? Because they don't even know what's on the other side yet. They don't even to know. When I start to bring up things, I go, like, when you walked up to this group of people, I said, you know, you were looking for how you were going to speak to me without, you know, have, what, what are you going to do? Have to send a note over? You know, and the guy kind of smiled, you know. It's like, it had crossed his mind, right, you know, get a bellman to, you know, 
go talk to a group of different bellmen, you know, and send a note over. Because that doesn't count, because I don't notice it, right? But the thing is, is I said, you know, you weren't looking for the group, you know, figuring who could you go out with, you know, <coughs> who could you go party with, you know, who could you, you know. And as I said these things, he went, well, of course not. And I went, well, which is stupider, not looking for that or hiding on the floor of the car? Now, that's an interesting comparison if you think about it. Because what I'm asking the guy to do is to compare two negative outcomes with each other. Either way, I win. Because again, what I'm doing is beginning to build a propulsion system by getting this guy to do what he did well, which was comparison. He was not an in-time kind of guy, if you think about it. I mean, could you maintain his difficulty if you were in time? It takes too much memory to do that. Too much planning. In-time people can't plan that well. You know, they would find themselves in the terrifying situation and go, oops, you know. <laughs> Shit, I'm talking to a group of people. I forgot, you know. Ah! You know, in time people are screamers, right? Guys like him never get to the point of screaming, you know. Hell, he'd be crocked before he got up in front of the group, you know. They'd go, he'd walk up in front of him and go, my name's so-and-so, and I'm an alcoholic. You know, that'd be his first major group to talk to. The thing is, is that by beginning to build a web and beginning to listen to, to difficulties, and beginning, if somebody's dealing with comparisons, to start out by building multiple negatives and multiple positives. You begin to, to build the foundation of what I call a complex. Because the thing is, is I'm going to build multiple negatives so that I can blow up the negative state by literally turning it on itself at some point. But I build it up slowly, and at the same time I build that foundation, I'm going to build a foundation of positive stuff on the other side, which is the stuff he's missing out on. And that's going to have to do with, since he's a between-time kind of guy, having him jump instead of to the past, into the future. Because I want, him, I want him to be more terrified of living the way he is than he is of whatever the difficulty is. And even though it's not the most positive attitude approach to things, he's not ready for a positive attitude. He's got to have a terror to avoid, and the only way to avoid it is to have a positive attitude. Now, with this guy, by the time I'd spent a three-hour session with him, he was so terrified, he went down into the bar and sat there and talked to a group of 16 people with me and was gregarious. And at one point, he left, and then he came back, and I said, what would you do when you were gone? He said, I had to go have a talk with myself. <laughs> and I said, why? And he said, well, my fear started to come back, and it scared the hell out of me. <laughs> now, there's an interesting double bind in this, in that feeling the fear, the fear then becomes ambiguous as to whether it's a fear of the situation or whether it's a fear of if he doesn't conquer the situation, he'll miss enjoying himself. Because what I've done is, is to open up and close the circle. The thing I told you about, we have a zero, we have a C. The Q for him was fear. And the fear was a particular Q. Now, by doing the, the little game that I played with him, opening this one up and closing this one down, what happens is, is, is I confuse that in him and assign a new cue so that what the fear actually becomes is something that's ambiguous. What I'm building in when I work with somebody is an ambiguity that switches the cue so that the fear itself now became a fear of not being social, whereas before it was a fear of being social. So that the same kind of a trigger now triggers off a whole other propulsion system. So that, the, yeah. So you're, you're utilizing his away from strategy, but in doing that, you're also building it towards, because he's, on another level, he's not being social. He's not being social. Yeah. He's not being social. Yeah. He's not being social. 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 He's not being and, and one thing I want you to watch here is I don't want you to categorize things because I find that, that people learn these NLP terms and they use them to not think, right? They go, oh, that's utilization, and they lump it all into utilization instead of sorting utilization out. It's the way in which it was utilized that's important. The important distinction is what's different about this utilization than other utilization. And the difference falls down to that I'm taking the same internal Q. 
it's the same external situation, right? It creates the same internal response, fear, right? External situation, many people. Internal state, fear, okay? Generalization, fear is of external situation. I change that to fear is of avoiding external situation. But my point was also that in, in using the fear and building a fear, you're also building a want in him that's stronger than his head before. Right? Yes, I am. And that's because that's exactly what I want to do, is to build in desire. Right. Yeah. And, and see, because, see, the thing is, is, is it isn't that people are just moving away or moving towards. It's not that simple. They're doing both always at the same time. And it's a question of what they're doing with which. I mean, you know, you can say he's moving away from groups, or you can say he's moving towards, you know, safety, right? You can say he's moving away from fear, or you can say he's just moving towards loneliness. I mean, you know, you can do it as a description. The thing is, is to be able to take the, to take the metaprogram distinction without changing the distinction itself in him, and to be able to make it so that it creates an ambiguity in the situation that makes him propelled towards behaviors. So that, and the difference is, is he was moving away from the t past. That's fine, I want him moving towards the future, which is what he was kind of doing anyway. That's why he was going to all the damn therapy. You know, I mean, you'll, you'll find that people are moving towards the future. They're just not good at it. And, and I don't mean that. I mean, it's, you know, it's fine for them. I don't want to live that way. And if they work with me, I know they don't want to live that way or they wouldn't be here. And so what I'm trying to do is to create a context. And it, you know, it's not something that's done simply or, or you know, in the, in the sense that it's just one piece. It's being able to line up a series of pieces and punch them all at once. And then it, get, then it gets down to, you know, to sometimes with instructions. I mean, with him, I gave him a list of homework a mile long, I mean, three pages of things to do. And, uh, you know, it's like, I, I love this. He had bought, and when he got such good results from the book, you know, he bought Using Your Brain for a Change, I think, or Frogs and Princes, I forget which. And he had, quote, unquote, fixed himself so much. The next thing he did is he bought every book and every videotape. Okay. And... Uh, and he looked at a lot of them, but there was a couple that he didn't look at. For example, the flirting tape. He had it there, but he didn't open it, right? And when he, one of the things he said, you know, at the end of his session is he said, do you think I'm ready for the flirting tape? And I said, I think you've been ready for it for years. I said, I said but if you watch it, you have to try everything that's on it. You have to watch one thing and go try it, and then watch the next thing and try it. You can't watch the whole film. And he looked at me like that made sense. <laughs> which clients do that, which has always amazed me, but that's the way they are. And did you like the little exercise we did this morning? Okay, well, one of the things about it is, is that that's not enough. As you know, my policy is, is too much is not enough. But one of the things that I try to build in people is I try to build a broader range of response from a state. And uh, I've discovered that some people, like, they can either be uh, aggressive and ferocious, but they can't be exhilarated and happy while they're doing it. And that one of the things I like to be able to do is, is to teach people how to layer states together. That if you go through and you, you take a, a, for lack of a better term, a, a four-tuple or a set of submodalities. So you take one like, uh, you take the exhilarated state and you call that state number one. Okay, and then state number two, you start, t you take something which is, for example, if if you've ever been in, found a time and a place where, where you were absolutely fascinated, where your attention was totally fixed, where you were learning something and you knew you were learning it, you were getting it, and your interest and your attention was just totally locked on. You know what I'm talking about? Times and places where you were so enthralled by something that you didn't want to miss even the smallest amount of it. And you did so with interest, not with opinion. Too many people I know, are t when they're learning, they're thinking. And those, a lot of times, do not go hand in hand. Uh, that when people try to learn something by figuring out if it's like something else, I don't know if any of you teach, but I get this where I used to. I don't get it so much anymore. People used to ask me, you know, is, is this, how does this fit with? And whatever they said afterwards, you know, trans, what was that, what is that uh, stuff with the parent, child, and the adult? TA, people were always trying to figure out how those fit together. I looked at the Nanelp uh, catalog that came out this time, 
And all they're trying to do is fit stuff with NLP. You know, how does this fit with it? How do you translate this to Myers-Briggs? And how do you translate this to that? My answer is, is it doesn't translate without losing a lot. Just the same as when you translate any language to another language, all you do is you lose things in the process. And uh, so if you take something which is, which is a highly positive fixed attention, and then maybe take a state where, you, where, have you ever had a day where you could do no wrong, where you were just totally on when you were working and you always were picking the right intervention, you know, where your intuitions were working well? You just had a certain zing to it. You know what I'm talking about? Think back. Remember one. You'll need it. It may not have been this morning, but you'll think back. You'll find one. You know, so, so you pick something that constitutes an exceptionally good day. And where it overlaps from experience to experience, you know. I don't know if any of you are gamblers in here, but I found that uh, one of the best ways to win at gambling is to gamble at the right time. Well, I've, I've really discovered that you can go, and no matter how well you play, if you're not in the right state, you won't win. And that the trick is, is to figure out when you're in the right state. When you're in the right state, you can almost play anything. Put money in slot machines, and money comes pouring out. And when you play other times, the best you can do is break even or lose. So if you find something that's got that certain zing to it, where you just have, it has a feeling that everything is going to work, and you're just up for it. Now, if you add to that something which is, there probably have been some times where you, where you were able to be fairly ferocious, where that, you know, one of the things I've discovered is, is that people try to be too nice when they do NLP, and that it doesn't work that way. It's not that you have to be mean or cruel. It's that you have to literally be in control. It's not a passive art form at all. That, you know, it, that you, you don't, I mean, you can listen to clients until you're blue in the face, or you can listen to your clients until you're done listening. And at that point, you rise up like a four-toed dragon and just simply rearrange things. And sometimes when people have watched me work with clients, like they're pulling their hair out. They couldn't understand how I let the client go on long enough. That, but to me, I'm stringing them rope. I'm going, here, take this rope. I want you to tie it right up here. Is it good and tight now? Does that not slip freely? Because what I'm doing for is looking for the kinds of things that allow me to take both ends of a spectrum and to change the way that they respond to experience and to make it so it's more pervasive. So it builds in me a kind of ferociousness that's connected with patience. It has a thoroughness to it, has a determination, and it's like I don't let them ramble on. I make them answer my questions. And sometimes, I don't know if you've noticed, clients, a lot of them have a story. And they won't be happy till you tell them the story. And a lot of times, I interrupt the story because I make it so that until they answer my questions, I won't let them tell me the story. And when I get that message across that what their job is, and I, I always tell clients that they have a job, their job is to do what I say and answer my questions. And it has to do with the ability to be firm with clients. Because if you seem and project uncertainty to them, then, you see, your nonverbal communication is as important. See, to me, that, that, that the, the importance of learning the Milton patterns themselves is so that you start out every session as a hypnotic induction. That, I mean, right out of the gate, I'm altering people's state. I'm building in everything that I say has presuppositions connected to it that, you know, as you change yourself, when you change yourself. There's never a question of if. And that not only comes across verbally, but it comes across analogically. I make it clear on no uncertain terms are they allowed to, to, to stay the same. You bring me a problem, it gets changed. If you, don't, if you decide halfway through you don't want it changed, you're still going to have to come back next time and get me to change it back that on no uncertain terms, you hire me to do it. I'm going to do it, and it's going to get done, and it's going to be done my way. And because a lot of people, one of the reasons they're stuck as they are is that they've decided what will change them. I mean, I have people come in, and they go, I want you to use hypnosis to change this. And that's probably then the only thing I won't use. Because typically, if they knew what would change them, then they wouldn't be stuck the way they are to start with. And uh, certainly, they would be the least qualified to know what techniques to use. Because it's, the, it's, it's their trying to run a session, which has probably got them in trouble in the past. And that to me, I run it like a trance, and I want it done my way and in the order that I want it. Because the order in which you do things is as important, if not more important, than actually what you do. 
I mean, there's lots of different ways to, to fix a phobia or anything else. But the, the most essential ingredient has to do with the way you package the whole session in terms of how it's going to affect their behavior in the future. Now, but if you take and find an experience of ferociousness, now what we're going to do is I, I want you to take the same kind of technique that you did before, only instead of taking just the, you know how you place the one thing on the timeline and stood behind it, looked through it, stepped up to it, and then pushed it forward? Well, this time what I want you to do is first we're going to do is I want you to go through and elicit these. And you don't have to go into great detail, just enough that the person would know what it's like to look through the submodalities. So that if they did the same exercise you did last time, they would be able to replace it with each one of these four. Now, I want you to really make sure that when you elicit these experiences that you get primo examples. The, the purpose of elicitation and the skill in it is always going to be based with your analog. You have to think of elicitation as a very short trance in congruency. That's in space congruency, okay? not incongruency. Because when, when you talk about a time and a place where people were really ferocious and be able to be in control and felt powerful and like they knew what they were doing, that when you elicit that from somebody, you want all of your nonverbal, your tone of voice, your analog to help them to access prime examples of it. Now, when you find examples of each of these four, what I want you to do is then turn around just like you did before and put it out on their timeline, looking towards the future. So the future is out here. Here's the past. We're going to start from present time. And what I want you to do is first, like, take the example, which is what you did this morning, which is number one. Only I want you to put next to it number two, then after that number three, and number four, and have them literally move through time through the four. Okay. Have them spaced out at first, okay? Then what I want you to do is have them cycle back, right, to this time, which means this is associated, then you're going to disassociate them out, bring them back through. I want you to cycle through so they can move through them rapidly. So you'll notice by watching them whether they're literally changing the facial expressions that go with each one. Now, if you want to accelerate the process, anchor each one. It will help them to go through. But make sure they move forward in time as they do it. Now, you might have this spaced on their timeline by days. I mean, this might be day one, this might be day two, this might be day three. As Soon as they can move through it quickly, I want you to have them go out on their timeline, keep cycling through the same four, but pull them closer together. So that it's one, two, three, four, and then closer together until they all end up in the same place. And keep going further out into the future as you do it. Now, what this does is literally layer yourself together a new kind of a response where all of these things are operational at once. This builds you a new state. Does this make sense? Yes? Good. <laughs> That's one you did this morning. Fill in the blank. See, it's also not essential that you use the same responses I'm talking about. Exercises and workshops are only examples. These are examples of how to build a better state to do NLP in. And remember, as they go out into the future, you want to you either contextualize these things or not, depending upon how much you want it to ramble through people's lives. See, if, you want some, if, you know, if you're dealing with somebody, uh, let's say you have a client that's a total wimp, right? comes to you, you know, and, goes and says, so everybody pushes me around. And you go, what? And they go, nothing. You know. That sort of a thing, where you want to build some chutzpah into it. That as you begin to take a technique like this, where you layer together three or four different types of the most ferociousness you can find in them, might be that they're only ferocious with a goldfish, or might be able to push their dog around, you know. They might be tough with their children, but not with other adults. They might be able at work to be tough with their employees, but when it comes to women, you know, they're a total wuss. That as you want to build it in, you want to, as you go future, contextualize as you come, because what you're doing is taking different sets of submodalities. Submodalities, remember, is the simultaneous representation. Strategies is the sequential representation. What we're doing here is using time as a variable to literally first build a chain and then to compress that chain into a single state. 
because what we're doing here is building a new and better state. Because uh, somebody said in here when we were doing the last exercise that they, they could get into the state of exhilaration, but they couldn't talk when they were there. So like with that person, we might want to throw in a number five, which is being chatty. Have you ever felt like you just had to talk? You know, sometimes you get so excited that you just have to talk. You guys know what that's about. So with that person, you want to add that dimension in. Now you might, with your partner, ask them what kind of dimensions they feel they need more of when they're doing this kind of work. For example, it might, you might want to make number five a sense of humor. Um, because doing NLP, you really have to keep your humor around you so that you don't forget and think all of this is real. It's, it's as artificial as the rest of life. You know, that, I mean, there are so many things that we believed so strongly when we were young that, that, that we don't believe anymore. I mean, I'll never forget something that happened to me. I, had a, I have a friend that really grew up middle class white bread. And uh, he was sitting at my house, and it was, it was Easter, and he told me this story, which I thought was the most unbelievable thing I'd ever heard. He said, you know, isn't it amazing that when I was young, I believed that there was a six-foot rabbit that went around and hid eggs. And I looked at him, and I'd never heard of this before. I don't, you know, just if people mentioned it, I missed it somewhere along the line. And there were three other people there all laughing and nodding. And I looked at him, and I said, I beg your pardon? A six-foot rabbit? And they said, oh, yeah, you know. He had clothes on, though, as if that made a difference, right? And they all sat there telling me that, of course, everybody knew about this when they were young, that there was this six-foot rabbit, and how amazing it was that they believed it. And I thought, how amazing it is that you're still talking about it, right? And to them, that, you know, this was artificial, but yet, out of the same people, two of them believed in, two of them were, thought that this was ludicrous, but yet they were Seventh-day Adventists. Now, uh, I, I've had some weird things with clients. I've had some clients, and I don't know, religion and mental health seem to go hand in hand in some way, and I mean the absence of mental health, that, you know, I had a client who literally believed that their daughter was nuts because she talked to an angel in the closet, and, and yet, you know, she was speaking to Jesus every evening, you know, at 9 o'clock when she went to bed. And to her, that wasn't abnormal, that to her, you know, she told me when she was born again, Jesus had come to her in the middle of the night, put his arms around her, and, you know, and, and I love this, taken, take, taken her inside of him or something like that. Whatever it is, it sounded like scary shit to me. <laughs> I didn't want to know about that part of it. But to, to think that that sane and what her daughter was doing re was something that required a psychiatrist's help, I mean, to me, it's where people have lost a little of their sense of humor. And, and to me, in order to put things into a perspective, it's not that Jesus didn't come to her. It's that, you know, if you're going to believe that, then it should be as possible to believe that, you know, your daughter can speak to angels in the closet. I mean, to me, those don't seem like profoundly different, <laughs> right? Now, to try to explain that to her, you know, it would sound irrational. But part of what made the problem as bad as it was, because for, I mean, to begin with, children the same age have imaginary playmates. I mean, her, this was only a seven-year-old girl. Right? I mean, how many of you had imaginary playmates when you were a kid? Right? I love if people do this stuff. <laughs> you know, I'm sure more of you did. And so, how many of you had imaginary pets? You know, you, you had them all. Huh? <laughs> how many of you still have them? That's what I want to know. <laughs> hey, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, it's the same thing, you know, for most of you have seen the tape of Andy the Schizophrenic. You know, it's just the thought, you know, if you can get people to come off the TV, why are you watching Little House on the Prairie? I mean, the term Playboy Channel ring a bell, you know? I mean, you know, it's those long road trips. You wouldn't be alone so much. I mean, how many shrinks would think that that was a nutty thing to do as opposed to, you know, sitting around by themselves all the time twiddling their funds? They could have a whole group of people there. There would be no more loneliness if people learned that strategy. You just have to have a little better taste about what programs you watch. You don't want to be watching no horror films, right? You know, Friday the 13th. Oops! Get back in there, Jason! You know, you don't want to be doing that crap. That, that for our purposes, we want to build the best state to make what we do as fun as possible. There are so many people that I find that, especially people who have done therapy for a long time, that they don't like doing it. They take the fun out of it. And, you know, and then, of course, the, the best thing to do is blame it on your clients, you know. I have boring clients. And, you know, 
Some of them are boring, but it doesn't have to sound boring to you while it's going on, as long as you're going to see them. If you go into an exhilarated enough state where you have enough interest, where you begin to find out how this stuff works and how people can maintain it, and as long as you keep the attitude, I'm certainly glad this is me, you know, but also, by the same token, every once in a while something comes along which you really want for yourself. And I mean, it is a fringe benefit of this profession, being able to learn strategies, to being able to learn what's wacky and depressing in one person can be fun for you. I mean, you know, most, I don't know how many of you in here have learned, I mean, if people can see an imaginary playmate, think of the uses you could have for that. You know, just in terms of being able to try out techniques, you know, you'll never be lonely again. Uh-huh. That, but if a human, one human being is capable of doing it, then the rest of us are. That, I mean, if you're somebody that never had an imaginary playmate or, you know, has never had a hallucination that looked real to you, learning how to do this is only going to expand your ability to do things, your ability to use your mind. For example, I had a friend that uh, took his broker's examination to become a real estate person, and he claimed he couldn't remember things. But yet, yet this, this guy had an imaginary playmate, but not one, but several, and he could dress them, play a game, and stop the game, go off and do something, and come back and start it right where they left off. And this is a guy telling me he had no memory. So I had him put all the answers to the broker's examination on their shirts, right? <laughs> Freeze it and go in and take the test, right? And he got most of them right. He got a few wrong because he couldn't get the people to turn around. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I call a not user-friendly, unconscious mind. It's a number 34. They look up and the person goes, nah, 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 nah. It's a problem with having kids as imaginary playmates, too, I suppose. Now, for our purposes here, you know, if there's something you want to add to this, these are just suggestions. They're not cast in stone. You want to pick the things that you figure will make your work more dynamic. The more dynamic, the more charismatic, the more of an altered state each session is. Because remember, the event for the clients that you have, whether it's a business client, even I teach in my sales training course. I have a new sales training course I'm teaching this year, which has been a lot of fun. I, I went out and elicited the strategy from two uh, compulsive buyers, people that you know, buy things that they don't need. This one guy just got like 10,000 shirts. He just goes out five times a day and buys shirts, not even in his own size <laughs> stuff. He has garages for them because he just has, has this feeling he has to buy things. So I figured, there's a sales course. And so I elicited a strategy, and what you do is you install it in people. And then sell them something. It's a lot easier that way. But see, even in that course, what I try to teach people is that every sales event must be high drama. That part of what makes you a good salesman or good at NLP is that you look at each event as a maximum exhilarated state. There is no such thing as nonchalant work in NLP. I mean, it's not something where you churn things out. The more profound the altered state, more exhilarating the event, and the more you connect it with people's future that way, the more generative the change is going to be and the more lasting. It should be an event that stands out the way an impact experience does. It's unforgettable, unless you give them amnesia, of course, but it should still have the same amount of power. Because the thing is, is if you... Every session, no matter what you do, is going to be an altered state. And if it's a mundane altered state, those are the ones people have amnesia for. And when you have to remind clients that they changed last time and it was, they did all right, and they squint their eyes like this, it tells you that there was not enough drama. And it's part of your job is to create that drama and that stimulation that creates the affect that makes it work, makes it last, makes it stimulating. It also makes it more fun for you in the long run, and your longevity in this business will last. Then you won't end up going, I hate going to work, you know. Instead, you should walk in and look at your clients in the waiting room and see pieces of raw meat out there. Hear the sound of a knife sharpening. Shk, shk. A lot of good auditory internal cues you can throw in while you do this. If you find when you elicited with your partner that there wasn't a lot of high-powered auditory, throw in some of that stuff. Remember, you don't have to stick with just the submodalities they had. You can use existing anchors, sounds. Uh, just like when we, we did the thing last time where you, you did the, uh, the submodality shift and had the sound of the bolt slamming shut. You guys remember that? Were you here last time? And you don't remember it. It's really slammed in your mind, huh? <laughs> shut the bolt, what did it do? 
take all my memories and have two steel doors closed. <laughs> now, what was that we did? <laughs> that being able to add naturally existing auditory anchors is always going to amplify things. Remember, we don't, we don't care what system is their primary system. That's only a way to establish a rapport. It's not the way to maintain it. You want to build people out so you're operating in every system. So you can not only anchor these things, you can add naturally existing auditory anchors that, that stimulate and bring things up so that you build a heightened experience. Then you stack them out one in front of the other so that they run through them in the way that builds a natural chain. In essence, it's chaining, but instead of firing one anchor, firing the other, and firing the other, you're doing it through a set of high-powered submodalities. Then what you do is you cycle through it till they can go through it fairly quickly, and then you go out further and further in the future and bring them closer and closer until they become simultaneous. And what you will end up with is a new set of submodalities for a powerful state. Okay, grab yourself a partner, the same one if you want, or a new one, and power through this. And remember, when you do this, the, the timeline stuff, have them move and the timeline stand still, which means you may have to stand them up and move them around. Okay, go for it. Layering them is what it's called. You don't want to laminate them. If you laminate them, they're still separate. You know, you want to get them so that you're actually layered so that they're all in one time. If you get them stacked, if you just get them so they're stacked real close, you don't get the full impact. See, if you think of it as lamination, all you've done is you've, you've compressed the time so it's barely noticeable. Whereas if you get them so they compress into one thing, that's where you get the full impact. Say, so actually, when I do it with people, I'll tell you that what I like to do is I like to, I like to get uh, some anchors for uh, things like... Uh, sort of orgasmic type things to, a to access that, that sort of stuff. And then what, you, you, <laughs> gonna handle that, huh, Robert? <laughs> See, because when I do this kind of stuff with a client, typically what I like to do is I like to really build it into a, a, like a gigantic crescendo so that what I do is I access really intense types of explosive experiences. And then when I go through as I bring them closer and closer. A lot of times I'll do this in an altered state. And I like to set up a thing where they, they, they feel a rubber band between their nose and their hand pulling, but yet they can't get their hand there, so it builds up stress. The closer their hand gets, the more they move out on their timeline, the closer they get together. And at the moment it touches, it explodes into a single unit. So that when it does it, what happens is, is when you set up that kind of physical tension, when, when you get to the point where it simply slides into a single unit as opposed to something that's laminated, you get really dramatic physiological responses. And it also integrates the kinesthetic uh, components of the five different states. See, if you think back through time, for those of you who have done NLP for a long time, there used to be a thing called the visual squash, where you... So I can tell those of you who've been around for a long time. Yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> Putting that part in this hand and this one in this hand, driving them together. And you remember, you remember Keith, and you get them like this. People will be like this the last moment, trying to get these two parts to fit together, and then they go <laughs> and pull them in like that. Well, the the thing is, is that the the kinesthetics of taking two because each of the things that were in the visual scotch were in themselves anchors for totally different kinesthetic states. And I mean, it's, it's kind of like firing two really distinct anchors off at one time. You get that sort of wiped out look on their face, and their face goes asymmetrical. That was a sloppy way of going about this. But it, in this state, what you're doing is you're really building a much more elegant state. Now, there's another thing, which is that there's a trick embedded inside of this. The trick is, is that the more you project it out into the future, the fact that going into the future brings it closer together sets up a direction in the future that the more you go forward, the more you will integrate. Now, for those of you who have some hypnotic experience, you have experience with the more, the more pattern. The more you try to resist going in trance, the more you will now. You know, and you can try in vain, but the more you try in vain to go in a trance, the more you'll begin to go into a trance now. Can you feel this happening to you slowly and quickly? Not too responsive, Robert. <laughs> Yet. 
That's right. It's like the more you try to write notes, the more incoherent the page will become. <laughs> the more yellow you see, the deeper trance it will be. And the more you laugh, the deeper you'll go with each breath. <laughs> and they say you have to do hypnosis with a monotone. Can you believe that? Henry Hilgard proved that scientifically, which proves you can prove anything scientifically. You can prove that scientifically. I love it when I went to Hilgard's lab. I went to his lab, and there, uh, he wasn't there, but he had some of his experts there. And they were explaining, and I was asking them questions. Like, I was looking at them, and I was, you know, because I was being real serious. You know how serious I can get. And I'd look at them, and I'd say, now, what you're telling me is that if you don't use a monotone, you can't go into a trance now deeply. And they'd do this. No, you, you can't. <laughs> and I'd go. So when a person shut your eyes <laughs> tightly, <laughs> when a person shut your eyes tightly, uh, doesn't mean that they're going into a deep trance as much as you understand what I'm saying. Now, they go, yes. And so without using a thorough monotone, you can't get people to go deeper. No, you can't. <laughs> I love picking on scientists. It's my hobby. They're so serious about things. They always do this. They go, no, of course not. That's right. And I go, so there's no way you could put people in a trance if your voice wasn't truly monotone. So if you change the pitch, it wouldn't make you go deeper and deeper. Still going deeper and deeper. <laughs> There's no such thing as, as hypnosis, Robert. You understand that? Yeah. It's, there's only consciousness and unconsciousness. <laughs> <laughs> now? <laughs> That's right. You can open your eyes shutly. <laughs> you guys should have had the camera up here. You guys missed all the fun. But you have to have your eyes open to know that things are going on. <laughs> now, I wanted to tell you that above and beyond the trick of going into the future, I wanted to give you a little pattern that I use. And what I'm going to do is have you just break for a few minutes. And this is a real quick exercise that I want you to add. I want you to have the same partner. And I want you to go back, and I'm going to have you build in something. There's a trick that I've used for a long time with my clients to build in longevity of change. And I haven't told other people about it because I hadn't come up with a better way of doing it yet. Until I come up with a better way, you guys don't get it. It's the law of requisite variety. But since this is supposed to be closely held patterns, I thought I'd throw this one out for you. And that's mostly because I can't remember if I did it last time, and it won't hurt to get it again. But one of the things that I've, I've used as a trick is I've used presupposition inside of my work so that uh, failure when people fail, when they make a change, a lot of times, now and then, they will revert to the old behavior. And I found that one of the things that happens is, is if people have one or two instances where they begin to revert at all, it means to them they have failed utterly. I've noticed this especially with dieting. When you listen to people talk about dieting or exercise programs or if they're trying to give up alcohol or drugs or any of these things, that that if you do a piece of work with them and they backslide even a little bit, it constitutes a thing where the whole game is over. That, that they set up an either-or situation. So one of the ways in which I've used timelines is to set up a failure presupposition by having people go into the future, six months, 12 months, and a year into the future, and having the experience of backsliding. And with some things, you know, I may make it a week or two weeks. For our purposes here, what I'd like you to do is to back up, take the four tuple, which where you guys were smart enough to anchor the one when you compressed it. Why are some of you gritting your teeth and looking at me? Whenever you get a good response out of people, you anchor it just in case. So always, you always want to keep those around. And, you know, if nothing else, you anchor it just by naming it or use, you know, a contextual <coughs> word. You know, or you kiss them in the left ear. There's any old anchor will do. If you didn't, don't worry about it because it's so recent they'll be able to go right back to it. But now what you want to do is to take them back to the present time, have them step into the new set of submodalities you've just created. 
the layered set. If any of you laminated them, as you have them step into the present, have them compress the lamination into a single feeling. Can you feel this? No. <laughs> yes, it's done now. Okay, once you've done that, then what I want you to do is to have, have, have your person go one week ahead, see and in the future, doing NLP and reverting back to being boring, mundane, and too serious. Then have them go two weeks and revert back. The magic word here is revert back. Because, and then when you have them go a month ahead and revert back to an example. Now this is where language becomes a powerful tool. Because if you can have them go into the future and revert back three times, it presupposes that when they reverted back, they went back to doing it the right way. That they went back to what's useful. If you give somebody a diet and you program them in the future to fall off the diet three times, the presupposition is they got back on it. Now, when you embed this in their unconscious on the timeline in the future, it alleviates this, this thing, which is a built-in mechanism in most people, that if they fail one small amount, that they're going, then the whole game is over. People talk about falling off their diet. I, I, they used to talk about falling off the wagon. That if people would stop drinking, if they, felt, if they started drinking once, then they were going to drink forever. You know, that whatever they did to stop drinking was over. But by, by using a technique where you build in three failures into the future is actually more useful than building in three successes. Because it presupposes, since the failures are spread apart, that they're succeeding the rest of the time. So by using presupposition, you take care of this, this cataclysmic thing that if they backslide one little bit, and you also build in a very powerful presupposition that the rest of the time they're going to be succeeding. So the important part is, is that when you program it out into the future, you want more space between the failures so that if you start out with one week apart between failures, then it's two weeks, then it's four weeks, then six months. So that as you go future, into the future, you spread apart the failures. Now, when I, when I, I tried to teach this in the practitioner course, and, and I had an uprising in people because they told me if you did this, it would make it so people fail. And quite to the contrary, I have found it so that what happens is, is that people have trouble failing. Because since what they've done is to program themselves to backslide in a week, typically they're late. And what happens is, is they're so expecting it to come in a week, they have no trouble doing fine for the first six days. And when it comes time to backslide, they're not ready to backslide because they've been doing too well. And I get guilty calls from my clients. <laughs> I do. I get, I get guilty calls like, well, I wanted to know, you know, you did this thing where you said in a week I was going to backslide. Why well, didn't backslide? And I said, you didn't. You know, and I said, well, we'll see what happens in two weeks. I said, just start the same thing now. <laughs> now, by sliding time in that way, what happens is, is they built up a whole wealth of experience. But it also means if at any time in the future they backslide, now all they have to do is make it two weeks. So that you're building in a powerful set of presuppositions that make it easier for people to succeed by, and especially with your polarity responders. Your polarity responders never make it. The ones that have built-in polarity responses. Once they know they're supposed to fail, then of course they're stuck succeeding. And the thing is, is that is that it is also important when you use this, especially with your clients, not to explain it. Because they, they get uptight about it. They go, well, why would you want me to go ahead and plan to fail in a week? And I, I always look at them and I go, I don't. Just do what I say. This is one of the things about having firmness in your strategies, is because a lot of clients, if they can figure out what you're doing, then they can figure out how to sabotage it. If they don't understand what you're doing is programming them to be able it's not, it's not a question of whether they go off their diet. It's a question of whether they get back on it. And as long as they can fail in a week, and then they have to fail again in two weeks, they have to get back on it in order to be able to fail again. And as long as they don't realize this is a way of getting them back on, not of getting them off. Because if they never fail, then they don't have to get back on. But even if you take a technique like we just used, 
so that when you start to do NLP with the client, you catch yourself so you don't go into, you know, especially those of you who have done therapy for years, you don't want to go into a therapist mode and, you know, get serious and analytical and start thinking of, you know, if you catch yourself wanting to do reframing, that sort of thing. When you, when you feel yourself wanting to say, go inside and ask, you can be sure to that. You don't have to do that anymore, you know. And, you know, there's some real weird byproducts of doing reframing, uh, especially with some people, with people who are, you know, somnambulistic hypnotic subjects. You know, you're kind of on the road to multiple personality. I mean, one of the things that blew me out is, is that when I was first introduced to the concept of multiple personality, other than seeing the movie The Three Faces of Eve, it turned out every multiple personality client I could find was discovered by a psychiatrist who used hypnosis and believed in multiple personality. And I couldn't find any exceptions to it. Now, it doesn't mean there aren't any, but it means if there are, there aren't very many of people who do this on their own. I mean, when that book Sybil came out, they broke out all over the place. You know, people look, watch that movie and their unconscious mind went, that's a better choice. <laughs> but, I mean, before the movie came out, uh, there was this psychiatrist in, in Santa Cruz who had discovered an epidemic of multiple personalities. And he published a list of symptoms. And they were ways that you could identify. And he had like five different personality traits. And the first personality trait on the top of the list was easily hypnotizable. And I went and saw this guy and how he discovered, is he noticed that sometimes people acted differently. So he gave the different behaviors different names. Then he hypnotized them and asked for the person behind that behavior to come out. And I want to tell you, this guy did some stuff that made Billy Graham look like a straight man. You know, but of course, he had a medical degree, so it was OK to be weird. I mean, this guy was out there doing exorcisms on the helicopter pad at Dominican and calling my work nutso. I want you to think that one over. Yeah, he, th he decided NLP was too strange. The stuff we did with people was dangerous. And yet he was walking up to people, and walking up to somebody and going, Bert, come out, Bert, come out, come out, Bert, come out. Hit him on the head, shit like that. And he'd be whacking him, you know, until, so, yeah, until Bert would go, and go, I'm Bert, anything you want. Quit whacking me in the head, you know. And these are the people that think NLP is weird. I mean, these people that look, I love this shit. People look at you and they go, well, actually, you're talking to me and your parent now. If you were talking to me as your child, then you would be sincere, but you're not sincere, so you're talking to me as your parent. Ooh-wee! And these people are telling me my stuff is outside. Well, I do have to admit that go inside and ask stuff is a little spooky. That's why I gave it up. Sometimes people go in there, you know, and I'd really want to run around behind them and go, nice day for an exorcism, isn't it? <laughs> now, what I want you to do is is again, what I want you to do is to remember, you're, part of what you're learning is, is, is to put spice into your work so that when you use a technique like this, it's not just enough to go through it rotely. You, what you, you need to do is to literally, you know, have the person, you know, say, and now, you know, stop and first, you know, see yourself a week from now doing work with clients, looking enthusiastic and stuff. Then step inside your timeline, go out a week into the future, and then go back into the same old rut. So you catch them off guard and they go, like that, right? And then go a week further and discover yourself doing this again. So it's a single unit of time. You want to use all the words and pieces of language that segregate time. And another time. Once again, all of the types of language that fragment out experience. For those of you who have not delved into Patterns 1 recently, go back. Patterns 1 is your guide to precise use of language. All of those appendices and the construction appendices are designed to teach you how language operates in terms of the control mechanisms. It's not just a way of doing hypnosis. It's a way of using language methodically. In order to have it be a whole book instead of a handout, we had to write all that stuff about hypnosis in there. We needed the money at the time. But the construction appendices are still in and of themselves, mostly really precise use of, use of language. Then in my master track, one of the things that I make people do is to take a transcript of a tape where I work with a client and to go through and make 10 different columns where they go through and analyze language in terms of quantification. Because quantification of language is an important thing. The difference between each, always, every, 
and looking at how quantification affects which, which types of experiences are accessed and in what order. Because you look at quantification and after that then you look at sequences or what we call chains. And in terms of what chains are being installed, which chains are being broken up. And as you begin to analyze things in terms of a multi-leveled outcome, it's not that that's what I was thinking about at that moment necessarily, but it gives you the opportunity to learn how to be precise. Uh, I always tell people, if you'll find in each of my sessions, I always do everything wrong before I do it right. I will do one time at least, I will deliberately do something that mismatches what's going on. And even in the Marshall University tape with the lady that starts out and she's, the first thing she says is, oh, well, I have a problem. I need to get more distance from. So the first time I did the swish pattern, I used size, right? Now, this, I do this as a test. I do it as a test because you kind of get it partially. And then when you go back and do it the other, you can watch it zing. And I like to do that with clients. I do it a little bit tilted. And it makes the money easy. It's a real mismatch. It's, it's the same kind of a technique that, like, one of the things, if you watch in the film, sometimes I, I respond to clients with an absolute opposite answer to what they gave me. If they go, I can't do that, and I go, well, I'm really glad. That'll make it easy. Right? And you watch it go phew, right by. Because, it's a way, because they don't know what they said. They haven't got a good, most people can't remember the last thing they said. They're reacting. And the fact that they're reacting is how I respond as if they're reacting to something else. They get convinced if I'm congruent enough. Because my, my goal remains constant. I don't, as long as I hear what they say, I can decide what I respond to. Especially if a client is incongruent, you know, when they go, they go when they say to me, they go, I could never stand up to my mother. And I go, boy, you're really going to enjoy it this time then. It'll put her in her place. So that you literally inverse the messages. For those of you who've had, have most of you in here done mixed state communication? Some of you look real quirked when I said that. Is there anybody in here that doesn't know what that means? Mixed state communication. That's, that's where you just ignore the conscious part and talk right through somebody. It's like trance, only you don't fuck with the trance part of it. You just talk to their unconscious, you know, and uh, just assume that anything that you, and you literally focus your eyes about three or four inches behind their eyes and just keep talking to them. You go, he knows what I mean, doesn't he? Sure. Sure. <laughs> right. Guy's got a big mouth, doesn't he? Now, the thing is, is that when you use mixed state communication, what happens is, is you end up setting up a signal system. It's, it's just like setting up finger signals, only you just do it in the waking state. And since most of people's behavior is unconscious anyway, it's not that difficult to do. And, I mean, you can do it deliberately. I mean, you can send messages to people as you put them in mixed state. But when you put them in a mixed state where they, they feel themselves responding in ways that they're not in control of, you're not changing their state so much as making them aware of what's going on anyway. And the fact that they feel unnerved by it just allows you to be able to begin to embed suggestions. Now, we used to do it that way because it, it, it was a quicker way of doing it than, it than what it took to go with the reframing. It was the first step that made reframing unuseful because it just takes too long. Because some people, you have them go inside and ask. They could be there for a week. Have you ever noticed that? Some people, you go, go inside and ask this question and notice what happens. And they close their eyes. They go inside and you go, da -da 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 -da. And you go, has anything happened? And they go, no. I mean, you know, their heart has to be beating. Something must be going on. It's just a question of what are they doing in there? Doodling on their brain or something? Um, that, to me, that when you start dealing with compressing states, you're bypassing the need for that because instead of worrying about whether there is a part, because most of the time you have to understand you're creating them. They're not there. And I've decided people have too many parts as it is. Too many parts, too little behavior. And this is what builds internal conflict. So the more parts you create, the more potential conflict you have of creating in somebody. This is why I don't think that reframing in itself is all that ecological, even if you do go check at the end. It's, it may, everybody may agree upon that, but you may have created potential conflicts in new situations by creating new parts. I mean, we used to sit around and just generate them wantonly, thousands of them. But given what happened to those people, I don't think it's a good idea. Too many people stuck at various levels in my development. I mean, they end up writing a book. They always end up writing a book about how to reframe everything at once. Instead of having to reframe it, instead what you can do is to begin to combine things. 
Now, then once you've combined states, then all you need to do is to connect them with the future. Because one of the big shifts that you make with people, I figure, when you do good NLP work, is to take the focus off the past and to put it on the future. That too many people believe that what happened in the past is what makes what's going to happen in the future. That they live in a cause-effects universe. You know, that since I was a wimp for 20 years, I'm going to be a wimp for 20 more. Now, if anybody taught me that this does not have to be the case, it was Ann Teachworth. Ann Teachworth told me that uh, she had a relative that told her when she turned 50, she didn't have to do, she could say, speak her mind, and she didn't have to worry about what people were going to think. And when Ann had her 50th birthday, boom, it happened. Because she believed it. She had a belief that when you turn to a certain age, you change automatically, overnight. And as long as she had one, that's exactly what happened. It just went, boom like this. Now, a lot of people have a belief that the way that they were determines how they're going to be. And people change overnight all the time. Anybody that, any of you had a near-death experience? Right? Would you get up the next day and live the same way? Nope. nope. Right. Suddenly your value system changed. Some of those things that seemed so utterly important didn't seem so important anymore. Now, I, that's why I always try to provide my client with a near-death experience. <laughs> <laughs> Something to reassure you with. <laughs> um, that, you know, that for, well, for some of them, it's probably as close as they'll get until they do a real one. But uh, for me, the thing is, is that you always want to get people to be aimed at the future and sticking new things in the future. That, that you know, if I go through the past, I go through the past to blow up things. I mean, like last time we did the Decision Destroyer. The Decision Destroyer is a way of going through and just blowing apart the semantic response from the past. Now, the only way in which the past has a hold on your future is insofar as these cues that I talk about trigger familiar responses. But yet, sometimes those responses are not familiar. Now, what I want to do is just bracket for a few minutes. I want you to just take your, go back with your partner, and I want you to program them to go back to to the mundane way they worked, right? But now, do three failures, right? But start with a success. So what you do is you go back, you go into the present, have them see themselves doing NLP with this new change, excited, step inside of it, and fire off an anchor for the new state. Have them enjoy it, and have them go a week into the future. And if you can totally build the expectation, right? Now, since I've already told you what you're going to do in here, Go a week into the future and either have them succeed or fail. And then go another week so that you can keep them guessing a little bit. Now, as you, go, as you go into the future, you want to build, primarily with clients, examples of single failures. You don't have to tell them they go back into success. You have them move further into the future and then fail once again. Then once you're done, then what you do is have them stop and then pick any period of time in the next whatever, say, say you go six months into the future, or three weeks, or however far is the maximum you went. When you're done, stop. Have them pick one point randomly in the future. Step inside it and tell you how they feel, or you should know by looking, because you should have a dramatic enough foretuple. And find out whether they move to success or failure. They move to success, you did it right. Use every presupposition you can stack in your language. Presuppositions are powerful. The presupposition, you don't want to presuppose that they're going to fail. You're building the presupposition that they're going to succeed. You move into the future. See yourself failing one time, going back, which means you have gone forward, right? It's a presupposition when you say going back once to the old boring way you used to do it. By saying once again, back, anything that, 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 that is a repeat in future, if you build this into your language, at the unconscious level, you are giving a direct and overwhelming command that you will do it the positive way most of the time. It's not even a command, because you're only saying that you're going to see yourself falling back into that pattern. And notice how it feels to go back into that old behavior. OK? Now just do this real quick. Take about five minutes apiece. And then we'll move on and see what else we can do here. So, okay, you said you had a question. Um, when we were looking forward 
One week, one month, six months. When we were looking forward. <laughs> yes. When we were. Okay. When Barbara was or you were? Uh, Anne. When Anne was or when? When, when Anne each was. of you sequentially or uh. both of you together? <laughs> First when she was looking forward. First when she was. And then what? when I was looking Okay. Forward. Sequentially. That's good. Sequentially. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Just checking. But when she was doing it, I was looking forward. Why would we want to be in the land of sensory experience? That's right. Uh, <laughs> she said she uh, stepped in to that one time going back to the old way, yeah. rather than just looking at it. Mm -hmm. said that was important for her yeah. to have that kinesthetic, and then she popped out rather than moving. Well, out. what does that tell us about her? <laughs> Miss In Time, why yes. would she do that? And that yeah. worked great. I wanted to do it strictly out. Doesn't surprise me a bit. Um, That's what we did it both ways. And we did it both ways. Well, <laughs> good. Doing it both ways is going to be useful. See, just like in the other exercise, remember I had you do it all three ways? See, if you do it all three ways, you can't miss, right? It, in other words, if you can't figure it out from somebody's language, the best way, because what you're doing is, is an upgraded version of future pacing. Uh, the concept of, when we started future pacing, one of the things that, that we were aware of was that, that a lot of times you could get behavioral change with people uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a session. You know, somebody that had never stood up for themselves, you could goat them to the point where they'd stand up to you, right? But then when they'd leave your office, especially if, since most of my clients have had overdoses of therapy, they also have learned to disassociate those experiences. It's one of the, the thing that I got into with the encounter group people was that the concept was that you built this environment of trust with people where you could actually be more yourself and do more things than you could with your family. And that, that I always had a big problem with that because it seemed to me this is where you wanted people to be able to do things was in their life, not in your office. And especially not with a group of people because, you know, you don't want people to have a more intimate relationship with a group of strangers than with the people in their life. If you're going to be intimate, you know, you're supposed to do it with your wife, not with your psychiatrist. And, uh, you know, I, for a long time, used to get into it with shrinks because shrinks would always say, well, you know, all these techniques are well and fine, but isn't the real core of therapy, the real thread and the most important thing, the relationship that the therapist builds with the client, a more trusting relationship than they could know anywhere else? And I go, no, that's prostitution. That's a different thing. But for a long time, a lot of the training for psychoanalysts and, and psychologists that they believe that building a more trusting relationship, the massive transfer, as they called it, and all that stuff, is what it was about. For me, the trick is, is to gather information, not build a love life. You know, I mean, I want, I want, I love, I want clients when they leave that, that the, thought of, the thought of staying fixed is a lot better than the thought of coming back. <laughs> I like that. You know, and they think I could call Richard on the phone or I could just do it myself. That I want them to go, I'll just do it myself, <laughs> Jesus Christ. That, you know, I don't want to be their buddy. And that, that one of the things is, is when, when we discovered that this was a major problem for people, one of the reasons was is that they could get angry. They could be honest with their shrink, but they couldn't get it to the outside world. So when I came up with the concept of future pacing, what I was trying to do was to take just the stimulus response conditioning and, like, take the, you know, the stimulus with the response and then do, there literally is a, a technique that was developed, you know, Pavlov, you know, hit the tuning fork, got the dog to salivate, and then hit the tuning fork and did something else. And then pretty soon he could just do this, the something else and the dog would salivate. So that you could literally transfer stimulus from one thing to another. And as much as you would lose a little bit on a generalization gradient, you'd still get some out there. Well, what I wanted to be able to do was to make sure that whatever the kinesthetics so that I took the cues that would occur in the world, that I took the way that the, their wife looked at them, that, you know, that, I mean, a uh, certain tone of voice that people used, uh, their, where their office, or, you know, the way their boss intimidated them with just raising one eyebrow, and to make that the cue to feel that way, so that it wasn't enough to get somebody to stand up for themselves. They had to be able to have that same feeling and look at the image in their head so that it would transfer over. Now what we're doing is we're, we're trying to build more generative systems so that as the person goes into the future, 
that what we're doing is we're presupposing they're going to get where they want to go and making it so that it generalizes to a wider range of contexts, especially when we're dealing with things that, that, as far as I'm concerned, are more attitude adjustments. And the attitude adjustments, the primary ones I work for, are that people go towards the future in a positive way and away from the past. That, you know, that the amount of time that most of my clients spend thinking about the past as opposed to the future is simply not economical. That, I mean, even when they think about the future, it automatically TDs them to the past and gives them, you know, well, if I were to try to do that, then something like happened in the past would happen. And those are not necessary nor even logical connections. And I want to break that up so that I can build the feelings in them so when they think into the future, they get the feelings. In fact, the activity of thinking of the future generates positive feelings. And because to me, I want them to move towards the future and away from the past, especially what they don't like about the past. If it was bad, don't do it again. And the way to not do it again is to not do anything. It's to change the way you feel when it happens, not to change what you do. And it's not being in a group of people. I mean, like, I did, a, I did uh, after I did the platform skills and the trainers training last year, I got hired by a, a company uh, to go in and train people that do public speaking. They go around and they give lectures about a product. And uh, they have people that had a lot of product knowledge, but as they put it, they were, they were not snappy enough public speakers. Uh, that is not exactly what I would use as a description. Uh, they didn't even know they were in the business of selling, is the way I would put it. Uh, they, like they had, I asked people, because I, I watched uh, each of them for five minutes do their shtick. And then I went through and I asked them some questions, because I was kind of curious, about how did they respond to the audience? And the first guy, because I had to ask this guy, because uh, he had every cue that I've ever seen when I've done limited vision with hypnosis. That's where you get a client to, to like, if I was working with a client hypnotically, I would get him to disappear the rest of the people in the room. You do things like you put them in a deep trance and you go, is it all right to be alone with me? And they go, yeah, and I go, okay, in a moment you'll open your eyes and we'll be totally alone, which kind of presupposes the rest of the people aren't there. Now, when they do that, in order to create limited vision, there's a way in which people defocus their eyes to disappear things. And this guy pretty much was doing that. So I asked him, I said, what do you do with the audience? And he said, well, he said, basically, I pretend that they're not there. And he said, what I do when I walk up in front is I imagine a curtain and I pull it in front of the audience. <laughs> and I thought, gee, I ought to try that. <laughs> now, the thing is, is, is to me, like, if you're going to, like, talk to an audience, you talk to them, right? And I mean, you know, it's, it's, it, to him, he, since he was afraid of talking to an audience, he disappeared them. But then it sounded like he was by himself when he talked. I mean, the thing is, is, he was explaining things, but it sounded more like he was talking to himself. You know, like if he was in a room by himself, practicing going over a speech, right? And it was pretty rote, you know. And then he would even say, you know, and then I would say to you. <laughs> I mean, it's not, he wouldn't just say it, he would say, and then I would say to you that this is a wonderful product. What I would tell you is that this is really going to be valuable it's going to be one of the most useful things that you could use. And I could get you to understand that. And, I, you know, and when I listened to his language, I mean, the presupposition was is that he was alone. And in fact, he developed the technique of being alone. See, with somebody like him, what I want to be able to do is to open that curtain. But I want to start with the feeling of excitement that, you know, it's, I want him, you know, to have the attitude, fresh meat to carve, you know, that, that to me, you know, that if somebody is, he had been in front of an audience and had froze up. So frozen one time he couldn't speak. And it was such a bad experience that every time he looked at an audience, he thought about that, which is I didn't think was the most effective way to be it, put yourself at ease. I mean, so I pointed out to him, if he thought about it, made the picture big and bright and close, he could do it again. But if instead, every time he looked at that picture in the past, it cracked him up as ludicrous, and instead, looked down and just looked at it, you know, the way you'd look at, you know, if you'd walked out on a smorgasbord that nobody had touched anything on. And you weren't supposed to eat any of it for 15 minutes, but you were alone. <laughs> right? Nice four-tuple, isn't it? Right? And anchor that and then slowly open the drape and fire that anchor off so that his attitude changes. Because to me, one of the primary things that I'm trying to build in people is I'm trying to build in an attitude that's more pervasive 
than the single change. I even look at a lot of times that whatever the particular small thing is, is it's almost a hook for me. I mean, when I had the guy who was a social phobic came to me, it's not enough to change, you know, the fact. So you can sit down with a group of people and he's not afraid, but that doesn't, it's going to do any good if he's just boring and just sits there. It's like, okay, I'm not afraid. <laughs> so then he can just be dull for the rest of his life as opposed to terrifying. You know, I mean, to me, you know, it's, it's, got, it's got a lead on to really looking at, as, at, the, at, at a single change as an opportunity to head off in a more powerful direction. That if you can begin, you know, if you can do an exercise, a little thing like you did this morning, where you step inside of exhilaration and it makes you feel different. And then you consider, look, if you can take that and make it so that all of your work becomes more exhilarating for you, then you're going to become more dynamic in the way you do it. Then you're going to learn to do more things. It sets up a direction and opens up a world. But then if you can begin to layer other stuff on there and then do it no matter how hard you try to screw it up in vain. So that you begin to build something that, because, see, I find that too many times that people take powerful technology and they don't use it powerfully. And then, you know, because I get, I get calls from people, they go, well, I went to two workshops and I learned to do the phobia thing and I read it in the book. But I do it with my clients and it only works sometimes. And I go, well, I'm surprised at that. Must be a fucking great technique if you can get it to work. Because it's not just the technique, it's an attitude and a methodology. It has to do with having some punch in what you do. And, and because it, it, as you teach people and take them through a series of responses, I mean, you know, you've got to have a response to anchor it. I mean, we used to spend a lot of time developing people's sensory experience to see real minimal cues. And I stopped doing that because what happened is, is people didn't have to elicit intense responses, right? Since they could see minimal changes in lip size and breathing, they'd only access puny little responses. So I decided it's better I blind them, you know, and make it so the response has to be overwhelming if that's what it takes to get them to get people to respond. Because if you anchor five little chump change responses and you can see the anchor go off, but it's so minimal they can't notice, it's not helpful. It needs to be just fucking dynamite responses, things that are volatile in nature. Anyway, does that answer your question? Yes. Good. Is there any other questions about what we've been doing or other stuff? That's it. That's all you want to know about NLP? The thing is, is if you want to learn advanced patterns, the thing is that you've got to have advanced interests. I mean, what kinds of things? I mean, you know, you've been using this stuff. What kinds of stuff do you not get enough dynamite with? Where do you find yourself not being powerful enough? What do you need to lace into your own experience? Because I tell you what, can I, I can assign a homework assignment for you tonight. I want you, do you guys know what the word semantic packing means? Do you know what a semantically packed word is? A word like lurk is semantically packed. One does not lurk right through a crowd and speak their mind, right? It's a word that is so semantically packed, it induces. And see, when, when, when the kinds of uh, experiences I've been asking you about, I've been picking words that are highly charged for experiences. Go home and make a list of them tonight. Make a list of highly charged, semantically primed names, nominalizations for experience that, that are powerful and positive and dynamic. Things that have chutzpah. Right? And tomorrow I'll show you a closely held pattern of how to lace them into yourself. I'll show you the ultimate visual squash. I'll show you the way I do it to myself. It's a deep trance phenomenon, but it's fun. You can build your own external behavioral generator. Teach you sci-fi reality. But now, what, yeah. Um, one of the things that happens for me when I get into people's patterns on my own that uh, are not comfortably easily changed, and then they start changing, I get really tired. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not following you. First, I have to follow what you're saying. Okay, well, I'm thinking of two different experiences. So let me talk about one first. The idea, Good idea. Yeah, <laughs> the idea of working with someone whose patterns are very complicated and difficult for me to work with. Well, how do you, how do, what makes them complicated and difficult? Because either they're so much like my own that I have to kind of figure out ways to get out of it, 
And what I'm saying is, you, you've mentioned before how when you really go through change, you get really tired or it like, can give some you a headache. Some people do, yeah. You can if, you, if you do too much at one time. You can also get tired just because you think too much. I mean, I discovered that when people try to figure things out too much, as opposed to being interested in what's there. And one of the major ways that happens is when people relate things to themselves. When you constantly relate behavior to your own, switch referential index with stuff and relate it to yourself, rather than doing it on the outside, it will exhaust you. And from previous experience, I have a good idea that's what you do. See, one of the things that, that, that is a trap, it's the same empathy thing I talked about, is if you try to figure out other people by analyzing it inside of yourself, there's a difference between trying somebody's strategy to see if it produces the result. You do that as an interested party. That, you know, when I tried the thing with the, la the lady that scared the shit out of herself when people were late, all I, d I didn't put myself, I didn't relate it to my personal life to see what kinds of things I do that are like it or that are similar. I took her literally at her word, did the steps literally, and see if it scared me. And if it didn't, then I went back and asked more. And if it did, then I was done. But I, I took her at her word and took her literally. I didn't examine to see if I did anything that was like it or anything that was similar. Because, see, when you search for similarity in yourself and a client, you will exhaust yourself. Because when you search for similarity, you will find it, whether it's there or not. And typically, it will make it so that it seems more complicated than it is. Learning to do things in a disassociated state, that even if a client has similar patterns to you, you don't want to know about it. You know, that your job is to do it out there. And, you know, that, because you can always go back and figure that shit out later on. And I mean, you know, I mean, that's, you know, that's just hobby stuff. It gives you something to do between clients, you know, or to do at home when you're sitting in the dark or something. But I mean, to do it with a client, you really need to put it out there on the outside. That, you know, we talked about uptime. Well, uptime isn't even enough. You have to, you have to put yourself in such an uptime state that you're in the state of being fascinated and curious, and it simply never occurs to you that it relates to you at all. That you just keep it on the outside and find through it. The reason I teach people the rigor of always going back through and finding out if things work, and going back through and seeing that they work, so that you could punch the same button and get the same result, is to keep it on the outside. You don't process the information inside you. Sometimes you can stop and try it on, but you always know that you're trying on a sequence of theirs. And, you know, if it suddenly seems familiar and it's like you, then you're going to start mixing your shit up with theirs. And, and it just, it gets too complicated and too messy. And it's just not, it's not temporally useful. And it creates too much work. Makes, makes it into work instead of fun. It's much more fun to torture them. Anything else? Inquisitive group we have here. You guys are going to have to go home and make some questions up tonight of what you'd like to know about. Yeah? I got one now. Good. Um, you can still make up more. Okay. What is it? Last time you mentioned uh, time distortion a couple of times without really going into detail on how to do that. Um, I'm like, all right, before. Uh, we didn't do time distortion last time? Time before that, we did. No, no, no. Too late. <laughs> uh, there's some real fascinating things. The things about altering your sense of time, um, there, there's some, see, to me, like, there's, there's different tasks. And one of the major tasks that I deal with is removing uh, semantic response. And semantic response is, has to do with, with, in essence, where you get your own shit mixed up with, with the situation that's going on. Because of the similarity of what's going on, you begin to respond as if there's other issues, as if hidden agendas are going on. That uh, becomes, you know, when people are trying to get something done as a team, uh, when, you know, they were trying to have a peace treaty about Vietnam, I mean, they were arguing over whether the table was round or square. I mean, these were not what we call team players, because they were trying to establish positions, and they were... Their, their suspicions about other people's motives and all the stuff that was going on. And if you believe, like all the time, that people are trying to take advantage of you and you're looking for that, you'll be responding out of behaviors. And, you know, and if your father yelled at you and made you feel small, if somebody yells at you, you know, it, it can trigger off old feelings that aren't related. The Harvard Business Review figured that 
it costs somewhere in the neighborhood of $70 billion a year just to deal with semantic response. And that's not to cure it. That's just it going on in the boardrooms. That the, it's, it's something which is human inefficiency. Did you have a question or just stretching? OK. Now, the thing is, it's like, in terms of time, uh, I found that there's a little thing I actually that might be kind of fun to do, is if, if you stop and think about a situation in, in your life, something that happens repeatedly where you have trouble dealing with it. You know, maybe a, pick a person for, if you sort by the person, pick a place if you sort by the place. Some people have trouble dealing with the bank. Some people have trouble dealing with a particular kind of person. Pick an example in your mind right now. Just go ahead and pick one. Okay. Go back and run through it in your mind. Okay, now, the speed at which you run it in your mind, okay, is different than real time. Real time is clock time, okay? When you run through a memory, you do it faster than the event that occurred, or you're the worst client anybody will ever have. <laughs> I've had a few clients that run their memories at clock time. And those are people that are going into a deep trance right now. We will have no personal conversation. There's nothing. Just, go back and remember a time you did this. And, you know, an hour and 45 minutes later, you know, they come out and go, yep, got it. Now, okay, then if you take internal time and the speed at which you ran the memory, no matter how it subjectively seems, it may seem like it was the same because you can do time distortion mentally. Now, inside of the memory you just had, the speed at which you were moving in your own perceptions. Now, some of you might have seen yourself in the memory. Some of you saw what you saw at the time, because those are your choices. OK. <laughs> now, the internal speed, there's two components. Typically, what happens is, is that you, person X, and the event, event Y, are moving at the same speed. Now. If you use it, stop. Now, what I want you to do is to, is to go inside, and I want you to step inside of yourself at the beginning of the memory. And I want you to just to hold it as a solid frame, OK? So it's just fixed. And what I want you to do is I want you to hear a, a, like a rheostat in your head. What I want you to do is to turn yourself down to half speed and then start the memory. So the memory moves at normal speed, and you move at half speed. OK, now go back to the beginning, right? freeze it as a frame. And again, give yourself a little dial that you can hear clicking. I want you to click yourself back up to normal. Now what I want you to do is to click yourself so you're moving twice as fast. That means everything else will appear to be in slow motion. But I want you to run the memory at the same clock time. But you'll move twice as fast, so it'll take twice as long in your subjective experience. <coughs> Try that. It's the opposite of what you just did. Got all that, Keith? Do the experience, then take the notes, OK? <laughs> it's easier that way, because if you're going to miss anything, it's just the note, not the experience. All right, now. Now what I want you to do is I want you to go back and do exactly the same thing you did the first time around that I asked you to. Run the memory, quote unquote, normally now and see how it feels different. So what happens? You can't do it. You must do it. Well, you didn't want to. Well, now you, that's chicken shit. I told you to do it. This is experiment. Think of yourself as an adventure. Just go back and run it clock time so that you're, you're now. You know you can always change it to the way you liked it. Go back and run it the same time. When you say you can't do it, that means you don't want to. You found a better way. Well, you want to find the way to have control over your brain. It's not going to feel the same anyway. Just go ahead and run it. What did the rest of you find when you went back and ran it then? It seemed really slow. Slow. 
Didn't have the same response. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't have the no, same response? No, because it, was no. like, when it seemed gonna, really slow. Yeah, I was like, oh, come on, let's want this over with. Didn't have time to have all those bad feelings, <laughs> did you? You're going, hurry up! <laughs> now, the, the ability to control your own sense of time, both inside of your control of your internal memories, is, is that what happens is, is that you're dealing with semantic response. Because your semantic response is fixed with time. Because given that you have certain semantic responses, one of the things is, is they take a certain amount of time. Now, try something even trippier. What I want you to do now is, is literally take, for example, take something that you enjoy, but you really want to enjoy it more. All right? Not yet. I'll tell you when. God damn. <laughs> Jesus Christ, you guys. Just take it and go away. Don't bother me and pester me no more. See, now, as soon as I say good feeling, see, I can always tell when people have done an FNLP. You say good feeling and they jump in, right? You know, you can always tell. This is an advanced group, an introductory group. You go pick a feeling and they go, oh, shit, you know. You guys start turning out to be ecstasy junkies. Now, the thing is, is I want you to take a good feeling. Now, this time what I want you to do is, is just before you go in, I want you to figure out what would make it feel better. Because some things feel better if they last longer. And some things feel better by going faster. You've got to remember, if you speed yourself up, the event slows down. And if you slow yourself down, then the event speeds up. Or the opposite. <laughs> Depending upon who you are and what you're doing. Now, so I want you to stop and figure out, do you want the event to last longer or be quicker? Then what I want you to do is then take the sound of the rheostat that you have. Okay, and this is why I built the sound in. What I want you to do is to start into the experience that you enjoy and turn the rheostat. First, I want you to slow it yourself down, keep the event going the same, and see if it increases your enjoyment. If not, turn it the other way. And keep turning it until you can heighten the enjoyment more and more and more until you can fine tune it by hearing the clicks on your rheostat back and forth, till you literally tune yourself in to the speed that fits with that experience to maximize your enjoyment. Go ahead, now you can go try it. into a mellow group here. <laughs> All right, so now what do you want us to do? Now, the, the sense of time that you just built, okay, okay, you now have an anchor internally for something that controls that. True? Okay. Now, what I'd like you to do is to think of something that clients do that throw you off kilter. For example, do they, if when they yell, does it throw you out of whack when they cry? Uh, is there certain things that people talk about that throw you out of whack? Because, see, you're a human being. You're not a fucking piece of furniture. There are some subjects that are hard to talk about. There are things that get you hooked, you know. I mean, you know, there are certain words that you can say, you know, that, that set you in to not, to not maximizing things. There are probably, if you run through in your mind, the clients you have, there will probably be a couple that when you cross them in your mind, you get this little voice that goes, Bleh, you know, or ones that go, oh, shit, you know. Uh, some clients are, see, there are some kind of clients that probably are the ones you don't want to work with. And those are the ones that would probably be the best because they'd be the most challenging. But you haven't gotten into the state where you look at the more difficult it is, the more fun it is. There's more to figure out. There's more to try and more new stuff to learn. That, you know, that one of the things that... Uh, See, for example, for a long time, I didn't like to see depressives because they were so boring. And they talk too slow. You know, they'd come in and they'd go, well, last week, yeah, last week. You'd, I'd go, what? <laughs> you know? And, I mean, they'd make me nuts. Well, I found out that, that one of the things that I could do is if I speeded myself up three times as fast, I hit a threshold where it didn't matter anymore that instead of it bothering me that they went slow, I began to bother them instead. And that's where something began to happen. 
Now, if you take now and go back to the, to the event for the event that I had you pick, something where the situation where you didn't like it. You remember the first one? Okay. Now, you remember which direction you went in that made it better? All right. Now, what I want you to do is to go back and pick another event that's like it, something else where you don't like the way it works. Since we screwed that one up, I want you to just pick a new one. Only this time, I want you to go in, and I want you to click the way that didn't work, but I want you to jam it through the ceiling. So run through it, and instead of just cutting it in half, if cutting it in half didn't, wasn't the one like doubling it was the one you like, this time, cut it in half, cut it in half again, and cut it in half even again. Just jam it through the ceiling with your rheostat in the opposite direction is the way the one worked. Because you'll discover going both ways will disengage semantic response. One way, it hits the point of being totally ludicrous. And when it starts getting ludicrous, it starts giving you choices about what to do in those contexts. Like, for example, pick the client that aggravates you. Go back to the last session and turn that dial wildly in the opposite direction. Try it. Find out what happens. And see if ideas don't begin to pop into your mind of other things that you might say, which might interject some humor into the situation. Be extreme about turning that knob. When you look at it, it'll give you a different way of reading their nonverbal behavior. In one context, it's like making a videotape go 10 times as fast. In the other, it's like having one go 10 times as slow. In either case, it's going to exaggerate everything that your client does to the nth degree, including whatever it was that was bothering you, to the point where it won't, because the things that affect you affect you in real time. Gregory, what happened when you did that? Uh, yeah, it was sort of like a ludicrous generator. It was a lot more humorous, <laughs> slowing it way down. Um, except I'm sitting here thinking that, OK, I can do it sitting here thinking about it. But when it's well, we haven't done the rest of it yet. OK. Don't jump ahead. Now you have to learn to do it on the outside. Yeah. OK, which even for the sake, we might repeat that a little bit. But I tell you what we'll do, it's, since it's a little warm in here, why don't we take a 10 minute break? Okay, do you have any questions about this so far? Thus far? Okay, if not, what I'd like to do is, is I'd like to take this and I'd like to stack it apart. I'm going to have to back up to the exercise that we did, not last time, but the time before. And because I want to set up your ability to adjust your subjective experience of time. Okay, and I know some of you did that and some of you haven't done it. But I want to run through it real quick. And since we've got a half an hour, what we'll do is we'll run through it right now. And if you're not done, you can finish it up afterwards before we get back tomorrow. And then we can take it and build with it. Basically, what it boils down to is I want you to find extreme. And these are the kind of words you're going to be looking for in your homework. Words like extreme. Because you're, you're looking for an extreme example of fast time. OK. Do you know what fast time is? Time, that's where you, know, you, go, you go somewhere, you're having a good time, and whack, the day goes by like that. Ever had an experience like that? You went somewhere, and you know, it was 9 o'clock in the morning, and choop, 6 o'clock at night. You know, either that or you went out, it was 9 o'clock at night. And you looked at your watch, and damn, it was 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Oops. You know, and then you went home and you told somebody, well, I just got lost. I was having so much fun. And they went, that's a likely story. But that's what happened is time just went, flew by. That's fast time. Slow time is where you're waiting in line. Right? You're waiting in line. You walk up somewhere. You know, the movie is going to start in five minutes. You wait what seems like a half an hour. You look at your watch, and one minute has gone by. And you feel like you've been listening to the two people in front of you talk for a week because they're talking about the importance of Marshall McLuhan as a poet, right? And they're going on and on and on about it. The last 10 minutes of an airplane flight, that's a good example, takes two and a half hours, right? The pilot comes on and says, we'll be on the ground in 10 minutes. And you fly for an hour, and you look at your watch, and one minute has gone by, right? The 
pilot comes on and says, now we'll be on the ground in 15 minutes. Because only airlines can make time go backwards. <laughs> if you've ever waited in line to buy a ticket at the airline and you are third in line, and they have three people at the ticket counter, and the person, I love this, because they look over at you and they go, what is your name? And you tell them and they go, and then they look up and they go, and where were you going? They go, it doesn't tell you yet? They go, Chicago. Oh, what was the flight number? I don't know. I don't work here. Uh-oh. I don't know who programmed that thing, but that person should be killed. Slowly. They should, they should put them up on a hang noose and leave them there for a week. And then have somebody walk up like this and go, and take two weeks to pull the handle. Because those kind of experiences are slow time. Now, what I want you to do is to take somebody, and the important part of this is to get them inside the experience. You cannot do this disassociated. You want to get them right there, take them back in their timeline and drop them in so that they're there. This is where you pull out your hypnosis voice and have them go back fully and completely, words like completely, utterly, and honestly back to that experience so that you fully have them go back and go through the experience until they get that sensation. And as they get the sensation, have them allow their hand to rise up and then have them go and do fast time. First do slow time, then fast time. Then I want you to compare the difference in the submodalities so that you find out the difference between fast and slow time. Okay? So once you have fast, we'll make that short because it's quick, and slow time. Once you have the submodalities, what I want you to do is as you go through to build a sliding anchor. Do you know what sliding anchors are? Yes? Well, you missed a lot, Merlene. Where you been? <laughs> sliding anchors work this way. When you go through, as you go through, when you find a difference in the submodalities, slow time, fast time, because all we're looking for are the things that are different. When you find a difference, what you do is so we find out that, that, that things seem larger than life or smaller than life. Okay, that's one of the distinctions. That not that the images are small or the images are big, because remember, you're going to be inside this, just like you when you were there. But I've noticed when time is moving slow, everything seems smaller than life. That's one of the distinctions in my world. So what I do is, not only do you anchor it, like you anchor it on the knee here, but you have the person shrink it down even more. And as you do, you slide your finger a little bit. And then you do that with each of the submodalities where you find a dramatic difference, and you end up with an incredibly powerful anchor. You make a sliding anchor, one on each knee, slow time, fast time. Okay. While you're doing this, you are doing a trance induction the whole time. Remember, shh, hypnosis voice so that you get them inside the states, oscillate them back and forth. And then what you do is leave them in fast time. In other words, go back, access both, and then leave them in fast time so that time is just moving a mile a minute, you know, where time whoosh, goes by. You have a nice anchor for it that's exaggerated. Have them open their eyes, stay in fast time, fire off the anchor, and open their eyes and look around. And if they're there, people will be moving somewhat slower, talking somewhat slower. And they'll be having fun. See, I always thought it was a ripoff that when you're having a really good time, whoosh, it goes by. And when you're waiting in line, it takes too long. That doesn't seem fair. So I wanted to learn to switch these. And that's exactly what I did. That way, the last 10 minutes of going down on a plane goes whoosh, like this. And having a good time takes forever. Of course, you can't think of a good use for that unless you have an imagination like mine. OK, what I want you to do is go ahead and get started. And you won't get it all done, but maybe you can find somebody you can work with a little bit tonight or tomorrow morning before I get here, OK? Get yourself a partner and get going.
This videotape is edited from an advanced NLP training in Boulder, Colorado, April 1989. Many of the participants had also attended previous advanced training with Richard. Richard considers this seminar to be his best ever presentation of how he works with clients. Although he presents some new submodality methods, his major emphasis is on how he puts things together and the methods that he uses to create lasting change. Since this is a carefully sequenced seminar, we recommend viewing the videotapes in order. Okay, I um, wanted to take a few minutes this morning uh, before we dive into a little more stuff about time. I, I hate to put people in trance when they first wake up. Sometimes you can't get them back. But I wanted to ask you uh, if you came up with some other sorts of things that you'd like to cover if you had some good ideas. Yeah. Integration of disassociated sta states without using six-step reframing. Yeah, that's fun. There's all kinds of weird ways you can do that. Uh, we can get into that. That's a good idea. Do you guys know what he means by disassociated states? Have you got some? <laughs> <laughs> Think about your disassociated states now. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of times you, you find that, uh, that there are behaviors that people have that they don't count as themselves. <coughs> and one of the reasons that they have trouble dealing with it, a lot of alcoholics are like that. They don't count their drinking as part of their own behavior. And that's one of the reasons. It's like, you know, they only do certain things when they're drunk, especially bad drunks. Instead, instead of assuming that they're, you know, the part of their personality that's just obnoxious, and doing something about the obnoxious part of themselves, they always they say it's the alcohol. Like the alcohol has bad tonality in the bottle, you know, and bad manners. You know, let's have two shots of bad manners and bad tonality. Unfortunately, it does not affect everybody that way, so it should dawn on them that it must be them doing it. Whereas if they integrated the behaviors, they could actually alter the behaviors and probably end up drinking as well without becoming an obnoxious person. I don't know how many of you know people who are obnoxious drunks, but uh, they either need to be integrated or clubbed. You should take them out, put them in little white seal outfits and put them out in the snow at a certain <laughs> time of year. Give them a couple of drinks. <laughs> Hide the seals. <laughs> what other kinds of things did you come up with that you'd like to do as long as we have some time? Yeah. I'd like to get some input on how to Establish curiosity in, in a work group that I'm in now. Um, what do you mean, establish curiosity? <laughs> well, it seems like it's kind of dormant at this point. <laughs> you have a work work group, like an NLP work group, or no? It's a sales organization. Where sales, people right. have it's a group of salespeople. Curiosity is gone. Yeah. yeah, that's where you really need it. When salesmen go dormant, <laughs> they get poor quickly. Yeah, um, it's one of the things that I really spent time doing was studying the top salespeople and finding out, and uh, they are a ferocious crew. And I have, I have a group of people that, uh, that's, that I met, this is top insurance salespeople back east in one particular company. And uh, one of the things that is amazing about them is that this is one of the most curious group of people I've ever worked with. And they're insatiable. And uh, that one of the things that they have built in is they, they, have, they have a set of beliefs that they have built into themselves. I mean, their beliefs themselves are not genetic. And one of the most powerful ones they have that I also find is rampant in really good neuro-linguistic programmers is that challenge is fun. The more challenging something is, the more they drool out of the corner of their mouths. That they're out there looking for the hard sell, not the easy sell. And that uh, a lot of salespeople, you know, if something is difficult at all, that's where they have a tendency to back off from it. And uh, that you'll find that, do you get to do things to these people? In what way? <laughs> overtly. <laughs> yeah, I can do overtly or covertly. You know. Well, I always like to mix them up, you know. Yeah. But, uh, as long as you can do overt things, that one of the things you can do is to really do some belief installation. And belief installation, I mean, where you go and sit down, find out what the strongest beliefs that they have are, and find out which ones override which ones. Because belief systems are interesting in that there, there, are, there are very strong beliefs that people have that become suspended at a certain point in time. And you have to have that kind of stuff. I mean, as mostly that you can find that out by asking about survival situations and when you touch on ethics. 
Because see, like a lot, of, a lot of salesmen will use all the techniques they use, but not with relatives, whereas others will use them only with relatives and not with other people. Um, <laughs> you recognize this phenomenon. And, and sometimes, I mean, I've found that, you know, you can, that there, there are salesmen that have the greatest pitches, but they use them with everyone but their clients. I mean, you know, the other salespeople, telling people how great their job is, uh, relatives, people like that, friends. But, but until they know somebody, they don't use their really good skills. And, uh, and it's like, if you can alter the belief system so that that's when they're operational, you can do some real high-powered stuff. We can do some stuff about investigating beliefs. That's, that's always fun. I like tearing beliefs apart myself, especially the ones that limit people, you know, that if they do stuff that people won't like them. A lot of salesmen are much too timid, and that's one of the reasons they don't enjoy their job. When people walk in the door, they don't have that attitude where they look at them and say to themselves, you're mine, you know. They, they, don't, they don't see people walking into the palm of their hand as they march through the door. They, they, they look at them and they, they make them larger than life and they're, they're afraid they'll offend them and all kinds of stuff. And it just, it isn't, it isn't productive. Most of the good salesmen also have a tendency to run scenarios. They have a generative machine built into their head where they run worst case scenarios. They literally make up the most difficult client they can imagine in their head. And then they start running, you know, over and over and over. They go into a state of time distortion, which is kind of convenient because that's where we're leading into. One of the advantages of being able to do accelerated time states is that you can run massive numbers of scenarios, try different options about what to do in certain situations. And see, one of the things that's always helped me with clients when I, because a lot of the clients that I get are pretty weird. And I, I used to have a group of psychiatrists that would refer me what, what I ref classified as impossibles. I said anything that nobody can do. And they had to be to at least five or six therapists, and they had to be people that were given up on. And when people would come in, you know, it's, it's like I had to run different cases in, in terms of trying to figure out. Because, you know, my theory of schizophrenia is, is really fairly simple. If somebody's schizophrenic, uh, that's because they're not in touch with reality. So the trick is, is to make whatever they're schizophrenic about real. And it's kind of the opposite of what everybody else does. Everybody wants to put them in touch with reality. And I figure if you make their schizophrenia real, especially in the context where you can control the environment. Uh, we were talking yesterday, and one of the things that, you know, that I said is that I always believe that the people that are given up on in mental hospitals, the ones that are considered chronic and terminal, and, you know, where they don't actually even treat them anymore, there are whole wards full of these people roaming around mental hospitals, that these, but that since, you know, in essence, they've given them up for dead, that what they should do is take these people and give them to grad students, you know. And I mean, because, I mean, I don't know how many of you went to grad school in, in the field of psychology, but mostly all people do is statistics. And, I mean, which is ludicrous if you think about it. I mean, it's, the, to begin with, the last thing anybody needs. Plus, you're, they, they're sent, I mean, not so much now, but, I mean, it really used to be true that, I mean, people would graduate with a Ph.D. in psychology, and they would and get licensed, and they would have never seen a client. Not one. And I mean, now even in colleges, at least they have things like peer counseling classes and stuff. People who like actually got to talk to somebody. And uh, I mean, it, you know, how would you feel about it if you know, somebody got their license in surgery and had never cut open a frog or anything? You know? I mean, it's one of the things you don't want to be as a surgeon's first. I mean, that's, uh, I think that's why they use cadavers. At least I hope they do. Um, but, I mean, to, to turn people loose. But, see, I figured if they took these people and really got grad students to try anything under the sun, then what would happen is, is to begin with, a new, brand new technology would be developed in the field because the field of psychology has been rather dormant, as far as I can tell. And that new technology would be developed, but also after working with people that are that far out there, when people actually started working in the field and seeing clients, that that they would be less likely to get hooked into their difficulties. They wouldn't seem so severe. Plus, they would learn to distrust people enough that they didn't get hooked into their problems. Because, you know, uh, I've done a lot of things with clients, especially ones who have been through too much therapy. Uh, you know, like I've had people that, you know, told me horrendous stories about being beaten up by their parents when they were little and all of this stuff, and this is where all their traumas came from, and actually did regression with hypnosis and found out none of it happened. I mean, literally, none of it happened. And that, you know, they had taken, you know, a couple of small spankings and literally blown them out of proportion. 
there was a, a period, uh, I don't know, it must have been about 10, 12 years ago, where there was a group of therapists that uh, themselves had been beaten up as children who decided that everybody had been beaten up as children, and that was the basis of all of your problems, was that all children were actually abused children. You either had to be beaten up or, or molested and that everybody was by someone, and it was only a question of whom. And, uh, well, it was doctors, you know, next door neighbors, aunts, uncles, relatives, but I mean, every presupposition in their language, because I got this <coughs> uh, student, I had a grad student who came in, and, and, and this, is, this is the God's honest truth, who came in and said, Richard, I need, I need you to help me personally. And I said, well, you know, I don't normally do that with students. And, and she said, well, this is pretty serious. And I said, what is it? And she said, I was, I've been raped, and I don't know it. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but that strikes me as one of those sentences where, where your brain goes, Whoop. And, and I looked at her, and I said, if you don't know it, how can you tell me? And she said, well, my, my therapist found it out. And I said, did your therapist call some of your relatives? She went, no. And so... Uh, being the kind of guy I was, I gave her a tape recorder and I told her to tape her next session. And I listened to it and literally at least every other sentence had the presupposition in it that she had been molested when she was young. I mean, and now if you sit there and lay the same presupposition on somebody, embedded, double embedded, triple embedded for an hour. See, I found out if you stack three presuppositions, you can slide just about anything in. But if you did it for an hour, you would have people utterly and absolutely convinced. And it just didn't happen. I mean, I hypnotized her, regressed her, searched all around. It just didn't happen. But this particular therapist believed that if you had a sexual problem, it was because you were molested as a child, period. And there is no other, you know, it couldn't be that you just didn't know what the hell you were doing. Couldn't be something simple like that. Couldn't be the fact that the first time you had sex, you were scared out of your mind, so you anchored it, you know, which is always a great way to begin your sex life. Scare the hell out of somebody and show them their first naked person of the opposite sex. There's a good system. Well, I mean, this kind of stuff happens all the time. I mean, I found through the years that most of the problems that people have aren't as serious as they blow them out to be. And one of the things is, is that, is that, is that if, as long as, see, I had the advantage in that I was building a technology to get results in the future. And I really didn't care about the past because I don't believe in causal relationships. I mean, my background in physics taught me that the causal universe is simply a fallacy. I mean, the Newtonian universe that X causes Y, it just doesn't work that way. I mean, when I was doing physics, they'd already dropped that. You know, we moved on to Einstein. In fact, they're beyond Einstein. Now they now know his theories are bunk. But <clears throat> in terms of causal relationships, you see, if having something happen to you when you were five makes you have a problem when you're older, then there'd be nothing you could do about it. That would be that. It would be the end of it. And it would mean that everybody that that happened to would have that problem. And it just doesn't work out that way. I mean, some people, you know, become, you know, very introverted, you know, who were beaten up as children. And some people become total extroverts. Some end up with sexual problems and some don't. So it's not that simple because what they found out is that things operate in relationship to a lot of nonlinear variables. And it just isn't predictable in that way. And since I don't believe that things cause things, when people tell me about traumatic past experiences to begin with, I don't even know if they're right. Because, you know, if, I don't know, have any of you ever been to a Virginia Satir workshop uh, in here? But she, the well, first time I went to one of her workshops, she did something which I thought was interesting. She made uh, people who were therapists uh, in particular get down on their knees between two, she took the two tallest adults in the group. You know, there was one guy that was like seven foot and a woman who was six foot four, right? And had them hold their hands like adults do when they, with kids, stand between them, do things like lean over, you know, and pinch them on the cheeks and stuff so that they would know what it's like from a child's point of view. Spooky stuff, let me tell you. You know, and some giant person comes down and goes, hi, how are you? <laughs> you know, so that's the stuff nightmares are made of. Um, and, and so from the point of view of a child, that, that things can seem, you know, because uh, you know, a lot of times people, I remember that, uh, one of my clients telling me about his father, and he was this big guy, and he was brutal, and he was all this stuff and mean, you know. And I had this picture of this football player. And finally, one, one time, he said his dad was actually coming to town, and he was terrified to go see him and stuff. 
And so I said, well, I'll have him meet you here. So the guy walks in my office. The guy comes up to about here on me, right? My client is about a foot taller than I am, right? And after the session, my client still didn't know. When I said, did you notice that, you know, you're two and a half feet taller than your dad? And he went, I am not. And I mean, to, in his eyes, he was still looking through the old grids. And, you know, and if he like stood up and walked up next to his dad, but I mean, as soon as his dad walked in, he sat down because that's the position he knew to look at him from. It was familiar. And there is a thing about generalizations. One of the things that you will find about human beings that's the most true is that human beings have a tendency to do what's familiar, even more than what's safe. You know, that, uh, that if you consider that people think about suicide, Right, you know that that the survival instinct I don't think is as strong as doing what's familiar. That's why you have people that have like seven or eight suicide attempts. I mean, give me a break, seven or eight suicide attempts. I mean, you know, if there's one thing you should be able to get right, it's killing yourself. I mean, give me a break. You go up to a tall building, you throw yourself off. That's a one-shot deal, you know. I mean, you know, but I mean, and these people, I mean, they can take, you know, I I know and have had clients that have like slit their wrists six or seven times. What, they didn't notice the first two times it didn't work? You know, plus, you know, they slit their wrists this way. Everybody's watched enough TV to know you slit them this way. And I mean, it's, it's the kind of thing is, is that to them, I mean, even hurting themselves, I mean, they're, or, I mean, think about these people walking across hot coals, right? They're not thinking real clearly. Paying money to walk across hot coals. Think about it, right? All right, okay, you can, you can go on a vacation to Hawaii, or you can walk, for the same price, you can walk across hot coals. Hawaii, hot coals. <laughs> Hawaii, hot coals. <laughs> now, 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 not only that, they come up to me and brag. Listen to this. They brag to me, of all people. They come up and they go, I've done the fire walk 16 times. And I go, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like I go, Hawaii, <laughs> hot coals. <laughs> You know, it seems pretty overt to me. But the thing about, you know, when, when walking across hot coals now has become familiar to them. You know, I mean, uh, and to me especially, you know, to go and pay again to do it, think of how much, uh, you know, tan bark and gasoline you could buy for that price. They could be walking across hot coals every day for the price of that. Um, I mean, if you could be having some outrageous barbecues. I mean, you know, you could throw in the steaks and the potatoes for that price. I mean, to me, that, that human beings that, in terms of doing, protecting their, themselves and their own welfare, that's a new generalization for most people. For example, most of the clients I work with, the idea of aiming towards ecstasy and enjoyment is not the way they've directed their life. Then, I mean, one of the things I try to instill in all my clients is, is to do things in their own best interest. And you would, you would think that would be a prime directive of being a human being, it's doing things that are in your own best interest. But that's not at all the case. That, I mean, that, that uh, lots of human beings do, and I mean, if you think, think about it, just kind of roam back in your history a little bit and think about how many things you've done, and while you knew you were doing them, you knew they were stupid, right? And something propelled you to do them anyway. So, something seemed so important, you know. I mean, if, you, you know, if your boyfriend drops you, you know, so, so you're going to go out and get drunk and go drive your car off a cliff. That'll show them, you know, make it easy for them is what it'll do. And, uh, you know, either that or you'll go out with people you don't like, you know, stuff like that, you know. Uh, that, I mean, I see this kind of stuff in human beings a lot. Rather than they're taking, the, having the ability to know how to put something in the past and not care about it. Because one of the things is, is that when human beings get locked into something being familiar to care about, it's hard for them to stop caring about it. It's one of the reasons people have so much trouble with relationships ending. You know, you would think that, you know, if, if somebody goes, I don't love you anymore, I don't like you, in fact, I can't even stand being around you, that that would be enough. <laughs> you know, that, that something inside your brain would go, all right. But instead it goes, if you don't love me, I'll die. You know, it's as if they want somebody to, to pretend to love them who hates their guts. But something inside their brain in the stupid center you know, uh, a switch flicks over and goes, I'm going to get you to act like an idiot for at least three months. And uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, <laughs> well, it's true. I see this shit all the time, man. It's like, you know, you know, you think you've been dumb before. Watch this. Click. The switches go over. 
and you know, and then the dumb juice comes out, and you, and you know, and you start getting mad about things you don't even care about, you know. You start doing things you don't even want to do, and you start hanging around with people you don't like either. Because after all, if you want somebody who doesn't like you to hang around with you, then you should hang around with people you don't like. It makes sense, doesn't it? There is a certain perverse logic to it. And to me, one of the things about really learning to run your, your brain is to learn how to put things behind you. Learning how to, how, to, how to make yourself be able to not care about things that you really don't care about. I mean, because if somebody doesn't like you and you're in a bad relationship, like, you know, that a more appropriate response should be relief. You didn't have to be the one to say it. But somehow or other, it, this thing kicks off in people. And they don't realize that, 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 that time is a very relative phenomenon. And see, like, one of the things that, that I've used, like the exercise we did at the end of yesterday, too, is when I've had people that, you know, that when they were in a bad situation and they couldn't get out of it, they tell me that. And, you know, and I always go, look, you know, don't you know where the door is? You know, I mean, it seems to me they go, well, you know, I'm stuck in a bad relationship. And I go, you know, like, what stops you from leaving? And they go, well, I just can't, you know, because if I do, I don't know what he'll do to himself. And I go, what difference does it make? You don't like him. Well, yes, but I used to like him. So I still care about him. I just don't love him. I love him, but I'm not in love with him. Now, even your brain's got to be able to go, man, we're way into the fudge factor now. <laughs> you know, if you had a little voice inside you that just whistled, had a loud whistle, went, yo, you know, <laughs> listen to yourself talking. So I'm going to sacrifice. So one of the things I do with people is I take and I have them go, well, if it took you six more months to get out, what we're going to do is go through those six months. And then I take the same, the same types of, of submodalities as waiting in line, right? And I have them move through those six months and have it take forever. So that even things like going through, like I usually start with just one long dinner, right? <laughs> Sitting across the table where it takes, it seems like it takes an hour for the other person to get a spoon up, right? Because I've discovered one of the things that's a useful response in human beings can be impatience. That, that they're, they're, there's a whole lot of waiting going on in human beings. And that, 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 that the waiting itself, is, I don't know why they're waiting for, but it's, it's a natural response. And I think that, uh, that we're trained very, very young to wait for things, you know, to wait for meals, to wait for other people, to wait in line. And especially when you're children, you spend a lot of your time waiting for adults. You know, I mean, you know, they tell you to get ready to go somewhere and you get your coat on and you're all ready and then they sit and talk to somebody. And of course, when you're a kid, t you know, you've only been alive for a short period of time. You remember when you were children, you know, that a month seemed like forever and now they go by whoosh, like this? Well, I mean, when, when you were five years old and you had to wait 10 minutes for your mother, you know, to put on that last dash of makeup, you know, that seemed like an eternity. And you were taught that you had to wait, and wait, and wait. And as you get older, that, that those waiting programs operate automatically. And knocking some of those out, one of the things that's very useful that I thought might, we might start with this morning is learning how to blow them apart. Now, most of you in here know the threshold pattern, right? You know what the threshold pattern is? That's where you turn submodalities up until things get so horrible that it cracks. Um, we were, I was talking yesterday about, uh, they were, I, somebody finally told me what codependency is. Silly me, I thought that's where you took more than one drug. <laughs> it sounds like it. Here, all this time, everybody's, you know, these psychologists always come up with these words, and I always get them wrong. But anyway, it's, it's the situation the person was describing to me is that they have a client who is so in love with a junkie, and the junkie abuses them, treats them badly, beats them up, and they do disassociation for the other person. They go, oh, it's just the drugs. He's not really that way. Now, somebody had been beating you up for four or five years. I mean, I think your brain should accept that that's the way they are, you know, and that, uh, you know, maybe going away is a good idea. And one of the things that I explained to him is that the kind of pattern that we use is a pattern that, that's, see, to me, that since anything that human beings can be done can be learned, that the way to learn it is to find out how people fall out of love. Because people do it all the time. So if we have somebody, we now have somebody who needs to, right? Which is not the common situation. 
Most people need not to. But if you have somebody, and I mean, it's a fairly easy thing to do, you, because the difference is between when people are in love, they're associated with the good times and disassociated from the bad times. And I mean, if you, if you think about, like if you live with somebody, and you think about memories that you have with them, if you disassociate from the bad ones and associate with the good ones, you will feel more in love with them. Now, that doesn't make sense, doesn't it? Think about it just as a formula. And if you spend time, you know, doing this, you know, a little bit every day, you will build and you'll get more back into the state when you first fell in love than you ever were. In fact, you'll get more into it than you were when you were there because that's what it's made out of. I mean, when you take people who are in love, it doesn't matter, no matter what happens because when they think about it, they're disassociated and the pictures are far away. Now, so if you have somebody you want to fall out of love, the thing is, is what you do is you take at more than five because it has to do with frequency and how close together. Because you always hear it's called the last straw. You know, the straw that, you know, it's just, that was the last one. And the pictures flip. And suddenly, people are associated with all the bad stuff and disassociated from everything good. And that's what it takes to fall out of love. And then you run about 15, 20 of those real fast, and it stays that way, just like all the threshold patterns do. And you can do this by, you take the bad ones, and you amplify all the submodalities that make it hurt right through the ceiling. You make them bigger, closer, brighter, louder, and louder, and louder, until it hits the point where the pictures flip to the other kind. Now, what I suggest is that there's another way also, not only of taking the submodalities, but of using time as the control variable to be able to, to create the threshold phenomenon. Now, yesterday what we were doing, the reason I was getting you to build a rheostat for time, something where you could hear it click one way and hear it click the other way, there's two parts to that. One of the things I've discovered in the past few years is people do not make very much use of their auditory system in terms of auditory tonal. That this is, you know, other than replaying McDonald's commercials, stuff like that, that they don't seem to utilize it, and especially neurolinguistic programmers don't utilize it in terms of all the naturally occurring anchors. Because you know all these pictures you're making in your heads and the submodalities and that stuff? That stuff works because they're anchors. When you think about a time, a pleasant past memory, and it makes you feel good, that's because the picture is an anchor. Well, the same thing is true about sounds like thunder, sounds of bolt shutting, all the naturally occurring sounds that automatically tell you things, that you've grown neural networks that access all the kinesthetics that go with that. The sound of locks shutting. I mean, when you, hear, when you hear a deadbolt click shut, you know what that means. I mean, you don't have to look through the crack to know the deadbolt shut, unless you're real disassociated or real deaf, one or the other. But I mean, you know when you turn a deadbolt, you can hear the sound of it clamping shut. And you've learned this, and you know it, not just at, at the level, but you also, when you hear that sound, you also know the feeling that goes with it. You know, the feeling of a door not being able to open. All of those things are connected together. Now, being able to utilize the sounds, the sounds that are, uh, uh, of something that clicks one way and clicks another way, all of the naturally occurring things that occur inside of our lives. See, one of the things I like about video games now, I now have, having played enough video games now, I now have video arcade sounds inside of my head. I don't know how many of you have gotten hooked on these things. But like we were talking, somebody was going to go uh, to, to uh, South Lake or Vegas, and they were asking, you know, of a way to store cards so they could count cards visually, you know. And, and when, when I play blackjack, I have, I have the deck of cards up in the corner, right? And as a card comes face up, it blacks out on my deck so I know what cards are left. But when it does it, it also makes one of those video sounds. When it turns over, it does that, and then gets a little red X over it. And so I go through, and that way I know what cards are left in the deck, and it tells you what the odds are of getting the kind of cards that you want. And uh, after you start doing that for a while, I don't know, I've noticed that I've begun to have, that, that a lot of the things that I do inside of my head now become games. That, you know, it's like, what do you want for lunch? And it puts all this stuff up, and it blinks on and off. How many of you have gotten a Macintosh? Do you become Macintosh thinkers internally? Do you now have scrolls that come up? Everything. I now have, I find myself moving the mouse on my leg now, and the in, my internal images are shifting in new, in Mac Lang. I have, I have menus that come down and they blink, and I have a little black thing that goes up and down. When it gets there, I press a button, and pictures pop in my head and stuff. Because that's because the outside world affects us. See, I discovered a long time ago, uh, I used to work as a photographer when I was in college, and I, the cameras we used had a little crosshair thing in it, 
with a little circle around it. When the circle was clear, it was focused. And I discovered if I worked on a shoot for 15 hours, when I put the camera down, that was still there. And it would stay, you know, well, you're staring into these bright lights and stuff, and I mean, it would stay there. But after a while, I discovered it was there all the time, right? That when I focused my eyes across the room, this little thing would get clear when I focused. If I looked at a person, it would be blurry till I focused it, right? Uh, which I decided wasn't useful because I kept running into things because it was in the way. But the, your, the, what the point I'm trying to make is, is that the external representations around you become a part of your internal representations because that's what they're built out of. And that utilizing sound as a control mechanism, especially since most people don't use the tonal sounds for much of anything other than to scare themselves, the middle of the night, you know, people hear noises. I love it. You turn the lights out, people are beginning to hear noises immediately, even if there aren't any. So it's, like, it's like a partial sensory deprivation tank. Right? Since most people don't use much auditory internal, that what happens is, is if you just make a room dark, people go, what was that sound? Because they begin to hallucinate sounds. It's the easiest system for them to hallucinate in because it's the system they have least control over. So also adding the dimension of having sound control into people's lives gives them more control over their brain because it'll be the system that'll be the most out of control. Learning to be able, see for example, one of the things that I started doing was, is, is taking sounds that people don't like and associating them with things when they're trying to break habits. Um, I have a, a, a friend that, that had a, a, a habit which was, it's, I, don't, I don't know how he developed, but he developed amazing sensory acuity to the point where he could walk in any place and know who had drugs. I mean, he was better than one of these dogs. And, you know, and he was trying to give up smoking pot, but I mean, he could walk in a room and look around and he'd know who had joints. They just scanned the room. And, I mean, and it was amazing, you know, plus he could talk them out of it, too. And I mean, and he was trying to give it up, but I mean, it was, it was so developed. And I mean, he came and he told me, he says, he said, it's, I says, I'm walking down the street and I can just look at somebody and they'll look at me and they'll know that I know they have joints on them. You know, it's like he not only that would give out radar. And so one of the things is, is that I began to scan through and every time he would hit one of those experiences, I had him hear the sound of fingernails going across the blackboard. Now, which induces a different set of kinesthetics in him, <laughs> does in most people. So that, so that as he used that sound, what happened is, is when he scanned and he heard that sound, instead of making it so he felt like he wanted to get high, it made it so he didn't want to look at them. So he began to avoid those people rather than to seek them out. Now, there's lots of internal mechanisms like that that we can use. I want to jump back to the threshold thing. One of the things that I'd like to do is, is, is I'd like you to pick one or two situations in your life where you find yourself hesitating too much from trying new things, saying new things. I found out the government did a research. I love these government. Where, who gets this money to do this stuff? Why don't they give it to me? Let me throw parties with it. Instead, really, they spent all this money and they, they did this research to find out what the major psychological problems were in the country, you know, and I, which strikes me as one of them. I mean, that would be a good place to start, whoever's idea that was. Let's find out how fucked up this country really is. I mean, they, nothing about how to make it better, you know, or nothing about the people. They, they, and they didn't talk to the people that didn't have the problem. They isolated out just the ones that did. And they found out that the most pervasive problem in this country is shyness. Think about it. Shyness. 70% of the people that were interviewed, and they did a cross-section of something ridiculous, like 50,000 people in different parts of the country, just to make sure you, don't, you didn't, weren't just fucked up in one part of the country, that they found out that 70% of the people consider themselves shy. And, uh, of course, you know, they weren't very specific about what that means. You know, if you walk up and ask people, are you shy? And they answer, they go, yes, I am, you know. I, I guess they go, they count that as a yes or a no. I don't know. But one of the things that I've noticed is, is that, that in terms of people being shy, it runs over into the kind of work that they do in terms of, of, because of, of, everybody when they do NLP is going to use their own style. But there's a difference between your own style and being a wimp. And this is one of the things. And where people get into the fudge factor is where they wimp out and call it their personal style. Because, I mean, sometimes, you know, client needs to be told the truth. You know, I mean, when a client comes in and is pissing and moaning and whining, somebody needs to tell them to shut the fuck up. You know, you know and you know, that they've been whining for years and it hasn't helped at all. And that you're not going to listen to it if they want to whine to go somewhere else. 
you know. But if they're going to sit there, they're going to they're going to answer your questions and do what you tell them to, and not give you any guff. How many times have you told somebody go inside and remember a time, and they go, but there's this thing I have to tell you first. You ever heard that one? Pretty common. What do you do? I tell them to shut the fuck up and do what I say. You know, I say you're here because I know how to do something about this, not because you know what I need to know. If you knew what you needed to know, you wouldn't have the damn problem in the first place. So shut up, get inside, and do what I say. And, it, and, you know, because it's not that they do it maliciously. They do it out of habit, especially if they've had too much therapy. Because, you know, the talking therapies, uh, the question is who gets to talk. And, and some people have talked their problems into being so fixed and solid because when they, if you listen to them talk, where you begin to hear is all the semantic illformness, all the cause-effect relationships. I'm this way because for years and years and years. They're that way because they're still doing it, and for no other reason. The reason you are still the way you are is because you keep acting that way. And that's it. I mean, that's, that's, you know, don't go no further than that. And what does it take to get you to stop behaving that way? I mean, if you have somebody who hesitates to use skills, I mean, I, I, I get clients referred from people who have been through training seminars, and I know they know what to do. But they can't do it because they don't. And that's the only reason. That means they can not do it. You know, that the kind of clients they send me are the people they have trouble dealing with. And that's, you know, and it'd be the best thing in the world for them, you know, to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, fix themselves, and then go back and work with the client. But they don't think about it that way. They think of those clients as being hard, not as the fact that it's an indication about the inflexibility in their behavior. That, you know, I mean, I, I've had some people that go to my seminars that are, that are real sweet. But these aren't sweet techniques. Sometimes they are. Sometimes being sweet is exactly what you need to do. But sometimes it's not. And having the choice of being one or the other is, is what allows you to have the skill. Now, I also found out, because I went through this with a group of practitioners. In my practitioner program, there was a whole lot of people that were already master practitioners and trainers that went through it. And they seemed to be having more trouble than the other people um, overtrained, you know. And one of the things is, is that, that I had discovered is, is that they had not applied these things to themselves. Because one of the things that was missing was beliefs about where you find limitations in yourself is where you go, oh boy, let the games begin. That they didn't have that built into themselves. That when, you know, when they came up against something that was hard, that their tendency was to move back and start making excuses, to start hesitating. So the thing that we did is what I'm going to ask you to do. What I did is I, I, I had them create an alternative universe, which is where you take the things where you know what to do, you know how to act. Like some, you know, with some of them, some of them, you know, they, 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 you know, they, some of the, the women and the men, like, they knew how to flirt, they knew what to do, but they couldn't do it when they were out by themselves. I mean, they could demonstrate it in a class, but when it took, when it took just like going out by yourself and being that way and enjoying it in public, that was a whole other story. And for them, it's like they knew what to do, but their semantic response stopped them. Now, there's one way is to go through and start removing semantic response, but the other way is to blow it out with threshold. So what I did is had them take whatever the situation is where they hold themselves back and create for themselves six months of future experience where that's all there was, and then make time excruciatingly slower and slower and slower and slower. So that time becomes then the threshold variable till they're not till they get this thing in there, I am not going to live this way anymore. It's been too long. Now if you've listened to people talk about having changed, that you'll talk about you'll hear sentences like I finally got fed up, just said I'm not going to do this anymore. Uh, you know, they'll do things like, I looked at my life, you know, and you'll hear either they looked back across it or they looked into the future and they finally just went, I'm fed up, I'm not going to do this anymore. You know, enough is enough. And that phenomenon, a lot of it is built upon being able to do time distortion. Now for us, we're trying to take the things that occur natural and speed up the process so that somebody doesn't have to take drugs for 20 years. You know, if they've been doing it for a year, we can make it seem like 20 years so that they'll go, fuck it, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be a junkie for 20 years. Because you know, most of them don't live through it, quite frankly. I mean, especially now, 
with the needles, not only can you kill yourself with the drugs, but you can get a fatal disease from the needles alone. You know, it's a new way to scare junkies. <laughs> of course, junkies don't scare very well because they don't have good enough memories because they're all fucked up. Um, but if you can catch them in the, in the state where, where you can instead spread out time so that you can make six months seem like 20 years. Now, what I'd like you to do with your partner is the following. The first thing is, because you don't need to know the content, of course, because this is a workshop, you can do that in your private practice. But the first thing is to identify a context. And the kind of things that I like to do in workshops are things that beef up your ability to do NLP that make you more ferocious as an individual, that get you to really use your skills and be more flexible. Because when I hear people talk about things like they go, well, boy, I really wish I, had, I wish I had Richard there to see that client because he would have done this. I know that they know what to do, and they could have done it. I mean, that doesn't mean that they need me there. That's like the biggest insult you could possibly give me. It means, well, I learned what to do, but I'm still too much of a wimp to do it. You know, and that means fix yourself. Because if you know what to do and your brain tells you this would work, then do it and have fun at it. Because it's not enough just to get yourself to do it. You have to be able to put yourself in state. That's why I think one of the major mistakes people do doing NLP is they don't put themselves in the right state to do it. They don't take state-conditioned learning seriously. They don't take a few seconds before they, the client put themselves in the state where they look at them, where they're, they're all there. They get into a rut, especially the people who see clients every hour. They don't take space between. You know, if you see, if you see them for 55, you know, the people in the 55-minute hour have the five minutes. And that five minutes you should be using to crank yourself up. You know, I mean, me, I don't do it that way. I see clients until I'm done. And I let them know that. You know, it can be quick or it can be long. And I know I can stay awake longer than they can. And I'll do it, I'll do it while they're awake or I'll do it while they're asleep. Or I'll put them asleep while I'm awake. One or the other, but it's going to happen. And having that determined attitude. See, for example, a lot of people, like when they hear me talk about that, they'll say, well, I know that that's, I know that's right. I know that's the way to believe, but I am, I'm not like that. Well, we're in the business of changing what you're like. So this is the kind of thing that, you know, that you can change. And especially things that have to do with attitude. An attitude is the stuff that goes through time from the inside. It's the kind of stuff that, that ends up being not only available when you do work, but it ends up running through everything you do. It's that kind of core personality. And, you know, I don't, didn't always have the attitudes that I have now. I wouldn't pop out of the womb and go, hey, motherfuckers, you know, it's not the way it was, you know. That, you know, there was, a, believe it or not, there was a time in my life where I was shy, right? But I got fed up with it. And I mean, basically what happened is, is it just, you know, it was too much trouble. I mean, you know, it, 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 if you think about how much work it is to be shy, and all the time you have to feel bad and you have to feel like everything's a struggle and stuff, you know, whereas you just go, fuck it, you know. If, you know, if things go badly, it's got to be quicker than this. You know, it's, I mean, it does. It's, you know, it's like, you know. I, when I teach the flirting class, I have to teach men that, you know, you're better off being rejected a hundred times in an evening than you are worrying about whether or not you would be rejected once. One is easier. At least you know. You know, I send them out. You know, I go out and sit to see if they can get a hundred rejections in an evening. Typically they can't because they can't get through a hundred people without getting an acceptance. Of course, then they don't know what to do. Because <laughs> when they're going through a hundred, they usually aren't that selective, you know. And... Uh, they end up getting a yes, and typically they end up getting a yes right out of the gate, you know. And then they're thinking, God, if I go home with her, I'll have to be back out here and get 99 more, or Richard will kill me. <laughs> and they're right. <laughs> they go, you do want to go home with me? Well, I can't. I have to be rejected by 99 women. Could you wait? <laughs> and then when they get a yes to that, it really throws them off. Now, I want you to have the person stop and identify the, a context in their work where they find themselves uh, having attitudes that slow them down, especially wimping out, because most people wimp out too much. And especially doing NLP, wimping out just makes it take a long time. And NLP has to be done quick, or it doesn't work. You've got to get in there and get it done, or you have to do it over again anyway. And Because uh, you don't want to let people push you around, if you know what I mean. 
other, you know, the, th the, the easiest way to become a moving towards person is to be fed up with what you're moving away from. Because if you're moving away from people feeling rejected, you know, or feeling like you're mistreating them, then, and sit around and let them mistreat you for a long time, that's not a hell of a deal. And, you know, you're better off setting limits about what it is and what, what the context is and just getting it done. Now, when you identify this, then what I want you to do is to have the person start out by picking one example. And this is an example which is real, okay? Just one example of where it happened. So that, and have them run through it, okay, in slow time. But we'll make this one half speed. Now, The next thing I want you to do is, is to take and go out onto their timeline, go into the future, only what we want to do now is to go at fast speed, and we'll make this like five or six times as fast, if, if, or even faster than that, it's probably about 50 times as fast. I want you to have them build out a month or two months of nothing but experiences like this. It's as if if you wimped out, if, if, if there was the mind police came in and found you wimping out with one client and you got sentenced to hang out with that client or people just like them for the next two months. Lunch, breakfast, dinner, you even had to sleep with one like them. Date one like them buy things from the store from people like them, <laughs> get waited on by someone like them in a restaurant. I'm talking a full reality of just people that are like this. I mean, we're talking your whole day, your auto mechanic, your dentist, your doctor, your spouse, your children. Everybody acts this way so that you build a nice full shitty reality. No time off for bad behavior. Okay? You'll discover, this is kind of fun to do, by the way. I don't know if you've considered this. It may seem awesome to you, but once you go through it, it'll seem fun. Because it gives you a way of beginning, because as you build these scenarios, see, I love doing this with clients, right? Because as I explain to them, they have to do this. Because they always look at me and they go, well, can't we just deal with my problem? And I go, this is your problem. <laughs> you know, because that is. That, I mean, the fact that they continue to live a way they don't want to is the whole point. Especially when, they're, when, when everything inside them is telling them the way they're acting is getting in their own way. You know, this is, this is a way of finding out, do you want to stop it or not? Now, once you've built this reality, this is the fun part. Then come down here, and what you do is go to one fourth, to one to one eighth speed. But what you do is you just keep slowing it down, and down and down, so that you keep decreasing this speed, and you run through the six months. So you rerun all of this experience right here, but you keep making it slower and slower until they nut up. But they have to stay in it and go through the whole thing. Now, what will happen is, is, is there'll be a point where they literally can't. Because what will happen is, is, is even inside their own mental construction, they will change their behavior and they will be unable to go back. So when they, when they finally crack and they go, they go, well, I'm just seeing it doing, I'm seeing everything happen differently, what you do is make them go back to the beginning. Right? And if they can't do it anymore, then what happens is, is they can't do it anymore. Because what we're building now is called temporal threshold. And normally in life, this happens slowly and in pieces. But what I discovered that people did when I was modeling how people change things is that when they go through, when they really make life changes, big decision changes, that what they do is they gather together from their history all of the examples of something and rerun them and they rerun them slower and slower. And sometimes they, people describe like walking around in a daze for a week.
just running over things in their mind over and over and over again until they just couldn't stand it anymore. Now, the thing is, is that what will happen as you do this, if you, rem if you remember the, the exercise we did yesterday that I kind of ran through you a little bit, is it's going to hit a point where it is so humorous they can't do it anymore because it's because it becomes as ridiculous as it is. The thing is, is, is when you're doing it in little doses, you don't notice how stupid it is. But when you get a big mouthful like this, what's going to happen is, is you're going to notice that you really are wasting your time. And what happens is, is when you get out into the world in the future, it has an interesting future pace built into it. Because when you start to do the same behavior, time will slow down automatically and punish you. <laughs> This is a good way to change moving away from people, if you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, now go ahead and grab yourself a partner. And when you're programming this in the other person, remember part of your job is to make it sound like it's going to be when you talk about slowing things down. Use congruence and make sure that it seems as heavy as it's going to be because it has to become so burdensome that it becomes silly. Because remember, what we're after for here is the mechanical part where threshold is broken by utilizing time as a variable. So you want to make sure that everything you do analogically. Now, I also want you to keep in mind this is a hypnotic phenomenon. We're doing time distortion. So from the minute you sit down, as soon as you decide which one of you is going to be doing the work, that's the point at which you, you, you start breathing at the same rate, matching tonality. You remember all that hypnosis stuff you learned? All the language patterns and patterns one? presuppositions, all of the stuff you've learned before? You guys remember that? Now! <laughs> yes? Okay, all of that stuff is operational. Plus, do what we did yesterday. Put yourself in state before you start. It will help you. Curiosity, exhilaration, all of those things. Take that compression. Step inside it before you start. Take a minute or two for yourself before you begin. But do it now. So how'd you guys do? Uh oh, what? Well, for me it was like things just came to a stop. Just never got to. The, where I said fuck it all. Well, you were running. How slow were you running it? <clears throat> to where, it, like, whenever I was in there, it just stopped. Almost, there was like... Well, if you, if you do, if you, you're supposed to run it slow, you're not supposed to stand still. <laughs> <laughs> I know time seems that way sometimes, but, uh, I mean, it's that when you, sub when you subject... See, when you internally, you leave real time the same and up your subjective time. See, like, you have to think about it this way. This is the kind of thing you're after. Uh, this, is, this is the Milton Erickson diet. Uh, Milton Erickson... Uh, being somewhat of an unusual and creative clinician, one time uh, took a lady and she wanted to learn to lose weight. She was really quite obese and uh, so what he did is hypnotized her, taught her hypnotic time distortion and then gave her a post-hypnotic suggestion that when she touched table utensils she would go into the state of time distortion and it would take an hour for her to get the fork from the plate to the mouth. But it didn't take an hour. It, I mean, it actually was the same amount of time that it normally took to do it. But subjectively, it seemed like it took an hour. And what it did is it made her bored with the phenomenon of eating. <coughs> so, you know, that she would try to eat as quickly as possible and get it over with, which meant she didn't eat as much. Because, if, you know, you can imagine a bowl of soup. You know, you're there for 16 hours. <laughs> you ain't going to eat the whole bowl of soup. But, I mean, so that you have to keep one of the things that makes this work is keeping real time the same so that you don't end up, as you do this exercise, each time you do it, actually taking longer. It's supposed to seem like it takes longer. That's why it's important to amplify the, the slow time distinctions, the stuff you elicited yesterday, and make sure you use the slow time anchor so that it drags on, but real time stays the same. Because um, if you do it the other way, it, it's boring, but it isn't going to create critical mass. Say, if if you take, see, like, if you notice, like, when you did the exercise yesterday afternoon, when you did slow time, did you use amplifiers? Okay, when you went through and elicited the difference between slow time and fast time, the next thing to do is to go through and to amplify 
the distinctions between the two. So that when you create the sliding anchor, you're creating the sliding anchor by amplifying slow time so that you get ultra slow time. Say so now, ultra slow time is useful if you're doing something you enjoy. And, but if you're doing something like this where you're hesitating where you don't want to, and you make it so that it's excruciating, it has to get to the point where it's painful to be able to watch it. And you also have to do it associated, too. If you did it dos disassociated, it doesn't have that impact. How many of you found that you got through a threshold to the point where you were just fed up and you just don't want to? You do. Yeah, you can always you can tell by the tone. I did it. You know, are you going to do it again? You know, can you can, can you really foresee yourself now? See, the nice thing is, is when you get into that context now. The other thing is, is when you use a threshold pattern, when you're working with somebody else, you want to control real time, and I actually clock them when they do it. I go through and clock them so that the first time they run through it. Right? And then when they build what the six months is, I'll notice if it's two minutes long. And then if they slow it down and the next time it takes four minutes, they're not actually changing. They're changing the length of time they take to do it. They're not changing their subjective experience. So what I'll do is go back in, crank up the, the submodalities of slow time more, fire the anchor off, and literally as they go through, I'll go, you should be one-fourth of the way through, you should be one-halfway through, done now. And if they're not done, then I make them go back and do it again so that you build an external sense that controls time. When you teach people hypnotic time distortion anyway, you need to be able to build real blips that way so that they actually do time distortion. Uh, when we were running experimental hypnosis groups, what we used to do is we used to have, we had people watch a, uh, start out, we had them watch a 10 minute movie. And then what we do is have them go in and replay the movie in their head, but have them do it in five minutes. And then we'd have them do it in two and a half, and keep cutting it down until they could get it down into a matter of 10 seconds. But their experience had to stay the same. They couldn't just speed the movie up to the point where they couldn't hear it. They have to actually subjectively distort time. And that's part of the thing that, but that's not having it feel fast or slow when you do time distortion. It's supposed to seem normal. Because just like you can do fast or slow time, you can also hold normal time the same. Uh, this, is, this is one of the things, by the way, if, if, if you don't have a lot of time to work with people, it's one of the things that's a handy thing to teach your clients, is you can get a lot more done. You can never go back and review shit. They do it like this instead of taking hours to do it. Uh, we used to do things like when we made uh, pervasive changes, a lot of times we'd have people go back and go through their life and recode it in relationship to the changes, literally go way back to, to you know, when they're two or three years old and come all the way up through their timeline. And if you do that state of time distortion, you can lift up their hand, tell them to go down only as fast as they go back and recode their whole life. And then you can walk away and come back in 10 minutes, they're done. If you come back, you know, and they're still like this, and you go, how old are you? And they go, I'm still five. They're not doing it in the state of time distortion. And they could be there for, you know, another 30 years, which is not what I call the most efficient session, although it's more efficient than some therapies. <laughs> uh, I, so I've had some clients this year, and I... I, I started doing a thing with my clients at the beginning of the year where I had them go through their checkbook and find out. And I had them do two things. One, write down how much money they had spent on a problem, and then in the other column, how much time they'd spent. <coughs> so that if they, it took them an hour to drive to the session, and they spent an hour or two in the session, and an hour to drive back, and, and whether it was a work day or not. So if they had lost time from work that wasn't paid for, they added that on the money list. And I did that with, with the first 15 or 20 clients I got this year, and the sums were astronomical. I mean, one guy was like $180,000, and he'd been working with one problem for 16 years. I mean, 16 years fucking around with the same problem, you know, and $180,000. I mean, this is not a problem you could have if you were poor, or at least you'd have to just keep it or something or change it on your own. Um, and, I mean, he had a thing where if people cleared their throat, he became furious built-in response. And of course, <clears throat> I had to ask him about that. <laughs> um, but I mean, when you think just something like that, and his problem was is it interfered with his business because he'd go into meetings and stuff and people would clear their throat and he'd throw temper tantrums. And, you know, which is not the best way to be a salesman, you know. Uh, but if, you, I mean, just the incredible amount of time that people spend on stuff that if they're going to spend the amount of time, and I mean, he even at this point, you know, he said, well, you know, I finally decided to come and see you because I would be willing to try anything. I don't know if that was a compliment or not. <laughs> I didn't quite know how to take that. It's like, you know, I always get this from people. They always go, well, you know, I went to all the normal, you know, 
mechanisms. And then I figured, shit, I'd try anything. I'd even come see you, you know. But I always go, thanks a lot, you know. Um, that one of the things is, is that if, if you consider the amount of time and money this guy spent on this thing, that if you can compress that into something like we're doing here, to the point where people get fed up. Now, getting fed up isn't all there is to it, because then the question is, what do you do next? Because now when you're in that context, this is the point where you need to be able, and this is where I start building in what I consider layers. Because as soon as you get people to the point where they threshold them with any difficulty, then you have to start layering in in front of it what it is that they're going to do. And see, to me, this, this, is a real, this is the real difference between elegant work, between just using a technique. Whether you cure somebody of a phobia, well, if you cure them of a phobia, some of them will come back. And they're, they're, they're different, there are different characteristics to phobias. Like an elevator phobia, I mean, going in an elevator and being bored like everybody else, it's just up the, you know, or down. But if you have them be curious, then if they get in a glass elevator, it won't be, you know. Because if you do the elevator cure, the one thing is when you run them through in their mind, always do a 70-story glass elevator. Do worst case scenarios. Now, the thing is, is what we just did here has built into it worst case scenarios. I mean, when you start, gee, I noticed some of you are nodding. <laughs> you know, when you start having lunch, breakfast, and dinner, you know, and, uh, and, and stuff with the situations, it has a tendency to, to make you less tolerant. And especially when you're doing something like this, where you're programming yourself to be able, see, like with salespeople, I do this a lot. There's a, there's a, what I find when I teach sales, that, that there's a class of people that people can sell to. And then there's a whole class of people that they just can't. And, and their tendency is to just try to increase the number of people they see, which is the fastest way to a coronary, instead of increase their interest, that they don't look at those people as the laboratory of learning. And that this kind of an attitude change, because see, the next piece for me is because is you can be fed up with the kind of person. And you can be fed up with the way you treat them. But the next thing is, is, is an attitude change. And attitude changes, to me, have a couple of different components to it. One is that you need to always build in a couple of beliefs. For example, uh, you, need to build in, you need to build in a, a belief that, that, in essence, reframes whatever it is in some useful context. When I worked with salespeople and I found out that there was somebody like that, that if instead what they could do is build a belief that it was an obligation to their own health, their own welfare, and their economic success to view these people as a learning laboratory. Say, and, and to me, I try to install the same kind of thing in people that are doing NLP. That whenever there's anybody where there's a difficulty, instead of like being you know, over obsessed with changing them, especially if you don't know what to do, because when you don't know what to do, this is instead of going, oh my god, this is the time to go, this is where I'm going to change my skill level. Because, see, as a professional, you have an obligation to get better at what you do. And not just in workshops, but by taking the things that are difficult and viewing them as a learning opportunity and as a challenge. And that's where you really need to build in tenacity. That's where you go after them. I mean, like a pit bull. And so if you stop right now and begin to think that an attitude is built out of a couple of different pieces. One is, is there'll always be a couple of underlying beliefs. And most you guys all know the belief change in here, right? You guys know how to do that? You don't know how to do it, but you're about to find out. <laughs> Just get a partner. Make sure your partner knows what they're doing. Ask him if he believes he knows how to do it. If he's incongruent, pick a new partner. What we want to do now is, is we want to start to build attitudes. OK, now. Attitudes have component pieces. One is that you're going to have to build in a couple of underlying beliefs. Okay? Now, depending upon what kind of change it is, and given that hopefully there's some uniformity in this group, you know how to spell the word. You'll live through it. It's just a way of torturing visuals. <laughs> Pay them back for having put those red marks next to things when I was young. <laughs> Visuals are so much fun to play with. I've been working with a guy that's a movie maker. He's a, a producer. And I mean, you don't get any more visual than this guy is. I mean, this, this guy has to see three movies a day or he goes through withdrawal symptoms. Has a theater in his house, spends all of his time editing movies. Just, I mean, he's totally Mr. Visual. 
And for him to have to work with me is probably the most painful thing in his life. Because, you know, he, he like, this is the kind of guy that when he was waiting in, in my office for me, cleaned my desk, <laughs> and ordered all the papers up. When I come in and sit down, I went, <laughs> and I said, now I can find things. But it hurts him to sit and watch. That's being a little too, being visual external is not a good idea. If you think about it, if the way the outside world affects your internal feelings, um, hey, well, then you have to control the world. That's why he's a producer. <laughs> and as long as he's a producer, he can do that. But uh, if you think about it, because like one of the things that always amazed me is that is, is people that suffer if a house is dirty. Or I, I mean, I had a friend that would come over, and if you smoked and put a cigarette in an ashtray, he would, walk, he would literally, at your house, pick up the ashtray, empty it, wash it out in the sink without ever breaking. He didn't even know he did it. But the outside world had to be organized. It's the kind of person, when you walked in his bathroom, the toothbrush was lined and facing in one direction. The toothpaste was next to it. Then the mouthwash. You could tell the order in which he did things. You know. I like to, what I'd do is I'd go in and I'd move them around. <laughs> so he'd come in and he'd know something was wrong, but he couldn't tell what it was. Now, the thing is, is the first thing we want to do is to build a couple of, of powerful beliefs. And for the example we'll use here, and I mean with clients, it will depend upon what it is, the change that you're making. So you're going to need some content to determine what kinds of beliefs would be useful. And if you think about the choice of beliefs as being the same thing as, as what they call contextual reframing. Contextual reframing is an attempt to build a belief. When you do a good reframe with people, you know, when somebody comes in and goes, well, you know, I just can't stand, you know, these people, they come in, you know, and they, they walk into a stereo store, but they don't really want to buy something, you know. And if you looked at them and said, yes, but if you thought of it as a rare and unprecedented opportunity to enrich and increase your skills, that's, that's the, the verbal form of reframing. Now, the shit-kicking way of reframing that is, is to not just say it, but to build the damn belief in, to find out what the strongest belief that they have is. And I mean, when, when you want to use, use a belief that they have and do elicitation with submodalities, you don't pick a wimpy belief. You know, don't pick, you know, well, you know, you know, I believe the Broncos are the best football team. You don't pick a belief like that. You pick something like, you know, if I don't breathe, I'll die. But if you really want a good example, you know, if you say, well, you believe if you don't breathe, you'll die, the person hesitates. What you do is pull out a piece of rope with a knot in it like this and walk towards their throat. And when they access, that'll be where the belief is. Because, I mean, you can really tell, I mean, with, with people, I mean, the length that they focus their eyes, whether they move their eyes to the right and left. And, I mean, if you really begin when you do elicitation to start pay attention to these cues, it will expedite things for you because, you know, it, you just want the information, whether it's told to you or not, is unimportant. So the faster you can do elicitation, the faster you can get this kind of stuff done. Now, the, the thing about the beliefs is the first kind of belief that we want is we want, it, we want, we want the submodalities of a strong belief so that we can build in a belief. Now, the thing is, is, is when you're changing beliefs, like, like the stuff in using your brain for a change, basically you're taking a belief, making it go away, and building in a new one. Now, in, in this case, you may have the opportunity to do that because there may be an underlying belief that these people don't, if somebody you know, tells you, well, the person doesn't really want, they come in a store, they don't really want to buy anything, right? Well, for me, that doesn't matter. I don't, I don't use that as an opportunity to change beliefs because... To me, it doesn't matter whether they want to or not. Because if they come in not wanting to buy something, it shouldn't have anything to do with whether you sell them something or not. Your job is to sell things, and it's the largest profession in the country. And yet you can't get a college degree in it. Isn't that odd? You can get a college degree in poetry? Because right? they always tell me, well, it would, I, I hear stuff from people when I bring this up when I work at colleges. They say things to me like, well, to have a degree in sales, you know. Like, like, that's not a serious discipline, but poetry is. I mean, you can, you, can get a degree, you can get a degree in improvisational dance. I mean, think about it. You can get a degree in improvisational dance, and you cannot get a degree in sales. And it's the largest damn profession in the country. Silly things. That's why they call them academic colleges. Now, the thing is, is, is to me, that when your job is to sell something, and it, it's not a question, if they come in, as long as you know they don't want to buy something, then you know the first step is to make them want to. And that's not a hard thing to do, to make human beings want things. Uh, if you think about it, you just ask them, have you ever just looked at something and you knew you had to have it? 
I mean, just looked at it and, boy, you know, you know what I mean? Ever had this feeling? Well, I want you to look at that over there. I mean, it's tough to do, huh? <laughs> Can you see this? <laughs> Would be useful. Now, what we want to do is to begin, begin to build in a belief. Now, when building in a belief where you're not really taking one away, once you know what the submodalities are of the belief, then basically what you do is you have somebody start out by, by literally constructing, like, and I do it with an if-then. I go, if you were to believe this, right, what would, it, what, what, what would image? Because, you know, some people, their beliefs are stills and some are movies. And to me, that's the first consideration I need to know about, is I need to know how to formate the content that's going to become a belief. And what I do is I have them pick an arbitrary place, right? So if their belief is over here, I pick some arbitrary place in the, in the middle. And if it's a movie, then I have them make a movie here. If it's a slide, I have them make a slide here. And then literally, then, then move it off from an arbitrary point, have them pull it up to where the belief is. And when it comes in, I use the sound of a bolt slamming shut. Now, the thing is, is that it's, it's not much different than, than the normal belief change. But by building in a belief, only this time we want to build in a set of beliefs. And the easiest way to build in a set of beliefs is, is, is if there are two or three, you build them one right after another, and then you make it so that they are connected together. Literally, when you see one, the other one pops out from inside of it, just to open it up, whoosh, so that in essence they chain pretty much the way we chained stuff yesterday. Because having an operational set of beliefs, you want to start with a foundation belief. And, for example, in the context we have here, you want to have a, a, a solid foundation that says that all of, the, all of the people that are difficult for you are an opportunity to learn. Now, as well as, as not only do we want to build a belief, but we want to build the feeling that goes with the belief. And this is where I find when people build beliefs where they miss the boat. Um, when you build a belief, see, if you build a thing that, that says that, that these people are an opportunity to learn, the feeling that people have with the belief might be, oh, God. See, it still doesn't build in the, necessarily. So you also want to build for yourself a powerful anchor so that you have an anchor for which feelings, so that you have one that, that, that when they view somebody that's difficult as an opportunity to learn, they have, they have drooling desire to learn it. You know, it's one thing to, to say, you know, it's an opportunity to learn, but for some people that is, not, that is not a ferociously fun thing. I mean, you know, a lot of people, when they have an opportunity to learn, it's a struggle that people believe that learning has to be hard and difficult and all that stuff. So, you're, so there's going to be two parts. One is going to be building the belief, and the other is going to be building the anchor that you want to go with the belief so that when you slam the picture up into the right things that make it so they absolutely believe it, you also put the feelings with it as well at the same time. So here you're going to try and find a set of submodalities and amplify the shit out of it and anchor it. So that in essence what you're going to do is build a very powerful sliding anchor so that if the, for something that is irresistible, and I mean, you know, it's like if there's an opportunity to learn. You don't want somebody to go, okay, there's an opportunity to learn something. You, know, you want somebody to have the same response that maybe they have to a dive of chocolate, you know, or to wanton sex. Um, little things like that. I'm sure something will rubbage into your mind. But once you find this, okay, again, you're going to amplify and build a sliding anchor. Then what you do is you pull these two together. So you pull the submodalities of the belief and fire off your sliding anchors simultaneously, building in the belief. And the belief is about whatever the last thing was that you, you had drudgery. Because now what we're doing is we're layering. First thing is, is when you go through a threshold or you use the phobia pattern or any of those things, the next thing in terms of building a project, uh, a, 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 a system which propels people into the future is to give them a solid foundation of beliefs and feelings that go into the future. So you also want to connect this with timelines because you want to put this new learning into the future as well. Now, with me, I also layer it deeper because what I usually do is I do about three of these because I also, I also want to have, you know, 
that challenge is fun. And I also, I also want to put in there something about mystery. The fact that you don't understand makes it a mystery that has wanted curiosity. So I put challenge is fun and that it's, it's an opportunity to step into the mysterious. Because it's mysterious that, that somebody could not see. Uh, to me, like when I train people to do telemarketing, I want them to have the belief that the person who picks up on the, the phone on the other side, that this is the most important thing that they could possibly be doing. Now, see, the nice thing about beliefs is they don't have to be true. You have to keep that in mind. They're operational. They guide your behavior. And if you're doing telemarketing, if that's your job, if you believe the most important thing that could happen to this person is that they could answer the phone, such that if nobody answers the phone, you feel sorry for them, then this is going to make you a ferocious telemarketer. It's going to change, you know, it's going to be like if nobody answers the phone, instead of going, oh, shit, they're not there, you're going to go, the poor person, I have to write their number down and call them back. Now, this is the kind of training that I find makes salesmen much more powerful in what they do. Now, the same thing is true for me when, when I'm working with people, that, that when I work with clients, to me, I'm always trying to layer in sets of things that make them ferocious about just enjoying themselves. That uh, especially, you know, a lot of my clients, whatever their problem has, has made them uh, a wallflower through life. I mean, imagine the social phobic I was telling you about. I mean, this guy has been the ultimate wallflower his whole life. I mean, he, he, not only could, he not only didn't ask anybody to dance, he couldn't get in the room. But, I mean, if he got in the room and then sat on the wall and was a wallflower, to me, this is not success. He, well, he wasn't scared of people, but he's no fun. And there's enough boring people in the world as it is already. That I want to build in him a belief that, given the fact that he felt left out of everything, that gives him the obligation to not be an asshole. And when I said that to him, he looked at me and he went, what? And I said, look, now that you don't have this problem, whenever you look around and you see somebody that's a wallflower in some place or somebody that's nervous, you now have an obligation. Because if you know how bad it feels, then you should walk over and ask them to dance. Otherwise, you're just a prick, a self-centered one at that. Yeah, it's an interesting reframe, isn't it? Well, that's, this, is, this is the way I deal with shy people. I tell them they're pricks, right? If they know that it feels this bad and they let other people feel this way, then they must hate people. It's interesting to watch their brain warp when you use that logic. But it is as logical as their logic. But you have to understand, logic is something that sounds like it makes sense. And there's a real difference because most of their logic is junko logic too. So when I use Junko logic, I'm just setting up building in a belief. Because then what I'm going to do is because I want them to believe when they see somebody that this is their opportunity to relieve someone else's suffering and that it's a moral obligation because they've suffered this much. Otherwise, they're just being cruel. Do you enjoy being cruel to people? You do, but I <laughs> asked the wrong, yeah, sure, you know. But when you ask somebody who's been a wallflower for years, they would go, oh, no. And I go, then you get out there and do it. In fact, you know, because I want them, when they look at somebody, to switch referential index. Because the truth is, if you think about it, what makes my logic work is the wallflower is so self-centered, they don't think about the other people in the place. That's, that's what makes it so they could sit there. And the fact is, is that when they, if they switch referential index, they won't be paying attention to the fact they're nervous or afraid, so they'll get out and do something. Now, in our context, if just for the sake of practicing, if you build these beliefs, and if you'd first do them one at a time, and then layer them together the way we did yesterday. Remember what we did yesterday, where you went out on the timeline, you took the three sets of submodalities, right, stacked them together in the future, and pulled them closer and closer together? You guys remember yesterday? OK, that's the last step here. Because, see, one of the things I, I've, I do when I do training workshops is as I teach people to do things, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but I, I teach you to do something, and then the next day I teach you to do something, and then you add that piece onto it. I teach technology in reverse. But one of the things is, is if I didn't do it that way, what would happen is, is it doesn't integrate as well. Because now that you know the hard part at the end, 
it should be a piece of cake. Because now, all, see, yesterday when you did the exercise, it didn't give you the foundation to know what to use it for. And see, this is one of the, well, a lot of people learn techniques, but they don't know what to use them for. The decision is about what to use it for now is to first, the example is, is where you find somebody living their life a way they don't want to, and they know they're going to do it in the future. And that pretty much sums up most of what you're going to get, is that people don't, I mean, every once, in a, <laughs> every once in a while, you get somebody that wants things more the way they are. But I only get one every five years as a client. You know, I, get, I got a guy that came in, great client, guy comes in, and, he, and I said, well, you know, what's wrong? And he went, nothing. And I said, well, did you just drop by to pay me this money? And he said, no, he said, he said, I love my wife, I enjoy it, but I want my feelings to be 10 times as intense. Now I thought, we can do that. Of course, then I got a call from his wife afterwards. <laughs> about, about three weeks later, she called up. She wanted to know when she got her turn. She sounded pissed off. He was having too much fun. She didn't feel, if he's going to enjoy himself that much, then I am too. Now, that's the kind of conflict that should be in relationships. It's a contest of who's going to enjoy themselves the most. Just a thought. Okay, now, if you build these three beliefs complete with, and I want these anchors to be fucking dynamite anchors, because when you build a belief in, it will be a strong belief, but to make it operational in behavior, you want to put feelings with it that are propelling feelings. That, you know, when, when you anchor... You know, because you can build a belief that challenge is fun, but that doesn't make it fun. Say, I mean, a lot of people can believe challenge is fun for Richard. <laughs> do you understand why it's important that you do the anchoring when you build beliefs? Okay, because otherwise it is fun, but not for me. It becomes disassociated. And when you want to pull in and associate states with beliefs, the best way to do it is with anchors that when you fire them off, the person trembles. That's how you can tell a good anchor. If the person goes, yeah, all right, that ain't good enough. You go back. So you want to make sure the anchor that you have for fun is one that, that makes it to the point where you can see their pulse beat in their neck. You want to find something where somebody got a turn and they were only good, and there was a chance. You know, it's the kind of thing where, you know, you put your number down on the roulette wheel and spin it, and you see the balls bouncing right up to your hole, and it hangs on. Have you ever watched that? Like in California, we have the lottery. They have a thing called the big spin, right? And they spin this thing, and just at the end, the ball will stick, and it like drop in a million, and it'll kind of go up like this. And every, you can, everybody in the place is going, stay there, stay there, and it goes up, and it may fall out or it may stay there. You want something that, that is just an exhilarating opportunity, you know? It's the kind of thing, do they have the scratch-off things in this state? Scratch-off things? Have you ever scratched off one and looked at it wrong and thought you won? <laughs> no, I'm fine. people do that all the time. I watch them do it in bars and stuff all the time in California. They scratch it off and they go, $25,000! And then they go, oh, no, it's the wrong. It's, a, it's just before the, the second response. It's the one where they go, ah! That's the kind of thing that you're looking for right here. You want to lit up one. Now, the thing about... about things that are mysterious is not mysterious bad, but the thing where, where mystery is good. I mean, the thing that, thing that something is so marvelous. I mean, it's, it's like when, I when you start, first start studying like how genetics work, I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, when I met Gregory Bateson, he was writing a book on mimicry. And I didn't know anything about it. I never thought about mimicry. I was just, you know, not being into biology or anything, I never thought about it. And he had a big refractory table. And he had all these pairs of pictures of, of uh, butterflies that looked like plants and all these different things. And then he had a set of equations that literally made it mathematically impossible to do this by natural selection. That it would have taken millions and millions and millions of more years for it to even happen randomly. Just couldn't happen that way. And the fact that he had like 3,000 documented cases of mimicry. And some of them were just fucking phenomenal. I mean, you know, you'd, you'd look at them and, you know, and of course, to me, when I look, since they were such good mimicry, I, they could have been two pictures of the same thing, for all I know. <laughs> but he had one that was butterfly and the other was plant, you know. And uh, if he didn't have that written on there, I wouldn't have been able to tell. And, uh, you know, and then underneath, like when you lift up the one, then the butterfly would be flying and the plant would be standing still. Um, there's a reason for that. <laughs> 
Uh, but I mean, when I went through that, I mean, it, it gave me a sense of mystery about the way nature works that was where you just marvel at something. That uh, sometimes, you know, uh, if, I mean, when I first learned how an engine works, you know, I mean, it was a marvelous thing. And I mean, that anything that you found that's like that, if you've ever seen a baby born, uh, the first time I saw one of the, they have these things now where you can watch the baby inside of a mother. I mean, that's a really incredible thing. I mean, you know, it's just awe-inspiring. This is the kind of response that you want. And when you find the submodalities of it, you want to amplify it and build an anchor. Then you go through and you build the three beliefs with the anchors, and then you layer them together in the future the same way we did yesterday. Okay? Now, I don't, want to make, I don't want you to make this into gone with the wind. Remember, keep moving fast. You don't have to go through and elicit every submodality. Just the big ones. Just the difference that makes a difference and amplify the hell out of it. And make sure that you have a good, strong, solid belief. One, one where there is no ambiguity about it. And that means you can pick simple stuff, you know, like breathing helps you to live, you know. The sun will rise tomorrow. Some people even have doubts about that. But stuff, pick real basic stuff because it makes your work simpler. Because if you take stuff that's beliefs that are opinion beliefs, stuff that one person believes and the other doesn't, then you end up having ambiguity. So pick simple, solid stuff. It makes your work easier. Okay? Now when you do this, I want you to just power through it. Okay? Because it's not just these techniques individually. Remember, when you do this kind of stuff, you want to, you want to, it's connecting it all together in a package that makes it work. So I want you to try and get this done by taking 20 minutes a piece max. Okay? So just keep moving, and if your client tries to talk to you too much, use chutzpah to shut them up and just have them answer your questions, do what you want, and don't get into babble discussions, okay? Especially about what the instructions are. Can I ask you a question? Yes, you, yes. <laughs> yes, you may. Uh, is there one belief or three beliefs for three. each of us? Three. Okay. And what, I mean, is, is it supposed to be reflective of the ink, the content? No, it's not reflective of it at all. It, 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 it is. See, a belief that, a belief that, 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 that uh, difficult clients are an opportunity of lear to learn could be a good feeling or a bad feeling. What we're going to do is make it a good feeling. It's not that it is reflective of it. So, we're going to make it the way we want it. So there are just three basic beliefs. Th well, these are the three beliefs we're using here. But when you're working with a client, you may use three different beliefs. Got it. Okay. These are, we're, we're picking three so that you concentrate on learning the skill rather than choosing the beliefs. With a, some other change with a client, it might be different beliefs. It's the sub-modalities of just a normal belief that you listen to. Well, first you get the sub-modalities on a solid right, belief. Right, right, then you're right. going to build in these three beliefs with three totally powerful anchors. And then you're going to layer them together by using the exercise we did yesterday so that it propels itself into the future through time. See, what we're building here is a new attitude about how to do things. And because I find that the most important part of working with clients is changing their attitude more than solving their problem. Because their problem, their problem is almost symptomatic of an attitude change. Because their problem is always a reflection of, of and a good example of, of what it is that, that's the difference between, it's, it's the, the emphasis that they put on the past as opposed to on the future. As opposed to just, you know, pulling out in the fast lane, you're putting a fun meter to the red line, making sparks off the guardrail and making their life, you know, full of ecstasy and better and better every day. They're trying to solve a problem that existed in the past. Um, I mean, and I realize because I've taken clients and just given them amnesia for having had the problem. But it doesn't do anything to make it so that they make their life the best it can be. And, you know, I figure if you're going to see them, you might as well shoot for everything you can get as quick as you can get it. Otherwise, you have to see them week in and week out, and listen to them drivel and snivel and complain. And it's up to you. Total ecstasy or listening to drivel and complaining. <laughs> I mean, you guys choose. Okay, get going. How'd you guys do? Went real well. Now, I also wanted to understand if you're gaining the concept that, see, I know that over the years you've learned a lot of techniques. And, and I know that, especially in the, my teaching, that a lot of what I do is I go in and I teach for two or three days. And what I try to do is give people a wealth of, of tools that fill up their bag, you know. 
I mean, a lot of times, I mean, f especially, you know, the first 10 years, I'd go around and teach people things like anchoring and like to watch their client and stuff. Um, like to listen to what they say and notice, like, you know, some of them talk in words that have to do with pictures and sounds. And you'd be surprised how blown out people were by the concept of rep systems. I mean, and, it, and to me, it's like, you know, they, they, they had all of these disciplines, like active listening, as opposed to just listening. Um, <laughs> active listening is where you distort everything your client tells you, right? So it fits your feelings. Um, that, that <laughs> well, it does. I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, there's uh, Rogerian therapy, which is where, where, where you mismatch all visual clients. Um, <laughs> every, every visual statement they make, you make a kinesthetic one back, thereby making rapport take years uh, <laughs> until your client can finally adjust themselves. Once the client learns to speak in feeling languages, then you can communicate, and they're cured, and you feel better. <laughs> <laughs> I always love, I met, uh, one of my favorite clinicians I ever met was a lady named Alice Elliott. And she was a counselor in San Diego. And uh, she, went, she went to like two or three workshops. And uh, then she sent me this letter. And the letter was, you know, I learned the techniques. It worked so well. I, uh, I tried them on myself, made all the changes I need. So I thank my clients very much and quit. <laughs> it was a very honest response. She decided that she was dependent on her clients, that she didn't really like doing therapy anyway. And now that she felt better, that she just wanted, if I could send a list of people, she could refer them to. That, that she decided that she made herself feel so good, she didn't want to hang around with them because they were all very depressing, unhappy people. <laughs> <laughs> now, the thing that I'd like to get across to you in the, the course of this is that above and beyond having techniques that are that are just techniques, is the way in which you can begin to lace and layer these things together to, to build what I call a complex. And a complex has to do with building belief systems, with building feelings, with layering in chains. Because even in this one thing is the exercise. To me, it doesn't even constitute a whole unit of what I would do. But it's, a, it's the way in which I begin to lace together different things you've already learned about. You've learned about elicitation, submodality, timelines. But to me, in order to teach them, you have to separate them out to teach them. But it's packaging them together. And the, the, where you really get to get creative with NLP is where you get, begin to build packages so that you begin, you begin to build what I refer to as safety systems. Like, you know, in a nuclear power plant, they always talk about backup systems. Well, these are the systems that would go in front. Instead of having it so that if the first one fails, there's something that might fix it. This is where you have things that fix it before it breaks. So that as you begin to, as you begin to, to change what, what's a difficulty for someone, so that, uh, and I, to me, if, what, if you understand how convincer strategies work, that you can utilize, because see, if you can take somebody and fix an elevator phobia or, or some kind of a compulsion, uh, you may be able to reduce it a certain percentage, but not entirely. But even if you can get a small amount of it and use it as a convincer, that everything is going to change and get them to really start having more positive attitude towards changing, towards learning, towards living, and towards the way they treat other people. Because one of the major things that I discover is, is that when people have something that they're stuck on, they use it as an excuse to be unpleasant to other people, which means they don't have really good relationships. That, you know, I mean, think about, like I was just talking about the, uh, the goraphobic that, uh, that I saw. And uh, I told her that I'd take her out to lunch and work with her. Otherwise, she had to pay full fee. So it's like somebody coming out of the house like this. Of course, when she got out and wasn't afraid, she figured I did something to her. Of course, I was such an asshole. I said, maybe you haven't been afraid all these years. You know. <laughs> I always like to make them, because the, the, when they have to stop and wonder about that, you know, it's like maybe, maybe just the few things I said to you didn't really have any impact. And you've been waiting here for five years. Maybe you were fixed four years ago. Because the fact is, is when I asked her when the last time she tried to leave the house was, she said about three or four years ago. And uh, you guys remember, if th th those of you who have seen the Marshall University tapes, you remember Lee, the guy that had the phobia of driving out of town? OK. Here's a guy that has a phobia of driving out of town. If you remember on the film, I asked him, I said, well, maybe it was just that road. How many roads are there out of town? And he said, well, you know, he says, there's like four or five ways. And I said, have you tried them all? And he went, yeah, yeah, I tried them all. 
And I said, well, you know, how long have you had this? And he said, eight years. And I said, and at that time, I said, how many times have you tried to leave town? And he said, well, five or six. Now, this isn't what I call a balls-on person, you know. And, I mean, to me, it was getting him that day to drive out of town. And maybe my guess is, having watched the beads of sweat pour off his face when I suggested it, that he probably still had the phobia. But, you know, even after using the phobia thing, I wanted to install in him. And one of the things I said to him that isn't on the film, it's after the session, because he came up to me and said, geez, Richard, this is that's so amazing, you know. All we did was just sit there and talk. And I said, yes, it's, but it's how you talk. Um, but I suggested to him, I said, you know, when was the last time you actually tried to leave town? And he said, well, it's been a few years. I said, maybe this went away on its own. And I said, and, and this is where I begin to layer things. I said, maybe there's lots of things that you haven't tried in a while that would be worth trying. Because it's not just being able to leave town. Even on the film, I began to, I said, well, now that you're not afraid, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I'd like to take my family on a vacation. And I said, where? Because I want to make sure that he does something. Because I wanted to open up the possibility that he could get better jobs. He could take his family places. Uh, you know, he could go to dinner at new restaurants. I mean This videotape is edited from an advanced NLP training in Boulder, Colorado, April 1989. Many of the participants had also attended previous advanced training with Richard. Richard considers this seminar to be his best ever presentation of how he works with clients. Although he presents some new submodality methods, his major emphasis is on how he puts things together and the methods that he uses to create lasting change. Since this is a carefully sequenced seminar, we recommend viewing the videotapes in order. Did you come up with any other questions? You, things that ramble through your mind? Things you want to know about? Questions about this morning? Yes. Um, hmm, let's access auditorily. <laughs> Are you, you've been talking about how this is a through time. Um, well, it's, it's to build through time. That's why you do it. You time tunnel out into the future, yeah. So, so I'm thinking about, do people not have attitudes if they don't do through time much? It's not been my experience. No, I, they carry them differently. This is a way of installing them. It also, does, it also does in time in that you're collapsing it. In time, people have attitudes, but they fluctuate more. People who are through time have more consistent attitudes. Yeah. Uh, consistency is also something you will find on their hierarchy of criterion. That will be what they complain about in others. You know, they won't like that people change their mind and stuff like that. You know, uh, um, whereas in time people, you know, uh, you know, could be one way or another. And especially if you if you pay attention to how they sort. When you the, remember the meta program stuff from last time, the different sorting principles. Some people have different attitudes in different places. Some with different people. And depending upon what criterion they sort by, you'll find that in time people switch radically from person to person and from place to place, depending upon how the sorting principle works. Through time, it won't be so much that way because uh, you'll, when, when they sort, there be for them consistency between people, even if they sort by people, they'll try to sort people to be the same so that they can, you know. Uh, you, well, you, you find this a lot in people, you know, if you really listen to them when, they, when they're talking about things, that, that bother them, you know, it's like, I find this a lot, you know, that uh, when I'd worked with couples, I'd find, you know, that these husbands would come in and complain that their wife is always the same, and I always look at them and I go, would you really want that, you know, and they go, well, only in certain things, you know, <laughs> they want to mold people, and it's a tendency to, when you're searching for, for coherency, which is what metaprograms are about, is building coherency in your experience, it's how you sort the world up, out so that it builds coherency for you so that it makes sense because the world doesn't make sense so you have to make sense out of it and people who who do external referential index 
checks on things, have a tendency to try to get people to act certain ways to make their world coherent. Those are people who try to change your behavior a lot. You know. Is there more you wanted to know about that? Or? Probably. <laughs> when, it, when it crosses your mind, let me know. Any other questions about what we did this morning or anything else? Such a curious group. I think the altitude wipes your brains out or something. <laughs> well, this is not about this morning, but it's oh, okay. for me. Um, I'd like to build a stronger internal sense of what is real, what really happened, so that it's just as you were saying. What do you really mean, what really happened? Okay, in any, like the, the client that you talked about who came thinking that um, she'd been raped because the therapist had, had given her all the presuppositions. I want to be immune to that. I want to have a clearer Don't sense. Don't go to therapy. Right. <laughs> like, Next. To have more of a, of a trust in my own knowledge or my own sense of reality of what happened, and or to be able to go away and to say, well, we have a different perception on that and feel okay about it. Yeah, you need to learn certain gestures. Like <laughs> those help a lot. You need to have more of an attitude. Uh, <laughs> well, it, to, to, there's one thing about people that have heavy external references, which is that they're easily convinced of stuff for a while, right? I mean, but that you catch them between two people and they're like playing ping pong with them. I mean, I know of people that, you know, somebody tells them one thing and they believe and somebody tells them another. One of the things is, 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 to, is, is to take the foundation of the things that you feel the strongest about, the things that you have absolutely no doubt about. And it's different than a belief because these are things about your experience. You know, that th you pick of what you're most sure about happened in the past the way you believe it happened, right? And notice the submodalities of it, right? And then tag it. See, for example, I had this schizo once, and uh, I know I've probably written about it in books and stuff, but this schizo could not tell the difference between a constructed image and an eidetic image. They had no idea. I mean, you could say to this person, they, they had driven to, uh, out from Michigan to California, and uh, the psychiatrist uh, took her, literally took her out of a back ward of a mental hospital and threw her in the back of the station wagon and brought her out. I love this, and brings her to a seminar. Right, too cheap to buy the session, right? So he goes to, brings her to a session and doesn't tell anybody she's schizo. And we're doing all this constructed imagery stuff in the workshop, right? And so, of course, she just flipped, right? You know, you know you're making up all this change personal history. A perfect technique for her, huh? Right? And she does three or four change personal histories about the same thing with different people, and then she doesn't know what happened. And the thing is, so I sat down and I found out from the psychiatrist, I said, look, you know, the reference structure to know how to work with loonies. I mean, the guy works in a mental hospital, and you want to know how to work with a schizophrenic. If they're schizzy in a way you're not, then figure out how you do it. I mean, and install your strategy. It's better than nothing. You know, it may not be the best strategy, but it's better than somebody bouncing off of a rubber room. And with her, you know, I mean, literally, I did things like I, I said, you know, I had her make up an, a fantasy of fl having flown to California. Then I said, did you fly or drive? And she went, I don't know. And I mean, this was like three minutes. You know, I just said, ran her through the guided fantasy and then asked. And she had the conflict, conflicting. She knew both, but she didn't know which one was real. She had no sense of what really had happened. So what I did is I had her put a border around constructed images so she would know those were constructed, you know, and did it with hypnosis, made it so that in dreams and everything, just put a black border around it. See one with a black border? It didn't really happen. See one that's panoramic? Know that it did. And so the thing is, is with your raw experience, you leave it panoramic. And then with things that are constructed images, especially that come from external voices, what you do is you, you, you give yourself a very distinct set of submodalities so that when people tell you what must have happened when you were a kid, you, you do it, you know, and you can always put a grain of salt in each corner just to help to remind you that other people's opinion of your life is just their opinion. And, uh, you know, put a little internal voice that goes, ah, no, maybe, you know, just to kind of remind you while they're talking, you know, and that kind of an internal auditory anchor along with a set of submodalities so that you can begin to sort out for yourself. So, like, you know, the thing, to, thing that I would do would be to, like, take something that somebody told you, the kind of thing that you would believe too easily, and then take something that you know actually happened. You know where you had lunch today. 
you know, and if somebody tried to convince you you had something else for lunch other than you had, uh, they'd probably have trouble doing that. Take those submodalities, add to it an auditory sound, and then have somebody literally give you a post-hypnotic suggestion that when other people tell you about your experience, to put it in that. See, one of the nice things about doing trance work, and uh, I'm surprised at, at how little trance work people do, especially people in the, in, who do uh, therapy and counseling kinds of stuff, because, because you're always dealing with altered states. I mean, all the NLP techniques themselves are mini trances for the most part. I mean, you don't go in and do the, you know, the phobia cure you know, and change history, or a technique like we did this morning without going into a trance. And I mean, even, and especially even people like, you know, Gestalt therapy. Gestalt therapists insisted for years they didn't do hypnosis. They just had people hallucinate dead relatives on furniture and talk to it. And it talked back. I want you to think about that. I went to, I guess it was about 15, 16 years ago, I went to a Gestalt Institute in the Midwest. And they'd, they hired me to come in, you know, and I said, well, you know, you're all Gestalt therapists, so you all do hypnosis. And they got, like, insulted. And I said, wait a minute, that's a compliment, for God's sake. You know, this is one of the primary skills. Learning to deal with both people's conscious processes and their unconscious processes, I think, is an obligation. You know, I mean, uh, especially for people who are in the business of sales. I mean, you're working primarily with unconscious processes. People don't know why they want things. They just do. And as long as that's the case, that's what you're, you're working with. And also, when somebody makes a decision to buy something, you want them to congruently want it consciously and unconsciously and over time. You don't want no buyer's remorse. I figure that once somebody buys something from me, they've signed up for a job. Their job is to go out and prospect for me. And I mean, and I, I take that as a basic presupposition. Many people are business people here. I just hadn't asked that before. Doesn't that make sense to you? That, I mean, as soon as somebody, as I close any sale, to me, the only step left at that point, because I want to make sure every time they look at whatever they bought, they feel so powerfully good and delighted about what they do that they have to bring somebody else to buy something from me. And, and, and I wouldn't want to deprive them of the opportunity of sharing that good feeling with other people. Now, as long as I have that kind of a presupposition built in, I'm going to spend less and less time prospecting over the years and more and more time actually making money. Because, you know, it, it, prospecting is a time-consuming thing because you don't know exactly who wants things. So best you send your clients out to find out. When I was selling cars, I mean, to me, you know, I, I mean, I literally did a trance at the end of the closing. I mean, it's, it's as deep a trance as the one I do at the end of workshops. You know, and, and as they signed the contract, I'd say, now, just I want you to close your eyes for a minute and feel good about what you've done. And to realize that right now with your eyes shut, you can't see your car. But in a minute, when you look at your car, you're going to become overwhelmed with such good feelings that you're going to want to share them with other people to realize that you've made the right decision and to realize who helped you to do that. <laughs> and that you don't want other people to be ripped off by other salesmen. You want them to make the right decision too, don't you? Yes, I do. And I mean, uh, I mean to me, salesmen, they don't realize they're engaged in a hypnotic process. I mean. I mean, and, and people in advertising, too, a lot of them don't realize. They're so worried about this thing about subliminal communication and commercials. I mean, to me, you know, they show other product, induce bad feelings. Show your product, induce good feelings. What do they think that is? That's hypnosis, man. It's nothing else. That's what they're up to. Uh, you might as well get pretty overt about it, you know. I mean, because there are hypnotic techniques. Because, like, when you're working with an individual, you can pace their breathing with your tempo. But when you work with an audience, whether it's on film or at large, you control their breathing through tempo fluctuations so that they can breathe only when you want them to. Now, the, the thing for me is, that, is to understand that the hypnotic process, for example, in, in my courses, a lot of what I have people do is to do wanted double inductions. For some reason, that's an easy place for people to start. And it also induces such severe trance that you get a chance to install good post-hypnotic suggestions like that. For me, like that, the nice thing about hypnosis, too, that I really recommend that people spend time learning it, is that it's a good idea to discover how, how crazy a post-hypnotic suggestion you can give people. Because it does two things. One, it sensitizes you to the kind of shit you're saying. Because just because people don't have their eyes closed, they are in a trance, man. I mean, I want you to think about, you know, it's, I mean, like when my private practice when I started, 
I was out in Ben Lomond in Santa Cruz, and people would drive over from the Silicon Valley. They had to drive through the redwoods, and up this windy road through the trees, and down this little road, you know. By the time they'd get there, the sun would be going down. It'd be dark, you know. They'd go out and hear wolves howling in the hills, you know. Walk in this little room with a complete maniac like me, you know, I had to assume they were going into an altered state. That, I mean, you know, you go sit out on the beach for a day and you go into an altered state. And when you go to a doctor, I mean, I've had clients that have had crazy stuff, you know, where doctors have induced in them. I had, uh, I had uh, one guy that, uh, you know, so ulcer kept getting worse and worse and worse. And they invented new medicine that pretty much clears up an ulcer. And they gave this guy the medicine and it was like, it would get better and... But then it would get worse all of a sudden. As soon as he'd stop taking it, it would get worse, you know. And they, so they started coming up, and they told him he had a metabolic dif difficulty and that probably it would start affecting his blood pressure. And, I mean, they gave him all of these suggestions to the point where this guy was freaking out. And uh, when he came to me, he came just to learn relaxation. And so I put him in a deep trance, and then I set up finger signals with him. And I, because I knew he'd been to a doctor, I said, did your doctor give you any suggestions that this sort of stuff would happen? I get a yes, and I said, and have you, his unconscious, been carrying out these suggestions for no reason? I get, yes, I have. <laughs> I go, would you prefer to stop? Yes, I would. Stop. You know, have you stopped? Yes, I have. <laughs> right? And then he was fine. I mean, but I mean, you know, got to understand when people are scared for their health or when they're dealing, of course, even if you have somebody with a phobia, you bring them in, you have to think about their phobia. Fear is an incredibly altered state. I mean, you can give really wanton suggestions. I was talking earlier uh, to somebody about using the visual squash, that when you set up, you know, when people, the people that come in that have had so much therapy, they got a million parts, you know. I mean, me, I just try to integrate them, stuff them all into one and shove it inside them. And I do things like have them spread them out and look at them all and then just literally physically crush them into one thing. And then as soon as they get them crushed together, they like shove them inside their chest. And when they do, they go, <gasps> when you get that, I start firing off post-hypnotic suggestions like crazy. Because when I see radical shifts in people that look like trance inductions, the same thing you see, you know, you guys done the handshake interrupt? Most of you in here? Is that yes or? This is an interesting combination. <laughs> You get a few yeses and a few noes. Well, the handshake interrupt when you do it, the one nice thing about it when you learn to do it is to watch the expression on their face because you're going to see that anyway. And when you see it, just start firing off suggestions. You know, you will enjoy life more. And it's, it's kind of like, did you ever see that Saturday Night Live skit where the guy worked for the Center for Subliminal Communication? Yes. Right? You guys ever see that? And he walks into his boss and he goes, hi, how are you? Give me a raise today. <laughs> Right? And he kept embedding these verbal things. Well, it's a little bit like that, but you catch these moments because when you're working with people, when you're having them go inside and access things that come out, when you look at them, if you know what trance looks like, you're going to be able to recognize it. And when you recognize it, throw out suggestions. It's the same thing as the, the one thing I always do throughout sessions is I stack post-hypnotic suggestion on post-hypnotic suggestion and presupposition on presupposition because it doesn't hurt. You know, since you want everything you do, because the one reason I'm so conscious of it is, is that if you're not deliberately doing it in a way that's useful, you most likely will be doing it in a way that's not useful. I mean, when I get done working with a phobic, I'll look at them and I'll say, now think about your phobia and try to have as much fear as you can in vain. Now, that, I mean, that's a pretty loaded suggestion. Try in vain to have the same old feelings. I mean, it pretty much sets you up for success. But, you know... If somebody says, now, I want you to go back and re-experience all that fear fully, right? Well, it's a suggestion. You may have cured their phobia, but you can re-induce it. I mean, I can take anybody whose phobia has been cured and give them a new one. I mean, if you can take them away, you can give them back. And the trick is, is to make sure you so pad your work that the inherently helpful people that surround an individual don't do it. Because imagine, <laughs> hey, it's... I took a course from the guy that had the theory of inherently helpful people. <laughs> it's this, I'm serious about this. This guy had a, had a theory and a government grant and everything. And he did a research study, and this is how he got his PhD, and proved that it had nothing to do with what you did as a therapist or as a clinician, that some people were inherently helpful and others weren't. <laughs> so you are genetically a good therapist or you are not.
And he had all the characteristics of what an inherently helpful person was like. Of course, they seemed a lot like him. <laughs> it was the same as Maslow's authenticated person. It was a description of Maslow, right? Because, I mean, Maslow is kind of the visionary of modern psychology. I mean, you know, the authenticated person was somebody that liked to be alone and read and sit in their office. You know, kind of like Maslow, you know? And it was so, you know, and, you know, there was the person who was the transparent self and then the one that was, I guess, the translucent self or the opaque self or whatever that shit was. I don't know. It was all real confusing to me. It was just all that sounded like was Maslow. If you are like me, you are authenticated. If not, you are not real. You are not your real self. If you were a real self, you'd be me. <laughs> I mean, ah! you know. When I took this in college, you know, and I asked this guy, I said, you really believe being able to help people is genetic? You know, and this guy looked me straight in the eye, and he said, yeah. And I said, well, maybe you could help me with this. And the guy said, I don't think so. Because <laughs> I'm not an inherently helpful person. But I am pretty good at changing people. And one of the reasons is, is that, I mean, I, when I realize, because see, I always think about and take into consideration that you're not just working in your session. That all that stuff, you know, about, like Virginia Satir talked about family systems, you know, you fix the schizophrenic, put them back in the family, they get schizzy again. Well, you have to deal with not just the family, but all the inherently helpful people that are surrounding somebody's life. I mean, it's like, I worked with somebody one time that had an escalator phobia. And when I was done, of course, I wanted to test my work. And so I had to meet me in a hotel that had this really neat set of escalators that went up three floors. You know, it's a, it's a big hotel in Seattle. And it's the Washington Plaza Hotel. And it's got, you know, I like it because it has the big teeth on the end. You know, because I always do that. When, when you want to scare your phobics, you have them look down at the escalator and turn the things on there into teeth. Right? <laughs> and then you put lips on them and shut them. Turn them into a kiss. You know. <laughs> That always confuses them. <laughs> I go, everybody has teeth, including the people you love. <laughs> I said, you kiss your wife, don't you? Well, of course I do. Well, look at the elevator and feel this. It's like your wife. <laughs> but only for kissing. <laughs> so anyway, I take this guy out after I work with him, and we go, we go down the elevator, and he was fine. Elevators were no problem. And we walk around, and I didn't realize, but he had had his family wait in the lobby. And he had his wife, and he had his two sons, and something. And they were going to go out to dinner or something afterwards. And they were sitting in the lobby. And I walked this guy around to the escalator, and they all jumped up with panic on their faces as I led him up to the thing. Now, I was lucky you didn't see him. I saw him, and I freaked out, right? I was like, ah, don't go on there. It's broken, you know? And the guy goes, what's the matter? It's OK. But I mean, the thing is, is that if he has to move through the world with everybody analoging analogically reacting as if he has the same problem. All of those things are going to be anchors. They are the anchors that maintained his problem in the first place. So if everybody acts as if you are the same and generates nonverbal and verbal cues to that effect, then what happens is, is this is one of the things that you're up against. Now, if you remember on the blackboard yesterday, remember I put up that thing about wiping out cues? This is the next step. The next step is to be able to go through and to literally wipe out the kind of cues that are going to occur. And I find the best place to do this is in an altered state. Because the nice thing is, is when you induce a deep, mellow, wonderfully pleasant altered state, and then review the situation, it has the same trick that the phobia cure has built into it. See, the phobia cure is, isn't related to phobias. Most people don't realize that. It has nothing to do with phobias. It has to do with the fact that you're looking at whatever you're phobic of or listening to whatever you're phobic of and feeling fine. That's all. That's the only thing that it does. Disassociation is just a trick to get you there. It's, the, it's not the only way to get you there either. It happens to be an easy one. So if somebody has a phobia of uh, roller coasters, if they see what they'd see in a front seat of a roller coaster and hear the sound, well, they, they feel phobic. But if you have them watching themselves on a roller coaster, well, they still hear the same sounds. They're still seeing a roller coaster, but you've now reduced the visual stimulus. When you disassociate them again, the sound is still there, and they're still seeing the same thing. There st still is a roller coaster. Because people who have a phobia of roller coasters can't even think about one, let alone go on one. But already, to them, it makes sense. And they're sitting there calmly watching a roller coaster, which means now the sound of a roller coaster is an anchor for the altered state in which they're calm. Now, the same thing is true. Now, if you want to go through and wipe out large numbers of cues, and the trick is, since you don't know what they are, 
the best way is, is as soon as you've done, like if we take the change that you made here, and the next step now is to be able to induce an altered state. And uh, I found out, I guess I didn't teach it. There was an induction that I always liked, and I asked somebody in here, and they told me I didn't teach it. I didn't teach you guys before the induction where you lift one hand as slowly as humanly possible. The, it was the second trick. This is the trouble with you guys not doing all four. Well, anyway, I'm going to have you try an induction. And, and uh, for those of you who haven't done any hypnosis, don't worry about it because you can't do hypnosis wrong. People either go into a trance or they don't. But what we're going to do is we're going to make it a little easier this time. Because what we're going to do is I want you to just simply realize that what you do is you breathe at the same rate. You make your voice tone and your voice tempo smooth and even so that it paces their breathing. So that as they breathe in and breathe out, you take your tone and you literally take the tone and shift it up and down, up and down with their breathing. And then you can take your voice tone and go lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. <laughs> and listen carefully while you do so. Because as, now the other thing is, is to remember all of the things that you've learned about language. Because this is where the art form comes. Linkage as while. So that each thing links to the next thing. Now what I want you to do is to tell them to sit there. Put their hands on their legs, on their thighs. Take a deep breath. Now, why do you tell them to take a deep breath? So that you can see where they breathe. You've got to remember, you do stuff for yourself. Some of you who have been too inherently helpful forget that what you do is you make calibration easy for yourself. Instead of trying to see subtle nonverbal cues that force you to squint <coughs> like this, I've seen so many people who have spent... I, I, I had some people who have went through a 27-day training down in Houston, and they spent three weeks, 21 days, learning calibration. And they were the most blind, deaf, dumb people I'd met because all they were trying to calibrate to was minimal stuff. So they missed all the big things, right? And I mean, to me, the thing is, is if you can't see it, exaggerate it in the person to make it easy for you because it'll be more useful that way anyway. It's nice to be able to see subtle nonverbal stuff, but not if you miss the big stuff. Start with the big stuff and work your way down. So you have them take a deep breath that shows you where they breathe. And as they let that breath out, you begin to talk. You tell them, take a deep breath. And as you do so, relax. Because as they breathe out, it's going to relax. That's automatic built-in pacing. Take another deep breath. And as you let this one relax, close your eyes and very slowly begin to lift one hand as slowly as is humanly possible. And while you do so, begin to make images of past pleasant memories, things you can enjoy from your childhood. And while you enjoy those things from your childhood, I want you to find one that's a pleasant past memory, one you can enjoy fully. And then very slowly, what I want you to do as that hand continues to lift up is to realize in a moment I'm going to reach over and lift up your other arm. Now, what you do is you then reach over and lift up either arm because the other one will be the one that's lifting. If it's already off, lift up the other one. Okay? Now, once you've lifted up your arm, what you do is you lift it up so it's even and you tell them, I'm not going to tell you to put it down any faster than what you begin to do is to make certain shifts because I want you to make an image of the most relaxing pleasant past memory you can find. Staring at a fire, watching the water glisten across a lake, any pleasant memory. And then very slowly, I want you to push that image away from you and make it larger. So that you begin to take, because trance is stuff that's not normal consciousness, right? Altered state. So what you do is go through and start taking pairs of submodalities and moving them in incongruent fashions. In other words, if consciously, when you drive away from a mountain, it gets what? So you have them get further away from something and make it bigger, right? You have a sound get further away and get what? Or get closer and get right. So that what you do is you begin to build incongruencies. And what you do is you tell them, as you suggest each one of these, if it helps them to relax and go deeper and deeper and deeper into a deep trance, 
that what you want them to do is to allow their hand to float up a little bit more. And if they begin to feel like they're floating up out of a trance, allow their hand to go down. So that what you do is you then have a pretty good piece of calibration. If their hand goes up, they're going deeper. If their hand goes down, they're not. In either case, you already have arm catalepsy, so they're going deeper anyway, whether they know it or not. Now, as you begin to induce the trance, what I want you to do is to watch, watch their face, watch their breathing, and as they appear to be going deeper, lower the tone of your voice. If they appear to be coming up a little bit, raise your voice tone up, and then just keep lowering your voice down, lower and lower, softer and softer, quieter and quieter, so that as you begin to speak to them in a way that they can relax fully and listen and understand each and every word, then you begin to suggest to them that what they're going to do is to take the new learning and the new understanding which they just made this morning. A change that builds in a new belief and a new attitude. And now what they're going to do is move back through time. Because here's where the past becomes a valuable ally. And you have them float back above their timeline, back when they were younger, and take the new belief and the new feeling with them and literally slowly move right up through times, bits and places, where they'd had a lack of these qualities of the past, and feel, that's the magic word, how they would have done it different. Not see, feel how they would have done it different. See what freedom it would have allowed them, and enjoy fully the magnitude of the freedom and the release of energy and the creativity and the productivity that this will mean in the future, such that when they reach the present time, they can explode into the future with enthusiastic and vigorous and delightful enthusiasm at the changes that they're going to have, lasting and lasting and lasting. Again, stacking presuppositions. Not lasted, lasting. That is, ING words go out into the future. I am looking for something. I am going somewhere. So as you go, get to the present and go into the future, you begin to use lots of ING words so that you propel them into the future with utter and wanton enthusiasm. Did you have a question? Now? <laughs> I'm sure this is all clear in your mind. As it gets clearing up more and more, it'll give you an opportunity to begin to calibrate. Now, if you want to join pairs so you could do double inductions on one another, that's fine for those of you that know how. The deeper you induce the trance, the more you'll be able to smooth out the semantic response in the past. Because now, the one thing you do want to do with your partner is remember you have a, a very powerful anchor that you made, right? Because you remember yesterday I told you when you collapsed the things together to anchor it? You guys remember yesterday, right? Some people didn't do it. So today, you all remembered to do it, right? <laughs> Oops! <laughs> it's the, ma the major thing I think people have an in internal dialogue when there's more, you know, because, you know, Miller and Glanner always said the limits of human memory was seven plus or minus two, you know. Bullshit, it's one plus or minus two. <laughs> and a lot of times it's just minus two plus nothing. That's right. You've got to remember these things, and the best way to remember them is, is if you should forget, notice that you've forgotten, go back and do it again. And when you get tired of doing it again, then you'll remind yourself. Some of you take notes, but then you don't read them. Okay, so you have a powerful anchor, which is for the, the thing that has the three beliefs and the new attitude together. You've now collapsed three sets of submodalities. So you want to go back, and you want to induce as pleasant a state. Now, I'll show you a little trick about inducing pleasant states. That when you've induced in them the altered state, and you have them go back and find something serene, pleasant memory, Tell them, because trance is the most powerful amplifier, tell them to literally double the intensity of their enjoyment. Because the most unconscious process, and I was, we were talking about this today, the most unconscious thing people do, other than speak language, is multiply. People do not multiply consciously. It's, an, uh, it's, an, it's a trance phenomenon. That's how people do math. That's why people that don't do math well, that's because they try to do it with their conscious mind. Conscious minds are not qualified to do multiplication. This is one of the reasons they have so much trouble teaching multiplication and division in school, is it is a straight trance phenomenon. And I was telling Michael that when Milton Erickson did time distortion ex uh, experiments, for those, any of you read his book, Time Distortion, in here? 
It's always nice to be well read in your field. Um, <laughs> anyway, he has a book called Time Distortion, which he did all kinds of time distortion exercises. And if he held real time constant, people could double, triple, and quadruple the amount of output. He took a dress designer. She could design five dresses in, in trance time and come out and, and draw them all down. And she could do this, but the one thing he could not get people to do faster in time distortion was multiplication. They could not multiply more numbers in time distortion than they could in the waking state. And he was always terribly confused about this. But since it's already a time distortion phenomenon, somebody says to you, like, what's seven times six? What? Right? Boom. You don't know how you did it, do you? You go into a little time distortion state, and you're out of it. Because when they, the way they teach you to do this stuff, they teach you to go through a whole list of it and find the one that fits. You know, that some of you were done visually with a chart. Some of you learned it through auditory repetition. And when somebody asks you the question, you go, zzz, poof, and give them the output. So you're already doing time distortion. So of course you cannot increase the number. But multiplication also, you multiply trans states. Notice how deep you are times two. Times four. <laughs> More reasons than you realize it will be useful for you. Scope ambiguity is a wonderful thing, is it not? Now, useful for you to begin to consciously understand what I'm saying. Now, that's right, we don't want to lose anyone here. After lunch. After lunch, yeah. Ah, it's always nice to do a little trance work after lunch. Helps the digestion, you know. Now, the thing is, is so one of the other tricks is, is you can multiply the depth of trance, but you can also multiply the intensity of feelings so that you take the good feelings that they have from the changes they made. Multiply the depth of trance. Say, like, one of the things I like to do is I like to say, like, for example, you can feel yourself float down one notch at a time, you know, and do it like this and go one, two, three, four times two. <laughs> that has no impact. I always love it when people are holding on to the side of chairs in seminars. <laughs> I'm not going into a trance. <laughs> Deeply and thoroughly and enjoyably with a sense of wanton pleasure and anticipation times two for many reasons after you ate <laughs> lunch. <laughs> I love brains. They're such great toys. Now, the thing is, is that once you get them into the altered state, you will remember to take the person back, take the new learnings they just built, the new attitude, and smooth through their personal history by having them go through and feel how much easier it would have been to have this attitude, how much more enjoyable, and see what freedom it would have given them. And then prepare tell themselves out in the future with twice to four times as much good feeling and sense of want and anticipation about how this is going to permeate their life. Because this is where you get to give suggestions about generalization. Now I'm sure this is all clear to each of both of you. Your unconscious can assist you in this process and you can enjoy the process of learning with both minds. So now go find your partner, take about 20 minutes a piece and rock and roll your way through it and pay careful attention to your tonality, your anchoring. Remember, it's okay to go into a trance when you're doing trance work with people as long as you can still talk and see. <laughs> so I remember when I taught the uh, handshake interrupt and two people walked up and they didn't get clear who was going to do it to who and they both did this and they stood there like this. I walked over and there were two people like this on the side of the room and I went, Hello! One at a time! Okay, go for it and enjoy the process. And remember, the best thing to do is to make trance enjoyable, pleasurable, and fun because that way people will learn much more from it. Robert's a real doer, and, but there's some things that, you know, he's just too awkward to do. He's Robert, you know. And so he always wants me to do them because he loves to watch me do super deep trance inductions, rapid ones and stuff. So he, he talks to this guy, and this guy's got all these vision problems and stuff. So he tells this guy, as I'm sitting in the front row, and we're supposed to be co-teaching, right? And he, and he uh, 
draws this stuff on the blackboard and has the guy try to read it. And the guy can't even read it with his glasses on. I mean, the letters are like this big. The guy's blind as a fucking bat, you know. And so Robert says, well, you know, he says, we'll do something with him. And then he signals the guy, says, come on up. And as he turns over, he looks at me and he goes like this. He's just over his shoulder. He goes, put him in a deep punch. <laughs> like this, right? And, 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 and I, of course, you know, I don't hear that well because I'm not paying attention. I went, what? And then it just kind of rolled back through. And he goes, he goes, you haven't really met my friend Richard. He said, I'd like to introduce you. He goes, Richard, like this. And Robert does that, a handshake gesture, like, you know, would you like to meet my friend Richard? So this kid walks up on the stage like this to me. And I thought, Robert, set me up, man. So I whacked this guy into a deep trance, right? Just, just zone him through the floor, right? And then I had him come out of trance, and I left his arm in trance. Told him his arm would stay in trance, and he would come out. So the guy comes out, and he's like this, you know, and I said, in a moment, I'm going to reach over and touch you on the nose. Your conscious mind is going to go totally away so that I can speak privately with your unconscious mind. And the guy goes, huh. Now I said, you don't believe that? And he went, no. And I said, let's ask your unconscious mind. Does it believe it? And his hand goes, like this. And I said, is there anything he can do that will stop it? And he goes, like this. And then I reach over, and I go like this, and as I... He starts moving his hand back like this, like, like that. And it's like till he can't go any further. And when I did it, the guy just slopped down in the chair. So then I did this stuff where I age regressed and made his eyes better and did all this stuff. And bring him out, and without his glasses, put him back in the front row, he could read everything but the one emotional, the word emotional. He couldn't read the word emotional. He could read every other word, but he couldn't read the word emotional. It was, it was, the guy was just, you know, well, a lot of people, you know, it, you know, he obviously, you know, had gone, a lot of people blur their eyes out as a way of dealing with stress. And you can always identify them because the minute stress occurs, they take their glasses off. You know, if you make things tense in the room, they take the glasses off immediately. And those are people you can fix their eyes just like that. And the thing about, about hypnosis, the one thing is, is that, I mean, you know, if you make a mistake, you can always fix it. Because one thing I like about hypnosis is it's so overt, it's obvious. But you have to respond that people respond so literally that you can't give suggestions by conversational postulate. You can't assume that people mean what you say. You have to really say, you have to be very exact with language. And actually it's true in the conscious state, but it's, it's less obvious in some ways. One of the reasons I like people to spend a lot of time doing hypnosis is because there's always these quirky things that happen that, that uh, uh, teach you to be more precise about your language. I mean, funny kinds of stuff. Because uh, I, I, had a, I had a client when I was first learning hypnosis. And I told this guy that, and I mean, I just, I just knew what was on my mind. I told this guy I was going to count from 20 to 1 and that he would come all the way out of trance. And for some reason, uh, something, was on, something interrupted me or something. And I went back and I counted from 10 to 1. And the guy just didn't come out, right? You know, I counted and I could tell as I was counting nothing was happening, right? And I, and I stopped and I thought, I thought, well, you know. Maybe they can get stuck, you know, <laughs> right? And finally, you know, like this, you know, and I said, is there anything that stops you from coming out of trance? And I get this, yes, signal, right? You know, what is it? And he went like this, he went, <laughs> right? And I went, oh, 20, yeah, 20, I remember. <laughs> you know, it's, it's always nice. You can always get them to help you out a little bit, but I thought that was a great finger signal. <laughs> Wrong number. <laughs> you said 20. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, anything you say, man. And... Uh, 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 one time I, we did this trance work with this guy in Palo Alto. He was some guy that ran a clinic, and he hired us to train his staff and then pretended to be a client, like we didn't know who he was. But we knew who he was. And I tried to tell him ahead of time. He was trying to pretend to be a client. And I said, do you want to pretend to be a client? I was real, you know, it's like I know who you are, right? And the guy wouldn't break his role. It's like if he kept pretending, I'd forget or something, right? So I figured if this guy's going to be a jerk, you know, uh, I'll use hypnosis because there is no pretend in hypnosis, you know, because he was one of the, a lot of therapists role play, you know, to, you know, that's role playing stuff. Well, you don't role play being in a deep trance, you know. <laughs> so I figured, you know, I'd go straight for the thing. So I just, you know, whacked this guy into a deep trance, you know, and uh, did the work with him. And it was amazing afterwards. He told me, gee whiz, those problems are actually things that occur in his life. Big surprise. But I decided at the end, you know, as long as he was being a prick about it, that I'd give him a suggestion. So I gave him for a suggestion that he would go for a walk in downtown Palo Alto, right? But I didn't give him the suggestion he would come back, right? So it ended up backfiring on me because while I'm waiting for the, I'm waiting with the rest of the staff and they're all getting nervous because I don't know where the hell this guy is. Suddenly it dawned on me the suggestion I gave him. 
I suddenly like played it back in my head and I realized I'd given him a suggestion to go for a walk. And conversationally, that means you go for one and it ends, right? But when you give it to somebody in a trance, so we had to go out and roam the streets. <laughs> you know, and I, I found him, he was halfway to Menlo Atherton, you know? So it's dun da da dun, da 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 You know, it's like, what are you doing? I'm walking. You know, <laughs> you can stop now. Oh, phew, thank you. You know, <laughs> uh, you get some really funny stuff. And I mean, but I mean, it happens the other way around because a lot of people, you know, a lot of people don't realize that one of the reasons that you always want to have a sense of humor, no matter how grim people's problems are, is you do not want to reinforce their problems. Uh, like, you know, I mean, I've heard some of the most bizarre stuff that when people, you know, describe something bad that happened to them, they go, that must terrify you to even think about it. You know, it's like, ah, now that you mention it, you know, you know, and it's like, you know, and I've heard people say, well, you know, do you relive this phenomenon over and over again every night in your dreams? And I know they're trying to be helpful. They don't realize they're giving embedded commands and embedded commands do work. And the nice thing about using trance work and, and making sure you end your sessions with a trance that goes back and smooths out the past and really projects people in the future is that if you've screwed up at all in the middle, you're going to fix it. And it's so, you know, because you can't be perfect and you can't expect yourself to be perfect. So you build in little safeguards to try and make sure that you'd, as, as it said in one of the brochures, the first workshop I did up in Seattle was for a family therapy institute. And the, they didn't know what I did. And they... They kept talking to people and reading some of the stupid magazine interviews and stuff. And they really didn't know what to put in their brochure copy. And they, so they put, you know, Richard Pandler and John Grinner are, are going to help us to get out of our own way <laughs> while we're working with other clients so we don't hurt them anymore. You know? <laughs> and it was so good I had to clip it out and put it on the wall. You know? <laughs> and when we went in to do the workshop, I was surprised that this brochure got like 200 people. Right? You know? And I asked people, I said, are you here to find out how to not hurt your clients anymore? Go, oh, yeah, yeah. Do you know that you are? No, but we must be. You know. <laughs> if you say we are, Rich, we are. Well, good. Stop it. That, I mean, to me, one of the nice things about learning, because, see, when you learn to utilize timelines, it allows you to be able to do all kinds of things to reduce, reduce semantic response and to increase semantic response. Because to me, like, one of the things that I've discovered is, is that the focus that people have on their unpleasant parts of their life, the fact that they're so focused on it, it's like, how many of you, have ever, do any of you do body work in here? Do you have people that do any kind of body work? Have you ever noticed this thing that, you know, you take somebody who hasn't been able to move their arm in three years, right? You give them back mobility of their arm, right? You know, their left side of their body was paralyzed. You know, I'll spend three hours and make it so they can move it again, right? And do you know what they say to me? Instead of something like, thank you, Right? They say, well, if, you know, if I move it like this, it still hurts. You know, and I go, well, don't move it like that. You know? But the thing is, is they're so aimed at searching for pain that the, the whole grid is still aimed that way. Well, the same thing happens when people have problems in their life. If they were, have a phobia of something, they'll go, it's better, but I can still feel this little tingle right here. You ever cured, cured a phobia and get this yet? You know, it's like that. And I go, well, gee, that's too bad. Maybe we should put the whole thing back. That always shuts them right up, let me tell you. I go, I'll install it, make it twice as bad as it was. That'll get rid of the tingle. And they go, no, mm, well, they're going to keep the tingle. But uh, <laughs> the thing is, is that they're so aimed at looking for if there's still any fear left, if there's still any discomfort, if they still feel threatened by a situation, you know, or if they still have, you know, well, if I think about it, you know, I, I still feel a little tightness up here, you know, or, or I still feel a little tight. You know, these are people that couldn't even do it. You know, you take somebody who's an agoraphobic, get them on the outside and you go, how is this? And they go, instead of going, well, I feel free and enriched, you know, I have my life back. They go, well, I still feel a little tight down here. And I go, well, go back to your room, you know, wait another 10 years. <laughs> and, you know, and, and the thing is, is if I can't interject humor at those points to the point where I can get them to laugh about it, that it seems so real to them, you know, because they focus so much attention on it that one of the things you have to do is literally switch perceptual grids, which is the third thing I put on the board yesterday. Because, I mean, we've now covered two of them. And for me, learning to switch perceptual grids is an important thing. Because when, when people are trying to solve a problem, to begin with, they're operating out of the framework that something is wrong. Now, even though their problem works perfectly, I mean, even schizophrenics, like Andy worked perfectly as a schizophrenic. I mean, and Andy wasn't schizzy one day, and it, you know, 
there was five or six triggers that set him off. And I mean, and there's, I mean, you know, there's a myriads of things that if it was up to me would be what he would need. But he certainly didn't need to flip out because somebody had long hair. I mean, this is not, this is not profoundly useful. I mean, even in the, the third session, when I asked Andy, and I loved it when I said, you know, I said, you know, this sounds like a lot of work, right? I said, between your house and the bank, how many of these episodes do you have to have? And he stops, and he thinks about it, and he goes, well, about eight. And I said, you know, I said, or it was eight per block or something like that. And whatever it was, you know, I said, God, you know, and they don't even pay you for this, you know. And he's, he's going, yeah, you know, this is really a problem. Because part of what I was doing was switching his framework to the fact that it was a job to maintain it. I wanted him to have his problem seem like work rather than something that he re responded to. I wanted him to, number one, know that he was doing it, to respond out of the attitude that instead of this is something that happens to him, it's something he's doing voluntarily, and it's something he should be paid for, that it is an accomplishment, and it's a pain in the ass. It's a lot of work to have to have eight psychotic episodes per block, you know, and they're not even paying for you, just trying to go to the bank and cash a check, and just because the bank happens to be two blocks away, you have to have 16 psychotic episodes. I mean, that's, you know, that's a lot of work, you know. And he was going, God, if you only knew, you know. He said, he said you have no idea how much trouble this is. I said, you know, not to mention the fact if a long-haired guy comes along or there's a dog or one of these things, I said, you know, I said, you, you could spend a whole day going to the bank, you know, go through all this pain, all this stress, all this freaking out. And who pays you for it? Nobody. What a ripoff. Now, part of the thing that I'm doing inside of the thing that I think is really important for people, especially if you're going to work with individuals. And I mean, I not only use, I use this especially when I do management training, because managers, a lot of them get geared into looking for what's wrong, rather than filling people with doing things right. See, for example, when they, if they noticed who does what well and have them do that more and have somebody else do the other parts, part of the responsibility of being able to delegate authority is to know to whom. That's one of the things that I find that managers don't pay attention to. They keep giving people the wrong tasks and then blaming them for not doing them. You know, you take somebody who can't spell and have them copy at it, uh, you know, it shouldn't be their ass that's kicked. You know, it's yours. You either teach them to spell or you have somebody else do it. I mean, this is part of what makes businesses operate efficiently as teams is that you utilize people's skill. You don't, make it, you don't have them do things they're not good at because it's their job description you switch their job description and give somebody else that part of the job so that you get things done and make money. I mean, that's the purpose of having businesses. It's not a hobby with most of us. We have businesses because we like cash and because it gives us the opportunity to do what we like. Now, it's not a question of whether somebody likes a task or not. It's a question of whether they do it good because it's easy to get people to enjoy things. It's harder to get them to be good at it. And so if you have somebody that's already good at it, it's better utilization. Either that or you function, you have to motivate them to want to become good at it. Because people don't learn to spell overnight. You can give them a spelling strategy, but they still have to learn words. Also, one of the problems with it is, is that if they learn the words off of stuff they've already written, they'll learn to spell them wrong. <laughs> you got to make sure they do it with a dictionary and not with their own writing. Or worse, from somebody else's writing who doesn't spell well. Now, in terms of switching perpetual grids, it's like when I do body work with people for the first couple of years, I got pissed at them for this. I thought, you fucking ungrateful assholes. I mean, I worked with a guy that rolled a motorcycle 130 miles an hour. And they had to reconstruct his shoulder, and they did a terrible job of it. It's one of the worst jobs I've ever seen. It looked like it was put together by a motorcycle mechanic who, who wasn't good at chopping Harleys. You know, he only did dirt bikes. And what happened was, is th three years later, this shoulder didn't hurt. But the other side of his body got so screwed up, he couldn't move his arm and leg without it hurting excruciatingly. His spine literally went like this. And so all the, the ribs on the side were unattenuated and twisted. So if he moved, when the ribs on the back, by the way, don't, don't actually, aren't attached, they attenuate. They just, they're like a, a press fit. They just kind of slide in there. So if your spine curves and this twists out, you have little sharp points that poke you in the muscles. And they hurt having a twisted rib. So he had a whole, all of this stuff was screwed up because the way they stuck the pin in arced his spine over. So I took this guy, and I mean, this guy was in pain. He was taking pain pills all day long, doing all this shit, couldn't work, stuff. So I take this guy, and with the person I did body work at the time, a lady named Glenda, 
We spent, we did a three hour marathon session on this guy to find out if we could straighten his spine out. Because he also had something called scoliosis, which is supposed to be irreparable. So we fixed it. You know. It's a weird thing. They claim you can't fix this, but if they hang you upside down, you don't have it. Isn't that weird? It's curv a certain kind of curvature of the spine. And they claim you cannot fix this, but if you hang somebody upside down, they don't have it. They only have it one way in relationship to gravity. So either you put roller skates on their head or you fix it. Uh, we decided fixing it probably seemed a little more practical. Um, but when we fixed this guy, when I was done, right, we sent him home and we told him, look, just relax for the evening, you know, and take it easy for the next couple of days and give us a call. Well, the guy calls the next day, right, and goes, I'm in excruciating pain. And I said, well, did you do anything after you left yesterday? And he said, well, I went home and split a quart of wood. And I thought, you son of a bitch. And I said, why did you do that? And he said, because I wanted to see if I could make it hurt. And I said, do you want it to hurt? And he said, no, but if I don't push it up against the pain, I won't know if it's going to hurt. Well, this is somebody that paid attention to too many of these commercials for people who sell exercise equipment. Have you ever noticed that they try to teach you that, you know, no pain, no gain? Bull you know, I know a lot of top athletes that, that you know, weightlifters, professionals, and they don't do it till it hurts. The thing is, is that in order for me, then I, I started discovering that the kind of grid these people had was the same thing that I found when I worked with people. If they were just working with somebody who was shy, instead of looking at how much further they got and how much further that meant that they could go, they would literally be going out to try and find a situation in which they felt shy or how little shy. It was to them then a degree. They didn't think about how much less shy they were. It was, well, there's still a little bit left. Now, I'm sure you've heard this kind of stuff. So one of the things that I started to do is to build perceptual grids while I've got them in trance. Because what I want to do is to refocus their attention so that if they notice any change, that as they look, they're going to find that they change more and more each day. So one of the things that I do is the next little piece that I want you to add on to what you did, just as, as a taste, is I begin to set up an old thing that in sales, they call it in sales, it's, it's the Ben Franklin technique. It's the either or, right? It's which weighs more, which do you want more? So I begin to describe that, and this is actually a lie, but I'm always willing to lie to my clients as long as they get where they want to go. But it's not really a lie because it kind of works. I talk about how if, if you pay attention to the unpleasant parts of your life, you notice them. And I have them think about how much energy they spent noticing about the problem that they have had. This is a perfect place to begin to slam in massive presuppositions and massive post-hypnotic suggestions. This is where you want to get into past tense predicates because they are very, very powerful. That if they notice the problem that they had, that it was so all-consuming, the amount of their energy and attention that they spent looking at how bad they felt made it so that they felt worse. That's why problems get worse. And even now, no matter how much better they feel or if they totally have changed now, if they go looking to feel bad, they will. So now they come to a choice point, a decision in their life, a focal point. And this is the point at which I use all my tonality and all my direction to make it sound as if they are on the precipice of life. Either they can make the rest of their life shit, or they can make the rest of their life ecstasy. Now, as I go through this induction, what I set up is, I set up, in essence, a scale. But the scale is not just a verbal one. I do it kinesthetically as well. And I use anchors, because I set up an anchor for unpleasantness, particularly whatever the unpleasantness they had. For example, in the thing we were using today, hesitating, being wussy. Now, as you took them and slowed time down till it hit critical mass, if you then review it, if you go back and you go, if you remember how it felt as you watch time go by slowly so that you got to spend every moment of every waking day with the client that was the most problem, as you watch and you realize, and then you say, and you remember how bad that felt. 
And you can think about if you want to focus on that over and over again for years to come. No. <laughs> no, please, Richard. I think we should stop here. <laughs> right. Let's see, because we could leave it like that. Or on the other knee, I mean hemisphere. <laughs> I also want to be able to anchor noticing how much better and how much freer life is. So that by the same token, I'm going to go on the other hemisphere and I'm going to say, but you can also think that when you came in and you thought about your problem, it overwhelmed you. When you think about it now and it doesn't, how much freer you are, how much human energy you have, energy that could be used for passion, for orgasms. And if you're looking for passion, orgasms, lust, wealth, and excitement, you have that choice. So that you can either take your attention and you can focus it here, or you can focus it here. Now, which do you want? Where is your attention going to be as you close your eyes now and look out into the future? As you step and look down your timeline, which are you going to take with you? As you walk through each moment and each session, which are you going to find you're doing with your clients? How are you programming their future? What are you getting them to pay attention to? What do you listen and hear in what they say that tells you what you can do with them? Because you get what you give to other people. What are you going to add to the other peoples in your lives? What are you going to comment about your relationships with other people? Are you going to tell them about the parts of their experience that you don't like? Or are you going to tell them what you do like and expand and increase the amount of time and attention that you spend doing that? It's up to you which you want to feel. And notice which you have a tendency to go towards with a compelling and overwhelming sense of direction. Because as you look out your timeline, begin to move one day at a time forward. And each day that you pay attention to this, it will become stronger. And keep moving one day, another day, then a week ahead, and then a month, and then a year. And notice how you can multiply what you pay attention to. Can you feel this would be useful now? Whoopee! <laughs> Ain't nothing like sitting in that chair in the front row. <laughs> That's right. And keep moving forward down that timeline and make a firm and solid commitment. And then what you do is I want you to step away and look at what kind of a future you plan for yourself. Does it glow and glitter around your timeline? Is it a positive future that you're going to have? And then slide back into your present, and as you do so, feel something lock into place, a, a good feeling, perhaps, that you want to keep. And always look to see how much of that good feeling you're getting. And take the most convincing voice in your head and hear it from every direction. Ask the question, how much am I enjoying this? How much pleasure am I finding here? How good is this? How can I make it more fun? And hear it resonate through your head, both sides, and resonate. And every time you begin to miss the point of living, that voice will ask you that question. How much more fun could I be having? How much better can it get? And as you keep that voice in lock in your head, your unconscious mind can and will confirm that you will make this a way of life that you can and will enjoy utterly and completely with a growing sense of wanton anticipation. And as you do so, take a deep breath and begin to feel a good feeling start to spread throughout your body. That's right. Start to tingle all around. Start to light up your life. Start to put wanton fantasies of just what you can do into your mind. So that slowly as you return back to the waking state, that commitment becomes locked firm and solid. And the firmer and solid it's locked, the more you can get to the waking state and the more your body will feel wonderful. Now, that's just a suggestion you will carry out and follow. <laughs> Utterly and completely. <laughs> now, this is the kind of subtle stuff that I'm trying to get you guys to do. Right? It's none of this sitting around and going, and how do you feel about that? You know, I mean, uh, you know, or going into a meeting and going, uh, well, do you see any good prospects for the future? Fuck that. Jam them in their head. 
you know. If I want people work for me to have a positive view of the future, I'm going to take it and put it on a brick and shove it right in their skull so they don't miss it. <laughs> I'm sort of the sledgehammer approach to things. That everything that you do by stacking and reinforcing and putting positive feelings with it, putting positive stuff, begins to build a grid. <laughs> See what I mean, Robert? <laughs> Of course, it really doesn't impact you much, you know. It's the kind of thing you'll forget about in a few minutes. It'll just slip right out of your head. Because as you stop now, Robert, stop and think about, you know, going back and working with a tough client. <laughs> Does it make you want to look at them and go, you're mine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We were just talking about, you know, they wouldn't give me a license to do therapy because I'm not qualified. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. I don't, I didn't take all the right classes in college. You know, I have, t I have, t I have too many physical scientists, science classes to be a therapist. <laughs> not stuff which would be relative and useful in any way, shape, or form. You gonna live, Robert? Yeah. Pleasantly so, no doubt. <laughs> but too much is not enough. I keep telling people that and they won't listen to me. You know? See, you're... you're <laughs> What's good is when you do that with clients, when they come in and they go, well, you know, I just, I just, you know, I got out of hand, I yelled at my kids, I got in a big fight with my husband. And, you know, I feel like I'm just on the edge of divorce. And you go, what a stupid thing to do. You spend every day doing that? It's a lot of work. They don't even pay you for it. You know? Because it, what could you do that would put a smile on his face? Do you remember? Do you remember when you first got together and decided you'd actually like to marry this guy and live with him? Did you intend to make him feel like he hated you? Or did you have other things on your mind? that maybe slipped your mind in the past, but you'll begin to start to remember now just how pleasant those might be. Would you rather be doing those or would you rather be fighting? It's up to you. And I always like it because they always look at my empty hands like that. <laughs> they always do that when I do it this way. I go, it's up to you, choose. They look at one hand, they look at the other like this. Because you can anchor it visually and they, they start looking at the one hand and they kind of do this stuff and I go, well, if you want it, take it. It's yours. Now! <laughs> I love spatial anchoring. See, the thing is, is it's, it's, it's the degree to which at this point, because given all the other stuff we've been layering together, now's the point where you got to kick some shit. Because once you got the changes in people, they have the resources they need. Now you've got to punt them into the future. Because you've got to understand, it's unfamiliar to them. And you've got to make it so that they're now, the thought of going back is like, fuck that. You know, it's not like, oh, I have to avoid it. It's like, fuck that shit, you know. Give me some of that. And you've got to put that in their mind because you've got to switch the focus of their attention to, I'm afraid I'll slip back, to, I don't want to go back. It has to seem like work to do that. I mean, it's like, you know, do you want to go back to the way you were? All I've got to do is fire this anchor. <laughs> See, it was just a demonstration. It really was. It's like, no, don't make me go back. Don't make me be the way I was. See, and what it does is it takes their attention off of it. Instead of being afraid of falling back into old patterns, their old patterns don't seem so good. They also, it makes their old patterns unfamiliar, which is one of the importance of the recode that you did. Since people opt for the familiar, what you want to do is to make it seem what they were doing seemed weird, seem uncomfortable, seem abnormal. Instead of, well, you, you're sure, you're used to it. It's like, when they put, they don't touch my knee, you know? It's like, because it's not like it's, it's not like it's, they'll slip back into it. It's like, then they start thinking, he could really make me do this. And he would, too. I mean, my clients are, you know, I have clients that, they do this shit. They put one knee over the other one. And they go, don't be touching that knee. Now, you finally got me the way I want to be. You just don't, and I go, oh, let me put it back. And they're going, no. And it's not that they, it's that I, they think I can, and they know I would. You know, so I always tell them, look, I'm going to give you two pages of homework. 
of ecstatic things to go out and do. If you do them, then I'll leave it there. If you don't, you know what will happen. <laughs> Did you watch him flinch? That's the test. When you can get a flinch out of a client, say, I'll do anything. Because I like to give them a wealth of experience right out of the gate. I want to give them, you know, a list. Of, and I do. I write out two or three pages. And it doesn't matter what you write. As long as it's stuff. You know, I always tell them, you know, that they have to go out and have fun this way and fun that way and fun this way and be nice to their wife, be nice to their kids and do all these things, which are probably what they'd want to do anyway. But they weren't thinking about doing it because they were too consumed with some petty little bullshit problem. But if they'd rather spend their life thinking about it, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> this is the threaten your client phase, right? This is where, and, and, and it's, not, it's not just a futile stage. It's the part where you behaviorally lock in, making it feel unfamiliar. It's, not, it's no longer easy to go back the way they were. You know, it's, it's not that they just don't want to. It's that it seems like so much trouble to live that way. So by making it unfamiliar. Now, the techniques, in case you didn't notice, involved in this, require, it's out of the meta model, it's called universal quantifier. Only this is behavioral universal quantifier. First you set up diametrically opposed anchors. But you set them up in the context of really analogically doing an induction to make going back the way they were seem like such a pain in the ass. And you literally, since you're, you have people in an altered state, they're in trance, you do a nice trance induction along with it, but you're doing an induction for unpleasantness, you know, about, and then you have to, and whatever it is, then you have to go and find ways around all those elevators, and you have to make all your meetings, you know, and think of every time you step on a flight of stairs where you can take an elevator, a little voice inside your head will go, I'm such a jerk, I'm such a jerk, I'm such a jerk, this is so stupid, I hate doing this, and every step becomes twice as high, twice as bad, right, because the thing is, is this is the point where you re that's what clients do too, you know. They, they start cracking up. And when I can get them to laugh about the stupid way they've been living their life. Can you imagine what I did to this guy about eating lunch at the bottom of his car? <laughs> I want you just to let your fantasy run away with that one, right? I mean, he came in telling me this real sincerely, and I'm going, right. You lay on the floor of your car and eat your lunch. And I thought, I'm going to have a field day with this one. Ooh, in about 40 minutes, this guy's going to be rolling on the floor. He's telling me this with all seriousness now. 40 minutes from now, I'm going to be telling him the same thing, and he's going to be laughing like he'd have to be a jerk to do that. But I mean, I hear those things in the beginning, and I file them away because I know I'm going to slam people right over the head with them later on. And it's not that I just enjoy slamming them, which I have to admit I do. <laughs> That's just a fringe benefit. It's the, it's, it's the fact that I can, by the time I'm done fixing it, so they know they don't have to live that way, when I start insisting that they have to, that if they don't go out and live the rest of their life, then suddenly this is going to slip back. Only now, when they get on the floor of the car, they're going to have to kiss the carpet. They're going to have to eat their lunch off the floorboards. And every bite they take, they're going to go, this is the stupidest thing a human has ever done. And I go, can you hear yourself say that to yourself? No! You know. <laughs> it's like this. Here, you want a sandwich? Have some food. You know, this is the kind of thing that... <laughs> Yum! It's like, you know. As a matter of fact, you know, instead of hanging your coat up when you go to work, you should put your coat at the desk and you go in the closet. You know. And while you're in there and if somebody opens the closet and goes, what are you doing in here? Just tell them you're a jerk. Say, I'm planning to live the rest of my life. In fact, as soon as I retire, I'm going to go ahead and go to the mortuary and get myself a nice little 10 by 10 condo and move in ahead of time. What the hell? I mean, that way at least you won't be afraid of nothing. Except maybe suffocation. Ever felt suffocated? <laughs> Can you feel this? You know? I said, you want to be an agoraphobic? Let's take it to the limits. You know? It's, it's at that point, by being able to exaggerate things to absurdity, what happens is, is, is you're building in, and it, because what happens when they try to engage in the behavior, it doesn't, feel a, it doesn't feel familiar. Now it feels absurd. And this is one of the things about getting people to laugh about what they've been doing. You know, it's like taking a client seriously, feeling their pain, you know. That's, I always go, what are you going to do if a client shoots himself? Have your brains blow out? You know, I mean, I mean, I know people that just about empathize that bad. Their clients get stomach aches, they get stomach aches. 
you know, I'm the kind of client that would go out and eat a handful of jalapenos chilies before I came in to see you. Hi! Ooh! <laughs> that hurts, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, I'd be the kind of client that'd go like this, you know, see if I can beat you up. But, you know, don't move or I'll shoot myself. I mean, that kind of, that kind of way of dealing with clients. So that you can get people, I mean, even in the context we're doing here, it's like, don't use that technique. Who knows? It might work. You might feel good about yourself. You might enjoy life, become enthusiastic. Your whole life might blossom. That'd be the shits, wouldn't it? That by taking that form of exaggeration, where you take things to the limits of absurdity, absolute limits of absurdity, number one, it makes your work a lot more fun. Trust me. Because, <laughs> I mean, when you can get your clients to start to laugh, because one of my goals is not just to get them to laugh, it's a way of making it unfamiliar to them. So it just doesn't fit that they would do it. And I love threatening to make them go back the same way. Because the fact that they know I can do it and that I will, you know, when I look at them, they know. Because if they even hesitate, I'll do it. And I put them back, and then they go, oh, God. But then I can, of course, whack them back the other way. And then I go, now choose. Which state do you want to be in? Because they're doing that anyway in their life, and they don't realize it. By focusing in on how little pain or how much discomfort, or how, how, you know, you ask people, to go, how are things going with your wife? And they go, well, not too bad. I mean, what kind of statement is that? You know, instead of going, well, 90% ecstasy, you know, they're going, well, it's not as bad as it was the week before. Maybe next week will be worse or not as bad. But see, the max, they can, <laughs> what the hell that's about, you know? See, to them, they take nothing too bad down. That's the whole continuum. They don't have good on the continuum. They're taking ground zero and looking to see how bad things are. Whereas if you can focus their attention to see how good things are, pick the best thing. And going back and recoding, looking for just the good moments, if they're too and few, few between, then maybe you don't deserve them. Then I start in on that routine because I go, well, look, you know, you lived for 20 years without a lot of pleasure. There's one of two things. Either it's your turn or you just don't deserve it and we should wipe it out entirely. Which do you think? That's one of the things I love about being able to see. See, because when I see clients, you know, I don't sit at a nice desk. Because the nice thing about, you know, you know how pictures move closer and closer? And when you make people have choice and you start walking at them, when they start moving that one knee away, it's a kind of a decision, you know? You know, if they start sticking up the pain knee, hit it. <laughs> Only amplify it even more and go back and start over again. Because what you want to do is to get them to the point where it just seems absurd and unfamiliar. Because what you're trying to do is to switch the perceptual grid by using the fluctuation of going back, going forward, going back, going forward. And by doing that oscillation between those two, what happens is, is you're trying to create making their old state unfamiliar. You're trying to, so when you have them go back, you're cracking jokes about it, about how stupidity, how ludicrous it is. But you must want it because you've lived that way. And probably it was best for you. you all clients know it's best for them, right? And since you were fucked up for years, you should say, I've fucked up four years more. This is where you begin to throw the logic they threw at you. Because they go, well, you know, I don't know if anybody can help me. And I've been this way for years, so I'll probably be this way forever. When you throw it back at them at the end of the session, they're going, no, it doesn't mean that. Don't hurt me. <laughs> because what you're trying to do is really switch now at this point their perceptual grid. And the kind of trance that I did with him. And then after the trance, then I do it behaviorally. Because you also want to remember things are state conditioned. We want to pull it into the land of a different kind of absurdity. You want to take them all the way down, bring them all the way up, and then exhilarate them all with a forward focus. Because this means as they go back into their life and begin to fluctuate through states, it's still all going to be aimed forward. It's a kind of reframing that has to be done in multiple states. Uh, I was speaking to somebody earlier, and he's got a client. He fixed an agoraphobic, but uh, they're still hooked on Xanax. And it's a drug. It's a good drug, too, by the way. For those of you who ever feel bad, take a Xanax. You feel great. Right? And then after that, all you have to do is do drug of choice. It's cheaper. Um, but the thing is, is like the person is afraid that if they stop taking Xanax, they'll go back into agoraphobia. Now, it's possible that that will actually happen because he fixed her on the drug. So as you begin to decrease the, the drug, see, like what I told him to do is I said, go in and fix her once more. Right? Only this time, tape it and then have her decrease, decrease the dosage and listen to the tape over and over again. Now, that's kind of a one way of doing it. And when you do it with drugs, it's something that's just time expedient to do it that way. But when you're dealing with the kind of stuff we're dealing with, one of the things you want to do is to make sure you do things through multiple states. 
through states where, you know, because, I mean, sure, you come to work tired, so you want to trance them out and talk about how heavy things are, create that negative anchor, and then juxtapose it with the strong anchor. This is why I'm building a scale, and I'm going to flop it back and forth, aim it as a choice, and make this stuff going backwards seem real stupid and real unfamiliar. Because I'm trying to create now more than just with the technology, but behaviorally, the set of submodalities that constitutes that just ain't me anymore. And you know that there are things that happened, when you, things that you believed and did when you were a teenager that you cannot believe you did. You know it was you now intellectually, but you can't believe that you really did those things. You guys remember being a teenager? Right? Some of the things like, you know, I mean, you remember when you were a teenager, you were saying things like, well, I'll never have sex if I'm unmarried. <laughs> right? Unless you're given a chance. <laughs> yeah. You sure won't be 40 and divorced saying that, I'll tell you that. You know, it sort of changes your attitude. When you think that you really believed that then, you know it was you, and you know maybe it made sense then, but it sure don't feel like you. It feels unfamiliar. It wouldn't be familiar to pop back into that way of being. Some of us, when we were teenagers, thought we were immortal. We thought we could make cars fly and couldn't get hurt. Stuff like that, right? When you think about it now, you go, eh, I don't think I want to try that, you know. It's like, you know, you can get back in the old car, but that foot don't go to the metal like it used to with wanda abandonment. But, of course, you end up with more body parts that way, at least I do. I have my share of pins, you know, pin in my knee and a few plastic joints and stuff. Those, you know, and the thing, you know, the thing they don't tell you about when you're a teenager, I found out one of the ways of working with teenagers is I do time distortion into the future. I have them wake up and get out of bed and have that knee hurt, that old bruise ache, and stand up and hear their bones crack because they did stupid shit when they were a teenager. So, because I know, because I have those experiences. You have to get up in the morning and make your leg work, right? It takes you 15 minutes to get your leg to work in the morning because you did this stupid <laughs> shit when you were a teenager. You know, it'd be one thing if you just broke it and it got fixed. But it doesn't work that way. It hurts forever, right? It's like your body's way of saying, <laughs> you know, you know. It's like, don't ever try that shit again. Now, the it's thing is, is you want. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> I can tell that some of us in here know exactly what I'm talking about, to more or less degrees. The thing is, is that you want to build the same kind of thing in now. There's an exercise, I don't know if we did it in the workshops you were in, where you literally go and find something, and you go and you find the submodalities of something that was like that, and you put things in it so it doesn't seem like you anymore. Well, that's all well and nice. You can do that during the session. But what I'm talking about is where, it, where they have no choice but to put it in those submodalities, but at every level, consciously, unconsciously, and with every fiber of their soul. And you don't get that by having people go inside and look at submodalities and do subtle changes. You get that through wanted and unadulterated output, where it is high-intensity drama. That the kind of thing that I was doing with Robert here by way of demonstration was to show you that you can affect every fiber of a person and bring it through various states. So that it doesn't just happen in trance, it happens through trance and all the way out to the highest exhilarated state so that when you move towards them, they flinch, you know. And it's all about, are you going to look there or are you going to look forward? Now, of course, if you're real sneaky about this, the one thing that you do is that you make it so that which knee do you anchor on? See, you want to make it so that the past, the one they're pulling away from, right, if they look at that direction, they're looking into the future. And if they look in the other direction, it fires off the anchor for the future. Sneaky, huh? Come again. <laughs> Think about which, anchor I, which knee I anchored on. Remember, I tell you guys, I'm a tricky, sneaky devil. Right? And I think about what I'm doing. I am methodical. Okay, that, in other words, if somebody's timeline, if the future is going out this way, right? Okay, I anchor the negative shit over here, right? So that if they do look this way, they are looking into the future. The positive stuff about the future I anchor over here so that if they, they look this way, they go into the future. And if they avoid this, they go into the future. So that they're stuck in the future no matter what. Because that's where I want it. They either go for the positive future responses or they go for the positive future responses. Which is it going to be? Choose. Right? Now, being able to set things up at every level with presuppositions, with language patterns, with your tonality, with everything, thing, so that I start out creating a dichotomy of are you going to go back or are you going to go forward? Right? Ends up being are you going to go forward or are you going to go forward? 
Because if you're going back, when they look back, it doesn't seem like them. It seems so stupid, all they can do is laugh. I mean, think about going back, Robert. Think about going back and interacting with a client identically the same way, the same kind of context. Well, just no, do it anyway. Just go ahead and, and go ahead and run, go ahead and run through it. You know, imagine in, what? Well, it, it doesn't feel good. Does it? Doesn't feel familiar. Felt familiar this morning. I'm sure. Just go ahead and do it anyway. Or I'll or I'll make it go back the way it was. <laughs> Do you want to live that way or do you want to do it once? <laughs> See, do you notice how I keep compressing it? And I do this with, I have clients that throw their hands up and just go, leave me alone! Don't, you know, because the thing is, is I keep making it. I keep forcing it because it's a metaphor for the real choice. Because that is what's going to happen. They are going to go back and live the same way. But if I could keep focusing it and exaggerating it into instances, to the point where they slam their attention forward and it seems like ridiculous. Why would I do that? You'd have to be an idiot to live that way. I mean, I've had clients say that to me and I go, yeah, you would, wouldn't you? And they go, yeah, I know I live that way, but I'm not going to do it anymore. And I go, want to bet? You know, and, and the thing, and then when the hand comes out, they go, no, not unless you make me. You know, this is the kind of thing that you want where they know that they've cut loose of it. Because this is where you want to disassociate people from the familiarness, the kinesthetics that allow them to easily slip back into the old way of being. Just a suggestion, mind you. With that in mind, we'll stop for today. <laughs>
A lot of them go not because they want to train people in NLP, but they're really there for the platform skills, which is uh, what I consider to, this is, where, this is where you really put people to the litmus test, is, is to have me in the audience. <laughs> well, I figure I should provide them all the worst experiences imaginable, so it will be all downhill from there. And since I've taught as much as I have, I know every cruel thing you can do to a trainer. But when they do their first thing, when they first get up, I have them get up with me. And we do a little thing where I teach them tempo and tonality and stuff. But some of them are so frightened, they can't speak. And, and so you have to do something with their fears. And I, and I started asking last year some of the people, like, what do they do when they think about an audience? And uh, they would do things like the, the night before, they knew they had to talk. And so they go, well, last night, you know, I got... You know, I worked myself into a frenzy. When, and whenever somebody says somebody like that, I know you're headed for high comedy. And the, I mean, this is one of the things about disassociating and not identifying with your clients, as, is because until they can find what they do silly, they're going to keep doing it. And I mean, it's not until when they're describing it to you, they almost hit embarrassment. In fact, typically, I like to embarrass them once and anchor it. Because one of the things about about being embarrassed is it is one of the forms of unfamiliarness that allows people to escape the traditional ways that they act. Because it's, it's, you know, it's, some people can go up and be terribly nervous in front of an audience because it's familiar. But it's not so much the audience part that you want. It's, you want them, you want it to be unfamiliar for them to work themselves into the frenzy. I mean, one of the people there, I, I love this, as they laid down before they went to sleep the night before, they started by saying, okay, I have to get some sleep or I'll make a fool of myself tomorrow. You know, and I don't want to be nervous tomorrow. Right? Now, if you think about the hypnagogic state that you go into just before you drop off to sleep, it's a little bit like the trances you were in yesterday, isn't it? Right? Now, so if you go into a mild trance and start giving yourself post-hypnotic suggestions that, you know, that you're going to be nervous and you're going, you know, and you can phrase them as negation, but this person, I love what they did, as they would do it, they would picture themselves on the very stage that they were going to work on, right, freezing up, beads of sweat stepping off of them. Then they'd step inside the image and feel how bad that would be and say to themselves, don't do this. Now, uh, I don't know about you guys, but this doesn't strike me as the approach that we want people to do. I mean, for me, the thing I'm trying to do is to get people to step into the future in a way that adds resources. That as they, you know, as people concentrate on being more ferocious and concentrate on paying attention to the sensory cues on the outside. Because most of the fears, the anxieties, and the things happen are where when people get into a situation, they go internal instead of external. So to add to the dimension, because I want to go back to what we didn't finish up yesterday is by juxtaposing you know, good choices in the future or going back and having it be excruciatingly unfamiliar and also ridiculous. And I mean, to me, part of the reason I want to take things to extreme to, to the point where I can get my clients laughing is because I also want to stack on top of the unpleasant anchor ludicrousness. I mean, so I mean, when even with clients, like I, I saw this marvelous couple in, down in, in Orlando and uh, they, they, their thing was is that they had a good marriage and that they were mostly happy except when they fought. And, and I asked them, I said, well, how much time do you spend fighting? Because if you only do it once every three years, you know, it's really not that bad, you know, just when it starts, leave for a day or something, you know. And they said, well, no, we, we, fight, every, we fight every day at breakfast, but we don't fight in the evening. And I said, maybe you guys shouldn't have breakfast. Maybe you're a little cranky in the morning. <laughs> And they said, no, 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 because we get up earlier. It's just that when we sit at the breakfast table. And literally, they had, they had if they, and they ate dinner at a different table, right? Because I, th <laughs> so I told them to have breakfast at the other table. Throw that table away. <laughs> said it must be the table's fault. But, but actually what they did at the beginning of the day, they, they, they both had a thing, that, and they both did it, too. And I don't know how they programmed each other to do this, and it doesn't matter. But they got up, when they sat down at breakfast, they would make pictures of all the things that the other one didn't do that they had talked about doing. And then they'd, they'd start to fight about it, and then they'd make promises that they didn't mean to keep to each other just to get the other one to shut up, right? Which, of course, then fed into the next day. It's kind of a nice recursive sort of loop. 
uh, if you want to get up in the morning and torture your mate anyway. Me, I, do, I don't think fighting in the morning is a good idea. But it does kind of wake you up a little bit, get the blood moving. <laughs> but I typically, if I'm going to argue with people, like to pick strangers just randomly on the street, go yell at them. You know, that way I don't have to ever see them again. I always thank them after. Oh, thank you very much. I feel better now. <laughs> they go, what was that about? And, Never mind. It's none of your business. <laughs> but you were yelling at me. It has nothing to do with you. You were just the lucky one this morning. Now, one of the things that I'd like to do is, is, is I'd like you to think in terms of exaggeration. That when you take things to extremes, that you're really trying to build for yourself the, the two anchors that you want to establish here. You want an anchor that goes, that goes past. And again, it's going to amplify. I forget how to spell this. I don't spell in the morning. My, pi my pictures are too clear and bright. It hurts my eyes. Go in and look at those bright words. I think I should switch to a black background, don't you? That would be easier. Of course, then it might be too dark. To go in there, I'll fall back asleep. Just pull the shades down over the letters, and off you go. Now, on the other side, again, you want to be able to hook this with the future. And one of the things that I find useful is paying attention to how somebody's timeline is organized. Because people who have the future straight out in front of them and the past in the back, one of the things that I have a tendency to do is to anchor them on the shoulder with the, pa with the positive thumb. I'll, I'll have a tendency to move up and anchor them like this so that as they look over their shoulder, they get the future good stuff. So that that, again, I reverse so that the future is, is in there. And then if they look into the future, they get the good stuff or they look and they see the past. Because especially with people that have their past behind them, these are people who have a tendency to repeat mistakes. When it, whenever people put the past where they can't see it very well, they have to turn around and look at it or pull things out with great difficulty, one of the things that you want to be able to do is to take the past anchor and to be able to put it wherever the future is so that they would look at it. With some people, if it goes straight out, you have to anchor them here. And I will. I mean, I'll literally walk up and make an anchor like that. It's as plain as the nose on your face. See what I mean? So that if they have a tendency to go into the past behavior, it has them look at the future on their timeline so that you can orient them that way. Now, the, the one thing that I'd like you to do, because I'd like you to go back with your partner, and we'll just do this one little ending piece here before we move on to other ludicrous and strange things, is that at this point, one of the things is, is I don't know how much content you have about what you're doing, but you have, given that we did similar things, you should have enough content that you can begin to exaggerate. Now, there, there's a, another form of sliding anchor that I want you to learn to form. That not only do you anchor on them kinesthetically as you go back into the past thing, but you're doing your amplification with volume of your voice and with pitch in your voice. So that as you become louder and as the pitch of your voice goes higher with the negative anchor, right? And, and, and the same thing with the positive anchor. It's like, you know, do you really want to enjoy yourself and have a good time? Nah, probably not. You'd rather feel this. And it <laughs> not yet, Robert, I'll tell you when. It's like, OK, unconscious mind's ready. Put him in trance. <laughs> it's too early. You have to stay in the waking state in the morning just for a while. <laughs> I'll let you know when. <laughs> That as you, as you do it, now, you also want to be able to give yourself some movement room. That a lot of people get stuck in their chair, especially in their office. I don't, it's like somebody put that, you know, super glue in their chair. They figure they can't move. You want to be able to move because you want to think in terms of the submodalities that you elicited earlier. Remember when you were eliciting uh, the submodalities from your partner of all these different things we've been working with? Did you notice that there are certain things like distance that are powerful variables? Now, the thing is, is that if you think about, in your mind, just kind of scan over the stuff that you elicited yesterday from them, things about size, distance, volume, pressure, all the different submodalities, inside there, there'll be ones that are really kind of kickers. And one of the ones I find that's commonly a kicker with most people, of course, is distance. So one of the things I do is I watch where they focus their eyes. When I have them think about I go, well, now, when you think about going back and doing it just the way you did it before, you remember what it was like. Think about it for a minute. I, w I go, and I watch where they focus their eyes. 
in space. If you watch where eyes look, you can tell if I'm looking at the wall, if I'm looking here in space, or if I'm looking really close. You can tell by head tilt, you can tell by where the eyes. As soon as I notice where they put it, right, now I have the ability to amplify it, right? Because as soon as they look there, I anchor it with my hand, spatially, right? So as I, as I move away from that space, I cup my hand back, and as I move up, I open it up. Whenever you want to create a flat surface, you cup your hand round, and you come up and move away from it. When you want a curved surface, you start with your hand flat. What? Again. Well, if you want a curved surface, if you want to create in space a curved surface, you do it with, you do it with difference. You start with a flat hand, and you make a curved surface. So if we're talking with pictures that are flat, right, as, you know, as opposed to a cattle shock, shocker, that to create this, to, <laughs> it's a little motivation there, <laughs> paying attention clearly this time. <laughs> it's, it's just an anchor, that's all. Well, see, the thing is, is that, see, for me, that part, that when you're communicating with somebody, you know, that a lot of people get lost in the words. They don't realize your behavior. Everything you do is an anchor. And that, to me, that part of the reason of understanding submodalities is not just so you can talk the client to death with them, but so that you can utilize them. And part of that requires that, well, it is. I mean, you know, some people are all theory, no practice. Believe me. Uh, I, heard, I heard a tape on submodalities that I, I won't name the trainer, but that this trainer made, who has, as far as I know, never taken a course from me, and, never, and as far as I know, never taken a course from you guys. And their understanding of submodalities for example, they didn't have any kinesthetic submodalities, uh, which, given my memory of them, fits. Uh, <laughs> and in fact, their description of the submodalities, if you listen to the description, it was a description of this guy. But he assumed that, of course, everybody had that submodalities the same way he is. For example, when he was talking about uh, things on the tape, he was talking about things you believe strongly, and the picture is big and bright and right in front of your face to the point where you can barely see it. And that's, that's, of course, this is true for everyone. This is where, because, see, according to him, submodalities were fixed. There were certain universals. Like, now, if you think about your beliefs being in front of you and you can't see them, that pretty much sums this guy up in a nutshell. <laughs> that's it. If you're going to believe something, it's good that you don't know what it is. Or at least it's kind of blurry and too close to you. But, see, the thing is, is because when you lock up a negative feeling, right, and you want to begin to amplify it as you talk about now, you know, next time you're with a client, of course, you want to go back to the old way you were. And, you know, only you want it to feel a lot worse. You know, see what I mean? <laughs> and the thing is, is even as you grab a hold of a picture and move it, you take your tone of voice and you create a sliding anchor with your tone. Because that way you can keep repeating it over and over. So that as you want to build strain about going back to the way it was, because you want it to be a strain to go back to old behavior. Remember, people opt to go back to old behavior because it's familiar. So if you can make it strenuous, to have, okay, I'll go back and, you know, it's the thing at the end of the session where you tell people, now, try and go back and feel the way that you did before. And they go, but I don't want to feel that way. And you go, do it anyway. You know, and they go, oh, okay, I guess I can try and go back and have those feelings. Whereas 15 minutes before, they had no alternative but to feel that way. So as you grab a hold of something like this, and you go, you can feel that way. As you make your tone of voice sound that way, then all you have to do is repeat the tone. And you go, now, you can, because you know how good it felt to be free of it, don't you? Right? Ah, zzz. And see, so you actually create tone anchors. But by the same token, you notice where that picture is. Now, the thing is, is because you can literally, without saying anything to a client, because, you know, if you want your picture to be bright, you know, you can make them bigger. And I mean, literally, I go, you know, do you want more of this in your life? <laughs> yes, so, huh? <laughs> now, this is the kind of thing that, that literally, you don't have to say make your picture bigger. Make it bigger, right? You know where it is if you, if you say, and think about how this good choice is going to be, and they focus their eyes right here and go, there we go. <laughs> how does that feel? <laughs> you know, now, you can either be happy or you can be stuck. What's it going to be? You know? Now, as you use your tone of voice to create it, to make it more difficult, as you exaggerate, take the content, you know, because you can, you, and go back to the exercise, because you remember where, because, where, you know, with the, the client, you didn't like how you got to have lunch with them. 
have them wait on you at the bank. You remember how it was like, because that's really, that's really how you want to live life, isn't it? Take a look at it. You want to feel that way? Or on the other hand, perhaps you might look at things differently. Now, because as you create, because remember, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to go back and forth. Now, you don't want to collapse these anchors. Every time you go back and forth, you want to exaggerate each one. Then, as soon as you can get, because what you want to do is to get the powerful one, the strong one, to be the basis of going into the future, right? Now, again, kinesthetically, instead of just having them shut their eyes, we're trying to integrate this into conscious experience now. Now we're trying to get a hold of these things, this positive picture, and show somebody how much better it can be, right? So that they'll learn to live this way always. <laughs> And feel this would be useful. <laughs> now, whew, right. Now, that, that's one of the things that you can't do sitting down calmly with your hands folded over your lap. You like it. You'll know you're getting places with clients when they start doing what Robert did yesterday and what you just did when they go, whew, right. This is a good response. This is where we know that they're invigorated because to me, they're invigorated and they're not just in a deep trance. We've gone through the deep trance phase. Now we're starting, to, we're starting to really alter the conscious and unconscious things and get them aligned. Because one of the things that I try to emphasize is, is I don't want conflict. I don't want parts. I want a lined up person. I want everything going in the same direction. I don't want ecology. I want something good. You know, ecology is like peace between warring neighbors, right? Submodalities has ecology built into it in the sense that it eliminates parts. It takes the entire concept of anthropomorphism, because parts is anthropomorphized. It gets too spooky. I mean, you can take somebody and hypnotize them and make them a multiple personality. But just short of that is the reframing model. We're trying to make our work better now, which is the sense that what we do is we get the conscious and unconscious processes lined up to go in the same direction, to head towards having a positive future. Now, as you oscillate back and forth between this kind of activity and this kind of activity, listen to my tone of voice using different tones. Now, we want to switch now from this point to not only using the visual components we know about, but from switching to using my auditory to using her internal auditory, right? You know, I mean, you know, we want to begin to, we want to, begin to hear trumpets going off when she thinks about doing it, when she looks at a client, right? We want her to look at the client that comes in that would have been a problem. Again, always stack presuppositions in your language. Use your language so that it works for you. Right? Listen to your self-talk. Don't plan what you're going to say. Listen to the words as they come out of your mouth. Because if you say something and you afterwards you go, ooh, that wasn't good, keep talking. Right? Because you can always turn it around. That's one of the nice things about scope ambiguity. Now. Isn't it useful? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what he meant. Does it become clearer and clearer and clearing up now? Isn't that useful to have left behind you or to move into the future? Tense. <laughs> er, as you look into the past, <laughs> now, the next thing we want to do is to have her stop and think about, because as you look at that client, what you want to begin to do is to hear trumpets behind you, or your own voice saying, go get them, right? Either that or you want a whiny little snivelly voice that comes swooping up from right here that goes, you don't have to do this. You can have lunch and dinner with them. In fact, you can marry them. <laughs> think about it. Can you feel this? Good. Now, of course, it's up to you. I mean, you know, you can either marry them and be miserable for years and have a little whiny voice. In fact, it can start to sound like a dental drill. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's right. Or you can get the big picture about having fun with it, enjoyment, and hear those trumpets coming from behind you. Da 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 da, here I come, rock and roll. Life can be good, your ass is mine. All of those things coming inside of your head, so when you look at clients, zzz, you broaden your horizon, so to speak, and the sound gets louder and louder till it begins to send shivers of pleasure that start from right here. Can you feel this? 
would be useful in the future every time you encounter somebody like that. Or on the other hand, you could just feel your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, again, I like to use subtle examples for these things. <laughs> I like to rummage through my... See, this way, you know, you get to rummage through all of the weird experiences you had in your life and do them to people for their own good. <laughs> Any sound that's ever given you the shivers now becomes a resource for others. <laughs> See, I catalog these things, you know. As I drive down the road, as when I do it, I look over and I go, the dentist office. Ooh. Right. <laughs> Write that one down, you know. Think about things like, you know that little sound a needle makes when you, when they, just before they zap you with stuff, where they squirt the stuff out of the top of it, right? Get my point? <laughs> She's sitting behind her. I'm getting her as good as, you should see that the camera was going in this direction. I got a line moving this way. <laughs> That's right. Okay, now, what I want you to do is I want you to get your partner. And this is the point where, again, when you go into state, when you do NLP, you don't just go into one. For me, there are phases of what you're doing. And when I'm getting to the point where I'm doing things in the integration, I go out of that, you know, I'm just going to kick your ass phase into, into I'm going to tickle every nerve in your body. I'm going to have some fun. Because now it's time. You've gotten to the point where somebody has a sense of humor, right? You know, when you, know, when you ask somebody, you go, well, are you going to go back and be a wimp? What's it going to be? We see which way she looks. That's how you test your work. You go, because it could be this. <laughs> Embed everything you can, right? It's, it's like, because you want to make it so that when she even thinks, because before doing that behavior was normal to her, but now you want it to be a threat, right? You know, you want it like, you want it if she even looks over at that and even considers that as an alternative. So when the client comes in and starts to generate that behavior, instead of going into a want and fun NLT place, her teeth will hurt. <laughs> Can you feel this coming? Of course, it's your future, your teeth. Which is it going to be? <sighs> That's the kind of response you're looking for, because you're, you're looking for taking the natural processes. People are not just moving away, people are moving towards, they do both. You move away from something and towards something else. And you want them moving away from their past and towards the future. Doesn't that make sense? You know how many people have organized their life so they're moving away from the future? I mean, consider the clients you get in. How many of them immediately, as soon as you ask a question, go to the past? I mean, I get this all the time. I mean, somebody walks in and I go, I go, what's your problem? And they go, well, when I was five years old. And I go, well, how old are you? And they go, well, 47. And I go, then what the hell are you sniveling about when you were five years old? And they go, well, that's what makes me the way I am now. And I go, well, you wore diapers when you were two. You don't wear diapers now, do you? And they go, well, well that's not the same thing. And I go, want to bet? <laughs> if you're going to snivel about this, you're going to find yourself out in public in diapers. Wouldn't that be embarrassing? <laughs> and when they get embarrassed, I anchor it. And I go, now, tell me about being five, and whack, slam off the anchor. Because I want them to feel, you know, that, it, that sniveling about when they were a child is as embarrassing as walking out in diapers. I mean, to me, I don't want them to feel like they want to go into the past. I want it to feel unfamiliar. I want it to feel strange. I want them to head towards the future. Because your past doesn't make you who you are. It is the basis of who you are. It doesn't control just because you were beaten up as a child doesn't mean you have to be a sniveling now. But it's all you learned. But it's not what happens to you, it's what you make out of it. Some people who were beaten up as childs become real badass motherfuckers. And some become afraid of everything, afraid of their own shadow, you know, and everything in between. So the trick is, is to go back and take your past and make a new future one that pleases you, one that you can do something with, one that's more ferocious. Now, for yourself right now, it's like the thing that you need to do as preparation, because whenever you're doing NLP, you're not only working with other people, you're using yourself like an instrument. And you've got to, you've got to keep track of your state, not all the time, but from time to time, 
as you move into a new behavior, like, you know, when you're ready for the, because this is the phase at which I stand up. It's when clients know I'm going to kick their ass real bad. And you kind of, I've had clients that I've seen like once, you know, and then maybe three or four years later, I've seen them again. And so they get to the point where when I stand up, they wince already. You know, they cover their knees, stuff like this. I go, that won't help, you know. They go, I know, please. Hurry up, get it over with. Make me feel good, and then bad, and then good, and then bad. I promise I'll never feel bad again if you do this. <laughs> All right, if you promise to live in a state of ecstasy, I'll leave you alone, but otherwise I won't. What's it going to be? Which one? How do you want to live? <laughs> I don't know. Well, guess! <laughs> See, I know where these ministers got this stuff about slapping people on the head. Because when you can grab a hold of a picture and go, feel this, whack, you know. It's a religious experience, isn't it? <laughs> hey, they were out there. One guy was sitting by there, and he started looking at the pictures in his head. And he went, if I took one of those and smacked somebody in the head with it, they'd see God right now. <laughs> they go, see Jesus? Put Jesus up here. Can you see him? Whack, you know. <laughs> Holy God, you feel Jesus now? Praise the Lord. But I'm Jewish. <laughs> Does that mean I have to get killed? <laughs> well, now that you have your sense of humor about you, lock on to that feeling. Because your sense of humor is what's going to make it so you can do this. You must take as a presupposition that what they have been doing in their life is absurd. If it is not bringing them wealth, ecstasy, and happiness all at the same time, it's got to be pretty absurd. You know, I mean, cer certainly, if they're, if they're continuing to do it after it's over. I mean, I know people that, I know people that, that, that had a bad marriage, right? But it was over 10 years ago, right? But they're still in it. They're still, the other person is gone, so they're having the arguments in their head without the other person. Think about it. Is that not stupid? Right? Now, you can think of that as, as too bad, or you can think of that as totally ludicrous, right? I mean, as if once wasn't bad enough, they're going to do it without the person. And I mean, right down to the thing where if somebody is, is raped, right, and after it's over with, every night they get themselves raped again. Now, when they, it's, it's a bad thing, but if you can use, like, three-play disassociation to remove the bad feeling, you know, get a little amnesia, for them to continue to do it, and I mean, if they can get to the point where they, can, where they can understand that the other person isn't doing it every night, now they are. That's when they get to run their own brain. Instead of, instead of sit, sitting around having wonderful sexual fantasies about how they could have better things in the future than some idiot jumping them in an alley, instead they're jumping themselves in an alley every night, which is not the foundation of, for a future good love life. You know, I mean, before you go out on a date with a guy, you imagine getting raped in an alley. I mean, that'll give you a good evening, huh? You'll walk up to him and say something real sexy like, fuck you, you know? I mean, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's not useful. I mean, it's too bad bad stuff happens to us. But, but it's, even, it's even more too bad and even more ludicrous that we continue to do it to ourselves. To set people free from, uh, you know, I mean, some people have one unpleasant experience and center their life around it, you know? And I mean, to me, you know, at least, you know, they should take one wonderful experience and center their life around it. It's like, what would you rather have? Would you rather feel good or would you rather feel bad? Which do you want? <laughs> you know, and when you begin to treat clients that way, they, what you're doing is, is, is focusing for them what's really going on. And one of the things is, is, as much as I've heard therapists for years talk about honesty, they're the most dishonest people I've ever met. They talk about taking risks. They're the worst risk takers I've ever seen. Because when it comes to telling clients stuff, in order to tell them, I mean, you know, to tell them that what they're doing is dumb, stop it. Now, it's not enough to just say it, but even if you say it, you can then begin to get the, the idea of what it takes for people to focus in on it. Because if you can dissipate overwhelming bad feelings, right, and then go, look, we can make them overwhelming again. You did it once before. We can make them go back. We can make it, we can make it so that it feels just like sitting in a dental chair. I mean, and I mean, right down to when that drill hits the nerve, you know? That sound that it makes inside your head where the jawbones start to pop, 
and stuff. You get that little trembling up your cheeks, right? Because when you see those clients coming in, you know, and you start to go back into those old behaviors, it's right, suddenly you'll begin to feel that on the side of your cheekbones. And you go, I could live this way. But if I do it with one client, I have to live this way my whole life. <laughs> all day, all night. I have to find somebody just like this and marry them. Or, <laughs> on the other hemisphere, perhaps you could see a bigger picture. That you could begin to look at things in a way that gave you other choices, so to speak. But I don't know. It's up to you. Or, you know, you could just oscillate back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Stay confused, stay confused. But if you do that, then this comes closer and closer. <laughs> Depends upon which one you want. <laughs> now, I love visual anchors. Visual anchors are really fun. They, they give you the opportunity to now really throw the ball in the client's court. See, once you give people the resources, then you also got to tell them, it doesn't happen to them. Too many people think that they come in and they go, hypnotize me and change me. And I just go, no, that's too easy. You don't deserve that. I said, you have to earn that from me. You have to go out and kick the shit out of your own problem first. I'll give you the basis to do it, but you've got to actively participate in your own life. One of the reasons that, even though I do do it to them, I won't tell them I did. I won't give them the satisfaction of knowing because I still want them above and beyond whatever change they make to get actively involved in their own life, actively involved in running their own brain. I mean, if you think about the degree to which people don't, the, the reason they want you to come in and just hypnotize me and make the problem go away is because that's what's, the reason the problem is there is because it mysteriously has been controlling their life. And the, the missing piece is their active participation, right? You know, people tell me, well, you know, I want to stop getting angry all the time, you know, and I go, yeah, well, stop it. And they go, well, it's not me doing it. I just get angry. And when as soon as you hear that word just, you know, you're at the limits of the fudge factor. You're about, you're about to hear the fudge factor and the finagle phenomenon par excellence. And what are they fudging out of and what they're finagling out of is participation in their own life. You know, it's like, uh, you know, I wasn't myself. I lost my temper. Massive disassociation. It's the same thing we talked about yesterday when uh, Michael was talking about the stuff with people taking, with that their drug experiences or their alcohol experiences don't count. It's not a part of their life. They don't think, I'm a person who drank too much and beat up my wife. They'll literally say, it was the booze talking. Have you ever heard somebody say that? What a stupid statement. Booze doesn't talk. Except sometimes. <laughs> Calls out to you out of the bottle. And goes, Richard, I'm in here. I need to get out. But other than that, <laughs> now, but when you start, you know, but when you start taking a client like that, when you get them to this point, and you go, like you can feel it. Next time the booze is in your your in your veins, you'll hear it screaming, but it'll be muffled because veins are small. It'll be going, hit her, hit her, hit her, hit her. Right, and you can feel it coming up your arm. It'll go, hit her, hit her, hit her, hit her. But of course, why do you do it up their arm that way? You've got to think every moment while you do this, because it's moving away from the hand. But you don't want him to hit her, right? If it's going to hit anything, you get up to here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I figure, I figure when I'm working with people, I get to do what I want. And see, the thing is, is that as you begin to take this extreme behavior of disassociation, it's the booze talking. This is why in the beginning of sessions, I really perk up my ears for the stupid things that people say, because I'm going to save them. I always want to use them right away. It's my tendency to just want to shove it down their throat. But I know how much more fun I'm going to have if I wait, right? Because if I take the really dumb things that people say, well, like it was the booze talking, those great little idiomatic statements, save them to the end, you know, then, I mean, literally, you know, you can go, you, know, you see the bottle here, and it's screaming out of the bottle, drink me. But, of course, if it does, then you'll shrink. And you know where, too. <laughs> <laughs> Booze, sex. Booze, sex. It's up to you. Choose. <laughs> <laughs> hey, push it to the limits, man. Go for the throat at this point. Because this is exactly what's going on in their life. 
they are choosing, and you want it to become a magnanimous choice, one that's fairly obvious which direction they're going to go in, a positive future or a shitty future. What's it going to be? But that's what it boils down to. Now, by creating such massive things, the nice way, thing that you're doing is it's, you're not creating a polarity. You're not separating out parts. You are putting them in the position of making a decision about their life. These are two processes that they do, not two different things doing two different things. It forces association. It, in essence, takes both behaviors and rams them into the same bottle, so to speak. So that what happens is, is they are in the position of choosing which one they are going to do at any moment in time. But it's all them actively doing it and actively choosing. Now, the thing about submodalities, if you remember before anybody taught you about it, you were doing it, weren't you? It's like, but when somebody said, well, some of these pictures are bigger than other ones. Some are on the right, some is on the left. And you went, damn, look at that. Said, so pick a strong belief, and you went, pick a weak belief, and you went like this, and you went, shit, man, what is over there and what is over there? Ain't that weird? Right? But you were doing it anyway. Now, the thing is, 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 is since you're doing it either as out of consciousness or, or whatever, the fact is, is that your clients are participating in their life, but just like, you know, all this stuff is going on and the voices and stuff, they don't, they, even though it's sorted out to keep it separate, they don't know how it's sorted, right? And, of course, if they don't know how it's sorted, when they're making decisions that drive them back into old behaviors, right? I mean, think about it. If you have automatic access in queue, if you talk to yourself and a certain bad decision is automatically there, you don't have the choice of pushing it away. The lady on the Marshall University tapes, I mean, you know, making pictures of people <laughs> getting in accidents and their bones sticking out through the skin. And the later and later they were for an appointment, the bigger these pictures got and the closer they got. Now, that's pretty stupid. You know, I mean, if you're going to wait for somebody, I mean, there's no reason to sit and scare the shit out of yourself. But she had learned to do this, and she wasn't totally cognizant. Even though she did it, it wasn't an active process that she participated in. It happened to her. It was, it was just an automatic loop that had been built. Now, once I got her to actively participate in it, then, of course, I turn around and start ramming it down her throat. I go, go ahead, scare the shit out of yourself. And she goes, well, I don't want to. And I go, we'll do it anyway, right? Because this is what makes it so that she is doing it. I don't want it to disappear mysteriously as much as it did anyway. You know, she sat around. She thought about scaring herself, but she fell asleep. <laughs> People are late. You go unconscious. It's a better choice than scaring the hell out of yourself. She got tired of having to go through all the mental processes that wore her out, so she went to sleep. So better, you know, if you're tired, that's the best thing to do. I mean, you know, some people lay a bit, like insomniacs, I love them. They, they lay in bed at night and scare themselves about whether they'll be able to sleep or not. They go, well, I'm probably not going to be able to sleep. I'll stay up and I'll, then I'll be too tired in the morning, right? It's a great per suggestion to give yourself. You stay awake all night and be too tired in the morning. That way you get, you get tired all day and awake all night, right? Now seems to me there's a simple cure. Sleep all day and stay up all night. <laughs> Works for me. <laughs> okay, what I want you to do is now go get your partner. Remember to put yourself in the state. Go back and remember times where you had a good sense of humor and times where you were ferociously lively. You know, go back to the party days, right? <laughs> get into that attitude. Remember, as you talk to somebody, you're using your tone and tempo very methodically. You're using space very methodically. That, you know, as you create a space, you're watching their accessing cues because as you begin, start out very slowly talking about what you did yesterday. General conversation, you know. And it's the do you remember question that forces them to access. You know, do, do you remember, you know, what it was like when you first stopped and, you know, thought about the client, you know, that was tough, the things you did where you hesitated? Do you remember what that was underlined like, keep your presuppositions in order. Talk about what's past as past. And, and now that you know how you're going to be and how delightful it's going to feel. And remember, you're in essence, you in essence want to jump mildly back into the altered state, enough of an altered state. Now, the other thing is, is as, you, as you broaden a picture in front of somebody, it induces an altered state. It's a rapid change in submodalities. Remember, when you do any rapid, isn't it? 
So it's a good time to give suggestions like pleasure, you know, spreading, now. <laughs> right, now, so that when, when, whenever you move a submodality rapidly like that, throw in a suggestion. And you want the pleasure to be connected and to spread throughout them so that as you look into the future, you feel that. So you literally can use sound. Now, the other thing I want you to do experiment a little bit with is seeing how many pleasant sounds you can put in, motivating voices. And remember, now we're building. You don't have to use ones that are already there. Make you new ones, trumpets, dramatic things that, you know, as they look at the client, they can, you know, that uplifting Rocky theme music stuff, you know, dun, 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 that kind of stuff. Anything that's uplifting so that, and, and have it triggered off by the kind of clients, the whining tonality, anything where they'd hesitate, where they aren't experimental, where they wouldn't take the kind of things you're learning here and use it, where, where maybe a client would get mad, you know, Ooh, who cares, right? <laughs> Make my day, you know. Because, you know, any, especially those of you, like, you know, if you have a client, because I get, sometimes I get these guys that are like six foot six, they're like gigantic, you know, and, you know. So they decide rather than, you know, have their life turned into ecstasy, they're going to fight me on shit, you know. And I mean, I've even had ones where they'll stand up and go, and then when they do that, I go, impotent! <laughs> and I go, sit down or you will stay that way. <laughs> then, and as they sit down, I go, twice as sexually powerful. Now, are you going to fight me on this? <laughs> Say, as long as you have a sense of humor about it, because you have to keep in mind, you don't have to live the way they live, right? They came here to make their life better, right? Now, if they want to stay with their life cruddy, laugh at them for it. and go, Look, if you want your life to be as big a mess as it was, in fact, I'll make it worse for you if you want me to, you know? And this is one of the things that keeps you from connecting it to your own feelings. It's just really realizing when you're a neurolinguistic programmer, you can make it better or worse. And it's whichever they want, you know. You can give them this or you can give them this. You know, it's up to you. How do you want to live? And that, that the essence of, of what you're trying to do is to convey that to them so that they drive their own bus in the end. But they ain't going to drive their own bus till they take control, and they ain't going to take control if they'll let you do it. And part of the fluctuation of going back and forth is, is to get them to shift to the point where they do it. And at least if you're not there, they'll be able to drive their bus. Minimally. But some of them literally, literally wipe pictures out. I've seen people do this shit. They, they, they'll take the negative picture over there and they'll just go, you know. You see people do that where they rub their pictures out. Those are the people that have blackboards in their minds. Some people have photographs and then they're archival. They're stuck with them forever. Unless they burn them. Shh. You feel that? The heat? <laughs> oh, it's just a way of changing people. Okay, grab your partner. Take about, oh, about 15 minutes apiece. Remember, this is something you're doing building up to a crescendo. So don't start out screaming. Work your way up. You don't have to, you don't have to get loud. You have to get solid in your voice. It's not, so much, it's not so much that you scream loudly, because if you do, you'll, you'll disjunk their consciousness. It's not so much volume as a solid, rich tone. And if you have any problem with that, pull your chin back and lower your head. And you'll feel your voice is twice as solid. You're speaking from your diaphragm. When you hit low tones, they should rumble. Have that. You should feel the rumbling right here. You know what I mean? Robert knows about this. Go get him. Zzz. I wanted to talk a little bit more about some of the advantages of doing this kind of stuff, especially for those of you who, who are seeing clients on a regular basis. One of the things that I do after a session like this is I get clients, you know, and, and not so much me, but I know that a lot of the people I've trained with who see clients more regularly than I do, to, to give them, I give them a lot of homework where I have them come up with things that they want to make better. And I give them typically a generative system. But if you see clients on a regular basis, assign them homework to find things in their life that they enjoy, that they want to make ecstatic. So that when they come back, they've spent the week searching for what can be better, as opposed for searching for what's wrong. Because remember again, the thing about perceptual grids is that now that we've gotten a person at this point in time to start aiming, I mean, instead of a salesman 
you know, even if I do sales training, I want salesmen to look for how they can increase the percentage of clothes, who, what people they can have more fun with selling to, so that instead of having to see more people to prospect more to make more money, they can increase the number of closes so that a wider range of people become fodder for their success. And uh, with clients, you, you want to gauge them so that when they come back, they found other things in their life that they want to feel better. That they found, instead of looking for what's wrong in their life, they're going to start looking for what works in their life and doing it more. Because we want to switch the whole grid over from, you know, what's wrong with life, you know, from, being, from operating out of the grid of a pessimist to operating out of the grid of a wanton and total hedonist. That as, as they begin to make that shift, not just in their own life, but in the lives especially of those around them, that, you know, start thinking about things that they can do to increase the pleasure in the people around them. Because as they put a smile on people's face for no reason, it's just going to make them easier to be around and more fun to be around. I mean, so that as you, as you move through second and third sessions, you begin to get to more generative change. Um, you know, if you have a clients which are, which are married or in a coupling relationship, you have to understand one of the things you're going to have to deal with as you begin to take away problems is that a lot of relationships are built on problems. So one of the things you're going to have to do is you're going to have to be able to take and start, start, as you add pleasure to their life, you have to be able to connect it with their relationships, with children and with other things, so that they start thinking of things that they can do to make other people feel good. Because you're going to have to trick the people around them into not forcing them back into the same behavior. Because if their relationships are, you know, you know, because when people start walking in and, and asking the same, you know, like, how are you faring? I mean, there's a semantically loaded statement. You know, are you holding in there? You know, all of those kind of things are going to be the kind of things, you know, uh, you know, and as people walk, you know, because a lot of them, you know, a lot of people will be programmed for, you know, to ask questions like, you know, you know, are you any less depressed today? Presupposition you are. And, I mean, that kind of stuff is, is the stuff that you've got to overcome. And so, the, I mean, there's, there's two powerful mechanisms. One is to make sure that you program people to, instead of trying to get total dynamic results initially, you want to program your clients to start out slow and build it so that it always gets stronger down the timeline. Now, the other thing you want to do is, is to program new responses to old behaviors in the people around them. And, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that I do, especially if I have somebody in a coupling relationship, is I begin to take things like uh, putting them in a trance and taking the sound of that person's voice and having it, even if that person is complaining, in, you know, induce in them strong sexual feelings, you know. And that they begin to get pleasure where they did. Because what will happen is, is if somebody comes in and starts whining about their day, and they start looking at them with that look in their eye, the whining will stop. Therefore, it will break up the system. You know, and I, you know, I, like, I like, for example, like one of the things I like to do with people is, is, is to induce, and this, we'll try this, just it's not really that much fun, but it's a little bit fun, is, is to be able to go into, into their future on their timeline take the new feelings that they have, the ones that are avoiding the unpleasantness, and then to begin to, to, to generalize it from the context of where the change came to the context of their life. To say that now that you have good feelings about this, that you feel strong. I mean, even if it's something like just standing up for yourself, like, you know, somebody who, put, who gets pushed around by their boss or pushed around by, you know, the guys where they work or something, and they finally get, you know, a strong feeling inside them. Now that we want to do is to take that strong feeling and have it generalized to other, so rather than them becoming absurdive and, and you know, acting mean where they don't need to, to translate the, the, the strength into a playfulness. So that, you know, to me, that what I'm going to do is have them go out into the future, you know, and knock them a day ahead, put them into a trance, and have them see that somebody they live with. And then what I'll do is have them jump back. This is a between-time change. Jump back over on their timeline to the best feeling they've had with this person, right? And then have them jump forward, and as they jump forward, the minute they pop in, double the intensity of the feeling. Now, a trance is nice. Now, I'll tell you a little secret. Feelings, especially good feelings, have a tendency to be whole body sensations or part body sensations that grow into whole body sensations, a warmth that spreads throughout the whole body. 
So one of the things I found is, is that if you anchor at the midline, right, it, it is, it, I don't know why, it's a very, very powerful thing. And I mean, I like to, I like to, I like to create a sliding anchor right here. And because it's a good place for feelings to generate from. It's a nice centrally located place. You know, either that or down here, right at the midline. Maybe a couple, you know, chakras are nice places, you know. I, I don't know what they're there for, but whatever it is, they're a good place to anchor on. I found that out. You know, as you go, you know, like that, and then you go spread. And remember that, especially, especially since you're using hypnosis, that you want to keep in mind to use commands. And commands are where your voice inflection goes down at the end. Now, I found some of you, like when, when you were saying things, your voice inflection was going up. Remember, your control of your output systems is your tools. And when you want something to be a question, you have your voice inflection go up. When you want it to be a statement, voice inflection goes straight across. But what we're dealing with mostly is commands. And when, you know, because when you do things, when you shove a picture, you know, of the positive stuff in the future, when you shove it into somebody's face, Touch them at the midline and go, feel good. Good. Down. Voice inflection down. And, and they will. And then you go and double it more intensely than you've ever done before now. So that as you feel this good feeling spreading, I-N-G, all over your body and intensifying as it does so, remember using linkage and adding these commands so that you begin to build strong feelings then you do things, then take this feeling and see, you know, your wife doing the things she normally does every morning or every night when you come home. And it will put ideas in your mind. Certainly puts ideas in my mind, you know. Take things like saran wrap, whipped cream, and a lazy Susan and see what you come up with, you know. Because you want to... <laughs> it's interesting when you say that to a real conservative. I had this guy from D.C., really conservative guy, a very religious man, whose wife had died. And it had been 18 years since he had been out with anybody else. That's what I call patients. And uh, with him, when I started, you know, I, talking about, you know, that because there were women he saw every day at work and he'd, like, thought about for 18 years asking them out. And I thought it was about time he got on with it. You know, and I, I, saw, I said, well, you know, if you need to motivate yourself, you know, just take a few household objects, you know. At random, you know, just pick a few things out of the refrigerator and let your imagination run wild. Now! And this expression on his face was just like, like that, you know. And I, you know, I don't know what pictures he was making, but they had to be better than the ones of people rejecting him and being depressed and stuff. That for me, you know, that, that as you begin to give commands, when you induce trance, then get good feelings, then multiply the feelings, and then have them take the feelings and build images out of those. Because... Since you're building, once you build stronger feelings than they have most of the time, it's a really good foundation for them to build behaviors. Because the behaviors are built out of their own feelings. And then rather than having to see themselves doing things they wouldn't do, and then step inside it and see how they'd feel, a lot of times they feel uncomfortable. Whereas if you have them feel good and then generate images from it, the translation is a lot easier. And also, since you're, you start with the normal behavior of other people, not people behaving differently than they're going to, those feelings will automatically come when those, good, when those things are there. So the way their children normally act, the way their boss normally treats them, whack, those feelings will be there, and then ideas will pop in your mind. And whether you act on them or not is not the important part. The fact that they're there will make you look and sound differently and therefore be treated differently. It's only a beginning that will lead to wanton and exciting things. Can you feel this? now spreading mm -hmm. <laughs> few of you have wanton imaginations don't you see because the trick is is to be able to take the changes that you've now made and really begin to generalize them because now that you've got the context and you've just rammed it in and I mean this is the phase you've been in now is you've just been beating them with the kind of change that I mean, you know, it's like, well, you want to feel bad? Feel bad. Go ahead. Do it, do it, do it. Or you can feel good. Feels good to feel good, but you don't get to. And by oscillating back and forth, you know, you're driving to the point where they go, well, fuck you. I'm going to feel good whether you like it or not. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, yes, I am. When you have them drive, now you want to be able to take that strength and begin to generalize it to other parts of their life. 
And I mean, and this is, this, is not, this is not just being nice. This is an essential part of making your life work. Because the strength that you give them, if they're a student, you want them to, to have strength about studying. You want them to be excited about learning, even from the most boring professor. Squeeze juice out of them. You know, tell them to learn the meta model. There's no easier way to make a professor crazy than to meta model them you know, in class. Well, how do you know that? You know, especially a poetry class. Think about it when they go, this is what he was really thinking. Well, how do you know that? It's a feeling. Oh, so your feelings are real and mine aren't. You know? Well, I have a PhD. So all PhDs are right. <laughs> now, the thing that you have to think about when you're generalizing is, is this is the point where the information you got initially about their life, about, you know, who do they live with, who do they interact with, who do they talk to. I mean, you know, and if there isn't enough of it, then you make more. That's what I get them into missions, just like I made Andy in the schizophrenic tape, Captain Kirk on the starship schizophrenia, <laughs> and gave him tasks to do. I gave, made him Captain Kirk, and he had missions because he had to go to the bank and cash his check. Even for him at the smallest level, I wanted to start changing these things, like going to the mall, you know, uh, and going, going out in public places to be, to be an adventure. And to me, this is what I, you know, the things that they don't do, you now describe as adventures. And you have that positive anchor. You know where their future is. You have a hand anchor. And any time they begin to hesitate and go, well, like that, you go back to the other anchor. Because you got them now. You go, could be, and, you, and instead of going down here for what else, pick an arbitrary point. Zero azimuth, center above, and you go, what else would you like to feel good, right? You want to lead them to, up to visual constructs, right? And if they have trouble, make suggestions. Okay, now, the sequence I want you to use for this is, is I want you first to take them back, start a little bit with what you were doing before, like, show, you know, the oscillation. Because the oscillation between these two things creates a fractionation where people are extremely receptive su to suggestion. Then immediately induce an altered state. And, uh, for example, one of the things I like to do is, is if I have somebody where I've oscillated them between this and that, then what I like to do is say, just take your hand, hold it up like this, and shut your eyes now, and just relax deeply and feel good. Enjoy that sense of growing pleasure. Take a deep breath and just relax. Feel a good feeling and then suddenly just double it. And let it spread all the way up your arm. Feel it burn on your fingertips and tingle and in other places in your body. Let your imagination begin to run away with you in ways that will surprise and delight you as you take that good feeling and lead out into your future and see what else you'd like to feel that good. Numbers of images can run through your mind from here right up to there. That's right. You begin to see, and as you feel those things, I want you to hear a resounding voice from both sides very loudly right from there that goes, I want that. I'm going to ask for that. I'm going to do things to get that. Tell yourself you're going to do it until you're absolutely convinced and as you're becoming more convinced, that feeling will double again. That's right, even stronger and spreading even more. The clearer the images get and the louder the voices, the more convincing the voices get, the better you can feel. Now, I want you to allow this hand to go down only as fast as every single fiber of your soul makes a total commitment to do these things in the near future and to do them twice as much a week later and to feel twice as good about it now. And as that hand goes down, your unconscious takes a commitment to make yourself responsible and for it to be responsible to make sure that you carry out all these suggestions such that when your hand floats down to your side, you'll know that your unconscious and your conscious mind have aligned themselves utterly and completely to make sure that these don't become tasks, but become the joy of living and noticing how good your future can be now and more and more and more. That's right. 
Now, these kinds of subtle suggestions uh, are the foundation of taking that altered state now and beginning to really program your future, to begin to amplify those feelings, to begin to put new ideas. Because as you change yourself or change other people, you want to now begin to have full-blown new ideas about how to live. It's not enough to just break an old pattern. I've heard too much about interrupting patterns and not enough about what to do once you do that. Uh, there's a certain neurolinguistic programmer with very warm feet who shall remain unnamed who spends a lot of time teaching people to do pattern interrupts. But he doesn't spend much time teaching them to stick in stuff once you do that. And I mean, even the subtlest pattern interrupt, like the, the induction you just saw me do, where you start this and then you just lift up their hand and go, close your eyes, which people will do. And then immediately when you do that, if you go, feel good, here, let it spread. As long as you're going to interrupt a pattern, give a command. When you do the handshake interrupt, the reason when you do the handshake interrupt, you go, look. When you point across, you go, look. And notice the changing focus of your eyes as you allow your eyes to close, keep a deep breath, and drop into a deep trance. Is because you're doing the pattern interrupt to give a command. If you don't say anything, nothing happens. You want to be able now, to, since you've interrupted a major pattern in their life, to oscillate between these two things, to interrupt, induce trance, and now begin to, and I want you to take more time than I did, to really let them to develop. Again, you want each idea and each step into the future to increase the intensity. People are very good at multiplication in trance. When you say doubling feelings, you can watch them. They go, Tsh. you go double it again, they go, Tsh. and you should be able to notice those things. Remember, your voice inflection is all important. When you give a command, sound like it's a command. Don't go, and feel better doesn't have the impact as feel better, does it? Twice as strong. Not twice as strong? Do you hear the difference? Listen to the tone of your voice and your inflection when you give commands, because otherwise they don't come out like commands. This is not, this is not a wimpy thing, this hypnosis. You've got to have your voice. They've always said that, that you must be monotone, and I hope you've realized that hypnosis is not a monotone. The only reason they were monotone is they found out that if most of these guys were so incongruent, they were going deeper and deeper asleep, which is incongruent. You know, voice goes up and you're saying deeper. It just doesn't have the impact as if you go deeper and deeper and deeper, still going deeper. With every word I utter, you can relax more. That kind of intonation pattern where the, where, the, where the words match the sound is certainly going to be more effective. Is it not now? <laughs> Laughing makes you go into a trance, you know. <laughs> <laughs> makes you feel good all over. Starts at your toes. <laughs> That's why feet are ticklish. <laughs> Can you feel that now? <laughs> All right, now, what I want you to do is to go, sequence, remember, go back into the oscillation. You should have hand anchors set up. You rotate it a couple of times, and then do some kind of a hand induction. You want the hand, because this is the point at which you either want to do it with finger signals, but one of the things you want is as soon as you've amplified their good feelings, had them translate those into other times and places. Especially, I want you to run through anything you've found out about the fact that they live with other people or where they work, you know, you have to cover home, employment, hobbies, clubs, and close friends. All the potentially inherently helpful people that could fuck up your work. Okay? Relatives, all that kind of stuff you want to run through. They're having good feelings with the other people staying the same temporarily. And realizing that as you don't have the same problem. I mean, I tell clients straight out in trance. These other people are not going to be used to you feeling so good. So you don't unnerve them when you first see them. You'll only feel this good. But the more you're with them, minute by minute, you'll feel better and better. And you'll notice that so will they. You'll ask yourself now, how can I make them feel better to distract them from my pleasure so they don't want me to go back in pain unless you want to feel bad or feel twice as good, which do you want to feel now?
and watch and because they'll either go or they'll go and when they do tell them to spread it and then put it into their future and add it so that you generalize from context remember people sort by place sort by person sort by context if you've been listening you probably know something about their sorting principles oops <laughs> if you haven't do them all but I mean, the thing is, is one of the reasons you listen for this stuff is because this tells you how to future pace somebody specifically. So that as you begin, because meta programs are nice, they work. And this is one of the, this is a, a way to utilize them to really begin to program things into the future in a way that has a certain kind of dynamic quality to it. That, that as you align the, the kinds of hypnotic suggestions you give with the natural processes in this way, what happens is, is you make the process of generalization that much stronger. Now, okay, you induce trance and you get the unconscious and to give you direct signals to allow the hand to go down only, powerful word only, only as fast as you solidify these changes and your unconscious is willing to take responsibility to make sure this happens when you see your wife, when you see your relatives, when you see your mother, when you see your boss, as you walk into your place of employment, as you walk into your home, as you walk into the local pub, all of those things you want to be able to become the foundation so that these good feelings mysteriously appear and continue to grow and grow stronger and stronger with every day that goes by. So that each moment your pleasure increases and the ideas about how to enjoy yourself just start flooding into your mind. Now. <laughs> okay, then once you've done that, you've done your little trance, then as their hand comes down, what they're doing is programming, because in essence, now what you want to do is to give the biggest and boldest hypnotic suggestions you can for post-hypnotic suggestions about getting this into the future and about proliferating it throughout the rest of their life and also about inoculating them against the danger of inherently helpful people. Okay? Suggestions about inoculating. That is inoculating, inoculating them against. It is the inoculation, right? It is. Well, yeah, you, because if you make the same behaviors people normally do, make them feel good rather than guilty, it inoculates them. And, I mean, it's like... When I, when I teach my sales training course, one of the major things I teach them is, is that, that salesmen have been taught that what they have to learn is to overcome objections. And I think that's stupid. I don't overcome objections. I inoculate against them. Because, see, if salesmen really use their talent, my sales training course, one of the things I have them do is to make a list of every suggestion they hear. Because there aren't that many. You know, if you're selling cars, you hear a certain set of objections. You're selling houses, you hear a certain set of objections. Since you know what they are, then what you do is, is that while you're starting to go through your presentation, you go through and you inoculate against the whole list. Or else you do a little crystal ball gazing and find out, you say, and you, you can do this. You go, well, you know, some people come in here, you know, that, you know, at first they're real excited, but then, you know, you know, it, you know, the cost, you know, affects them, you know, or the location or the, you know, and you run through the list until you get the unconscious response. And when you get the unconscious response, you build in an inoculation so that later down the road, it wouldn't even occur to them. And I mean, it makes your selling so much smoother to figure out that rather than overcoming problems, you inoculate against them. So rather than having to overcome the difficulty of other people, you make the fact that it's going to occur fire off positive anchors. So they're inoculated against the danger of other helpful people, especially if they're seeing other clinicians, which is the most dangerous of all. Uh, I always, you know, I always get the, the most intense anchor I can find for ludicrous, right, and attach it to the, the sound of their therapist's voice, which will cut therapy short because there's nothing that will ruin your work faster than a well-meaning psychotherapist who takes them back into all the garbage in their life, tells them if they're thinking about good things, they're being resistant and avoiding uncovering the true pain that you're feeling now <laughs> you know because that's what a lot of therapy is about you know it's all focused on your pain and your discomfort and if you're feeling good I mean even at Esalen years ago one of the things I, that blew my mind is is that it, if you were authentic you weren't happy I mean it was a trait you know you know I mean everybody was walking around being authentic they all looked like they were grim grim was the word I would use and I mean, you know, when I cruised in, you know, I cruised in with a friend. I had a friend that was a resident at Esalen. And I just went down to see him. And, you know, I mean, 
I went down, I brought another friend of mine that was a musician. We went cruising in and we were ready to party, man. You know, here we were, you know. And all these people were like, <sighs> you know, you people don't know who you really are. And I went, well, I know who I really am, you know. I'm somebody that wants to party. <laughs> That's who I am, man. <laughs> and they were going, no, you know, if you had discovered your real self, your authentic self. And I went, if my authentic self was anything like you, I'd just as soon not know about it, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Pass the wine. <laughs> and I mean, they were all walking around. Even, they even had a thing like colloquialisms, like saying, hi, how you doing, was being inauthentic, right? And it, it never occurred to them that what that is is, is, is just being friendly, you know? <laughs> and you know, if you feel friendly and you say hello, that's as authentic as it gets. You don't, have, you don't have to investigate somebody's whole life before you have breakfast. You can say to them, good morning. That's just being friendly, you know? Put a smile on their face for no reason. There's nothing inauthentic about that. And, you know, their thing was, well, you know, if you really said to somebody, how are you doing today, you know, you should want to sit and listen to the answer. I just want to say hi, put a smile on their face, and be friendly. I, you know, I don't want to know about their problems. <laughs> I mean, but they got into this thing where everything had to be, everything got dwelt upon and dragged out instead of making life easier and more convenient. I mean, they could take five minutes of unpleasantness from their childhood and drag it out into a two-week seminar. And I mean, to me, you know, if it only lasted five minutes, you should be able to solve it in 10 seconds, at least. I mean, you shouldn't have to go back through it over and over and over again. This is where what you do is you start getting people to go over pleasure, possible pleasures. They don't even have to do them all. They just have to think about them. It's even fun to think about them. See, one of the things about the abolition of guilt that I found out in the flirting class was people thought if they thought about things, they had to do them, right? And it's not true, you know. I mean, it's like, you know, there was a little section I taught one time. I, I, I was teaching people how to undress each other with their eyes. I found out people that there were people that didn't know how to do that. And I thought, God, where have they been? And I found out in therapy. Where else? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the first thing I did, the first female therapist I met. I saw her naked and found out if I'd still listen to her, you know. It's, it's, it's really funny. The other thing I loved about Esalen is people took their clothes off and pretended like they weren't naked. <laughs> I just, I had more fun with that, you know, because, it, you know, these authenticated people that were down there, you know, you get in the big sulfur baths down in the cliffs, sit down there and you look at somebody and you go, fucking great tits, you know, and suddenly they knew they were naked. I mean, and it was really like the emperor's new clothes. It was like, suddenly they go, oh, you know, I was like, you know, oh, you didn't know you were naked? <laughs> Well, I knew, but you're not supposed to look, you know. I go, hey, you take your clothes off. I'm going to look. <laughs> and you might think that's authentic, but all parts of me know better. <laughs> One part in particular. <laughs> oh, the silly things they get people to do. Humans are really, truly strange creatures. They can be a lot of fun. They can get serious. You can get humans serious about anything. It's getting them to have fun that's tough. So go back, get your partner. Follow the sequence and mostly enjoy it. This is where you have to make it sound luscious. You have to use all the tones in your voice, all your behaviors, every expression that you use before they close their eyes. I know some of you gesture when their eyes are closed. It doesn't help as much. <laughs> but if it helps you to be able to generate the voice tones and the intonation patterns. Now the other thing is, is you want to put now sounds in their heads. The more sound you can put in their head at this point, the better. So that... You know, and this is where, where you pick words and, you know, semantically the worded, loaded words like yum, right? Now, when you want, when you want a, 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 to, to locate a voice, touch them on the back of the head where you want the voice to come from. Especially if you know something about where the voices are coming from already, put them somewhere else. This is new stuff, not old stuff. We're building new directions for submodalities. You know, you can even do, I do this, I go a chorus of voices and spread my hands across the back of their head that, that all yell out in perfect harmony and lewd unison that go, yum. It's the first time, when you haven't been around your wife for five minutes or for an hour or for all day, when you hear her voice on the phone or the first word out of her mouth, you hear a chorus of, from back behind you that goes, yum, and a certain part of you begins to respond. And I'll let you choose which one and how well it works or not. Because if it responds immediately, it will respond for a long time. Just a suggestion. 
Now, as you add in new voices, music, uh, you know, because, I mean, you know, if somebody comes home after a bad day, opens the door and walks in, and the chorus of voices comes out and goes, yum, and romantic music begins to play in their head, they'll have a tough time being sniveling. You know, they'll be dancing across the room. It makes life a lot more fun. And then you can say, now, you know, do you want to live this way? Or do you want to go back to the dental drill and the tooth? It's up to you. Now, I want your unconscious to take responsibility for blaring that voice out. And that if, you can, if you know how to set up finger signals, finger signals are good for this. Ask the unconscious if it'll be willing to do that. It yes, and say, do it. Each time. And each, only, every. These are words of generalizations. These are universal quantifiers. Remember them? You guys remember the meta model? The Milton model? Well, this is where universal quantifiers pay off because we're looking for universal suggestions here. Okay, go ahead, dive in for about 15 minutes apiece. Meet me back here and have fun with it. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask you, how'd you do? Yeah. Light touch bringing the auditory around. Does it synesthesia? It's kinesthetic. Mm -hmm. Whoa! Yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that using, using kinesthetics for auditory lead. See, the thing is, is that, that the cortexes themselves in the brain actually have overlap. The visual cortex overlaps the, the, the kinesthetic cortex, and the auditory does. They all, the cortexes actually overlap and ranging from 20 to 40 percent, depending upon who the person is. So synesthesia is real. And one of the things about, uh, see, like with, with images, you know, one of the reasons you place them out in space is that's where they are. But with the sounds, you can set directions. Because, and the nice thing is, is if you learn to take your hand, if you want the sound to move towards them, right, you put your fingers together and open them up on their head. If you want the sound to go away, you start with your fingers spread and pull your hand off their head, right? When it's away and towards. And when you do that, especially when you do it on the hair, it gives this nice little tingling sensation to it. Kind of adds a little added dimension to it. And given that for most people, you know, a large, especially in this country, a large percentage of the population is super visual. And uh, so as you begin to add kinesthetics and you begin to add more auditory, auditory stuff becomes more of a controlling variable. Because people who are super visual can manipulate pictures very easily. But sound controls them more. So as you begin to add these things, it really amplifies their kinesthetics, gives them stronger feelings, which is what they need in order to alter their behavior. It's OK, Charles, relax. <laughs> Pleasant sounds will blare in your mind. Happy music. <laughs> Are there any other questions about what we did? Anything else you noticed of interest? Do you feel the same? Do you want to go back? Now, does, given that we've drilled this thing, I mean, we've done a number of exercises, and I mean, but if you think about it, this kind of stuff can be compressed into a session. There's a difference between what it takes to teach people, because you don't have to teach your clients everything you know, you're just going to do it to them. Do you have the sense that, because people are always asking this question, which is, for a long time confused me, is about, well, how do you make this stuff last? And the way you make it last is by, instead of using a technique, you build a package out of the different techniques and out of the different patterns. Because there's a difference between a pattern and a technique. And I mean, patterns are like a language pattern, like universal quantifiers, like presuppositions. A technique is like the phobia thing. But the phobia thing works in relationship to your ability to control the rest of your output channels, to control your syntax, to use language well. Because I mean, you can do the phobia cure and have it not work. If all your language patterns presuppose that it won't, I mean, you know, if, and, and, you know, you're combining altered states. What we're doing here is combining all kinds of things, uh, timelines, submodalities, all of these things, and beginning to put together a package where the, the end result is, is that it's unfathomable that you could go back the same way. And, I mean, this is the kind of change that lasts. Is, it's, you know, because I keep finding, like, you know, these, these stupid researchers that test things, at, you know, I always love that their control groups are always, you know, 20 sophomore women. I mean, this is the way we test science, right? Some 45-year-old professor just happens to pick 20 co-eds, you know, sophomore co-eds to do his research on. They're science, boy. 
weird science, if you ask me. But like when they tested VK disassociation for phobias, to begin with, they did the, whoever tested it obviously didn't know what they were doing. And when they say there isn't a significant difference, well, the, the fact they don't get a significant difference is that they don't know how to do it. There's a difference between if I did it and if they do it. Because with the mastery of language that I have and the mastery of language you're developing, see, to me, like Patterns One is one of the quintessential books that, that we ever did. Because the construction appendices in there give you the opportunity to learn to master syntax. And in the practitioner course this year, I started with that. I decided that, that rather than teaching people to ask questions, I wanted them to be able to hear and talk. And then a after that, we get around to asking questions. Because I decided if you can't hear, you can't speak. And you know, I mean, if you can't hear, you don't know what question to ask. And uh, this is one of the th reasons when people use the meta model, they end up getting stuck on deletion and unspecified verbs, the two least useful patterns in the meta model. Well, that's because every, every sentence has a deletion in it, and every sentence has an unspecified verb to some degree. So you, if you start with those things, you'll never get past them. You, know, you really need to start at the other end and work your way backwards. That in terms of teaching people to gather information, if you know what kind of information you need and which information to use and which information to store, even thinking about now that, that as you hear ludicrous things from your clients, realizing that you can take them and here's a chance to use it later on, to solidify change. That anchoring isn't something that you anchor, I mean, because people talk about a technique as collapsing anchors. A technique is chaining anchors. But there's much more to it, and there's much more in the sense of the ways in which you can use it, that as you weave these things together in a package, this is where you get profounding change, and not just lasting, but change that's going to generalize, and generalize and broaden out. This videotape is edited from an advanced NLP training in Boulder, Colorado, April 1989. Many of the participants had also attended previous advanced training with Richard. Richard considers this seminar to be his best ever presentation of how he works with clients. Although he presents some new submodality methods, his major emphasis is on how he puts things together and the methods that he uses to create lasting change. Since this is a carefully sequenced seminar, we recommend viewing the videotapes in order. The thing about, about listening to the presuppositions uh, in what people say is that is, to, is first just the syntactic presuppositions. But then there's a meta level of presuppositions, which has to do with, the, with, with understanding their presuppositions about time. And their presuppositions especially about causal relationships. Because it's a double-edged sword when you, when you hear that people believe that if this happens, it makes you be a certain way. Well, then if you change what happened, then it's going to make them be different. And uh, a lot of the, the techniques that I use now are about going back and putting different things in timelines. For, for example, I don't know, did I do the thing where you, where you go back and build a new imprint experience? You guys know about that? Some of you are saying yes. Some of you are saying, this is such a coherent group. Well, anyway, let me just, I'll just, we don't have to do it, but let me describe in essence what it was so I can use that. Is that one of the things is, is that, that imprint experiences themselves, a lot of times that people, you know, would say that, uh, for example, I had a guy that had almost drowned when he was a kid. And, uh, and what, what had happened was, is, uh, I mean, he was, he was young and he was on an inner tube, and it was on uh, where a river is dammed up. And, uh, you know, it has a spillway that went down. It's one of these little places in the middle of nowhere. And apparently, you know, his father was playing with him and some kids and had them on little inner tubes. And he kind of drifted off, and his father was talking to somebody. And the more he yelled, the further off. And finally he went. And when he just, he, what was stuck in his mind was seeing his father turn around and suddenly just freak. The expression on his face was that he, he knew 
He didn't like realize that things were that bad until he saw the expression on his father's face and realized his father was too far away as his face disappeared over the spillway. And then, of course, suddenly the speed changed that he was moving as he rushed down the speedway, and it scared the hell out of him. Now, uh, and he claimed, you know, he almost drowned and everybody went and saved him or whatever. And after that, he was so afraid, of, this is one of my great clients, he was so afraid of water, he wouldn't drink it. <laughs> now, I think that constitutes a phobia, right? He w only washed with a sponge, right? And if you think about it, that's, you're never going to be really clean that way. So he had to wash himself with alcohol after he sponge bath. Yeah! You know, that's no way. Nobody should have to live like that or smell that way. You have to fix a client like that because you're not going to sweat a sea of more than once, believe me. It's the only time I've had a client come in and I took a bottle of cologne out of my bag and went, tss, 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 tss. now, what was your problem? <laughs> but I mean, this is, the thing is, is to him, one of the things that I did was to find out that this particular imprint was burned in his mind. And uh, even the sound of running water or rushing water was enough to trigger it off. So it was not just a visual thing, it was also an auditory phobia as well. He couldn't, he couldn't walk in the bathroom when his uh, girlfriend was taking a shower. And he couldn't flush the toilet for himself. And that doesn't even sound the same. But he knew it was water, any sound that he knew water could make. And of course, uh, this made rain a terrifying thing for him. He couldn't go out in the rain. You know, and I mean, this, of course, is going to cut down, you know, the number of jobs you can hold down, too. You know, and of course, well, of course, he lived in Arizona, but you know, that, that I don't think was entirely his choice. You know, I mean, you know, he'd have to live in the desert, you know, but it rains in the desert sometimes. And uh, I mean, you know, because uh, when I saw him, his girlfriend was there and she was actually, she had a great sense of humor because she was, she was kind of an oaky and she would go, yeah, it's when it rains, boy. He's down on the floor under the bed with the dog, shaking like a leaf. <laughs> she said, and she said, what? She said, you know, it's embarrassing if other people are there and it starts to rain. She said, I just throw a blanket on him and tell people to ignore him. He'll be all right in a while. <laughs> but, no, well, you get used to these things after a while. You stop laughing at him and just throw a blanket over him. And you, I won't pay any attention to him. It'll stop raining pretty soon. And I'm sure there are people sitting in their living room going, right. Mm -hmm. But see, the one thing I wanted to do was, is, is, to, is to take the very process that he was so convinced of. His presupposition of everything he said was, the presupposition was, is that it was the rain's fault. And that it was the experiences that made him this way. He, you know, because, I mean, he wanted to tell me all about this experience, and I really don't want to hear it. I don't give a damn what happened to people that much. Really, the only thing I need to know is how to utilize it. And as he kept wanting to describe, because he wanted to describe it in detail, and as he'd go back and describe it, you could watch him, you know, he'd be like flying through the first part of it till he hit that point at the edge of the falls where he said, you know, he could see, he could just see, you know, the top, all the way up till he could only see the top of his father's head, you know, this face of fear. And as he'd describe it, he'd even lift his hands up like that. And when his hands would be up, he'd be terrified. When he lowered them down, he'd be fine. It was kind of like that thing people do with their face, you know, that thing. <laughs> and... <laughs> Well, you know, clients are pretty amusing. You know, when you, the weirder they get, the more fun they are, actually. I like the weird ones because, you know, they always, they come in and they tell you the strangest shit, you know. And, and they always demonstrate it for you. But the one thing I wanted to be able to do was to take the same presupposition. And this is where that technique came from that, that I taught. What I did is I went in and got the submodalities of the imprint experience. You know, the, 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 the larger than life, because it was a picture, it was larger than life. It had uh, an intensity to the color that was more intense than everything. And it was three-dimensional, whereas his other images weren't. So I took all the submodalities and went back. And I had him build an experience first. But I had him build a two-dimensional and flat an experience that would convince him that when he turned his certain age, the phobia would disappear. And he'd fall in love with music, with, you know, something that happened, you know, something that his father said, you know, that, you know, or something that would build the belief that when he turned his present age, this would entirely turn itself around, that he would suddenly fall in love with, with water and the sound of running water and, and the feeling of water flowing on his body and stuff, that what experience could occur that would be as cataclysmic, that would convince him that he would have this problem, but when he turned whatever his age is now. Now, one of the things that made me think of it is he was about to have his 40th birthday. He said, 
he had actually said that coming to see me was his present to himself for his birthday. I mean, if I'm going to buy a present for myself, it wouldn't be therapy, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so, what do you want for your birthday? Oh, I want to go relive some old traumas, you know. It's exciting. But uh, so I decided to, to make it so that, you know, on his 40th birthday, all of it would change since it was his 40th birthday. So what I did is I went back and I put back in his history, uh, and it, first I put back a new imprint experience that said when he turned 40, all of this would change automatically. Then the other thing I did is I went back and screwed up the submodalities in the other imprint experience and used something akin to the decision destroyer to do it. So that basically we went back before the experience, went right up through and blew the submodalities out. Because since his presupposition was, since I remember this dramatic experience, I'm stuck this way. So of course I screwed it up because I believed his presupposition. Now as soon as you accept the presuppositions that people have, it allows you to work with them. And then sometimes you want to literally alter the presuppositions. For example, that life is always going to get worse. Some people, they hear them, the older you get, you know, the harder it gets. Stuff like that. You know, you can't teach old dogs new tricks. You should have told my dog that. He learned new tricks that I didn't even want him to know. And it's the only dog I know that could open a, a jar of peanut butter, lick it out, and put the lid back on. <laughs> it's nothing like opening a jar of peanut butter and there's dog tongue things on there. And you go, who put the lid back on this? And the dog goes, wasn't me. Can't believe the things done. He learned to open glass sliding doors, go out, get in the garbage, go back inside and slide the door and hit the lock. Right? And then when I'd come into the house, he'd bark out the door. Right? So I'd go running out there trying to find out who was messing up the garbage. Well, one day I fell asleep on the couch and he didn't know it and I caught him. I watched the whole thing in the mirror up on the mantelpiece. Right? Had this whole thing set up. When he was all done, you know, then he just sits and waits. And as soon as he heard me get up, he started barking ferociously. And I went, there's nobody out there. You got caught. And it was like, I have to come up with a new one. And he did. So I know you can teach old dogs new tricks. If he was 16 making this stuff up, it's not impossible. Now, by going back and building new imprint experiences, I'm accepting his world. Now, once it worked with him, I decided, well, if it works with him, we can try it with everybody. I mean, it's where I've gotten most of the best techniques is from what the clients actually do. Because what works in them to produce a negative effect will work to produce a positive effect. It's one of the reasons, you know, that I stress listening to how people pull off their problems. Because, you know, if, if you think about now, like the thing we've been working with, the one thing, like the idea of doing it again probably seems like a lot of trouble, doesn't it? When you think back, you know, it's like going back to the old way seems like work now, doesn't it? Well, it always was. It's, it's, it's just that you were good at it, that's all. And you forgot you were working that hard at having your problem. You know, like if there's something that you're afraid of, right? You have to remind yourself. You can't just forget you're afraid of it, you know. Uh, you know, it's like some people are afraid. To, I had a client that was afraid to go places by themselves. And I mean, I'm not talking like walking down dark alleys. We're talking shopping malls, anywhere. I mean, for them to go anywhere, if they went any place by themselves, just driving to work, they were afraid. They were afraid, you know. And they do things like driving down the road. They'd make pictures of people driving by in another car and shooting them or pulling them off the road and raping them and stuff like this while they were driving. <laughs> now, I, when I, so I started asking. I said, well, I said, how many pictures do you actually make in your head between your house and the office? And a person said, like, hundreds. And I went, hundreds? Right? And they went, oh, yeah, at least a hundred. You know, and I thought, I said, well, you know, I said, are they just slides or are they whole movies? And they went, well, well you know, of course, you know, they're, each one, you know, is like, you know, three or four minutes in length. And I thought, God, you know, I said, this is a lot of work. I said, you're a pretty creative guy, you know, being able to come up with all this stuff. And, you know, because what he hadn't thought of is the amount of energy that he put into it. And, see, the presupposition is that somehow or other this is going to prepare you for it. And the truth is, is he'd be more apt to get in trouble because he'd be so busy making all of these pictures, he wouldn't notice if somebody was breaking into his car. And, and if he did, he'd be so terrified that he wouldn't have any way of responding. Because especially in his scenarios, he always got killed. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to construct possible futures and you get killed in all of them, this is, you know, this is not what I call adequate planning. Uh, you know, it's, it's the old thing, you know. And uh, I, I asked one time in a group for people to come up with, with something where they picked their worst fear and then came up with a scenario where it never bothered them again, 
right? And everybody came back, and I asked people about it individually, and I asked this one guy, and I said, I said, I said how did you deal with it? And he goes, well, I got killed. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's a choice. I said, it's, it's not the first one that comes to my mind, but to him, it was the only way he could never have to deal with it again was to get killed. You know, he's, you know he ran into the situation, and somebody shot him, and he died. And, and I, you know, I kind of recommended that perhaps there might be other choices, uh, that it might be more advantageous for him to, like, do something about it. And in that situation, it was just that somebody threatening him in a bar or something, you know, somebody coming up and going, you know, fuck you, buddy. And so he just jumped back and shot himself. Ha, 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 that'll show him. Stick the gun in the other guy's hand and pull the trigger. That way he goes to jail, too. <laughs> Try to explain that to a judge. <laughs> uh, you know. But you go, the guy just stuck the gun in my hand and pulled the trigger. <laughs> right, sure he did. <laughs> go to jail. Do not pass go. Shows you being an asshole could be dangerous. You never know what wimps are out there. <laughs> that, uh, for me, that that's the basic kinds of stuff that I'm listening for. I'm listening for the presuppositions, especially about causal relationships, because they're going to tell me ways to change people. I want to hear their presuppositions about time. And also, I'm going to listen for sorting principles, the presuppositions about how the world is organized. Because I want to know how to utilize natural processes to get people out on the highway. So, you know, I mean, because I'm always trying to go get out there in the fast lane, put the fun meter to the red line, make sparks off the guardrail, and scream holy murder while you do. You know, uh, you know make some noise, be alive. You know, it's, you know it's, if you really want to be polite and nice, make people feel good. Don't become invisible, you know. There's too many boring people in the world. You know, there's too much complacency, too much hesitation. I mean, when they did this study and they came up with the figure that 70% of the people in the U.S. consider themselves shy, uh, you know, that's a huge number of people in the U.S. You know, it's, you know what, close, close to 200 million people sitting around not saying anything. And, you know, uh, try wanted things like, hello. I mean, I'm always amazed in the flirting class when, you know, these, these guys, you know, it's like, what do you do when you see a girl you want to meet, you know? And, you know what, they, this is the kind of stuff I hear, the presuppositions, they go, well, I stop and I, I think to myself, you know, and from that point on, I know that the first thing they do is go on the inside. Hell, by the time they figure it out and open their eyes, she'll probably be gone, you know, and they all go, yeah, that happens sometimes, you know? You know, it's like I open my eyes and look, and she's not there anymore. And then they've been torturing themselves for half an hour for nothing. You know, they're going, well, if I go up, she'll reject me. She'll do this. You know, bad things will happen. You know, and I, I always say, you know, has it ever just dawned on you to just, like, say hello? And, you know, and they always go, you can do that? Go, yeah, you just walk up and you go, hello. My name is so-and-so. What is your name? And if they spit in your eye, move on to another person, right? At least you don't have to spend years worrying about it. And, I mean, the, 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 the amount of time, it's like... Even when people learn techniques like anchoring, when I first started teaching anchoring, people would like come up to me during breaks and they go, you like really do this with your clients? And I go, yeah. And they go, well, how do they react when you touch them? And I go, what do I care? That's their problem, not mine. You know, the, their reaction is usually however I've anchored them. You know, and they go, well, pe people go, don't you, don't you think it's odd? And I go, look, people are touching each other all the time. It's odd if you're behind a desk, because then you have to jump over the top. That might take them <laughs> off guard. But, you know, not if you do it consciously incorporate it. And then, I mean, it's like when I started teaching sales, salesmen started telling me, well, you can't ask people about their internal states. You know, I mean, it's like, well, it's well and fine to do this stuff in therapy, but you can't ask people, you know, about, you know, submodalities and stuff in a sales situation. And I thought to myself, I didn't know that, and I've been doing it all these years. You know, because I do, you know, I go, I, I you literally ask people, I go, before I'm going to show you this, you know, sometimes you make good decisions. You know it's the right thing. People stop and they go, yeah. And I go, sometimes, you know, you make a decision and it's not the right one and you regret it. And they go, yeah. Or you know that, you know, it's, you feel mixed and you don't think it's the right thing to do. And they go, yeah, I know what you mean. And then I go, okay, here, I want to show you a brochure of a car. I'm going to put it up here. And, I mean, they, they'll show you with their eyes, and, and you can even ask them outright. I mean, I ask total strangers. People will tell you about their internal processes. They love to talk about it. In fact, they let, once they discover that's a subject, the clients don't talk about the past so much. You know, they go, well, I have this memory, you know, and it's big and it's bright and it's close, and it doesn't make me feel as good as I'd like it to.
you know, you end up having conversations like that. You go, well, try this. Ah! It's hard to teach people to do covert work. And I mean, especially for me, when I work with audiences, uh, you know, I'm always doing what I'm talking about, and I'm doing a few other things on the side. I've got to keep myself entertained, too. You know, I always have little hidden agendas, little things I want to stick in. But I mean, you know, so it might look more like this, you know. <laughs> well, I'm looking this way, but, you know, and I like to set them up in aisles and rows and various things. But a lot of it's based on, on crystal ball gazing, too, because a lot of times as I'm mentioning things, again, I go through lists. Having taught as many seminars as I have and having known the kind of things that get in the way of people being able to teach uh, NLP and to do NLP with, with a sense of humor and ferociously, I mean, it's like the, the exercise, the last one we did about exaggerating things, using humor to, to, to put clients and push them right up against the wall is, you know, I mean, I've done that. And if I don't adequately prepare people, when it's time to do the exercise, they're just afraid. Because, you know, they're going, well, I won't, you know, they start with, I can't do it as good as, you know. And they start, well, you know, I mean, I could have told them that, but that's why they paid money to learn about it, so they could do it better. When you start compare, when you, people who sort by the person have really got a bad thing when they get into comparatives. Because, I mean, I, you know, I know of people that won't do things because they won't be able to do them as good as somebody else the first time. Right? Which means they never get to start. Whereas if you compare whether you're getting better uh, through time, then, you know, you can always improve. And I mean, it's one of the best through time strategies there are, is where you focus the grid to find out how much you're improving. Because if you improve this much and it makes you this much happier, imagine if you improve twice as much, how much better it'll feel. Imagine as you take the skills, just the stuff about, that we've been doing about the overall packaging of working with a client, and as you take those skills, and because, you know, you've only done it once, now, unless some of you snuck off and did it last night. Yeah, there's a few of you here. The therapy junkies. Where can I find a client, man? I haven't worked with anybody in an hour. <laughs> you look like you want to change, man. Got any problems? Ever feel like you hesitate in life? Well, there's this thing, if you just close your eyes now, that you might find you. Well, anyway. Yeah. It's, po it's possible I may demonstrate on someone in the target zone. <laughs> and you know who you were, but you don't know who you'll be, and that's the good part about it. When you start making life more fun, and you start making your work more fun, and, you know, drop all this serious stuff, you know, as much as you can, because curing seriousness is where it's at. See, I mean, that's one of the things, like with the threshold pattern. One of the things I like about threshold pattern is, is to sort between what's serious and what's worthwhile. You see, if it's worthwhile, it's worth enjoying. And this isn't a set of, of some modalities that a lot of people have, that, that things that are worthwhile engaging in feel real good. It's a, like a new kind of seriousness. I mean, I can work for hours and hours and hours on things because I enjoy it. That, I mean, even making these tapes, you know, that when they asked me to do it, the way they described it made it sound horrible, right? It's like the first time they came and asked me to do it, they said, well, we want you to do a really basic induction, one that, that anybody can respond to that's general about everything. We don't want you to get real sophisticated and use a lot of fancy stuff. Just make it real simple, and we want it to be 45 minutes long, <laughs> right? And I went, oh, no, you know. And then I stopped and I thought, well, what could I do that would make it fun and make it worthwhile? How can I make it so it has juice? And I thought, music. Aha. So then I sat down on the piano and began to play. And then I thought, now, if I had a voice coming from here, a voice coming from here, and counterpoint in the voices that related to the music, this could be fun. It could be deepening and deepening. And I started playing that piano lick. Ring. And uh, as I started going it, I started to turn it in, because to me, for it to be worthwhile, it must be enjoyable. Otherwise, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Now, being able to build that kind of framework as opposed to, a lot of people think worthwhile and seriousness, and they've got seriousness mixed up with just feeling bad, you know. Because, I mean, I have people in workshops, I have people in workshops that, who are much too serious that say to me things like, they go, well, I, want, I really have a serious question you want to ask, and I don't want you to make a joke out of this. And I mean, that's, I mean, 
That's like painting a target on you and handing me a squirt gun, man. You know, that's just asking for it. That's all there is to it. And I go, oh, okay, I'll be serious. Right. You know, go ahead, ask the question. <laughs> that, to me, that one of the things is, is, is one of the, the techniques sometimes I do with clients is I find a set of submodalities and disassemble them and reassemble the actual submodalities because it's not that the things that they're serious about aren't worthwhile. It's that feeling serious stops them from doing anything about it. It's, it's, it's just like, you know, when we studied strategies in NLP, you know how some strategies are just useless? Well, some sets of submodalities are just useless. And, you know, to be real serious and grim about something is not helpful. That, I mean, one of the things that I noticed, um, I had, I was taking care of, I was babysitting somebody's, uh, five-year-old kid and uh, you know how five-year-old kids are when they come over to babysit the first thing they do is hurt themselves you know I mean that's like to make you look like a bad babysitter it's sitting there that's find a set of stairs I can fly <laughs> right so <clears throat> first thing he, this kid did it before his parents even left you know he found a sharp object and cut himself um, you know it's like oh he thought his parents had left that's what he said he thought his parents had left he didn't know they were still there but they were only out in the driveway so one of those things you know jump the gun there Told me next time he wouldn't hurt himself until after they came back. Uh, but he cut himself, and so he needed a few stitches. But his parents were so serious about it, they scared the hell out of him. You know? And I mean, I literally slapped him across the face, just both of them at once. Like a, you know, one of these Three Stooges movies. I said, knock it off. You're scaring the poor kid. I said, stitches aren't any big deal. You know? I said, you know. And I said, you know, I said, I said did your mother get all upset when she sews a, a tear in your shirt? And the kid went, yeah. Right? And I said, well, aren't you glad you're not a shirt? You're a person. And he went, yeah, I guess so, you know? And I said, I said, the thing that you got to watch, though, and you have to watch this very carefully, is that you have to watch to make sure that it doesn't hurt when they do it. And he went, I have to watch to make sure it doesn't hurt? And I said, yeah, you do. I said, because you see, if you look just close enough in just the right way and hold your hand just right, then what will happen is all the feeling will drain down your arm and you won't be able to feel a thing and that way it will heal ten times as fast. Isn't that ridiculous? And he started laughing. He goes, nah, you're just making this up. And I go, there's only one way to find out. I said, if you do it my way, it's painless. If you do it your way, it hurts. Now, which one of us is smart? Which one is stupid? <laughs> now, by making it, see, I'm still serious about the thing about getting it sewed up, but I'm not going to make it scary. And I think a lot of times, like especially around colleges, there's a lot of this going around. People think, people think, people think that really good scientists, like, you know in the movies you always see the really top-notch scientists, they have the white lab jackets on, and they're always very serious people. Well, every lab I've ever been in, they're the biggest bunch of joking wackos you'd ever want to meet. And I've been in all the top R&D com companies in the, the world. You know, and I mean, they're, they're the guys in there late at night, you know, uh, fuddling with things, you know, lighting their cigarettes off of lasers and, you know, <laughs> figuring out how to see through cards so they can play poker. Well, if you put the right hue of light behind it, you can cheat at cards and stuff. I mean, all of, I mean, these are people that live in toy land. I mean, you know, research and development, I mean, there's no bigger toy land in the world than a research lab. Somebody gives you $20 million worth of toys, tells you to figure something out, right? And there's a hell of a good job. These aren't serious people, but they're always portrayed because it's as if you're going to accomplish more by being grim. And it's not. How do children learn new things? By playing. And it's the playfulness quality that's missing in a lot of people. Now, one of the ways of ungluing and making change in, in, in large areas is to be able to dissemble four tuple sets. Now, the sets of submodalities that constitute, see, like, See, like, there was a time, you remember, Connie Ray, when you were in uh, that strange place down there in New Orleans? Do you remember I did the, the section on dissembling your reality strategy? Right? Well, we, we, what I was teaching people, well, I was trying to teach them about assembling reality strategies. And the, the trick was, is I had people literally go through and dissemble their reality strategy so that their knowledge of what really happened, what didn't really happen, became like, I don't know. But then you can stick things in and put it back together, at least. ...methods. His major emphasis is on how he puts things together 
and the methods that he uses to create lasting change. Since this is a carefully sequenced seminar, we recommend viewing the videotapes in order. The thing about, about listening to the presuppositions uh, in what people say is that is to, is first just the syntactic presuppositions, but then there's a meta level of presuppositions which has to do with, the, with, with understanding their presuppositions about time and their presuppositions especially about causal relationships. Because it's a double-edged sword when you, when you hear that people believe that if this happens it makes you be a certain way, well then if you change what happened then it's going to make them be different. And uh, a lot of the, the techniques that I use now are about going back and putting different things in timelines. For, for example, I don't know, did I do the thing where you, where you go back and build a new imprint experience? You guys know about that? Huh? Some of you are saying yes. Some of you, this is such a coherent group. Well, anyway, let me just, I'll just, we don't have to do it, but let me describe in essence what it was so I can use that is that one of the things is, is that, that imprint experiences themselves, a lot of times that people you know, would say that, uh, for example, I had a guy that had almost drowned when he was a kid. And, uh, and what, what had happened was, is, uh, I mean, he was, he was young and he was on an inner tube, and it was on, uh, where a river is dammed up. And uh, you know, it has a spillway that went down. It's one of these little places in the middle of nowhere. And, Apparently, you know, his father was playing with him and some kids and had them on little inner tubes, and he kind of drifted off, and his father was talking to somebody, and the more he yelled, the further off, and finally he went, and when he just, he, what was stuck in his mind was seeing his father turn around and suddenly just freak, the expression on his face was that he, he knew, he didn't like realize that things were that bad until he saw the expression on his father's face and realized his father was too far away as his face disappeared over the spillway. And then, of course, suddenly the speed changed that he was moving as he rushed down the speedway, and it scared the hell out of him. Now, uh, and he claimed, you know, he almost drowned, and everybody went and saved him or whatever. And after that, he was so afraid, of, this is one of my great clients, he was so afraid of water, he wouldn't drink it. <laughs> now, I think that constitutes a phobia, right? He w only washed with a sponge. Right? And if you think about it, that's, you're never going to be really clean that way. So he had to wash himself with alcohol after he sponge bath. Yeah! You know, that's no way. Nobody should have to live like that or smell that way. <laughs> you have to fix a client like that because you're not going to sweat a sea of more than once, believe me. It's the only time I've had a client come in and I took a bottle of cologne out of my bag and went, <laughs> Now, what was your problem? <laughs> but I mean, this is... The thing is, is to him, one of the things that I did was to find out that this particular imprint was burned in his mind. And uh, even the sound of running water or rushing water was enough to trigger it off. So it was not just a visual thing, it was also an auditory phobia as well. He couldn't, he couldn't walk in the bathroom when his uh, girlfriend was taking a shower. And he couldn't flush the toilet for himself. And that doesn't even sound the same. But he knew it was water, any sound that he knew water could make. And of course, uh, this made rain a terrifying thing for him. He couldn't go out in the rain. You know? And I mean, this, of course, is going to cut down you know, the number of jobs you can hold down, too. You know? And of course, well, of course, he lived in Arizona, but you know, that, that I don't think was entirely his choice. You know? I mean, you know, he'd have to live in the desert, you know? but it rains in the desert sometimes. And uh, I mean, you know. Uh, because when I saw him, his girlfriend was there, and she was actually, she had a great sense of humor, because she was, she was kind of an oaky, and she would go, yes, yeah, when it rains, boy, he's down on the floor under the bed with the dog, shaking like a leaf. <laughs> she said, and she said, what? She said, you know, it's embarrassing if other people are there and it starts to rain. She said, I just throw a blanket on him and tell people to ignore him. He'll be all right in a while. <laughs> but, no. Well, you get used to these things after a while. You stop laughing at them and just throw a blanket over them. And you don't pay any attention to him. It'll stop raining pretty soon. And I'm sure there are people sitting in their living room going, right. Mm -hmm. But see, the one thing I wanted to do was is, is, to, is to take the very process that he was so convinced of. His presupposition of everything he said was, the presupposition was is that it was the rain's fault and that it was the experiences that made him this way. He, you know, because, I mean, he wanted to tell me all about this experience, and I really don't want to hear it. I don't give a damn what happened to people that much. Really, the only thing I need to know is how to utilize it. 
And as he kept wanting to describe, because he wanted to describe it in detail, and as he'd go back and describe it, you could watch him. You know, he'd be like flying through the first part of it till he hit that point at the edge of the falls where he said, you know, he could see, he could just see, you know, the top, all the way up till he could only see the top of his father's head, you know, this face of fear. And as he'd describe it, he'd even lift his hands up like that. And when his hands would be up, he'd be terrified. When he lowered them down, he'd be fine. It was kind of like that thing people do with their face, you know, that thing. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, you know, clients are pretty amusing. You know, when you, the weirder they get, the more fun they are, actually. I like the weird ones because, you know, they always, they come in and they tell you the strangest shit, you know. And, and they always demonstrate it for you. But the one thing I wanted to be able to do was to take the same presupposition. And this is where that technique came from that, that I taught. What I did is I went in and got the submodalities of the imprint experience. You know, the, 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 the larger than life, because it was a picture, it was larger than life. It had uh, an intensity to the color that was more intense than everything. And it was three-dimensional, whereas his other images weren't. So I took all the submodalities and went back and I had him build an experience first. But I had him build a two-dimensional and flat, an experience that would convince him that when he turned his certain age, the phobia would disappear. And he'd fall in love with music, with, you know, something that happened, you know, something that his father said, you know, that, you know, or something that would build the belief that when he turned his present age, this would entirely turn itself around, that he would suddenly fall in love with, with water and the sound of running water and, and the feeling of water flowing on his body and stuff, that what experience could occur that would be as cataclysmic, that would convince him that he would have this problem, but when he turned whatever his age is now. Now, one of the things that made me think of it is he was about to have his 40th birthday. So he had actually said that coming to see me was his present to himself for his birthday. I mean, if I'm going to buy a present for myself, it wouldn't be therapy, I'll tell you that. <laughs> what do you want for your birthday? Oh, I want to go relive some old traumas, you know. It's exciting. But uh, so I decided to, to make it so that, you know, on his 40th birthday, all of it would change since it was his 40th birthday. So what I did is I went back and I put back in his history. Uh, and it, first, I put back a new imprint experience that said when he turned 40, all of this would change automatically. Then the other thing I did is I went back and screwed up the submodalities in the other imprint experience and used something akin to the decision destroyer to do it. So that basically we went back before the experience, went right up through and blew the submodalities out. Because since his presupposition was, since I remember this dramatic experience, I'm stuck this way. So of course I screwed it up because I believed his presupposition. Now as soon as you accept the presuppositions that people have, it allows you to work with them. And then sometimes you want to literally alter the presuppositions. For example, that life is always going to get worse. Some people, they hear them, the older you get, you know, the harder it gets. Stuff like that. You know, you can't teach old dogs new tricks. You should have told my dog that. He learned new tricks that I didn't even want him to know. It's the only dog I know that could open a, a jar of peanut butter, lick it out, and put the lid back on. <laughs> it's nothing like opening a jar of peanut butter and there's dog tongue things on there. And you go, who put the lid back on this? And the dog goes, wasn't me. I can't believe the things done. He learned to open glass sliding doors, go out, get in the garbage, go back inside and slide the door and hit the lock, right? And then when I'd come into the house, he'd bark out the door, right? So I'd go running out there trying to find out who was messing up the garbage. Well, one day I fell asleep on the couch and he didn't know it and I caught him. I watched the whole thing in the mirror up on the mantelpiece, right? Had this whole thing set up. When he was all done, you know, then he just sits and waits. And as soon as he heard me get up, he started barking ferociously. And I went, there's nobody out there. You got caught. And it was like, I have to come up with a new one. And he did. So I know you can teach old dogs new tricks. If he was 16 making this stuff up, it's not impossible. Now, by going back and building new imprint experiences, I'm accepting his world. Now, once it worked with him, I decided, well, if it works with him, we can try it with everybody. I mean, it's where I've gotten most of the best techniques is from what the clients actually do. Because what works in them to produce a negative effect will work to produce a positive effect. It's one of the reasons, you know, that I stress listening to how people pull off their problems. Because, you know, if, if you think about now, like the thing we've been working with, the one thing, like the idea of doing it again probably seems like a lot of trouble, doesn't it? When you think back, you know, it's like going back to the old way seems like work now, doesn't it? Well, it always was. It's, it's, it's just that you were good at it, that's all. 
and you forgot you were working that hard at having your problem. You know, like if there's something that you're afraid of, right? You have to remind yourself. You can't just forget you're afraid of it, you know. Uh, you know, it's like some people are afraid. To, I had a client that was afraid to go places by themselves. And I mean, I'm not talking like walking down dark alleys. We're talking shopping malls, anywhere. I mean, for them to go anywhere, if they went any place by themselves, just driving to work, they were afraid. They were afraid, you know. And they do things like driving down the road. They'd make pictures of people driving by in another car and shooting them or pulling them off the road and raping them and stuff like this while they were driving. <laughs> now, I, when I, so I started asking, I said, well, I said, how many pictures do you actually make in your head between your house and the office? And the person said, like, hundreds. And I went, hundreds? Right? They went, oh, yeah, at least a hundred. You know, and I thought, I said, well, you know, I said, are they just slides or are they whole movies? And they went, well, you know, of course, you know, they're, they're each one, you know, is like, you know, three or four minutes in length. And I thought, God, you know, I said, this is a lot of work. I said, you're a pretty creative guy, you know, being able to come up with all this stuff. And, you know, because what he hadn't thought of is the amount of energy that he put into it. And see, the presupposition is that somehow or other this is going to prepare you for it. And the truth is, is he'd be more apt to get in trouble because he'd be so busy making all of these pictures, he wouldn't notice if somebody was breaking into his car. And, and if he did, he'd be so terrified that he wouldn't have any way of responding. Because especially in his scenarios, he always got killed. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to construct possible futures and you get killed in all of them, this is, you know, this is not what I call adequate planning. Uh, you know, it's, it's the old thing, you know, and... Uh, I, I asked one time in a group for people to come up with, with something where they picked their worst fear and then came up with a scenario where it never bothered them again, right? And everybody came back and I asked people about it individually and I asked this one guy and I said, I said, I said how did you deal with it? And he goes, well, I got killed. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's a choice. <laughs> I said, it's, it's not the first one that comes to my mind, but to him, it was the only way he could never have to deal with it again was to get killed. You know, he's, you know, he ran into the situation and somebody shot him and he died. And, and I, you know, I kind of recommended that perhaps there might be other choices, uh, that it might be more advantageous for him to, like, do something about it. And in that situation, it was just that somebody threatening him in a bar or something, you know, somebody coming up and going, you know, fuck you, buddy. And so he just jumped back and shot himself. Ha, 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 that'll show him. Stick the gun in the other guy's hand and pull the trigger. That way he goes to jail, too. <laughs> Try to explain that to a judge. <laughs> Uh, you know, but you go, the guy just stuck the gun in my hand to pull the trigger. <laughs> right, sure he did. <laughs> go to jail, do not pass go. Shows you being an asshole could be dangerous. You never know what wimps are out there. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, for me, that that's the basic kinds of stuff that I'm listening for. I'm listening for the presuppositions, especially about causal relationships, because they're going to tell me ways to change people. I want to hear their presuppositions about time. And also, I'm going to listen for sorting principles, the presuppositions about how the world is organized. Because I want to know how to utilize natural processes to get people out on the highway. So, you know, I mean, because I'm always trying to go get out there in the fast lane, put the fun meter to the red line, make sparks off the guardrail, and scream holy murder while you do. You know, uh, you know make some noise, be alive. You know, it's, you know it's, if you really want to be polite and nice, make people feel good. Don't become invisible, you know. There's too many boring people in the world. You know, there's too much complacency, too much hesitation. I mean, when they did this study and they came up with the figure that 70% of the people in the U.S. consider themselves shy, uh, you know, that's a huge number of people in the U.S. You know, it's, you know what, close, close to 200 million people sitting around not saying anything. And, you know, uh, try wanted things like, hello. I mean, I'm always amazed in the flirting class when, you know, these, these guys, you know, it's like, what do you do when you see a girl you want to meet, you know? And, you know, what they, this is the kind of stuff I hear, the presuppositions, they go, well, I stop and I, I think to myself, you know, and from that point on, I know that the first thing they do is go on the inside. Hell, by the time they figure it out and open their eyes, she'll probably be gone, you know? And they all go, yeah, that happens sometimes, you know? You know, it's like I open my eyes and look and she's not there anymore. And then they've been torturing themselves for half an hour for nothing. You know, they're going, well, if I go up, she'll reject me. She'll do this. You know, bad things will happen. You know, and I, I always say, you know, has it ever just dawned on you to just, like, say hello? And, you know, and they always go, you can do that? <laughs> yeah, you just walk up and you go, hello. My name is so-and-so. What is your name? 
And if they spit in your eye, move on to another person, right? At least you don't have to spend years worrying about it. And I mean, the, the, time, the amount of time, it's like, even when people learn techniques like anchoring, when I first started teaching anchoring, people would like come up to me during breaks and they go, you like really do this with your clients? And I go, yeah, and they go, well, how do they react when you touch them? And I go, what do I care? That's their problem, not mine, you know? The, the reaction is usually, however I've anchored them. You know, and they go, well, pe people go, don't you, don't you think it's odd? And I go, look, people are touching each other all the time. It's odd if you're behind a desk, because then you have to jump over the top. That might take them <laughs> off guard. But, you know, not if you do it consciously incorporate it. And then, I mean, it's like when I started teaching sales, salesmen started telling me, well, you can't ask people about their internal states. You know, I mean, it's like, well, it's well and fine to do this stuff in therapy, but you can't ask people you know, about, you know, submodalities and stuff in a sales situation. And I thought to myself, I didn't know that, and I've been doing it all these years. You know, because I do, you know, I go, I, I, you literally ask people, I go, before I'm going to show you this, you know, sometimes you make good decisions. You know it's the right thing. People stop and they go, yeah. And I go, sometimes, you know, you make a decision and it's not the right one and you regret it. And they go, yeah. Or you know that, you know, it's, you feel mixed and you don't think it's the right thing to do. And they go, yeah, I know what you mean. And I go, okay, here, I want to show you a brochure of a car. I'm going to put it up here. And, I mean, they, they'll show you with their eyes, and, and you can even ask them outright. I mean, I ask total strangers. People will tell you about their internal processes. They love to talk about it. In fact, they let, once they discover that's a subject, clients don't talk about the past so much. You know, they go, well, I have this memory, you know, and it's big and it's bright and it's close, and it doesn't make me feel as good as I'd like it to, you know. You end up having conversations like that, and you go, well, try this. Ah! It's hard to teach people to do covert work. And I mean, especially for me, when I work with audiences, uh, you know, I'm always doing what I'm talking about, and I'm doing a few other things on the side. Got to keep myself entertained, too. You know, I always have little hidden agendas, little things I want to stick in. But I mean, you know, so it might look more like this, you know. <laughs> While I'm looking this way. But, you know, and I like to set them up in aisles and rows and various things. But a lot of it's based on, on crystal ball gazing, too, because a lot of times as I'm mentioning things, again, I go through lists. Having taught as many seminars as I have and having known the kind of things that get in the way of people being able to teach uh, NLP and to do NLP with, with a sense of humor and ferociously, I mean, it's like the, the exercise, the last one we did about exaggerating things, using humor to, to, to put clients and push them right up against the wall is, you know, I mean, I've done that. And if I don't adequately prepare people, when it's time to do the exercise, they're just afraid. Because, you know, they're going, well, I won't, you know, they start with, I can't do it as good as, you know. And they start, well, you know, I mean, I could have told them that, but that's why they paid money to learn about it, so they could do it better. When you start compare, when you, people who sort by the person have really got a bad thing when they get into comparatives. Because, I mean, I, you know, I know of people that won't do things because they won't be able to do them as good as somebody else the first time. Right? Which means they never get to start. Whereas if you compare whether you're getting better uh, through time, then you, know, you can always improve. And I mean, it's one of the best through time strategies there are, is where you focus the grid to find out how much you're improving. Because if you improve this much and it makes you this much happier, imagine if you improve twice as much, how much better it'll feel. Imagine as you take the skills, just the stuff about that we've been doing about the overall packaging of working with a client. And as you take those skills, and because, you know, you've only done it once now, unless some of you snuck off and did it last night. Yeah, there's a few of you here. <laughs> Therapy junkies. Where can I find a client? Man, I haven't worked with anybody in an hour. <laughs> you look like you want to change, man. Got any problems? Ever feel like you hesitate in life? Well, there's this thing, if you just close your eyes now, that you might find use. Well, anyway. <laughs> yeah. It's, po it's possible I may demonstrate on someone in the target zone. <laughs> and you know who you were, but you don't know who you'll be, and that's the good part about it. When you start making life more fun, and you start making your work more fun, and, you know, drop all this serious stuff, you know, as much as you can. Because curing seriousness is where it's at. See, I mean, that's one of the things, like with the threshold pattern. One of the things I like about threshold pattern is, is to sort between 
what's serious and what's worthwhile. You see, if it's worthwhile, it's worth enjoying. And this isn't a set of, of some modalities that a lot of people have, that, that things that are worthwhile engaging in feel real good. It's a, like a new kind of seriousness. I mean, I can work for hours and hours and hours on things because I enjoy it. That, I mean, even making these tapes, you know, that when they asked me to do it, the way they described it made it sound horrible, right? It's like the first time they came and asked me to do it, they said, well, we want you to do a really basic induction, one that, that anybody can respond to that's general about everything. We don't want you to get real sophisticated and use a lot of fancy stuff. Just make it real simple, and we want it to be 45 minutes long, <laughs> right? And I went... Oh, uh, no, you know. And then I stopped and I thought, well, what could I do that would make it fun and make it worthwhile? How can I make it so it has juice? And I thought, music. Aha. So then I sat down on the piano and began to play. And then I thought, now, if I had a voice coming from here, a voice coming from here, and counterpoint in the voices that related to the music, this could be fun. It could be deepening. And deepening and I started playing that piano lick ring. and uh, as I started going it I started to turn it in because to me for it to be worthwhile it must be enjoyable otherwise I don't want to have anything to do with it now being able to build that kind of framework as opposed to a lot of people think worthwhile and seriousness and they've got seriousness mixed up with just feeling bad you know because I mean I have people in workshops I have people in workshops that who are much too serious that say to me things like they go well, I, want, I really have a serious question you want to ask, and I don't want you to make a joke out of this. And, I mean, that's, I mean, that's like painting a target on you and handing me a squirt gun, man. You know, that's just asking for it. That's all there is to it. And I go, oh, okay, I'll be serious. Right. You know, go ahead, ask the question. <laughs> that, to me, that one of the things is, is, is one of the, the techniques sometimes I do with clients is I find a set of submodalities and disassemble them and reassemble the actual submodalities because it's not that the things that they're serious about aren't worthwhile it's that feeling serious stops them from doing anything about it it's 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 just like you know when we studied strategies in NLP you know how some strategies are just useless well some sets of submodalities are just useless and you know to be real serious and grim about something is not helpful that I mean one of the things that I noticed um, I, had, I was taking care of, I was babysitting somebody's uh, five-year-old kid, and uh, you know how five-year-old kids are. When they come over to babysit, the first thing they do is hurt themselves. You know, I mean, that's like, to make you look like a bad babysitter. It's, it's in there, that's, find a set of stairs, I can fly! Right? So, <clears throat> first thing, he, this kid did it before his parents even left, you know, he found a sharp object and cut himself. Um, you know, it's like, oh, he thought his parents had left, that's what he said. He thought his parents had left, he didn't know they were still there, but they were only out in the driveway, so... One of those things, you know, jumped the gun there. Told me next time he wouldn't hurt himself until after they came back. Uh, but he cut himself, and so he needed a few stitches. But his parents were so serious about it, they scared the hell out of him. You know, and I mean, I literally slapped him across the face, just both of them at once. Like, a, you know, one of these Three Stooges movies. I said, knock it off, you're scaring the poor kid. I said, stitches aren't any big deal. You know, I said, you know, and I said, you know, I said, I said did your mother get all upset when she sews a, a tear in your shirt? And the kid went, yeah, right? <laughs> and I said, well, aren't you glad you're not a shirt? You're a person. <laughs> and he went, yeah, I guess so, you know? And I said, I said, the thing that you gotta watch, though, and you have to watch this very carefully, is that you have to watch to make sure that it doesn't hurt when they do it. And he went, I have to watch to make sure it doesn't hurt? And I said, yeah, you do. I said, because you see, if you look just close enough in just the right way and hold your hand just right, then what will happen is all the feeling will drain down your arm and you won't be able to feel a thing and that way it will heal ten times as fast. Isn't that ridiculous? And he started laughing. He goes, nah, you're just making this up. And I go, there's only one way to find out. I said, if you do it my way, it's painless. If you do it your way, it hurts. Now, which one of us is smart? Which one is stupid? <laughs> now, by making it, see, I'm still serious about the thing about getting it sewed up, but I'm not going to make it scary. And I think a lot of times, like especially around colleges, there's a lot of this going around. People think, people, think, people think that really good scientists, like 
You know, in the movies, you always see the really top-notch scientists. They have the white lab jackets on, and they're always very serious people. Well, every lab I've ever been in, they're the biggest bunch of joking wackos you'd ever want to meet. And I've been in all the top R&D com companies in the, the world. You know, and I mean, they're, they're the guys in there late at night, you know, uh, fuddling with things, you know, lighting their cigarettes off of lasers and, you know, <laughs> figuring out how to see through cards so they can play poker. Well, if you put the right hue of light behind it, you can cheat at cards and stuff. I mean, on a, I mean these are people that live in toy land. I mean, you know, research and development, I mean, there's no bigger toy land in the world than a research lab. Somebody gives you $20 million worth of toys, tells you to figure something out, right? And there's a hell of a good job. These aren't serious people, but they're always portrayed because it's as if you're going to accomplish more by being grim. And it's not. How do children learn new things? By playing. And it's the playfulness quality that's missing in a lot of people. Now, one of the ways of ungluing and making change in, in, in large areas is to be able to dissemble four tuple sets. Now, the sets of submodalities that constitute, see like, see like, there was a time, you remember Connie Ray, when you were in uh, that strange place down there in New Orleans? Do you remember I did the, the section on dissembling your reality strategy? Right? Well, we, we, what I was teaching people, I was trying to teach them about assembling reality strategies. And the, the trick was, is I had people literally go through and dissemble their reality strategy so that their knowledge of what really happened, what didn't really happen, became like, I don't know. But then you can stick things in. And at least. Of things that, that your husband or wife can do that would upset you. That in and of themselves aren't meaningful. But they're symbols. That's where you'll hear the word. And what they are is they're a set of four tuples that just make you feel that way. You can think of them as symbols. It's just out of your control for whatever reason. And the reason isn't important, but if you can dissemble and build in a new one which is more useful. Now, the dissembly process goes like this. Uh, <laughs> you want to volunteer for this? <laughs> I don't know why, why that crossed my mind, but... So, you don't have to tell us what it is, but pick something like in your work, like when you're using these materials and doing NLP. Do you find yourself getting too serious, especially about the right way to do things and that kind of stuff? Yeah. Okay, now, pick a particular type of client that you find you're much too serious with. You don't use enough playfulness with. Or particular other kinds of relationships you might have. Okay. Boom! <laughs> Go down the list. Clients, relatives, friends, lovers. <laughs> it's, always, it's always easy to get too serious about that kind of stuff. Because after all, there is a right way to have a relationship, isn't there? You don't love somebody for how they are, but how you can make them. <laughs> I love you the way you're going to be. <laughs> When I get finished with you, you'll be perfect, or I'll leave you. Because sometimes we decide what we want is not what we desired. Now, okay, what I want you to do is to stop and think of the last time you were in the context where you were too serious. See what you saw at the time. Put yourself back inside it, and notice for yourself, where do you think that image might be? <laughs> Okay, is it real life size? Uh, it's about. This is something 60. worth being serious about, right? Well, no. Not now, huh? <laughs> Boy, girls, you could make a lot out of this one. <laughs> He's changeable. No, I'm serious. Go back. <laughs> I love this one. Boy, you can have a Go lot. Go back of... there. Go back. No, back there. There's nothing to be afraid of yet. As long as you do what I say, you will be happier. Healthier and more virile. You interested in that? Yeah. If you walk back over there, every step will lead to impotency. Shortness of breath. 
I'm glad you've decided to go along with me on this. Feel good. Close your eyes. That's right. Just shut your eyes for a minute. All right. And stop and go back and think about something in your relationship you're too serious about. Even though when you look at it, you feel serious. Go back and look at something that happened that you felt was worth having an all-night discussion about. You remember those, don't you? The long, meaningful discussions where the discussion is longer than whatever the activity is you're discussing. <laughs> this is the way I weigh it. If it takes longer to talk about it than do it, it's not worth talking about. That's my criterion. And I have a little voice inside my head that asks, says, wouldn't you rather be fucking? <laughs> it's how I keep things in perspective. And then that voice moves down here and other places. Okay, but you go back and look at the series. Now, I want you to look. You know enough about submodalities that you know how big it is. You see the size of it, the distance. Okay. Now, this is serious, right? Okay. Now, well, hey, look, we got it. Okay. Now, what I want you to do is to think of something else that's that serious and notice that the submodalities are in the same place. Same distance, same size, same vividness or not. Is it a movie or a slide? Notice the sound, the internal tone of voice that goes with it. Self-righteous internal dialogue. Okay, notice the direction it comes from. Now, <laughs> okay, once you've, <laughs> now you can't laugh, that's not serious. Don't laugh. I always love doing that to kids. Don't smile. That's right. Now, what we want to do is we now want to begin to take that and to alter it. So take one example now. And what I want you to do is, you notice, is the, is the image, uh, how big would you say it is, <clears throat> roughly? Uh, about six feet. By six feet? Is it square? Kind of hazy. So. On, it, <laughs> what you're serious about is hazy? <laughs> well, as long as it's hazy. On I the edges. Obviously. Oh, just the edges are hazy. Okay, what I want you to do is, uh, how about the top, two top corners? Can you see where they are? Corners on the top? Or is it hazy there too? No, there's other different things there. Different things? Like handles and stuff? <laughs> is there a pair of rabbit ears or something? <laughs> That's good. I tell you what you do. Go up and pull, pull each corner up like, into a rabbit yeah. ear. Okay? All right, and then put a bunny nose on the front, <laughs> right? I'm serious. <laughs> I'm, as, I'm as serious as you're going to be. <laughs> no, I'm, real, I'm, I'm telling you, I, this is pure I've science, man. What? You it's got there. it there? Okay, close your eyes again, because I want this real vivid, right? Take the part that's fuzzy around the edge and just make it a little white fur, right? Have it kind of twist a little bit at the bottom so you can see a little bunny tail. And then put two nice little rabbit feet out there. All right. Then, you know that serious internal dialogue you have? Put it in Bugs Bunny's tonality and have it say the same thing. Okay. And then, know that you can deal with the serious, but then... Okay, you can open your eyes if, if you feel better. I just don't want, I don't want you to attach these feelings to these people, yet. <laughs> They're closed, okay. <laughs> they are closed now. See, either that or I have this desire to stick something in them, too. Now, <laughs> at least he had an intelligent response. <laughs> you know, I like what most people do is they open their eyes to see what it is. <laughs> what are you going to stick in there? It's like, don't taste this, it's terrible. People always stick their finger in it and go like this. You go, here, this is awful, try it. Now, okay, you got the Bugs Bunny voice? Okay, now, you, you got, you've turned the shape of this into a bunny rabbit, mm -hmm. right? Okay, then what I want you to do is to take a voice that comes from both sides here from behind, and I want it to come up from this direction, and I want it to be in 
incredibly sexy and say to you, would you rather be fucking? <laughs> if this is a relationship person, if it's with a client, I don't want you to ask that question. <laughs> you have to have an MD to do that. <laughs> Now, how serious do you feel about this particular content now? Not, I'm just nervous being up here. <laughs> I would too. <laughs> You'd be even more nervous if you don't do what I say. <laughs> Stop being nervous or I'll hurt you. It's the <laughs> So it's, so this is what I did to my stepson one time. He had a fear of water. He was afraid to swim. So I towed him out in the middle of the pool, and I said, relax, or I'll dunk you. And he went, and just relaxed comfortably. You'll be all right. You'll live through this. Now, go back and look at the event. Do you feel this serious? Now, stop and think of the time you've been the most playful. Stop and think of what the most playful thing you've ever done is. OK? Now, what I want you to do is I want you to take the bunny rabbit and I want you to just pull it over and stick it right in front of that. And as it hits, I want it to melt right in to the other set of, of submodalities and spread out so that the content of what you were serious about, you're now playful, but keep the bunny ears. All serious things should have bunny ears. Now, when you think about it, does it seem as serious? Which? That over there? Well, you're supposed to pull the, the, that over there, the bunny rabbit, you're supposed to pull up, right? This it's is the over here, yeah. Yeah, but pull it up and put it, put it so that, like, if you take the picture of your playfulness, think of it as, as almost being water. Put the bunny rabbit right in so it melts in, and as it melts, take the content of what you were serious about. Put it in the submodalities of playfulness, but add bunny ears to it. It's a normal thing everyone does. Okay. You got it? Now, are you as serious about it? No. Okay. Now, I want you to go back and look at something else that you're serious about. And as soon as you do, put bunny rabbit ears on it and repeat the process. Okay. It's done. Now, do another one. Now do being up here. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Mr. Slack here, huh? Do it, try it. Being up here is serious, right? No, it's just nervous. <laughs> well, I mean, it really matters where you sit in the room. Would you rather stand next to me or in front of me? I think it's more dangerous over there, if you ask me. <laughs> See, my philosophy of life is you can stand beside me or you can stand in front of me. Which do you want? Here's fine. <laughs> okay, now go up and put being up here is a serious thing. It's worth worrying about. Seriously, put up a picture that goes, it's worth worrying about being up here in front of all these people. It's real important. Listen to the internal dialogue that makes it a big deal. Notice what you're doing to yourself. And then make it into a bunny rabbit. Slam it over into playfulness. And then have a tonality up here and have it say, wouldn't you rather be teasing them? Yeah, I would. <laughs> Aren't you going to? We keep the voice up there. Have it make suggestions. Look at it, man. See, one of the things about being in front of an audience is that you get to watch them all at the same time. That gives you more choices of people to pick on than they have. <laughs> and never think about it that way. Look at them holding their breath, waiting for you to say something. If you wait long enough, some of them will die. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> See, you're too nice. <laughs> Me, I would have gone. <gasps> <laughs> OK, you can go sit down now. Thank you. Not there. <laughs> You know what happens to you if you sat there, for God's sake.
You have to be careful which trance you sit in. Now, yeah. I just feel compelled to comment that someday this pattern is going to be in a book and people are going to read it and think, in order for this to work, it has to be a bunny rabbit. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm going to stick with a bunny rabbit for the next year. There'll be groups of people sitting around at a committee meeting somewhere right. saying, we heard that Richard is making it into a duck. <laughs> He's lost his mind. We all know it must be a bunny rabbit. Uh, I know. Well, see, the duck is the other polarity. No, I, yeah, I know, I know. I'm glad you commented on that because uh, I really don't feel I should have to point out that it doesn't have to be a rabbit. <laughs> what it is. <laughs> But I know somebody so is going to do that. They've done it with everything else I've developed because they're serious. And they're going to get serious about making it a rabbit, too. Seriousness must be a little bunny rabbit. And logic must be a little bird. Uh, humans are strange creatures. But I'm glad you pointed that out because I know somebody in their notes goes, and then you turn it into a bunny rabbit. Uh, and I, the question was probably on their mind. Does it, does it have to be a bunny rabbit? Right. Because I'm, you know, because I get, I get the, you know, I get, you know, do you have to anchor on the knee? You know, and, you know, and I go, you know, well, let's see. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, I'm sure, especially if they're in committee meetings, you know, uh, they'll probably, uh, you know, probably kick somebody out of an organization for using a duck, you know. And then there'll be two organizations, the people that do ducks and the people that do bunny <laughs> rabbits. And then they'll write journal articles back and forth discussing which is the real one. Whether Richard really meant we should use a duck or a bunny rabbit. See, I mean, I've, I've watched journal articles back and forth where people argue about my opinion. And I'm not one of them. <laughs> and, you know, and as I look at these things, I go, so I feel that way, huh? And I go, I can do that. And then I read the other one, I go, so I disagree with that. <laughs> yeah, I can do that too. But so what? Now, it, it, uh, actually, it is important, though. <laughs> I don't know if I can even do this. I love discussing these important issues. Uh, the thing that I try to do when I'm doing dissembling is as they describe what shape it is, I try to find a natural animal that will apply. Uh, or, or depending upon what the subject matter is, sometimes I just use body parts or various <laughs> other things that, that I discovered, you know, that, for example, I worked with this the guy I was telling you about. What I did is, is I had him take the, uh, the, the things that he was being serious about, because he's being really serious with his wife about, you know, really extraordinary things, like, you know, which side the silverware was on on the table, you know. And, you know, he felt that, you know, that when she put the spoon on the wrong side when he brought his boss to dinner, that she was doing that to humiliate him, right? And she said she was, did it because she was in a hurry. Right? She just didn't realize, and he said, well, you know, this is the third time you've done it, you know. But, of course, then she got caught up in which was the right one because she didn't grow up knowing which ones were which, you know. And then, you know, she got the silverware right, but she put the water glasses in the wrong place, you know. And she just did that to aggravate him. Well, what I did is I had him take the things that were serious, and I, and I, had, them, I had him put them on his wife naked. And notice where his eyes drifted to. <laughs> now, he could either, because he was one of these people that he didn't have a picture of what happened. He wrote it out, you know, a visual digital. These, these people are real exciting lives. Their internal dialogue is a teletype. <laughs> they're, they're really slow to talk to, too, because they always do this. <laughs> and then they come back to speak to you, and they forgot what they read, you know, and stuff like that. But, so I had him put it on, you know, take, because serious to him was, it was, it was, it was a page, it was angled out this way. And so I had him just cut it into a shape of a woman and then have it come to life as his wife. But I also had her standing in a lewd position while she did it. Find out whether he felt like arguing with her and whether this was more important or whether he'd rather be fucking. Now, if you add internal dialogue, now, what I want you to do is I want you to instill uh, an internal dialogue that says, wouldn't you rather be playful? Would you rather be playing? Would you rather be enjoying yourself? Or would you rather have this conversation? Now, 
Because the thing is, is when you're doing NLP, your playfulness and getting people to play with their problems. One of the reasons I've taught you games, like most of you in here have learned the thing, you know, where you fill in for a day for people. You know, it's you're from the temporary uh, mental health agency and you go in and you have their illness for a day. You guys have done that, right? I love this group. It's so incongruent. <laughs> Normally a group goes yes or no and the half of you are going no. But it is. It's the same thing I did with the, with the lady on the film from the Marshall University tapes. I said, wouldn't it be nice to have a day off from your problems? You know, and who's going to say no to that? You know, no, I'm going to have my problems every day. And I said, you know, think of me as somebody from a temporary agency. And that my job, if you can tell me how to have your problem, then I'll do it and you don't have to. You know, I'll fill in for you and you can take a vacation for two weeks and you don't have to have your problem. You'll be free from it. And it's a way of getting people to describe uh, their problem instead of as a difficulty, as a skill. Like, so with her, she had the, the psychotic episodes that people were late. So I, she, I said, well, you know, how do I know when to have them? And she said, well, you have to arrange ahead of time for people to meet you. <laughs> right? See, already it becomes an active process. And I go, okay, well, if I arrange for somebody to meet me at four, if they're not there at four, I feel fine. And she goes, she looks at me like with kind of utter disgust, like, well, it's not that simple. <laughs> right? And I said, well, what do, you, what do you have to do? And she said, well, you have to think about something happening to them. And I said, well, I think about them going out and having an ice cream. And I feel fine. And she goes, nothing like that. She said, like horrible things, like them being in an accident. And I said, well, I, I can make a picture of them being in an accident. I still feel fine. And she said, well, of course, at first you do. And I said, well, what do you do then? And she said, well, then you get closer. And I said, well, where do you start out? And she said, well, it's like I'm across the street. But then the later they are, the more I float over till I can get over and see the blood everywhere and the eyes hanging out. And it gets bigger and larger and larger and closer and closer. And I went, ah, it works. <laughs> now I can fill in. But you see, as somebody does that, that what happens is, is for, rather than it being a problem, it gets translated into a skill. It's to me the translation device from therapy to NLP. And especially if people have had too much therapy, and this lady had 16 years of therapy with this. I can't, have a, I can't even, I don't have a good enough memory to have a problem for 16 years. You know, I, I'm sure I just forget. And I mean, I've tried it with people. I've tried just hypnotizing them, giving them amnesia for their problem. And the only difficulty with it is that everybody around them argues with them about it. You know, I took this one guy who was a chain smoker, had uh, emphysema, and I gave him amnesia for having ever smoked, right? And of course, what happened is, is people were showing pictures of him to him with cigarettes, and he looked at him, he'd look at the picture, and he'd go, I'm not smoking. Negative hallucination. But it, they spent all their time trying to insist that he still had the problem. So you'd either have to hypnotize the world, or else you have to touch a lie, which is what I did, is I tell them to tell other people that they were just doing that because that other people were really having a conspiracy against you to force you to have been a smoker <laughs> so you must agree with them now the thing that we're going to try to do here is what we're going to try to do is dissemble seriousness in a way that makes it so you can be more playful and of course the t what's the tool the tool is to play with your submodalities of being serious that's why we make shapes out of them bunny rabbits and ducks naked women, but no, no dogs or cats. <laughs> Don't ask me why, but you must not make dogs or cats. <laughs> we'll leave this on the tape for posterity. <laughs> that way they'll be having committee, they'll be, they'll be working this stuff out for years, won't they? I mean, I'm glad you have a sense of humor about that because it's the stuff that I hear people arguing about and stuff in NLP to begin with. This is all a hallucination that started with me and John, you know, being locked up in the hills with nothing to do. You know, it was raining and we couldn't go outside, right? <laughs> and that's basically where this started. And, you know, it was, we watched too much television, read too much science fiction, and didn't understand our limitations. <laughs> it's what somebody at the university told us, is that we just didn't understand our limitations. And I looked at him and I went, you know, you're right. I don't understand them. I don't even like them. <laughs> but I understand yours, and I don't like those either. Now, the trick is, is, is again, like, remember when we did the thing, the pendulum thing? The pendulum thing that we did where, where you were eliciting uh, what you wanted them to move away from was the old behavior. 
And what you want them to move towards is a futuristic behavior. We're going to do the same thing this time. The same principle applies. You want to build in something that draws them towards a future of being more playful about the things that they are serious in. Now, we'll restrain ourselves in content here and utilize uh, the same kind of a technique. I want you to use the same exaggeration techniques that you were using before, the same skills, because when you at, what I want you to do is to start, I'm going to actually, in a workshop, let you have some content. How's that for a first? Pretty good. You get to advanced levels. You get to do some content. I want you to ask the person that you're working with, and you can switch partners this time if you want. Probably get tired of your partner. They got all these anchors all over them, and now you got to wipe them off. It's okay. If they change clothes, then you get to make new anchors. That's why you have to have your clients wear the same clothes to therapy every time. And they can't wash them either. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> now, what, what you want to be able to do is I want you to have them describe what they're too serious about with their clients, whatever kind of clients they have, whether they do sales training, whatever. Where do they find that they get hooked? Hooked is a term Virginia taught me. Virginia used the term hooked by when, 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 when she was training family therapists, when they got hooked into content, when they got hooked into the family system, when they started believing that what one member in a family system did was worse than another, when they believed that one person really was a victim and the other was persecuting them, and as if it doesn't take two to play that game. You know, it, you know, if the wife poisoned him, he wouldn't be able to do it anymore. I mean, if she did, you know, she, if, if she made a rustle next to the bed one night and he woke up and she was sitting there with a straight razor next to his dick, he'd be a lot more polite after that. You know, there are ways of capturing people's attention. But, I mean, you know, if she lets him beat her up, you know, for five years, you know, it's not just him doing it because it's, these things work in systems. All it takes is the right tonality and she can get him to hit her. You ever notice that? You know, I notice Use a high, pitchy, whiny tonality and relentless jabber, you know, and pretty soon anybody will want to hit you. I mean, and, you know, I noticed that because I did a thing for uh, a shelter for abused women. And, you know, I was in there five minutes and I felt like slapping the shit out of them. You know, I was like, change your tone of voice, man. You want me to help you shut up or I'll smack you one. And I mean, it was, they had the most horrid tonality. I mean, it, it was like, you know, five dental drills coming at you at one time. You know, and I really had to teach them, look, if this is the way you want men to treat you, keep talking this way. And it was, well, we shouldn't have to change the way we act, you know, in order to be treated right. And I said, maybe you shouldn't, but if you keep acting this way, you're going to get smacked by me. <laughs> now, do you want to be treated well or not? Do you want to be hit or do you want to be treated well? Which is it? And they always go, well, I guess we want to be treated well. <laughs> I go, well, if once you start getting treated well, you might discover that it's better than you think. And all it requires is tonality. They go, but they go, but it wouldn't be really me. And I go, it will be after a while, believe me. When they start doing things to you that make you feel that way, your voice will come out that way real natural. Trust me. There are better relationships you can have with men than violence. Trust me, that is also the case. Now, when you find, when you have the person, have them describe where they get too hooked, where they start thinking about too much, or they start worrying about the right technique, or they start worrying about whatever it is. Whenever your partner finds that they get too serious, and have, all you have to do is have them think, you know, what, what, you know, what's the part where people come in, or you're in a session, where when somebody says something or things start to go, you say to yourself, Oh, shit. You know, that's a good indicator because that usually what follows that is seriousness or where you begin to, where you begin to get self-righteous about things. Now, if you really want to find out, ask them what they dislike about other neurolinguistic programmers. It'll come out there, too. <laughs> ask them if they've ever been to a committee meeting and what they talked about. It'll come out there, too. That as you find that, then what I want you to do is to get Compare the submodalities between what's really serious, and you have to be able to use that tone of voice because, again, it's elicitation. So when you say serious, you must sound serious. And if you have to laugh, then you have to turn around and go back and do it again. So you, when you find out what's serious, then you want to compare it with playful because both of these things do not preclude getting it done. See, a lot of people, there's a difference between acting serious and being serious. 
I am quite serious about the work that I do, but I do it in a very playful way because that's part of what makes it work. Acting serious and pompous uh, doesn't help to get things done. It doesn't, get, it doesn't provide you the range of flexibility and behavior to even do it. It's like, you know, if there's a right way to see families, if there's a, a right way, uh, you know, if there's a right way to learn NLP, for example, if you must spend two weeks doing sensory acuity exercises, learning to squint to see minimal changes, and you can't laugh about that, you will never learn to utilize this technology. Now, I'm the one that started that. I finally dawned on me that it wasn't that useful. You know, learn to squint later on. You know, make the responses more exaggerated and you're better off. But also, at the time that I was doing that, I didn't have the tools to exaggerate responses. Now that we have submodalities, you can crank anything up. You don't need to spend three weeks doing sensory acuity. You need to spend three weeks learning to have the right attitude. And the attitude is one that maximizes playfulness. So once you have seriousness and playful, then what you do is you start to dissemble by taking not one but multiple cases of where they're serious and having them convert it into animal shapes, anything that's playful. So they start playing it and then melting it into playfulness. Because in essence, what we want to do is start knocking out. We want the natural response to seriousness to get to playful to get it done. Okay? Grab yourself a partner and try this. It's fun. And do it in trance. Might as well. We've been doing trance all day. Tell them to stop and think back to the music they heard in the tape they were listening to. And remember that soft and playful melody. And as they do so, allow their eyes to close and enjoy the process of learning. Really learning about going into a trance. Now go do it. I wanted to, uh, once again, find out if any other questions had come to mind. I was hoping a few things would roll out of your curiosity. I mean, we have, uh, we have another day left, and uh, I'd like to be able to provide the kinds of things that you'd like to know about. Um, I can always come up with entertaining things for us to do. Uh, I'm always into wanton and unadulterated forms of making life more ecstatic. I wanted, while I was here, to to spend time talking about how you format what you do with the client. And I think we pretty much covered that you coerce them into getting better. That, you know, you make the way they live seem so utterly ridiculous and unfamiliar that it seems silly to not go out and live their life, you know, and not get on with it, you know. You know how many that people sit around and worry about asking for a raise rather than just keep asking? If you ask enough times, you're bound to catch somebody in the right mood. Plus, if you breathe at the same rate, if you walk in and you sit down, breathe at the same rate, blink at the same time, slowly begin to nod your head yes, and then ask. They'll find their head nodding yes. I've discovered this is useful for many things. <laughs> Any other questions that come into your mind? Did you have one? Back to time distortion. Um, All right. Back. <laughs> God, my time is rushing back. No, good. Go ahead. Uh, I tend to lose things, uh, particularly expensive earrings. And it seems to me there ought to be a way to use time distortion when I'm putting them down or something so that I can find them. Oh, they don't even fall off. You just hide them from yourself. <laughs> That's, that, you know, it's like, this is, I don't want to lose these. They're the, they're the ones I always lose. The ones I always lose. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you would. I don't want to lose these. Uh, I'm in a place where I will remember. Well, I, it, of course, you know, uh, the, the thing is, is you want to build in an internal dialogue that goes, Remember where you put these, and touch your ear, and put a picture of where they are in your mind. Look down, make sure they're still there, because memory is based, the whole problem people have with memory is they don't encode the memory. So you have to stop. You have to have a thing that when you pull the earring out, screams in your head, stop! Remember where you put these! You know, and then you will. And at first it has to be very loud so you notice it. Because if you say, oh, no, I'll, I'll, I won't forget where they are. You know, so you got you to literally sit down and program yourself to, to do it. And what you do when you want to learn a new behavior like this is you do it rotely. You know, put your earrings on, take them off, set them down, do it, look, wait five minutes, then see if you can get a picture of it in your head. Don't just look at where they are, get a picture, and then walk over to it. And do it like five or ten times, you know, three times a day, and you'll program yourself to do things. 
Repetition does work, but you don't need massive numbers of repetition. You just need a few where you take yourself through the process and you'll learn to install a new strategy. I mean, I found out, like with things with the spelling strategy, it's not enough to tell kids you have to encode a few words with them. You, you know, uh, you encode 10 words a day for a week and after that they start encoding them by themselves and it becomes a natural process for them. You know, the thing is, is when people tell me, well, you know, it, it, it's not like me to do this, you know, and I go, was you doing it, wasn't it? And they go, yeah, and I go, well, it's like you now. Because, you know, when just because things are unfamiliar doesn't mean they're not you. It just means they're new. When you learned to ride a bicycle, it was quite unfamiliar. First time you had sex, it wasn't the same old thing, you know. You know, it's, you know, but it's still you doing it. And, you know, it will become more natural the more you do it and the more you encode and learn those processes. And more enjoyable if you do it right. Seriously. Yeah, what was your question? When you do uh, covert therapy, when you're up there, how do you know? <laughs> how do you know what everybody's issues are? And, I don't. Uh, I do crystal ball gazing to find out. There how are, are you reading? What? What are you reading? Things like head nods like this. <laughs> <laughs> Facial explosions of color and stuff, you know. You know, small, small, really, it's really overt, you know. You have to understand, I've done this for so long that, that if, I didn't, if I didn't do it, so you'd come up and ask me anyway. You know, I get to the point where, you, you know, I've just done it. To understand, probably for, I've probably done more workshops than all the other NLP people put together, numerically. I just work more than anyone else does. And part of it is because I like it more, because I have more fun than they do. You know, I mean, a lot of the, my colleagues are just so damn serious. They don't have much fun. So teaching is really work. So they do, they do a lot of workshops for a couple of years, and then they really start to taper off. You know, and I mean, I've taken a break now and then, but mostly I, my workshops are a lot of fun. I have a good time. And so I've done a lot more. And through the years, I've gotten to notice certain things and that people come and ask me about them. And it's not just a thing that's for one person. There, there are like groups of things that dealing with. And there are things that if you just change in people, makes it easier for them to, to not just participate in their life, but to, to be able to do NLP. So I think of it as part of teaching. Because part of teaching has to do with installing chains with the information. You have to have the right feelings behind the behaviors. It's because it's not information. It's not just the dispersion of information. But that information has to be, there has to be a chain installed behind it. Um, people need to have a strategy to be able to think about it. And that's one of the reasons that I go through and tell stories is because rather than going through the same thing over and over again, I can tell the same story, but go through five different stories, content-wise that are different, but the same chain is there, the same sequence is there, so that I can make it so that, because I don't want people to take this stuff and go out and do what, you know, because the first few years when I was teaching, I didn't do this, and I saw what the result was, and I, w I didn't like it, so I had to do it better. See, to me, the trick is to become a better and better teacher. And I mean, I can tell by the, the kind of the quality of work that people do. I mean, I've seen some videotapes. I mean, I get them all the time in the mail. And I can tell, you know, which year they learned by what I was doing. I mean, I can see the difference in their skill level. I mean, you can tell the difference between people that continue to learn. And it's funny, some of my oldest students are the people that are still going to workshops. And they're some of the best, like Connie Ray and Steve. Uh, Jesus, what was the first year you guys went to a workshop? It's 1975 or six or something? 77? I mean, you know, that's, what is that? It's 12 years ago, you know? And, you know, you're, you're sitting here, you know, like this, you know? And, and, you don't, and you don't get into that thing that people get into. They're too good to do the exercises. I mean, I love, well, now that I've become a trainer, I don't need to learn anymore. I'll just be a jerk. <laughs> I got a piece of paper that says I can be one. You know, well, you know, it, it I mean, to me, you know, my, you know, my enthusiasm, there isn't anything I do to any of you that I haven't done to myself a hundred times. I mean, you know, I'm a lot harder on me than I am on anybody else here, let me tell you. You know, the shit I do to my brain, and a lot of the stuff I do doesn't work, and I have to fix it. You know? <laughs> I mean, I've been locked in my room for three days trying to put my head back together, going, boy, that was a bad idea. <laughs> Don't ever do that again, you know, and... Uh, but I mean, to me, the brain is a play thing. I want to know what it can do. And once I find out, sometimes I don't want to do it anymore. But, uh, 
you know, it's like uh, they, I had a, uh, somebody uh, loan me one of these uh, JVC uh, gr special effects generators, <laughs> right? And a video camera, right? And, you know, and I had, a, I had a VCR, you know, and I had this great big TV on the end of my bed. I, I don't go home very often, but when it's there, it's like going to the movies. It's a huge thing. And it's not even a projection one. It's a big slotted matrix, fancy Japanese prototype thing, you know. And I mean, it sits there, you know, and I, I, what I do is I get my face right in front of it. I lay with my head towards the end of the bed. So it's right there, you know, panoramic, you know. So if I watch a videotape, I'm there. You know, I got a bruise on my head from watching Raiders of the Lost Ark when the boulder came down and hit me, <laughs> you know. And, I mean, they gave me this thing, and I sat there, you know, and, and what I did is, you know, I just, you know, I, I, you know, created an image, right, on the screen, first with the camera, you know, made a picture of myself there, and then started doing all this stuff to it, right? And then what i do is i stopped, and I'd take things and do it in my head. And this was years ago. I used to do this uh, Fabric of Reality seminar where I taught people how to twist submodalities. I didn't say they were submodalities, so nobody else knew. Uh, so it's, it's funny, if you don't give a name, people don't think about it. But I used to do things like have people take images, right, of things that they thought were, you know, real. And, you know, and, and then find out what we could do to them, you know. Like I used to have them take the pictures and have them corkscrew forward. Have them go panoramic and fall over. <laughs> Had to give you a minute to get up from that one. Ah, have them fall forward, right? You know, take a panoramic image of yourself being 10 times as sensual as you are now, the way you're bound to be sometime in the future, right? Then turn it around backwards and have it fall on you. <laughs> and hear the sound of a brick falling down as it lands. <laughs> oh! <laughs> And, uh, well, we used to do stuff like that just to find out what your brain will do. I mean, I don't think that, you know, I mean, it's like, I love the one where the person put, you know, the swish pad. I love swish patterns anyway. People come up with great ones. The person, you know, puts the thing they want to swish to on the surface of a swimming pool, jumps off the high dive, and as they go down, they get bigger, right? That way it becomes life-size, and there's no turning back. <laughs> This is what we refer to. There's one thing about jumping off of mountains, jumping out of planes, and jumping off of high dives. This is what we refer to as a real commitment, right? I mean, I had a skydiver. I had a guy who was a skydiver who told me he had trouble making commitments. And I thought, when I heard him say that to me, I thought, I thought, if there's anybody in the world that makes commitments, it's you, for God's sake. I said, you know, I said, what do you do when to step out of an airplane? You know? And he goes, well, I, I just do it. You know, and I said, sure. I said, I said, I'm sure your body says, hey, no problem. Let's just step out of the plane. I know your neurology is going, this is wrong. <laughs> There's no way your neurology looks out of the plane, goes 30,000 feet. Let's step. Right? I know every neuron inside of you has got to be going, well, we've got a parachute. You know, there's got to be some serious conversation. And he goes, well, yeah, I said, but, you know, he said, I, I make a picture of myself stepping out, and I see the chute opening. Right? And then I jump behind it. So one of these days, see me, I'd be doing this stuff first. <laughs> I saw that. Did you see that guy in San Diego? Did you hear about this guy in San Diego? He's a skydive photographer. He's the one that takes all the pictures of them, skydives down with them, right? He does five jumps one day, right? The last jump, he forgets to put his chute on. Now, this is what we call getting a little too visual, right? And you can see they have the videotape. That's the only thing that survived. Right? You see the videotapes going along, he's videotaping. For about five, six seconds, he's videotaping, and then it suddenly stops, and it goes like this. It goes like this, and then it goes like this. And then you, that's where he dropped it, I guess. Uh, but, I mean, that's, this is what we're calling, you know, you know, when people get locked into a lot of times, you know, they forget they exist. You know, I mean, I've seen this, you know, like, like I know you, do, you, you watch the TV, but with these guys that always look through the thing, Right? Sometimes they forget. I mean, I, I've had, when they were doing the uh, filming on the, uh, this one set that I was working on uh, with a friend of mine who's a movie producer, the cameraman was doing this thing where he had to carry the camera, and his, he was doing his part, and then they had the ones on the trolleys and stuff. And when we broke for lunch, he was walking with the camera like this. Right? And we said, you can put the camera down. And he went, oh, oh yeah. Walked over like this and then set it down. And to him, you know, he'd just become a part of it. 
Now that's fine when you're talking about walking to lunch, but when you're talking about jumping out of an airplane, this is, you should have some internal process that goes, wait a minute! You know, I mean, you should be able to feel whether there's a 25 pound thing on your back or not. But I mean, this is where I, mean, this is where I want to have my kinesthetics highly tuned. You know, I mean, I, but I mean, this guy couldn't make commitments. But I mean, to me, you know, uh, if you can jump out of an airplane, you should uh, be able to translate that set of submodalities into, you know, jumping into something like a relationship. I mean, he was having trouble deciding whether or not he wanted to live with this woman. And so he'd get her all pumped up about it and then tell her not to move in, thereby making her truly nuts. And then he said, well, she seems to get upset a lot, you know. <laughs> and, uh, right, I said, good, blame it on her, you know. That's right, go, let's move. You really want to live together? Yeah, well, I don't know, you know. And then he'd wonder why she was kind of a yo-yo, I mean, as he put it. And I'd said, well, you know, if you're holding the string, you've got nobody to blame but yourself. Uh, these kinds of things, I mean, the presuppositions that, that, that somebody is unable to do something, when you can readily find examples in their life, is, is, it, is one of the kinds of presuppositions that I hear. And they also, even when you mention it to them, they will talk as if that's different. And so that's where I have to break presuppositions. And breaking presuppositions is fun, because this is where exaggeration is your most powerful tool. This is where you can, I mean, if you remember the thing I did with, on the shyness tape with this guy, you know, because I will not let up, you know, and they go, well, yes, but skiing is fun. Ski jumping is fun. And I went, jumping off of mountains is fun, and women is scary. And he went, well, yeah. And I just kept repeating it. <laughs> and it's like, it's like sometimes it don't go through the first time, sometimes it don't go through the second time, but by the third time you see the fog begin to clear, <laughs> right? It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's just like looking at Andy and saying, you, people come off the TV and you watch the Playboy channel or you watch Little House on the Prairie, right? Which makes sense. Even out of the, the waves of schizophrenia and the drugs that he took, you can watch the clouds part. You can watch that little glimmer where the eyes suddenly focus, and it goes, yeah, that makes sense. You know, that you can jump, that you're not afraid to jump off of a mountain on a pair of sticks, <laughs> right? Into God knows what, right? And walking across a room and saying hello scares you. Now, but, you know, and I mean, of course, I'm, I'm always anchoring these things, you know, in terms of, you know, well, if I thought about what was going to make me feel good, right, you know, throwing myself off a mountain, you know, meeting beautiful women. And as I kept on him in this way, I kept saying, think about it. You know, nice, soft, beautiful woman, hard, cold snow. <laughs> Put sticks on feet, race downhill, and jump out. Fun, you know. Walk over, kiss and caress lovely woman. Scary. <laughs> now, <laughs> they really need to learn to do this. It's different than sarcasm. It's really looking at them like, oh, yeah? You know, because sometimes you got to do it slow, got to do it a few times, and you keep got to go back and forth till something in their brain cracks open and goes, that's stupid. Because as soon as you get that opening, Boom! That's where you can slide in the suggestions. That's where you can go. Take the picture in this submodality. Put the woman over here. Put the sticks over there. <laughs> Try this on for a while, you know. Or put them both over here, you know. But for God's sake, don't keep the woman over there if you got the sticks over here, you know. I mean, you know, because, you know, as, you know, because even with him, I had to go, I go, right. You go out, spend money, buy sticks, buy all this uncomfortable clothing, right? Get in your car, drive hundreds of miles, right? So you can go and stand in line, so you can sit in a chair to go way up a freezing mountainside, so you can get on the sticks, so you can not just slide down the hill, but jump 200 yards out into God knows what. Now, this is your idea of a hobby, right? The guy went, yeah. <laughs> And then I said, and on the other hand, you're sitting in a room and you see a beautiful woman and you go, oh, God, I better not walk up and talk to her. Who knows? I might fall on the floor, you know. 
break my nose. Right? It's a lot more dangerous than jumping off of mountains. And it's a lot more trouble because you have to walk all the way across the room <laughs> instead of just drive 200 miles. Makes sense, doesn't it? Now, when you start to present things in this way, what happens is, is it begins to build a little perspective in. Because <laughs> one of the things you have to understand about the things that people can, that fit for them, primarily has to do with the angle. Like if, if you take, like, so if you take thinking about exaggerating things with clients in this way, if it feels unnatural, what I want you to try to do is like put an image of yourself doing it out in front of you in space. Only make it three-dimensional. In fact, make it holographic so that literally you can move around it. Close your eyes and make it so that you can move all the way around so that you could be from the point of view of behind the client looking at your face and then keep moving. And what you'll notice is, is as you enter behind yourself, there will be a particular angle that you can step in easily. In fact, an angle where you almost get sucked in. Now... This is one of the things when people say, well, they can make changes if they look at it from the right perspective. Now, this kind of a perspective assists people. Now, one of the things is, is that in order to get people to be able to be receptive, it's not enough just to change the angle of the image. You want to make sure that it's connected with all of the emotions possible. And this is why, where I use exaggeration as a powerful tool. With a guy like this guy who was shy, the more ludicrous I make it seem that, you know, you know, well, if you can jump off a mountain and you can't walk across a room, you know, like which is more dangerous? Let's think this over. Part of what I'm trying to do is, is instead of just like do, making submodality changes mechanically, I want them to have the full-blown emotions that go with them. That, you know, I want him the next time he gets up on that mountain to think about, you know, this is a little ludicrous, right? He can still enjoy it, but then when he gets down to the ski lodge, Walking up to a woman is going to seem like nothing. And this is what I'm after, you know, because if he can jump off of mountains and then he has to hide in the ski lodge, that really is stupid. There's no other description for it. You know, I mean, if he's got the balls to jump off of a mountain, he ought to be able to at least walk up to somebody and say hello. It seems to me that it's the simple things that people have trouble doing, that they have trouble being nice to the person they live with, where they can be nice to total strangers, you know. I mean, to me, I think about it, you know, if I'm going to be shitty to somebody, pick a stranger. At least be nice to the people you live with. I mean, for no reason, you know, other than the fact that when they're smiling and happy, it's a lot nicer. Either that or close the door and shut up, you know, because if you really anchor a lot of bad feelings to the people you live with, then when you walk in, those will all trigger off, and it's not very useful. <coughs> anyway. You come back here at 10 o'clock tomorrow and think of the kinds of things that you like to do. We'll get into that more tomorrow. Remind me. This videotape is edited from an advanced NLP training in Boulder, Colorado, April 1989. Many of the participants had also attended previous advanced training with Richard. Richard considers this seminar to be his best ever presentation of how he works with clients. Although he presents some new submodality methods, his major emphasis is on how he puts things together and the methods that he uses to create lasting change. Since this is a carefully sequenced seminar, we recommend viewing the videotapes in order. I had a lady one time that had lost her wedding ring. And she lost it about 15 years before she came in. And she, she just mentioned that, you know, because she said she was married. And I said, you have no wedding ring. Oh, yeah. And, uh, thanks. Get you Oh, Ted. Well, well, I, well. It was a pre I just asked her because I mean, you know, it, uh, I mean, when I have clients, I ask questions. Just you know, 
if it, it could have been a political statement, but she said she lost it and that she could never bring herself to replace it because it was so special that she just thought about it being there. And she was such a good trans subject that what I did is I just regressed her uh, back through time. I just regressed her back to when she first got married and then told her unconscious to quickly move forward and uh, at the unconscious level until the ring felt the moment the ring fell off and then to freeze right there and to have it pop into her conscious mind and uh, she was sitting there and all of a sudden she went like this and uh, she stopped and she went it went down the kitchen sink it f I was washing dishes and I pulled my hand up and it was gone but she didn't hadn't realized it at the time you know because when your hands are all wet or whatever you know she just didn't notice it and she still lived in the same house and she went and took the drain open in the sink and it was down in the bottom that many years later so I mean the ability the ability I mean we've done things like we, we age regress people back and had them read books that they had and be able to see the page that they hadn't seen in like 20 years and be able to read what was on it and had a copy of it there even though they hadn't read it in that many years I had a copy I had a pretty good library at the time and they were able to actually read the words and see them on the page that the things that the mind can do uh, are just phenomenal and it's not that you have to be in a deep trance to do that it's just that if you can see to me where NLP grew out of my fascination with trance phenomenon more than anything else because when I saw people doing this stuff I started going if you, it's the same brain doing it I mean you know the person that's you know reliving a nightmare you know some past unpleasant memory over and over again is telling me they don't have a photographic memory you know, and it's not true that they don't have a photographic memory, they're just not using it. And the question about how you get to be able to, to, to utilize the processes of your mind. I mean, one way is, is to practice hypnosis a lot, and the other is to find out how your brain works. I mean, if your brain will do it, it's just a question of who's driving the bus. I mean, the fact that somebody, you can do it in a profound altered state with a hypnotist, when all he's really doing is just telling you to do it. You know, that if you start telling yourself to do it and and also the the thing about trance is that most of your beliefs get suspended in the altered state because it's not that you can't do it it's that you believe you can't do it so that when you start really building beliefs and uh, that's that's why with the client m with most sessions even with this guy here I mean the first thing I did is began to build new beliefs and uh, when you start out building uh, a foundation of beliefs and then taking those beliefs and building work out of them because it's not enough to just build a belief, you have to make it operational. And uh, for somebody like him, you know, that uh, uh, the client that I had here this weekend is that, is that, I mean, he was afraid of everything. But, you know, he'd drop a pin and, you know, he'd be like a cat with his fingernails in the ceiling. That, I mean, you know, I mean, he's a good guitar player, but he's afraid to play. You know, he's afraid if he plays better than his teachers, then they won't teach him anything anymore. Or, He's afraid if he performs, he'll fuck up, you know. And, and, and of course, as long as he believes all this crap, he's not, he's not going to do anything. But if you build beliefs that he can do these things, it doesn't mean that he will. And so with, um, when you build new beliefs, then you really need to make them operational. You need, to have, you need to program it into the future. You need to have people try it. And one of the things that I like to do, one of the reasons I use trance work, typically at the end of most sessions, is I use it because it's a way of creating experience. Um, it's, it, it gives you the ability to go back and level out past semantic response. Because if you have somebody build a new belief, right, that, that they're going to be strong. And then in his case, for example, one of the things I did is, is I built a belief, it took, you know, weakened the belief that, you know, he's going to be scared and built one that he was going to be strong, but then had him literally go through and use amplifiers to make it so that he felt stronger and stronger. Because you have to understand, his concept of what being strong is, is probably weak at best. Because, you know, if you take even the strongest he's felt about something, it's not enough. It has to be something where once they build a belief, then the belief has to start to grow. So you can literally, even though beliefs might normally be this size for somebody, what you do is you have them use their feelings as a guide. Because where kinesthetics become a really valuable part of submodalities is when you use them as a gauge. Because as the picture gets bigger, as his feelings get stronger, don't make it too big, but just as big as it makes it stronger, just as close as it makes it stronger. And then, for example, he didn't have any sound in his. 
So then you start adding sound and adding only sounds that increase the feeling of strength. Because as you build up this kind of strength and then have him take the feeling, hold the feeling constant and go back in time. Now, and to be able to go back through all the different episodes where, that had convinced him that he was weak, but only go through the memory as far and insofar as he can maintain the feeling of strength. And what this does is it literally blows up the semantic response in the past. See, for example, if, you, if in your mind, see, for example, if you take something now, like think of, think of a time and a place where you were really strong, see what you saw at the time, hear what you heard, and get back the feeling of strength inside you. Now, some, I, was, I was talking to somebody in here earlier. Some people, when they make representations, even though they see what they saw at the time, hear what they heard, only get a minimum amount of the feeling. Right? Then the thing is, is notice where the feeling started. In other words, even if you get just a little tiny bit of it, right, notice where you felt it first. Because whatever constitutes the feeling of strength right, is going to start some location in your body so that there'll be like location number one, right, uh, might be some feeling at the midline, uh, and location number two might be something in your face and your cheeks, location number three might be in your forearms, and literally go back, take the picture and wipe it out, the sounds that were there, wipe them out, then bring it back and notice the order in which you begin to build strength. Then what you do is you start cycling your consciousness through these things in order. Just like for some of you have done that thing, drug of choice. What happens is, is, is your body knows what it's like to feel strong. If you were in the situation you felt strong, your body knows how to do it. Now the thing is, is, is being able to do it deliberately now, what you do is you start cycling through the sequence of, of maybe four or five, and you sort by location first, and then kind second. So, you know, maybe it's a tingling here and a drawnness on the cheek and then uh, a, a, a swelling of the muscles in the arm so that you have, you have here a location, here you have a type. And then what you do is you begin to cycle. And each time, a type, a kind of feeling. In other words, is it tingling? Is it warmth? What, else, what other submodality it is? It's just the kind it is. It's the kind of feeling it is. I mean, you know, it could be, could be cold, could be hot, uh, whatever it is. And then what you do is you start to cycle through these things and you amplify. Each time you begin the cycle, you make it stronger. Now, when you do this with somebody else, what you do is you literally start with the image. So if you now go back to the image and start cataloging these, and I'll let you guys do this with each other, but as you go through and you catalog the, the series of locations, then what you can do is, is when you want, to, you want to amplify it with people, what you do is you not only can manipulate the images, make the image bigger, make the image brighter, make the sound louder, right? But you keep doing that, and then from that point, you have them then go to the first place they felt it. And if it's a warmth, you make it warmer. And then if it's the next place is the chest, you know, feeling drawn, then they have it feel more drawn. And literally cycle through it four or five times to build the kinesthetics up. Then what you do is you have them notice how strong their kinesthetics feel and hold the feeling constant. And then drop down an image of, of where they want to be strong but aren't. See, for example, you know, if you were afraid of dogs, right? Because dogs know when you're afraid, so they pick on you. They really do, especially mine. Mine used to think that was just the hobby of the century. I mean, I'll tell you, you know, because people, when they drive up to my driveway, I had big signs on there that said, beware of guard dogs, you know. And, uh, you know, if somebody, somebody looked at the signs, I could tell by the way they looked at the signs that they didn't have good rapport with dogs, right? And, you know, most of the time I'd have to lock my dog up because he'd go, <laughs> somebody's afraid of dogs. I can smell that one right now. And so he'd, like, do things like he'd sit in front of him and he'd stare at him <laughs> like that. And if they start to move, he'd pull his lips up, right? And I knew he was laughing, because I knew my dog really well, right? But he just, it was like, how much could I scare this person? And, you know, and I mean, because, I mean, it's, it's almost instinctual in, in animals to, to pick on people that are afraid of them. So what you do with somebody to teach them how to, with this kind of fear, because it's not like a phobia. Fears don't work the same way as phobias. And a lot of people try to use the phobia cure to get rid of fears. And it's, it's, 
it, it helps, but it doesn't, it doesn't do it. Because what you're really doing in, in the situation, phobias are where it's blown out of proportion, and you have to reduce it down before you can do anything with it. But when, but when it's a fear, even though you know, it's very scary, it builds sl slowly. It doesn't go threshold break. You know, phobias go boom, and they're there. Fears work up slowly. A lot of people don't have a phobia of flying. They have a fear of flying. And they start scaring themselves all the way to the airport, right? You know, yeah, you know, they drive down the road, and they make pictures of the plane crashing, and they review all the past news, getting sucked out of the planes and stuff. They feel themselves being sucked out of the plane, falling down, you know. <laughs> it's a good way to make yourself feel relaxed as you're headed for a plane, you know. And the thing is, is what you need to do with, with those kind of contexts is that you build up the strength, right? Have them hold the feeling constant. And then from the center of the image of the belief, literally the belief they're going to be strong, because I take the, the, the strength and then literally switch it to a belief that they're going to be strong with dogs. And then what I do is I open up out of the center of that episodes, three or four episodes where they did badly in the past, the scariest ones they can find, but have them only open the picture up at the rate that they can maintain the feeling of strength. So that by the time the picture is all the way open, they have the strong feeling. Now, in this way, you recondition them in, so that when they're in future situations, rather than building the fear, they can, there's still the same things will be there, but it's going to bring out the strong feelings. And this is one of the powers of using. Now, the two strongest parts of this are maintaining the kinesthetics and building in auditories. Now, for example, when I want people to feel strong, I have them make noises inside of their head that make them feel strong, like growling, you know, stuff that accesses the old brain. Because old brain functions, things like growling and snarling, you know, and, and, and those kinds of sounds are the kinds of things that are going to access that old thalamic intervention. I mean, especially when I work with people that have sexual problems, because only human beings can screw up something that animals can do. You know, so as soon as you have thalamic intervention, stupidity becomes a possibility. And uh, so, I mean, to, to short circuit that, one of the things is, is when they think about sex, instead of making pictures of themselves failing, I want to override that with internal sounds, animal noises, you know, things that, that, that access, you know, snorts and snarls, you know, screams, moans, that sort of thing. The sort of thing that goes directly to your neurology. Because there's a lot of sounds that humans make that are direct neurological things. They're not like voluntary sounds. So, I mean, to me, I have like a list in my head of involuntary noises. And the fact that it doesn't mean you can't make them voluntarily, but even when you make them voluntarily, if they're done with wanton abandonment, it accesses the neurology the same way, so to speak, gets the right juices flowing. You know? And when you're dealing with things like fight-flight reactions, you want the fight reaction, not the flight reaction. You don't want, ah! that is not the noise that you want, right? <laughs> <laughs> You want the one that goes, Arr! you want that kind of a sound. And even if it's just internal in their head, the fact that it's connected is going to build more strength. Does that make sense? Good. Well, this is a good place to start, wouldn't you think? Visually, is it wired in the same way sounds are? It seems to no. me it's a totally different system. Yeah. So, well, the visual system has the property of simultaneity. That means you can hold a representation there. See, whereas sound is sequential in nature, mm -hmm. it, it goes by. And it, it just operates completely differently. It's also much more unconscious. Yeah? So out of the image of the, of the new belief of being strong, while holding constant the kinesthetics and the auditory, that comes an image of something yeah. that is... Yeah, I mean, literally what I do is I have them pick, pick a, a, a thing. So, for example, if they, you know, were walking down the street, you know, and a dog looked at them and went... Afraid of dogs, huh? And harassed them, and they did things like ran away, you know, and were embarrassed because it was the first date they had with somebody, you know. So it's a good first date, you know, and the dog runs up, and you leave your date and run away, um, Mr. Macho, you know, right? And then you think about it for 25 years and feel like a heel, right? This is the kind of thing that what I'm going to do is once I have the strong belief, I have them locked onto the feelings, you know, and I'll anchor it as well just to make sure so that if I notice on their face that they're beginning to slip, I'll give them a little help. 
but tell them, and I mean the instructions, just like you tell people, I'm going to lift up your hand and I want you to let it go down only as fast as you make these changes. Only this time, instead of lifting their hands, you're saying, you take these feelings of strength, and in the center, just first as a pin dot, begin to open up an image of the time the dog chased you away from your first date. But open it up only as fast as you can maintain the strong feelings so that the picture gets bigger and bigger till finally it will entirely cover the other image, but only at the rate and the speed that you are able to maintain the strong feelings. So that what you're doing is literally, you know, they'll open it up, right, and, you know, and, and their feelings might go away, and they, they lock onto the strong feelings and keep inching it open like this while holding their feelings constant. And uh, it builds in a new set of neural networks, basically. Are those, are those the feelings that they're holding constant going the ones, through the cycle? Well, you run through the cycle to get the feelings strong in the first place. Because you, you, can't, you, you, can't just you can't depend upon what they can derive from an image. Because whenever you see what you saw at a time, you're going to have the same feelings. But they won't be as strong as if you were really there. So you want to get as close to that as you can. This is where you want to use the kinesthetic amplifiers. You know, that, you know, and with some people, they're so removed from their body, you, you have to list for them what these might be. You know, you go pressure, you know, temperature, moisture, you know, uh, you know, just expansion, you know, of your chest, you know, whether your muscles feel tight or loose. I mean, I mean, you know, some people don't spend a lot of time paying attention to their kinesthetics. And so, therefore, they're less able to manipulate them. Some, see, for example, like we were talking, you can move pictures all over the place, but they don't affect you like sound does. And one of the reasons is, is you spend so much time making pictures. But that's one of the reasons they don't have as much impact. But it, now, if you can learn to move your feelings around that way, in essence, that's what this technique is a beginning to, to learn to have this feeling when these things are there, right? So when the dog turns around, you have control over the fight-flight reaction. If the dog bites you, you might go into a flight reaction. But if you have those feelings, you'll generate that odor, and the dog will go, not him, him. <laughs> Taste the girl away instead of you. You know, I mean, see, I mean, like, see, I used to breed, I used to breed guard dogs and, and train them, and I know a lot about them. And it's like most of you, those of you who have dogs, you realize how, how persnickety they are about their toes, right? Well, think about clipping their toenails, right? You pull out the toenail clipper, hold onto their foot, and before you clip, they're screaming. Now, don't tell me dogs don't have imagination, right? <laughs> they don't have, they don't make constructed images. They, you go like this, you pull it forward, and they go, ah! You know, I mean, they know what's going to happen. They have a memory. They access four tuples. And most dogs have a phobia of their toes being touched. This kind of a technique allows you to begin because, see, now, you, you really want to, when you do this, as you cycle through, keep adding sounds that match it. Now, this isn't just for strength. It could be any feeling that you need to learn to magnify in any context. For our purposes here, start with strength because we talked about it. Now, what I want you to do is get a partner and remember, when you access the strong feelings, okay, that's step number one. Then take the strong feelings and figure out, ask them where they want to have more strength, where they want to have more chutzpah, and then have them do the belief change. You guys remember from using your brain for change, the belief change? You start with, you know, you, you get a weak belief and a strong belief, right? So you take their belief that they are not strong in this situation. When you ask somebody where do you want to be strong, where do you need to be strong, Right? As soon as they answer, you know they're not strong there. Right? And they believe they're not strong there. So you have them start that out in a belief situation and then turn it into a wishy-washy belief. Then put in and build a belief that they're going to be strong from there. Then amplify that to get stronger kinesthetics. Then cycle through the kinesthetics to make it even stronger. And then add strong sounds to it so that you really magnify the kinesthetics so that they really get a full body representation of strength and then go back and put the content in and open it up. Okay, do you understand the sequence? Once more. <laughs> you start out by, okay, you're going to do a belief change. So you, f you start out by asking them where they want more strength, okay, which means that they don't have it there. Then you pick a time where they had strength, okay. First you take the, the feeling of strength, right, and then you, you, take, you have them take that feeling, and then you start by taking the belief that they're not strong there, turn it into a wishy-washy one,
and take the feeling of strength, literally flip over the new image, and the feeling of strength that they're going to be strong there. Then you amplify all the submodalities to build more and more strength, having them notice and report to you the sequence in which strength occurs, the lo by location and by kind. Then you cycle through the location and the kind, amplifying like hypnosis, like, you know, and it's more of this, and this will amplify. Literally, this is a trance right here, deep trance, it's as deep as you can get it, to amplify the feelings of strength. And you add in strong sounds, sounds which are congruent with where they want to be. Okay, once you've done that, then you take in the belief position, right, and you open up from the center of it whatever the actual object was, and you pick a memory where they fucked up from the past, and you open it up in the center. So if they were chased by a dog, you take the time they were chased by the dog, have them open it up, but only at the rate and speed they can maintain these feelings, and have an anchor for it so that you're sure. And the result, they'll be looking at the worst experience they had, but they'll be feeling strong now, which tells them they're going to be strong in the future. Means they won. Okay, grab yourself a partner. Let's build some chutzpah in. So, okay, how did you guys do? Love it. Now, I'd like to point out a couple of things to you about this. One is is I like to remind people, in, in lieu of the conversations we were having, about people's ability to get rigid about whether it's a bunny or not. You guys remember that from yesterday? You don't just do this with strength. You can do this with all kinds of things. That, I mean, there are many things where you really want to build the belief because there are feelings that propel us. And where this is most useful is the kinds of things that, that where people need feelings to propel them in behavior where the feelings lead to activity, you know, where, where strength leads to standing up to yourself. Uh, things like, mo things about motivation, because uh, uh, things that, that have to do with um, the kinds of feelings that are followed by behavior. A lot of times people try to build behaviors that create feelings, and there are a lot of things for which that's useful. But things like, especially things that have to do with learning, um, you know, the kind of motivation, the desire to learn, desire to try new things. Um, uh, desire. See, for example, a lot of people that I've worked with through the years were afraid to travel. And the thing is, is because they'd be stuck in new situations where they wouldn't know how to act. So what they needed was an overall feeling to deal with the unknown. Because, see, there's, if you think about unknown phenomenon like a lot of a lot of people I was interviewed yesterday by this person from anchor point um, and one of the things was is he kept asking questions like where are you going to be in five years right and you know and I tried to point out to him if I knew that then I probably wouldn't go there that to me you know that the motivating factor is going into the unknown it's that I like doing it it's it's not that you know I have some you know uh, emotional stake with saving humanity. I like it. I like life on the edge, but I like life dealing with unknown things, things that are not understood, things that are a mystery. I mean, to me, going into an unknown situation is exhilarating. Now, the people who have fear of traveling don't have the sense that mystery is exhilarating, that, mo that not knowing what to do or how to do something is what makes it exciting that figuring it out is an adventure, it's a challenge. That going into a culture where nobody speaks the language, and see like when the first time that I took a vacation anywhere without working or something that you know, the government didn't pay for and sort of require you to do, uh, was, uh, was I went to Tahiti, but I didn't like go to a resort, I went to the middle of nowhere. See, being able to, to create a set of feelings and a, and a new belief that when people believe the unknown is scary, it's dangerous, it's to be, that, that, that feeling awkward or, or unfamiliar isn't exhilarating to them. That, that what happens is, is that that belief itself limits their ability to go into unknown turf. Now, the same kind of formula that we just used is the kind of thing that I use to get people to, to disengage, because if you, if you think about how much people opt for familiar behaviors, if it's more familiar to fight with your spouse because you don't have experiences in, in flirting. I mean, the flirting class, when I started teaching it, was the first time was for couples only. 
And I mean, I couldn't believe the response of people. They went, what do couples need to flirt for? <laughs> right? And I mean, you know, and I mean, when the people did the telemarketing on the course, people would go, well, why? You know, we're already married. What do we need to flirt for? And of course, I had my telemarketers adequately prepared to go, that's exactly, the fact that you would ask that question is the answer. Because, you, you know, flirting gets certain kinds of responses easily and quickly and more enjoyably. Would you rather spend your time with your wife fighting or flirting? Think about it. You know, <laughs> and they'd go, well, we fight most of the time. You know, and it's like, well, we know how to do it, so it's probably the easiest thing to do. I mean, at least we got it down cold. And I go, well, yes, but would you rather have it down hot? Because, see, if you think of the degree to which people opt for the familiar, being able to install, because especially those of you who work with people on an ongoing basis, either they're employees of yours, um, uh, people you do long-term training with, or clients that you see, because I know I don't, you know, I don't see clients more than once, but, you know, unless they're very wealthy. <laughs> but when I do have the wealthy ones and see them more than once, I start wanting to build more things that have to do with dissembling this, this propensity to move towards the familiar and start looking towards the future as an adventure. So that as they get into unknown situations, rather than reverting to old behaviors, they stop and pause and start to learn start to learn new analog ways of moving. Because like in the flirting class, as we teach, start to give people the basis on, you know, how to flirt, you know, like do things like come outside of yourself. I mean, this is step number one, is get out of your head. Because we discovered it's the, the biggest lack that keeps people from being able to flirt is, is being able to get them to talk to the other person in, in, instead of talk to themselves. I mean, most of the time, people go inside and they talk to themselves. But with couples, what we found is, is that rather than stopping and doing unusual things, that their tendency is to do familiar things, that they keep building more and more rituals as time goes on. And it becomes so ritual, ritualized, it could be put on videotape, and they wouldn't need to live their lives. Now, again, I'm using absurdity, but of course that's the kind of thing that I use with couples, that if they're going to do the same thing every day, they should just tape it, put it in the house, turn it on, and kill themselves. You know, wouldn't that be easier? And they go, well, that's stupid. And I go, well, I'm not the one doing it. <laughs> that always gets them. I love those double hooks. Right? I see, it's such a beautiful setup because when they tell you it's stupid and then you tell them you're the one living that way, then I can begin to build a sense of adventure. Because, see, with somebody who would ask me, and again, somebody asked me about, uh, you, when you were asking me about identifying metaprograms, this person who's a reporter asking me, the questions, the presupposition is that you pick places and go to them. And uh, that, you know, it's like, well, you know, it's like, you know, well, where are you taking NLP? And, and it's, it's not like that. I'm along for the ride. You see, I'm going to go, I want to go where I haven't gone before. And I don't know where that is. That's something that arises out of a fluid process of paying attention to what goes on to listening to new and better nominalizations. Because nominalizations are, of course, where you find all kinds of great things. I mean, that I know that uh, Steve and you both told me that you, what was the one you had unpacked? Uh, forgiveness? No, that was the one he asked. Oh, shame, yeah. guilt, shame, grief. Shame, guilt, and grief. That when people use these words, they're so disconnected. Words, especially the words for which there isn't a verb, you know, like shame, shame, you know, there isn't, sh you know, it just, just doesn't, it doesn't have a verb translation, love, trust, uh, phrases that people use. Like um, one of the things I remember that Chris and I were, were talking, and, and uh, Chris said that she was talking to somebody, and this guy said that he had blown a problem out of proportion. And we both went, ooh, because we just heard it, and we thought, well, how do you do that? Because if you can blow it out of proportion, you can put it in proportion. And to me, you know, it wasn't that I knew a week before that that that's what I was going to look at. It's whatever strikes you. It's going in and that, that instead of trying to take things and make them familiar, that through the years as I've taught NLP, there's been this major mental illness that cracks me up, is that people are always trying to translate NLP into TA, translate it into Gestalt, translate it into, you know, Sullivan, you know, people are always raising their hand going, 
Isn't this the same as uh, Sullivan's concept of the ego analytic self? And I go, no. And they go, well, how does it relate? And I go, I don't care. But you see, when people are sorting for sameness, okay, one of the, which is the principle you hear when people are looking for familiarity, they're sorting for sameness. Or they're sorting for difference, and they have a moving away from strategy, which are the two, diff two different cases. Now, when people are sorting for familiarity, that doesn't mean that they can't have the same sense of adventure. Because, but if the familiar thing they're looking for is new. See, it's not that they have to sort back into their old behavior. It's the only sameness they've learned to sort for. So as you begin to build for people like this, a, a grid that says, this is the sameness to sort for. And for me, one of the things that I do is to build in something that, that marvelous thing about the unknown, the marvelous thing about going into context and a sense of adventure where, where something is new and to build into that exhilaration. Now, to me, this is where you begin to build new sets of submodalities, not existing ones, but ones where now what we do is we take kinesthetic leads. Now, the process you just learned here is a process, let's see, I'm in the right time zone here, I've got time for this, um, is if you take now and sort in, in the same system like this, but instead what we're going to do is we're going to do something a little trickier. If we take now, let's take three four tuples, okay. The four tuples themselves, for example, will we'll take uh, uh, just exhilaration, you know. I mean, the, the, the kind that makes you zing, you know, where, where something really works. The kind of, the kind of thing where, where you do something and you don't even know how you did it. Um, have any of you ever gone to a carnival and thrown, thrown a ball and it just went right in the perfect place and you won? That, that thing where just the moment before it rolls in, you don't know how you did it, but it worked that uh, sometimes when you're gambling or playing cards or when you're working with clients, sometimes just something pops out. And you don't know quite how it happens. Now, that kind of exhilaration, how does that spell? Is that with an E? I always spell everything with an I nowadays. It's got hooked on that. Uh, I don't even know. What, H? All right, well, you're all yelling at the same time. One of you do it. Ah, that's enough. You know what I mean. <laughs> I'm not into whole words. They taught me syllables, so I figure all you need is the first part. Um, I just don't like to use separated by morphemes. I like to stop just partially through the word. I'm, I'm into sentence fragments, too. <laughs> it's, it's a great new word to play with. Exilla the Hun. Exilla the Hun. Self-referential index. Did you hear that? <laughs> Sorts by self. <laughs> so he asked about metaprograms, about hearing those things. And the thing is, is you just file that stuff away. I mean, it, as it comes by, when people are, are using metaprograms, there's no way out of it. And uh, it's, it's going to give you information. And the information always tells you the best way to install new behaviors. But we're going, to do something, we're going to do something a little unnatural because what we're after is something new here. Now, if you take something like exhilaration, then there's also the thing where, where you notice something new. When, when you learn a pattern in a workshop uh, where the kind of thing where you actually hear what somebody says for a change, and, and when, you hear, when you hear something a client says and something inside you goes, ooh, like when Chris and I heard this guy say it's blown out of proportion. Uh, it's like the first time I noticed uh, uh, a thing. I noticed just one of the things the uh, uh, one of these TV evangelists did. He had a whole group of people there, and he said, "Now you can worship God." <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and I went, Ooh. "So there's that one, the one that just strikes you because there's something that you it's it's something you, that's been going on all along, but you never noticed it before." That, I mean, for, I mean, it's like accessing cues. When we used to go around and do intros, you know, 20 years ago, we'd tell people, we'd, what, what we'd do is we'd just have them sit down and we'd have them ask questions. 
and we'd have them do all visual questions and all auditory and then all visual constructs and tell them to watch which way the eyes moved. And like, you know, we'd draw the eye chart. And people were so blown out that they could ask a question and get people's eyes to move in the same direction. That's how developed the field of psychology was. You could have just said, look up and to the right five times. People would do that, and they could have got the same result. But it never dawned on them. It was like, wow, I can ask people to make a giraffe with a rhinoceros's head, and their eyes move. That's how much impact therapists were used to having. <laughs> they were stunned by that. I mean, really, you know. We teach them anchoring. That was, ah, you know, we could change somebody's life. That's nothing, but we can make their eyes move. <laughs> now, if you take this four tuple, the four tuple of ooh, and then one where, because everybody has, has had a sense of adventure, if, if only vicariously through the movies, you know. And the other place is, is what I want you to do now is we're going to do something a little trickier. I want you to find an example four tuple of each of these, some kind of, ad, some kind of adventure. And what I want you to do is the following. For each of these, I want you to have the person pick a theme, musical theme, right? Maybe down here we'll go Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, exhilaration, you know. Uh, uh, Radar left. What? Radar Love. I never heard it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, so Radar Love. <laughs> See, me, I think a magic carpet ride. I mean, it's a, <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> uh, different era, same drugs. <laughs> now, the same thing is, is that, that thing that's like, ooh, you know. Uh, find some kind of music that goes with that, the same kinds of experiences. Now, the way you do this is, is that what I want you to do is have them get, get the feelings. Anchor each of these feelings. So you'll end up with three anchors. Oops. Count in order, Richard. OK. So make yourself three anchors. Then go through and make music for each one. Right? Now, once you have an anchor and the music for each one, then I want you to turn the music up. Right? And as you turn the music up, louder and louder, have them notice the cycle and the kind of change in the feelings, OK? Then what I want you to do is, as, as you get your list here, then what I want you to do is we're going to do something real tricky. What you're going to do is you're going to do each of the first three feelings, each of the second three feelings. So you're going to do, this will be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that you're going to do the first part of the first one, the second part of the second, the first part of the second one, the first part of the third one. And you do the second part of the first. So what you're going to be doing is wrapping these things together. Now, as they wrap together and cycle. Hey, <laughs> Don't ask questions. Listen. You have to listen in order to hear. OK, that's, this is how you get lost each time. So take this as a lesson. You have three different feelings. Each, each one of them, as you turn, you do them one at a time. You turn the music up. Notice that the feelings get more intense. But you find out the order in the locations in which they do. Once you have three lists, then what we're going to do is we're going to integrate them. You do the first feeling from each of the lists. Then the, so the, if the location for exhilaration is forehead, for ooh is the shoulder, and for adventure is the stomach, then you do this, this, and this. Then you do the second one for each of them. And you cycle through these, and you keep doing it faster and faster and faster till you build a new feeling. OK? Once you've built the new feeling, what I want you to do is because you're now going to have a new set of submodalities. Because what you do is have them take that feeling and then think about looking for new things in this field looking at normalizations, new behaviors. Have them think about creating things in this field and build a belief that they can do it that matches this feeling. And then give them the post-hypnotic suggestion in as deep a trance as you can find that every time they have something unusual happen 
this feeling will come up and then they'll stop and start looking for other places they've had the feeling and find out how they fit together and do something new. That way when I come back next time, you guys can teach me. It's my turn. <laughs> is this clear to you? This is how you begin to build and create some really dramatic new representations using kinesthetic and auditory leads. Now, I'll tell you one thing which will help you is that as you go through this, when you find the music, right, when, when, you, want, when you want to amplify it, right, you're going to have to have them report on the order, but induce a mild trance and then use your hand to expand the music so that it becomes more fuller. So it's not some little tinny little shit in the background, okay? Some people haven't used that internal stereo. I mean, mine's so good, I can't listen to a stereo now. I listen to music in stereos and I go, <laughs> you know, I just listen to it once, turn it off, and then play it in my head, and it's much more dramatic because I had other instruments in, turn it loud. So you can, like, if, you know, it's just kind of a tinny little thing, have them add, you know, instead of, you know, a shitty little piano, make it a grand. You know, put in a horn section, put in more singers. You know, make it more dramatic, make it louder, get martial amps. You know, crank the volume up. You know, use drug of choice before you start. Anything you can to just fill it out as a total representation. Now, once you go through, then you take the three feelings, and, and what you're going to do is first unwrap them by location, and then you're going to wrap all three of them together and build a new feeling. This is something you cannot do by collapsing anchors. Because the reason you go through them sequentially is as you speed this up, you're going to create a new feeling rather than have two that cancel each other out. And it's much more dramatic than a chain. Trust me, you'll love this. Then you can take it and apply it to sex. And if you use I've been working on the railroad, you're fired. <laughs> OK, grab yourself a partner and uh, go for it. One of the things that, that the last exercise that we did is about is not only you're building new feelings, but you're finding ways to make them stronger. And the, the thing is, is that when you really want to intensify feelings in the outside world, one of the things that you want to be able to do is to take the systems that are more, quote unquote, outside of consciousness, and to be able to take them and to amplify them. You know, amplifying things like lust as a double-edged sword because, you know, if you want somebody to really be attracted to women, you also have to make sure that they have the courage to do something about it, which in many cases is not genetically installed, but it's also easy to come by. But again, you're going to be building configurations. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Look at camera. <laughs> Smile. Look at that color change you get. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Look at camera and feel good. <laughs> That's right. Now, I tell you what, you don't need your glasses. No. You can see without them if you close, close your, your eyes, eyes now. That's right. And as you do so, take a deep breath and relax. And what I want you to do as you relax is very, very slowly take another deep breath and go back in time to a place where there was a past pleasant memory, something that was lustful in nature something you can enjoy. Smell the smells, hear the sounds, and turn the volume up and up. And as it gets louder, what I'd suggest to you is that you continue to relax even more. And I'm going to reach over, and I'm going to lift up your left arm. I'm not going to tell you to put it down any faster than you begin to drift deeply and deeply into a trance. Because as you sit here, what you're doing now is beginning the process of learning. And what I want you and your unconscious to learn about is the process of going back and taking component pieces of your life to build a new future. Because all the experiences that you've had throughout the time you've been alive constitute the building blocks of your future. So very slowly, as that hand begins to slowly go down, I want you to find a time and a place 
where you have courage, the kind of courage to do things that perhaps others don't do. It might be with cameras, it might be with electronic equipment, but it's that matter-of-fact courage that says, just do it, just go for it. And to notice how it feels, and to take that feeling, and with each movement of this hand going down, I want the feeling to become stronger and stronger. And as it continues down and that feeling spreads and gets stronger, in the center of it, I want you to begin another feeling by seeing a time and a place where you looked and saw someone and felt lust in more than your heart. That's right. And as the hand comes down, I want that lust to begin to grow even stronger and spread and fill within the courage because lust without wanted courage is no fun. And fun is what it's all about. And feel those feelings spread and the warmth get hotter and hear the volume go up of the sounds that are appropriate. And begin to hear the kinds of things you would say and do as if they're coming out of your own mouth, moving from this point forward. That's right. And as that hand goes down, multiply those feelings times two, times three, four, the purpose of learning. <coughs> now, knowing what you know and what you've heard in the course of this and other workshops, I know both your unconscious and conscious mind know a lot of things about how timelines work. And as that feeling continues to multiply and grow and spread and become much more intense, I want you to float up over your timeline and drop down right in your presence, facing the future and with your back to the past. And then very slowly, I want you to begin to float backwards in time, floating on the wings of time and change, feeling air move around you. As the future moves <coughs> off into the distance, you'll watch your past circle around you and feel yourself floating back, honestly, unconsciously, getting younger and younger and smaller and smaller way back in time, taking these feelings with you and having them get stronger in your past. Find an appropriate place to stop and then begin to move forward and hear yourself growl as you find a new courage inside you. <coughs> Feel your nostrils flare as you realized that all the opportunities that you used to miss in the past are now going to be within your grasp as you lunge forward and move towards the future with a wanton and growing sense of passion, lust, and courage, and a newfound judgment that you can take these things and make them spread from your body to others. That's right. And when you reach the present, I want you to explode into the future by multiplying these feelings times 10, 20, 40, <laughs> that's right, such that as you look forward, there's no way you would want to act differently other than in your own best interest. Because in order to enjoy life, lust is an integral part of it. And you will find yourself, surprisingly, being able to spread this easily from yourself to others. The old adage, ask and ye shall receive, as long as you know how to anchor, applies here. That's right. And see yourself doing things that you would have never thought you would have done, and realize you're going to do them over and over and over. That's right. And when your hand is all the way back down on your knee, I want your unconscious to have taken total responsibility for amplifying this feeling more each day and making sure you act on it more each opportunity. 
That's right. And when your hand is touching your knee, I know that you're ready to seduce life. That's right. Take all the time you need to move in the right direction. That's right. And you know where your knee is. That's not your knee. There you go. Now, very slowly, I want you internally to begin to count for yourself 20 to 1. And with each count, you wake out of the trance one bit. But this will become one count stronger because you want to take the passion with you. Begin to become someone who counts internally. With each count, you'll arouse from the trance, but your feelings will get one notch stronger. Such that when you reach one, your eyes will open, but your mind will race. <laughs> now, <clears throat> this again is an example of the subtle sorts of changes that uh, I like to induce in Oh. Hi! <laughs> <laughs> Anything come to mind? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Well, now go back to your camera. <laughs> Can I have the rest of the day off? <laughs> no, it just will build up more and more so that afterwards you look out at the world and suddenly it'll appear like a smorgasbord that's for free. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> As the visuals and auditories of the world discover the power of kinesthetics, <laughs> multiple system life. Oh, and I, I, have, I have a tool I'll give you later. When I assign the first exercise, come over, I'll give you a, a little tool that you can use for this. It's a secret, though. <laughs> now. The other piece I wanted to add to the, the piece of work that you did is the same kind of thing. Because to me, and I want, I want to do it a little bit differently. He, had, he sat here and filmed four workshops. I figured it was about time he had a turn. But I'm going to ask you to try something a little bit different. This time, what I'd like you to do is, is to go back and access the new, the new feeling that you built. Remember in the last exercise before lunch? You like the feeling that you built? Yeah. Well, you can also throw a little lust in that one if you want to, uh, just as long as you don't do it with your clients. Right? I've discovered a good rule. Don't date anyone who knows NLP, especially if they know more than you. You'll find yourself doing dishes and windows. <laughs> just ask Steve. <laughs> It's ambiguity is a wonderful thing. It's lack of commitment. <laughs> now, the thing that I want you to do this time is, is I want you to induce, induce an altered state, and I want you to really magnify feelings. And one, of the th one of the things that I do is that the body has its own language. And one of the things I learned from Feldenkrais was that, for those of you, remember, and for those of you who have been before, we did a little of Feldenkrais things about how how that just literally, if you put your hands, like people who have real tight shoulder muscles, if you put your hands on top of their muscles and tighten them up and then relax your hands just on the surface of the skin without pressing, it tells the muscles, you're tight, relax. The skin has a certain knowledge or wisdom because it's, it knows, like for example, when you stretch the surface and let go of the skin above a muscle, it's the same thing as full arm extension. So it helps you to relax. It's like people say exercise helps you to, to relax. Well, with some people it does and some it doesn't. But if you literally extend your arm to the full stretch so that the skin is fully stretched and pull like this, when you relax, the muscle here will be much more relaxed because it sends all the signals to the brain, you're done. Now, for the purposes here, one of the things you can add to anchoring is knowledge of how to do this. Because one of the things is, is when I start out anchoring with a small anchor, when I say to multiply it, I use my fingers to create a greater surface area. And then when I multiply it again, I make my hand bigger and apply more pressure because we want more intensity, right? So that there's more pressure behind the feeling and more temperature. 
Now, when you put your hand flat, of course, in a temperature like this room, it's going to get warmer. And there's an old trick that I do. I rub my hands together before I do it. And you're going to feel it warmer so that you begin to actually take direct sensations, tell the body, heat this up. And it knows how to take it. And you're going to take this and spread it. Now, when you use direct commands with kinesthetics, do them as it, at the simultaneous moment you touch. When you go double it, move your hand bigger, right? And then when you go and make it more intense, press harder. The body knows how to take those suggestions from two channels and how to work with them. Wouldn't you say? Yes, yes I would. <laughs> Has been. Will you testify, son? Now, the thing that I want you to do is I want you to just now really amp those feelings out through induction, the same way I did with him. Then what I want you to do is to have the person, instead of just sitting there, like I did, and backing through the timeline, have them physically stand up in their timeline. Take their timeline, stand up in it, turn backwards in their timeline, and walk into the past. Make sure there are no chairs behind them to trip over. Back up into the past. See events fold around them and tell them to go back honestly. Remember semantically loaded words. Honestly, completely, thoroughly. All your L-Y words are the ones that modify so that you can get younger and younger and hold this feeling. Take it into your past. Now, this is a way where you take them back to an appropriate time and then begin to rush forward and see how things would have been different. Right? So that you can launch them into the future with difference, C-E, that, that the suffixes and the, all of the morphemes of language become incredibly important at this time. You want the C-E stuff as you go into the future. Difference, excellence, you know, that it's not choices, but choosing, I-N-G words, into the future. So that as you propel them up through the timeline, have them go through any unsatisfactory experience and meld it into the new feeling so that the feeling goes through much like the decision destroyer does visually this does it kinesthetically so that anything that would have gotten in their way is already different now so as you launch into the future you launch knowing that you have the solid foundation of having melted the past blocks so that you can move into the future with a new and challenging sense of wanton anticipation use your tonality your voice volume, your voice intensity, all of those things to keep the amplified feelings there. Keep a good kinesthetic anchor. Anchor at the midline. Anchor either here or the upper chest. Either one, because they're good places, because there's not too many neural ne neurons. If they sense the place you touch, like if you do it on the hand, everything's too close together, and it, and it, 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 it becomes much too precise. So use areas. You can do it on the back, but it doesn't work as well for this particular type of stuff. Uh, down here, uh, this area, it's perfect. Chakra points are always nice. I don't know why, but they work. You know, they spent 40,000 years finding them. We might as well use them. And launch them into the future so that they feel themselves doing new things and then let their unconscious, let their hand go down at the rate and speed that they see and hear themselves and their voice coming out of their mouth, not from somewhere else. And now add the music, have them use, find new music that fits with the new feeling. Either create it themselves or find some piece that gives them that feeling so that any time they're in that situation, they'll begin to hear that tune and have their unconscious take responsibility for playing that music such that when their hand touches their knee, the music will explode in their head and they'll have the feeling wantonly intensely. And make sure when you count them out that the feeling gets stronger towards the conscious state, and the trance goes away. Because remember, we want the new learnings to go into the conscious state. So we always want the more conscious you are, the stronger the feeling is, not the weaker. Do you understand that? Yes, yes? OK. Come out of trance. <laughs> Just for a minute. Four, three, two, one. <laughs> it's just talking to unconscious. No need for you to listen. <laughs> now, uh, then, 
then what they end up with is a strong feeling in the conscious state and a powerful post-hypnotic suggestion that the new music will take the new feeling into the future so that and then have them again see the context where this would be useful and have them hear the music immediately do four or five of them it's like an auditory visual switch have them bring the context in and have it be life-size panoramic and each time they bring in like four or five contexts where they want to use this feeling have them pop up a picture which is life-size panoramic and turn the music on do about five of those and you'll be ready to go now wow 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 do it how did you, how did this go do you like this kind of stuff how do you like moving back through time better <laughs> well if you take good feelings back with you yes I mean you know if you take your horrible feelings and use them for trans derivational search I noticed I was watching somebody do a piece of work uh, uh, during the uh, beginning of the practitioner course we had one of these uh, expert master practitioners from uh, 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 the professional school of neurolinguistic programming which I love that's one of the certification groups refers to themselves as the professional NLP group uh, which makes us unprofessional, which is, in my opinion, means we're probably better at it. Uh, but they were doing a piece of work with somebody in the lobby, and they didn't see me there. And I walked up, and that person said, now, you know, you, you know that bad feeling you get? And the person stopped, and they anchored it, and they go, now, make it worse. Make it feel worse, even worse, worse. Now, go back through time, further and further, till you find what hideous event started it. <laughs> and I thought, this is interesting. And uh, so I decided, I, t I walked up and I told him I could show them a thing uh, about moving anchors, right? And so the guy, said, the guy said to me, he goes, why would you want to move an anchor? I said, oh, let me show you. So I looked at the guy and I said, you know the hideous feeling that you have, the really horrible thing like that? And the guy says, yeah. And I said, watch it all come up into my hand and go into you. Ha! <laughs> See, now I can anchor you and you'll feel bad. <laughs> and every time you try to work with anyone in this way, this is how you'll feel. Because we try to make our clients feel better. <laughs> it's one of my favorite patterns. Is there's a thing called punctuation ambiguity. In patterns one. And that's, this is where you can take words and you can overlap and make a sentence. Because a sentence can end, but if you throw a few more words on it, it changes the meaning. And I do this a lot with clients. And... Uh, you know, where they go and they go, I'm really stuck, you know, uh, with not being able to stand up for myself. And I go, weren't you? Because just by the timing of adding it on their sentence, it goes boom in the unconscious and just throws it in. And, you know, people go, well, you know, I'm, I'm never going to be able to use this stuff to change my life as much as I will today. I'll throw in. And I mean, just when you do it, it just goes Zzz! and it hooks into the language machine. And that way, they cannot TD back through their own conversations. They cannot, you know, how, they can't use uh, pronouns and its and as is to continue to talk about it because you break up the language machine. Because transderivational search is the process by which you connect together multiple sentences. So if you change the meaning of their sentence, they can't go back into the conversation and it builds what's called a bracket inside of consciousness. Just fucks it up for them. And it's one of the advantages of like learning about language is because language is the most unconscious thing that people do. And being able to influence it to throw in things like this and, you know, people go, you know, well, I really, I, you know, I really want to change my life within the next five minutes, right? Because then they go, because oh, I mean, it sinks into the meaning machine, the, the semantic machine. And even, as long as you use their intonation pattern and their tonality structure. And, it, you know, it's one of those dynamite things you can throw in. Uh, the other thing I wanted you to try is, is we did a little experiment. Because we're doing, you know, different, we're using other systems, getting away from the old visual system being the main lead system. There's another kinesthetic thing like the one we just did. Did you like the walking backwards through the time tunnel? Well, you know, there is, in case you guys didn't realize it, timelines is, is something we made up. It's not something we found. The fact that people sort pictures this way, when you make a line through it, people, didn't, people don't come with a timeline. You make them one. And it, you know, the pictures may be ordered that way, but they hadn't drawn a line through them yet. Now, the one thing that we tried, what you just did is you, in essence, 
put your timeline out on the floor. If, if you think about it, and best, you know, some of you might have had it waist high or whatever, but, but in essence, what you did is you put your timeline out in front of you. And if you think about things like spatial anchoring, spatial anchoring works. You know, I mean, it worked for those of you who remember Gestalt therapy, when you had people switch back and forth between the chairs, they worked. They actually switch over to the chair, they'd be a wimp in this one, they'd go over, they'd be an asshole in this one. You know, and, you, and you'd say to them, switch. They'd move over and they'd change. Damnedest things. I always wondered what would happen if you burned one of the chairs up. Go, oh, you're stuck like that now, you're going to be a wimp for life. Or an asshole, one or the other. Weird set of choices, though, you know. I always thought I should add more furniture. You know, I always like to have, you know, put two chairs and a bed. And tell them, which do you want? <laughs> Just a thought. Now, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to try something just for the hell of it. What I'd like you to do is to try having the person stop and think about if this point on the floor, right, right, right here is your conscious state, right, how far can you go deeply into trance so far? And have them literally visualize themselves consciously, right, and look at the progressions of the steps to the deepest trance that they've been in so far. Then have them literally walk into it so that they are standing facing consciousness and then have them walk backwards all the way into a deep trance as they go backwards one step at a time going and filling each of the bracketed descriptions and then have them, don't have them go all the way backwards though, have them go a little bit down then back to consciousness then a little bit further up then a little bit further back so that they, they find out and then bring them all the way back to their furthest point and then bring them not all the way up but part of the way up and then bring them another 10 or 15 feet backwards and find out what happens. You might want a chair at the end of that. Or a bed. Oh, <laughs> after the workshop, Jack. <laughs> this is what we re Once we have the requisite variety in here, then you go out on the outside world. Now, once you've done that, though, I want you to do something else. I want you to bring them up, and I want you to walk them up to their conscious state, and then walk them further that way. And find out how the world changes. Anchor it, and tell them they can go into this state any time they need to. Have them then step out, again, move back to the position from the side where you started, right? and then literally build for them the ability to look at any of the places and go there. Oh, <laughs> that's so you can get back. <laughs> oh, yeah, so they don't have to be walking around and all this stuff. Literally, as you look over here, you can hit that state of consciousness. Because, you see, not only do you want to learn to alter your state of consciousness so that you can go into deeper and deeper trances, you want to become more and more in the waking state. Things clearer, brighter, more focused, more three-dimensional being able to see, hear, especially hear things that you couldn't hear before and learn to be able, because the more alert you are, the more you pick up with stuff with clients. And the fact is, is that when you're more in the waking state, time will be so much so that the rest of the world will be moving much more in slow motion, which is one of the reasons that you can perceive things. I teach people in the trainer's training to go into this state so that when they teach, they're never in a hurry. They get all the time they need. They can observe everything because they have nothing but time. I like the comment the guy made who interviewed me yesterday. He said, he asked me if I had a blowhole because he said, it's like you never take a breath. Well, I do, but he never heard it because I'm living in a different time zone than he is. That's all. Actually, I'm quite calm and relaxed. It was him that was nervous, especially after I yelled at him. <laughs> I, he said he wanted to know who I was, so I told him. <laughs> this is my good parts. This is my bad part. Which do you want? It's up to you. <laughs> okay, now I want you to do this fairly quickly because I'd like to get through some other stuff. Uh, so use your hypnosis voice, pacing, intonation, phonetic ambiguities, and deeper and deeper and deeper you go and then wow, all the way up. But anchor it kinesthetically on the floor and make sure initially from the waking state, one and two steps backwards, that they go down. Because once you've done this, what you've done is made a really unique sliding anchor. Because you won't run, you can run out of leg, but if you do it this way across the room, it opens up wide possibilities. So don't start with your face against the wall, okay? <laughs> right? 
So it's spread out. Go do it. So what did you find as you moved into more than consciousness, as you moved towards more than your normal waking state? What kinds of things did you notice? Did you manage to anchor it to the floor? Okay, this is yes. And then when you move this way, you went. And then when you move this way, you are. <laughs> did the colors get brighter, Mayor? Yeah. More depth of field. Did, what? More, more depth of field? Yeah. How about really, your hearing? I'm yeah. really aware yeah. of the far horizon. I was noticing way, way far out in the distance. The distance wow, you mean there's more than the nose on my yeah. face? <laughs> Guys, it looked like you're more alive. You got more color in your face and stuff. It's doing some stuff that's in the waking state. It'd be good for you, huh? <laughs> People will say, how was the workshop? And you go. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember the first time. I read in a book that Leslie Lurcan wrote that, that you could ask people about the last time they were in trance and that, you know, they'd go back in it. And I thought, what a crock. So this next client that came in, it, I said, have you ever been hypnotized? And this guy said, Oh, yeah, I used to be hypnotized by my dentist, you know. And I said, well, remember the last time that the dentist did step by step what he did to hypnotize you? And the guy went, well, uh, <laughs> hypnosis is a strange business. The kind of thing I would use this for is I'd put that line right into my office, right? <laughs> so I could walk out into a deep trance and walk in into the waking state. Uh, because the more, I mean, you want to start out really increasing. How about your ability to hear language, words, when you were listening to the other person? Say, how far did you go? This is the one thing I didn't tell you how far to go forward. It's just, yeah, I mean, did you walk another two inches? Did you take with you that sense of adventure when you went there? It's a random choice of how I sequence these things, isn't it? Do you ever notice how these exercises never fit together? <laughs> Think about these four days and notice. See, packaging is really important, especially for, I know some of you in here do training. And to me, you know, I know it may not seem like I plan and think about what I do, but I do think about it because I think about where I am and I think about where I want to go. And I found that, like, uh, some of the people that I teach with come in with an outline of all the exercises they're going to do. But they don't think about it in terms of how it fits together with experience. And to me, like with clients, I notice how far I get them, and then I go, what piece do I want to add to, for an individual or for groups of people? Like, where can I take how far I got further? And sometimes the nice thing about doing that is it builds whole new directions that, you know, taking people in trance and then literally just thinking to yourself, what happens if we go the other way? Because a lot of times what clients request for themselves isn't enough. I said for years, I, I've, I've used the adage that it's not that people don't have what they want or that they have something they don't want. It's the other two possibilities that really open the door. There's a lot of things that they don't want and they don't have. In fact, they've never even considered as possibilities. That people come in, they go, I don't want to argue with my wife. Well, see, that's something that if you think about it, they have something and they don't want it. And I begin to think, well, what don't they have that they don't want yet? Because part of my job is to make people want things. Because the problem is that, see, you get into conflict in the world of scarcity when people, when people figure, you know, the choice is, is we're going to fight or not, say, as opposed to going all the way to the opposite end. You know, because I figure if they're not, I start out, well, if you're not fighting, what are they going to do? And I mean, you know, it's like if people go, I don't want to be afraid, I think, well, if they're not afraid, what are they going to do? And I start thinking that it's better for me to decide how outrageous I can make it and how far to what extremes. Because if I shoot them on a highway that's way outside of the scope of their study, I'm going to put them on a road that starts making them have more and more grandiose desires. Because if... If you try to combat something back to ground zero, it's very difficult than if you try to take it on a whole new direction. That when somebody comes in and says, I don't want to argue with my wife anymore, well, the easiest way to do that is to shoot yourself. Right? Now, again, I use exaggeration because they always go, well, that's not what I mean. And I go, well, you have to be careful what you ask for here. Now, this, using exaggeration at this point as an information gathering tool 
is one of the things that allows you to begin to find out what kinds of things you can use. Now, if you think out of the wealth of things that, that we've done here, like all the different kinds of techniques and, and stuff and the ways in which I've showed you you could weave and layer them together, to me, the, the last piece we have to deal with here is now to take the extremes that we have at the end and to use them for the beginning of a session. Because to me, the beginning of a session is where it's at. It's what you do in the first few seconds, the information you can gather, and your ability to take your own brain and go to extremes, even if you don't take them. Because I start thinking when somebody comes in, like the last couple I saw, these people were fighters, let me tell you. I could hear them fighting almost a block away. And what I love is, I, I was, because I usually see people in hotels, and I got a, a room at the embassy suites, and you, know, you have to walk down these long corridors. It's on the, uh, the outside, but it's on the inside. You know, they have hollow hotels now. And, and I could hear them all the way down the corridor. Of course, not only could I, everybody in the place, because it's inside echo chamber. These two were snitting at each other. I mean, for the moment, they, they must have been ahead of time. So at the elevator, you couldn't hear them. But boy, once they got off the elevator, I was like, nye, 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 nye. Right. and then I hear knock, knock, knock on the door, and I open the door, and they're both quiet and smiling. Wow. Right. Well, well, this is what they do. You know, It's why generate the behavior we want to change in the context it would be useful. Let's only do it when we don't need it. <laughs> now, the thing is, is to me, is to capture people and take them not just to the opposite, but way beyond it. Because the further outside the scope of the study you can get, the easier it is to make it doable. See, it's one thing to get them to stop fighting about whatever it is. That's hard work. To get them to never get around to it because they're too busy being involved in passion and lust and flirting with each other, that's simple. Because they don't have to give up fighting, they just won't have time for it. And I, I find that, that one of the major things that I think about is keeping my clients occupied with ecstasy. And I know some of you have heard me say it in workshops, that if you can really fill somebody's life with tremendous amount of ecstasy, they don't have time for their problems. Now, it's, it's one thing to hear it as a concept. It's another to think about the intensity of the feelings that we've built here. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to try a little experiment. I want you to mix it up. Find somebody you have not worked with this weekend. I realize that most of you have probably seen each other, but just find somebody you haven't worked with yet this weekend, somebody that you know the least, right? Just, just to tilt it off a little bit. And then what I want you to do is one of you will be the programmer, one will be the programmee, and I want the programmer to start. Because what I want to do is I want to put all this together. I want you to run through your mind, start out. Remember, the most important thing is to put yourself in the right state. You want to be in the maximum uptime, the maximum time state. You want to be able to have that sense of adventure. You want to be able to really put yourself in state, and then that's why I want you to decide who's going to do which first. Now, the other person, what I want you to do is to stop and think of something that you spend time dealing with. I mean, that, you know, one of those things, you know, what do they call them, issues? <laughs> I heard somebody in the restaurant today talking about issues. Right? You know who you are. And I mean, you know, if you deal with issues, it's because you have the time to do it. Right? I mean, if you deal with, uh, you know, issues for yourself, you know, like somebody used the word trust issues. Well, you know, trust becomes an issue unless you're, you're really manipulative. Then trust isn't an issue at all. If your manipulativeness is founded on having positive intentions, manipulating those around you into feeling wonderful and into being happy. You don't worry about trust, because you only have to trust people who can manipulate you. Or unless you're doing business with them, that's a different kind of trust. That's done with contracts in a 44. You know, it's the greatest mover of submodalities, I notice. It's that or what the Aussies did. Before the workshop that I did in Australia, they gave me a bullwhip. <laughs> what could they be thinking? <laughs> I could, you know, they, they gave me this box and a nice ribbon on it and stuff. They went up and they said, we wanted to welcome you to Australia. And I opened this thing, and the first thing I see is a nice Aruba Australian hat. And I put it on, and I look down underneath it, and there's a bullwhip. And I looked at it, and I said, I said, do you, did you, do you people know who I am? <laughs> and they went, well, yeah, we heard you were kind of the cowboy of NLP. And I said, well, I don't think that this is what they meant, a cowboy hat. 
<laughs> I said, I, I think they meant something a little different. And then I pulled this thing out, and this one guy said, we're even going to give you lessons about how to use it. And I said, I already know what I'm using it for on you. <laughs> and suddenly, the Red Sea parts. Because I began to say, here's a true motivator. This is what they use it for with cows, right? To motivate them. <laughs> I want everybody in here. What sound does a cow make? And after they all did it, I had them, right? <laughs> That's the same one I use with people that tell me they're afraid to go into hypnosis because they don't want somebody to make them act like a chicken. I go, what sound does a chicken make? And they go, buck, 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 buck. And I go, see, that's what conscious minds do. Deep trance, you'll be safe. It's conscious minds that make you act like a chicken. <laughs> now, this quickness and cleverness of mind is something I want you to start instilling in yourself because once you go into state, change your time, when you turn around and the person, you ask the person what they still deal with as issues in their life. This is, you know, left over from having too much therapy, you know, that kind of stuff. Having dug around in your childhood looking for traumas, uh, uh, having co helpful colleagues. There's nothing worse than a group of therapists sitting around a clinic. I mean, they don't sit around and gossip like anybody else does. They all have to dredge through their personal history, you know, deal with their depression. They're the nominalization kings and queens of the world, you know. Well, you know, my, my depression is bad today. I feel fine, but my depression is terrible. Now, what I want you to do now is, is to start to take things that, to realize that what you need to do is to swing in your mind with whatever the issue is. What could you add to this person's life that wouldn't give them time for it? Right? What must be missing in their life for them to deal with this stuff? You know, to anybody who stays up all night having meaningful conversations with their girlfriend, right? is not thinking about the right part of their body and using it in the right way. I mean, if you use your mouth to sit up all night and discuss important issues like household chores, right, what should happen is, is you should learn to turn the sound off and keep making the same movements, but slightly different. Now, it's just a suggestion that when you find yourself engaged in activities, remember the things we went through, that about part of your task is to make the behavior appear stupid, right, to make it unfamiliar to them to do it by juxtaposing it with something that is much more powerful, much more positive. Now you have quick ways of inducing altered states in them and ways of being to amplifying the pleasurable state to the nth degree, being able to put it in their timeline into the future, lock it down to smooth out the past and to be able to do these things extremely rapidly. The only other piece that I want to add to this is that you all know how to do the belief change. The one thing I want you to do is to start out, and I'll show you, and you'll see how much easier this makes it, by telling them, even though they don't agree with you, to make them believe and do a quick belief change. Because I do this, because you have to understand your clients don't know how easy it is to change a belief. So what I do is I have them pick something they believe very strongly. Just watch where their eyes go. And I go, and you really believe this. Now, you believe this issue is really important. And they'll go, yeah, of course I do. And I go, well, let's try something just to make sure it really is important. Okay, pick something which is totally unimportant. They go, yeah. And you go, and you notice where their eyes go and you find out where that picture is. You have them pick the belief, this issue that's real important, and move it to where the unimportant one is and find out if they still feel it's important. Because if they go, well, it doesn't seem as important, you go, aha, it wasn't a real issue. You guys see the trick in this? Remember, it's part of your job to trick clients into being better. If they think it's a real issue and you pick something that's not a real issue and they can move it into those submodalities and it doesn't seem like a real issue, then it wasn't one. So then you have them then go and build a belief that that's silly to live that way and that they'd rather be involved in lustful ecstasy. And then you take that belief and amplify it out. This is a thing that I want you to really cognitively think about doing. That when you set off with a client, part of your job is to trick them out of their stupidity. To be able to juxtapose it with other things. They don't have to know that you're changing beliefs. See, they, you know, if they haven't read the book, they don't know that you're tricking them. They don't know that you're just taking a belief and making it into something ludicrous. 
You're just telling them, well, if you move the picture over here, if it's a real belief, you should still believe it. And they'll go, well, yeah. And you move it over there, and you go, still believe it? And they go, no. And you go, well, then it must have been dumb, wasn't it? Now, let's do something. And then you can ask them rhetorical questions, one of the most powerful sets of presuppositions. When you say, wouldn't you rather do something that felt better and was more useful for your life? Yeah, I mean, who's going to go, nah, not me. <laughs> I mean, you're not going to get that. So you use the rhetorical yes to get them then to engage in a worthwhile activity. And then you pick something like utter and wanton and total lust, which is a better use of time. If you engage in that, enjoying flirting, avoiding being cocacious, <clears throat> feeling lustful not just towards the, the women in their life, but towards money. That'll solve the unemployment problem, right? Desire, you know, because capitalism is a marvelous thing when it comes to motivation, you know. It's like all the Marxists I ever met in college, you know the quickest way to get somebody to shut up about that stuff? Give them some money. Then that stuff about sharing wealth. The concept doesn't seem, it's one thing to share somebody else's wealth. It's one another thing to share your wealth. <laughs> Marxism is a real good idea for other people. <laughs> now, the thing is, is, is that what I want you to do is to think that part of your job is to be a consciousness builder. That what, you get, what you've got to do is make, remember, you have to make what, what seemed important unfamiliar. Uh, Steve mentioned something to me which I thought would be a good thing for you guys to try. Have the person think, I love this one. I just, he threw this one out, and I thought, we got to all try this one. This one's a good one, because I tried it in the restaurant. It works really good. Is to pick something that you did which is utterly, absolutely bozo ridiculous. Steve used the example that uh, he told, he remembers that in college, he actually told somebody. He knows he did it, but I mean, when he thinks about it, it is just totally stupid that, you know, that if he was offered a one-way ticket, to, to Venus, he would go there. And he knows at the time he totally meant it, but he cannot even believe that he did it. You know, he knows he did it, but he can't even believe that he did it. Now that's a good set of, <laughs> ring a bell, huh? <laughs> that one lit up on somebody. I mean, think of some of the things that you used to espouse when you were in college. I mean, you know, some of those ardent, <laughs> Hardened beliefs. You must have had some doozies, right? <laughs> that if you thought about saying it now, the only thing you could do would be to blush, right? And if you hear other people say it, you think to yourself, what a bozo, right? We've all done that stuff. Find that and the four tuples and the submodalities of that and put the issue inside there and then pull out from the center of it something more important. Do you want to, do you want to remember how it works? Put it on the pendulum. Do you want to pay attention? to being a bozo, or do you want to pay attention to doubling and quadrupling your sexual prowess and lust in your life? It's up to you. Want this one? <laughs> or you want this one? What's it going to be? <laughs> okay, what I want you to do is to do it, I want, and I want you this time to go at top speed, okay? Now is where we start to integrate it. I want you to put the pedal to the metal. I want you to do 10 minutes a piece. Rock and roll. And no talking in between, just jam through it. Okay? This is integration time. Go out there and do it. Make me proud. <laughs>
They aren't the exact things that I do, but they're based on the same principles as everything else you've learned in every other workshop. That the true artistic application of using NLP with an individual or with groups, whether training salesmen or whether selling a car. Because to us doing NLP, we all realize there's no difference between what you do working with a client no matter what that client's profession is or their personal needs or outcome are, what we're doing is getting them to move away from the past and into the future in such a way that they build more and more useful representations. That what they do is they align their conscious and their unconscious resources. And as you begin to scan the various techniques that you've learned here, what you will recognize is that the most important part of them is how they are applied in combinations. That language patterns support all the other techniques. But it isn't the specific technique you use to get somebody to go into the future with pleasure and optimism. It's the way in which you weave and layer them together so that you build full and powerful representations. Representations that will stay with you for the rest of your life. As you listen to the programming your future tape, I hope that one of the things that you were able to gain from it was that that entire tape won't work for everyone, but the general sense of it is to aim people towards a future that's functional, towards one that's more functional than their world would have allowed. It's not just that you break the limits of someone's model of the world, it's that you build a model of the world around it it's so much larger, so much more inclusive, and so much more wantonly pleasurable that there's no way that they could possibly resist it because it's irresistible. And as they look back at that small model of the world, the one with the pain, the one with the discomfort, the one filled with righteousness, seriousness, and stupidity, they don't want to go back there at all because it doesn't seem likely that they would be able to fall into the same traps. And as you assist the people that you work with, both consciously and unconsciously, and aligning their resources in such a way as to be able to find that want and pleasure, what you will build in them is an ultimate sense of delight and wonder about what's going to come in the future. A hungry sense where instead of avoiding experience, people hunger for it. They want to know what's next, what's new, how can it be better? And as you focus on how much better things are and how much more you can have, you begin to increase the potency, the pleasure, and the desire that you're capable of feeling for all things. With this in mind, I now desire to leave Boulder behind. And as you leave or stay in Boulder and leave the Holiday Inn, take the learnings of this room with you and look into your own future and find out where they're going to be practical, feasible, and applicable. And use them in your own life in that way and with the lives of those that you work with and touch, not with a sense of unrealistic expectation, but with a sense that you go one step at a time and build more and more for yourself in such a way that you slowly expand the possibilities ad infinitum. With that in mind, I got a plane to catch. It's been fun. Rock and roll!